In this series, we'll be looking at specific cards from Yu-Gi-Oh's history, and detailing what was great about them, why they might have stopped seeing play, and everything else in between. To start this off, we'll be going over one of my favorite boss monsters, Obelisk the Tormentor. Obelisk the Tormentor is a level 10 Divine Beast type monster, and simply has the effect that you must provide three tributes for its tribute summon. Your opponent can't negate its summon, it can't be targeted by card effects from both players, once per turn it can give up its battle and tribute two monsters in order to destroy all of your opponent's monsters, and if this card is special summoned, it's sent to the graveyard during the end phase. This card is part of a series of monsters known as the God Cards, because in the original Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, they just gave them a whole bunch of effects, and each one was basically a boss monster of a card, in like the video game sense. But because of all of its effects, it couldn't possibly be released in the actual game, with all of the weird rules and limitations, as it seems like they just made up new effects every time they brought the cards out. And of the three original God cards which were released, only Obelisk the Tormentor saw any kind of competitive play at first. Nowadays, the only God card which sees competitive play is the Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode, which is technically just one of the versions of the Winged Dragon of Raw and not the original card itself. In the anime, the effects of Obelisk the Tormentor were as follows. First off, it also required three tributes for its normal summon. Secondly, it also had a couple of additional protection effects, where it could not be tributed by your opponent, control of the card could not swap to your opponent. It also had some weird protections from spells, traps, and monster effects, where basically it was immune to most traps except for the ones that altered its attack and defense and prevented it from attacking, but it was only affected by those cards for one turn. It was affected by spell cards except for ones that would remove it from the field. It was also unaffected by monster effects except for the monster effects of other god cards, which would only work on it for one turn with the exception of the Winged Dragon of Ra, whose effect would work on it normally. Obelisk was also treated as a warrior-type monster. It could not be equipped with cards. If special summoned, it would return to the place it was special summoned from during the end phase. If it was in defense position, your opponent could only target this card for attacks and effects, similar to Haman Lord of Striking Thunder. During your main phase, you can tribute two monsters to destroy all of your opponent's monsters, and then immediately attack directly, but then it can't attack during the battle phase that turn. And also, during the battle phase, you can instead tribute two monsters to make this card's attack become infinity for one attack only. So, all in all, its anime counterpart had around 10 effects, which is still way less than the Winged Dragon of Raw, which clocked in at around 20 effects. And you can see, with all of the weird rules and limitations on its anime effects, that they couldn't really directly import that to the real game. So in order to try to have a more balanced version of its anime counterpart, it kept some of its protection in the form of full target immunity, and since this is one of the target immune cards which also prevents the owner of the card from targeting it, it also kept its little distinction where you can't equip it with cards, since you need to be able to target your own cards in order to equip it with one. It also kept its ability to tribute two cards to destroy all of your opponent's monsters, but they didn't allow it to attack immediately afterwards, nor did it let it keep its infinite attack effect during the battle phase. And they even kind of gave it the effect where it returns to the place it was special summoned to at the end of the turn, except in this case it just goes to the graveyard because that's a lot less of a rules nightmare. And of the three original god cards, Obelisk was the only one who was given target immunity, and it was the only one with a high baseline attack of 4000. So, of the three, Obelisk was easily the most useful since a Slifer had its attack based on how many cards are in your hand, and didn't have any form of protection on the field, and the Winged Dragon of Ra was even worse. It had the restriction where it could not be special summoned at all. Its attack was entirely dependent on paying all of your life points, and also had no form of protection once it hit the field either. The only form of protection these three cards shared was how your opponent can't negate its summon or activate any cards on their summon. So they were safe from stuff like Bottomless Trap Hole, for example, but vulnerable to everything else. Although getting three monsters in the field for a normal summon, for just a target immune 4000 attack beater, isn't what you'd call a very good strategy in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. And it wasn't super good back in the day when they did finally release the card. But despite that, it did still see some competitive play. The year was 2010. A new wave of frog support had been released, culminating with Ronin Toten being added in the middle of 2010, which gave them access to the frog tribute engine trio. Substitoad, Swap Frog, and of course Ronin Toten all allowed frog decks to pull out a near infinite amount of tribute fodder. And since Obelisk the Tormentor was released at the beginning of 2010, 
It seemed like a no-brainer that Obelisk would be played alongside Monarch support and frogs. So a 2010 Frog Monarch deck would run excellent tribute summon cards like Caius the Shadow Monarch, Light and Darkness Dragon, and of course a single copy of Obelisk the Tormentor. Which was a perfect deck that countered a lot of the meta, where the main form of removal at the time was targeting, with cards like Gladiator Beast Guy Zaras, or just staple trap cards at the time, like Solemn Judgment, Compulsory Evacuation Device, or Bottomless Trap Hole, none of which could stop Obelisk. However, even with all of these things, it was still only a one-of, and it immediately stopped seeing play once Substitute was banned, and that wasn't even the most efficient use of Substitute. It still pretty much only saw niche playing frog decks until 2013. That's when Obelisk hit its peak of popularity, thanks to one certain archetype, which is famous for being one of the strongest archetypes in the game while never actually hitting the status of tier 0. And that of course is the Dragon Rulers. The Dragon Rulers were a series of four monsters, each one representative of one of the attributes in the game except light and dark and all four of them basically had the same three effects, where each Dragon Ruler could special summon themselves from the Hand or Graveyard by banishing two monsters from the Hand or Graveyard, which either shared the same attribute as that specific Dragon Ruler, or was simply just Dragon-type. Their second effect was if said Dragon Ruler was banished, you got to add a Dragon-type monster from your deck to your hand that shared the same attribute as that Dragon Ruler. And lastly, each one had a different and unique hand effect, where you could send it and another monster of its attribute from your hand to the graveyard in order to either destroy one card in the field, special summon one monster from the graveyard, send a monster from the deck to the graveyard, or add any dragon monster from your deck to your hand. And they all shared the same restrictions, where they all shared a hard once per turn between all three of their effects, and if they special summon themselves, they'd return to your hand at the end of your opponent's turn. So, what made the dragon rulers so good was the fact that they were a recursion machine. All four of the Dragon Rulers could bring themselves out very easily, and you could use the Dragon Rulers to bring out another Dragon Ruler as a material, in order to activate the effects of the other Dragon Rulers to search out more cards. In addition to the fact that the hand effects of the Dragon Rulers were all good. So, how did Obelisk fit into this deck? Well, for one, since the Dragon Rulers had four cards that could special summon themselves from the graveyard, getting the required three monsters in the field for a tribute summon of an Obelisk was not overly difficult. And for two, since Dragon Rulers were so popular, pretty much everyone was playing Dragon Rulers, and mirror match Dragon Ruler decks didn't really have an out to Obelisk. The two most popular extra deck monsters that Dragon Rulers went into were Mecha Phantom Beast Draco Sack and Number 11 Big Eye, both of which need to target a monster in order to remove them, and they just didn't have monsters that could easily boost their attack over 4000 to destroy Obelisk by battle. The only common out you could go into in a Dragon Ruler deck was basically just using Black Rose Dragon to destroy the field. And because Dragon Rulers could provide the tributes for Obelisk very easily, by either just special summoning through Dragon Rulers, or more realistically, going into Mecha Phantom Beast Draco Sack and using it to provide three tributes, Obelisk was the perfectly vile option to bring out, and was incredibly difficult for other Dragon Ruler decks to do anything about it. But Spellbook decks could deal with it no problem, as Spellbook of Fate was non-targeting banishing removal. And other kinds of decks had outs to it as well, so Obelisk was mostly purely a side deck option, very rarely played in the main deck. And even then, it was mostly played as a one-off in the side deck. Sometimes two copies, but rarely three. Which is kind of surprising for a card that's basically meant to win a mirror match. Then, after all the Dragon Ruler cards were limited to one copy, Obelisk just kind of stopped seeing play and was no longer included in their side decks. Although it's not because the Dragon Rulers were restricted and limited to one, it was actually because at the same time, a new generic rank 4 Xyz monster called Evil Swarm Excited Knight was released, which gave pretty much every deck an easy out to Obelisk, with its ability to destroy everything on the field as long as you controlled less cards than your opponent, and could get two level 4 monsters on the field. Despite Obelisk not really seeing any competitive play since 2014, it remained a pretty popular card in the more casual scene, alongside pretty much all archetypes from the original Duelist Kingdom arc. Although despite its popularity, it didn't really receive any support until 2020 in the OCG, with the release of a new card called Fist of Fate. This is a quick play spell card, which can only be activated if you control a monster whose original name is Obelisk the Tormentor, which basically allows you to negate the effects of a monster your opponent controls, and then just like super negate and destroy that card where the effects of its name, its mom's name, anything related to that card just no longer works until the end of the turn. 
Also, it's spell speed 4, so your opponent can't respond to it, and if you use this during your main phase, you also get to destroy all of your opponent's spell and trap cards. So a very thematic super destruction effect, which is nowhere near good enough to allow Obelisk the Tormentor to continue seeing play in the modern era. It is pretty in line with cards that require a specific name monster in the field in order to be activated, though. Generally, those effects have to be super strong because of how limiting they are. In 2014, it also did get some blanket support with Ra's Disciple, which is a level 4 monster that allows you to special summon two other copies of it from your hand or deck when this card is summoned, but with the restriction that they can basically only be used as tribute fodder for the three god cards, including Obelisk. And also, you cannot special summon monsters while it's on the field, except other copies of itself. And because of this lockdown on yourself from special summoning, this card actually saw competitive play in Duel Links when it was released as a card to give to your opponent in order to stop them from being able to special summon monsters, which eventually got cards like Give and Take limited on their ban list, as it allows you to special summon Ra's Disciple from your graveyard directly to your opponent's side of the field. And now, it's time for unconventional combos with Obelisk. Did you know, according to Yugipedia, if you have some good insect-type monsters in your graveyard, the trap card, Spider Egg, can protect both yourself from an attack and special summon three spider tokens, which can then be used to summon Obelisk on your next turn. Also, if you combine Obelisk with either March of the Monarchs or Mound of the Bound Creator, you can give yourself a virtually indestructible obelisk. And this concludes Unconventional Combos with Obelisk from the Yugipedia Tips and Tricks section. Now, I'm sure everyone is probably wondering, but what exactly is an obelisk? Well, it's the thing you're looking at that I got from the stock image website. Although, to be more specific, it's a type of religious monument from ancient Egypt, which can refer to any number of things, but the important thing is that it was based on ancient Egypt aesthetic. A lot of early Yu-Gi-Oh cards were based around ancient Egypt type things, unlike modern Yu-Gi-Oh where most new cards are based on anime waifus. Seeing as the Egyptian gods were so popular in the original Yu-Gi-Oh anime, there have been a number of retrains of Obelisk over the years. One of them being the Wicked God counterpart called the Wicked Dreadroot. This is a 4000 attack monster which requires 3 tributes for its normal summon and cannot be special summoned at all and its only effect on the field is to have the attack and defense of all other monsters. Which means the Wicked Dreadroot can beat over the original Obelisk in a fight, since its ability to have all attacks on the field doesn't target. It also has a Sacred Beast counterpart called Raviel, Lord of Phantasms, which looks almost exactly like the original Obelisk, and it has the effect where it cannot be normal summoned and can only be special summoned from your hand by tributing three Fiend-type monsters you control. And then has the effects where each time your opponent normal summons a monster, you get to special summon a token with a thousand attack and defense. Once per turn, this card can tribute a monster to gain that monster's attack until the end of the turn. So, it is nice that the card can special summon itself from the hand with its tributes, rather than requiring your normal summon, but requiring those three monsters on the field to be fiend type is what kind of kills this card, in addition to its pretty lackluster effects. Although, they did release a retrain of this card, called Raviel, Lord of Phantasms, a Shimmering Scraper, which can special summon itself from the hand by tributing any three monsters. Although I will note, the other Sacred Beast card called Haman, Lord of Striking Thunder, which is based on the Winged Dragon of Ra, actually has an effect that's very similar to one of Obelisk's anime effects, that while Haman's in defense position, your opponent can only target this card for attacks, and with 4,000 defense, that's not half bad. Now. As a fun little thought experiment, how could we fix Obelisk to make it compete in the modern era? If we were to alter the effects of Obelisk the Tormentor so that it would actually see play, and to fit the theme of the original card, here's what I would do. Just like, make it immune to card effects. Just straight up, ultimate falcon that card. In the original anime, part of what made the god cards so worth the effort to bring out was how hard they were to get rid of once they hit the field. And the only reason Obelisk saw play was because of its targeted immunity on a 4000 attack beat stick. The fact that it can also destroy your opponent's cards was just a bonus, but not the main reason the card was played. So if they simply changed its targeted immunity to just everything immunity, I think that would go a really long way to the card actually seeing play. In fact, it might go too far and make it a little bit overpowered in some unforeseen circumstance. Generally, the ability to become immune to all card effects is heavily regulated, 
Part of the reason Masterpiece, the true Draco Slain King, is banned is because of its ability to become immune to two-thirds of the cards in the game, on top of its spell speed 2 disruption. You don't have to change anything else about Obelisk except what it's immune to, and that might be enough to kind of break the card. Alternatively, if you don't want to make it hard to destroy, they did release a new card made specifically for Obelisk, so if they just gave that card's effect to Obelisk, I think that would also help too. Give it a spell speed 4 monster negation effect, which can also destroy your opponent's back row if used during your turn. In this alternative case, it would have all of its other same effects, just this one added on top of it. Although, in order for it to fit in the card text, we could just remove its ability to tribute two monsters to destroy all of your opponent's monsters in order to give it this quick effect. In that case, it would still be a target immune monster with a really good negate, which would be worth building the required tributes to bring it out. And one advantage tribute summon monsters have over special summon ones is the ability to play floodgates with them, like the Monarchs Erupt. Although, just to stress this again, only a fun thought experiment. I'm not saying they should change the card to make it more competitive, that doesn't really make any sense, but I do think playing with how you could fix the card to make it more competitive does a good job of highlighting why the card doesn't currently see play. Non-targeting destruction effects are very prevalent, so even a halfway competent meta deck can out Obelisk pretty easily. Which is a problem based on how many cards are required to actually bring the card out properly. However, if they were to release a clone retrain like they did with Raviel, Lord of Phantasm, Shimmering Scraper, then that could be a good way to give it better effects. Here's how the Tillman cards work. Every Tillman card has a powerful main effect, as well as a secondary effect whenever it's sent to the graveyard by a card effect, making them similar to the Shadow archetype. These effects can vary from gaining you advantage in some way, like the Tillamet Spell and Trap cards, or can instead be used to perform fusion summons, like with Shiren, Havness, and Merrily, by placing fusion materials from your hand, field, or graveyard on the bottom of your deck. This effect can be used to summon out any fusion monster you want, with the only restriction being that one of the materials you use must be the Tillamet monsters you activate in the grave. With these effects, you can access a number of insane boss monsters, including its archetypal bosses. There's Kit Kalos for swarming and milling, Rukalos, which beats Nibiru and Beasteals, and Kaleido Heart, which can spin back any card your opponent controls back into the deck. As a result of all the tier limit cards having powerful graveyard effects, most of the tier limit cards have some kind of effect to send cards to the graveyard by either milling cards from top of the deck, foolishing cards, or by sending a card from the hand or field to the graveyard. This made most tier limit strategies highly graveyard focused, with most decks incorporating powerful graveyard effects such as the likes of Fairy Tale Snow and the Ishizu engine, which helps cement them to tier 0 status. In fact, tier limits as a strategy is so strong that in every format where they've been released, they've had severe hits on the ban list and were even pre-hit in Master Duel before they even came to the game. So depending on the format you play, your Tillman ratios are going to differ drastically. When Tier was at full power, you would play three copies of Paler Rhino, Rhino Heart, Shiren, Havnis, Merely, and alongside one or two copies of Tillamet Suliak. And depending on the meta, you could play a copy of Crime, Meta Noise, Heartbeat, Perlegia, and or Grief as one ofs in the main or side, with one to two copies of Kid Kalos alongside at least one Rukalos and a Kaleido Heart in the extra deck. Astute observers may have noticed this is pretty much every single tier limits card in the archetype. And the reason for that is because there aren't really any bad tier limit cards, giving the deck insane adaptability. However, currently the TCG Kit Kalos is banned, and Shiren, Havnus, and Merrily are all limited to one copy. The OCG also has the same hits, but also has Paler Rhino and Rhino Heart limited. And the crazy part is, even despite these incredibly restrictive hits, tier limits as the deck is still quite playable in both formats. The same is true of Master Duel where the deck was pre-hit before the cards even got to the game. However, these hits weren't as restrictive as either TCG or the OCG, because while Paler Rhino is limited in Master Duel, you can still play Rhino Heart at 3, Shiren, Havnus, and Merrily at 2, and Kit Kalos is still legal at 1 copy. But because Master Duel's cards release are a bit behind the OCG and TCG, you can't play the likes of Tier Limits Cash Tier yet. But when it does eventually release, it's likely to be played at multiple copies, just like it was in other formats since it's an amazing extender. Now, let's take a look at what makes this deck so strong by looking at what the tier limits actually do, starting off with their field spell, Primeval Planet Pillar Rhino. In the Visa Starfrost lore, every archetype comes with its own field spell that has three effects. One which searches on activation, a continuous attack boost, and a pop, and Pillar Rhino might just be one of the best ones currently available in the game. The strength of a search is often based on the targets that you can search, and Pillar Rhino basically acts as extra copies of any tier limit monster giving it a ton of versatility since you can add Rhino Heart or Merrily if you need a starter, Shireen if you need an extender, or Havnis and Tillamet's Cash Tier if you want interruption. You can even search Visa Starfrost, and while most Tillamet builds don't actually run Visas, it being searchable with Pillar Rhino means you can search this particular field spell with a graveyard effect of Trivi Karma. 
which is really important in formats where Paleo Rhino is limited like Master Duel or the OCG. Its second effect might even seem relatively minor, because all it does is give every tier limit monster and every fusion monster you control a 500 attack buff, but this small increase goes a long way by turning your fusion boss monsters into absolute powerhouses that are incredibly hard to out. A 2200 attack window can be difficult out for most decks, but not impossible, but it gets a lot harder to deal with once it reaches 2700 attack. And while most decks might have a way to crash into tier limits Collider Heart with 3000 attack, most decks will struggle to deal with it once it reaches 3500. And last but not least, Pillar Rhino's third effect, where you can trigger whenever a Tillman's monster is returned to the deck, such as buy into Shizu Shuffler or their own fusion effects, and allows you to target any card in the field and destroy it with it being a hard once per turn. This effect is insanely versatile, and can be used during your turn to remove your opponent's powerful boss monsters in back row, or can even be used as interruption during your opponent's turn by shuffling back your own tier limits with their fusion effects. But that's not where the versatility ends, because instead of popping your opponent's cards, you can also pop your own in order to trigger the graveyard effects of your tier limits, which you can use in order to start comboing off, making it a really interesting way of starting or extending your combos as well. More often than not though, Planet's best use is as a searcher for the archetype, which you can use to grab your starters such as Tier Limits Merely. Merely has two effects. Its second effect is its graveyard effect that's shared by both Shyrand and Havness, where if it's sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can perform a fusion summon by putting materials from your hand, deck, or graveyard on the bottom of your deck, including itself. But its unique effect is what happens when it's normal or special summoned, where you get to mill three cards from the top of your deck. This effect is quite strong in a deck like Tier, because it gives you a chance to trigger some of your powerful graveyard effects to combo off. Most of the Tier Limit monsters have an effect to mill cards in some way, but what makes Merely uniquely powerful is that it's a level 2 monster. This gives it some really interesting synergy with the sprite cards, and even allowed for some hybrid builds of Tier Limits to thrive with a large sprite engine in the main deck. But in most Tier Limit strategies, Merely is used in combination with either Sprite Elf to revive Merely during your opponent's turn as some extra interruption, or is sent by the effect of Sprite Sprint from the deck to the graveyard in order to trigger its fusion effect. Depending on the format you're in, however, Merely's utility can vary, because Elf is banned in the OCG and in the TCG, and a Master Duel Sprint hasn't been released yet. But Elf is still legal, so you can still use Merely as an interruption during your opponent's turn if you're set up. But if you want to be able to combo on your turn 0, you'll be relying on Tier Limits Havness. Havness has the same fusion effect as Merely, but its unique effect is actually a quick effect that can be activated in the hand in response to an opponent's on-field monster effect. And it allows you to special summon Havness from your hand, and then build three cards to the top of your deck. And in any format where a mass of tier elements and Tashizu cards are legal at the same time, Havness becomes one of the best hand traps in the game. Because if you can fill your deck with a ton of powerful mills, Havness becomes an amazing threat that can put a stop to your opponent's combo by letting you combo off at the same time, letting you drown in advantage while your opponent's combos are interrupted by a turn zero window. This dynamic makes Havness both really strong and interesting, because while most hand traps like Ash Blossom and Effect Veiler are designed to stop an opponent's action, Havness instead allows your opponent's effects to go through, but punishes them instead by letting you reach your entire engine during their turn. And then, if you need to, you can tailor whatever boss monster you need for your opponent's combo. Letting you access Kaleido Heart to shovel back your opponent's important combo piece, or Dragostapalea if you really need your sprite opponent's monsters to be converted into a level 1 monster, or to just negate monster effects. But if you just need an extender on your own turn, it's hard to get a better option than Tier Limit Shiren. Shiren has the same fusion effect as the other main deck Dark Aqua monsters, but its unique effect allows you to summon it from your hand, then send a monster from your hand to the graveyard, and then mill the top three cards of your deck. Now, sending a monster from your hand to the graveyard can technically be seen as a downside, since you're going minus one just for a special summon in a mill. However, this is actually an insane benefit since it helps you activate the graveyard effects of the other monsters in your hand. Since because Shiren sends from your hand to the graveyard, it means you can easily trigger the Ishizu Millers, and because it sends for effect and not cost, it can also be used to activate the graveyard effects of your other Tillit monsters to go into your fusions. But like with Merely, Shiren gains a lot of versatility from its level. It being an extender that's level 4 means that the strategy has really easy rank 4 access, since Shiren alongside an Ishizu monster or a Rhino Heart can give you access to Baguska or an Abyss Dweller, which can be game winning in the mirror. It also means that you have easy access to Time Thief Redoer, one of the only Xyz monsters in the game that detaches for effect and not for cost. This means that in tier limits, even if you don't have a trap attached to Redoer, it's still a powerful interruption tool since you can detach your tier limit Shiren to trigger its graveyard effect during your opponent's turn and start fusion summoning. Speaking of level 4 monsters, there's also tier limits Rhino Heart, the deck's main starter and Visa's equivalent that's a key combo piece for the strategy. But unlike other main deck tier limit monsters, Rhino Heart isn't a Dark Aqua monster. It's a Water Warrior. When Rhino Heart is normal or special summoned, you get to send a Tillman's monster other than Rhino Heart from your deck to the graveyard, allowing you to instantly fusion to the likes of Kid Kalos off of just a single normal summon. But Rhino Heart's graveyard effect is actually quite different from the other Tillman monsters, since when it's sent to the graveyard by a card effect, 
You can special summon Rhino Heart and then send a Tealment monster from your hand to the graveyard, but then you have to banish it when it leaves the field. And just like Shiren's hand effect, Rhino Heart's graveyard effect has a lot of utility since it can be used to trigger the graveyard effects of any of the Tealment monsters you've drawn. And since it can also send Tealment spell and trap cards, you can use Rhino Heart to trigger the graveyard effects of cards like Suliac and Scream, which is a boon from the deck's consistency. And because Rhino Heart's graveyard effect and on summon effect can be used in the same turn, milling a Rhino Heart off of one of your Tealment cards is a huge benefit because it gives you a free foolish of any of your other Tealment monsters. Another strong aspect of Rhino Heart though is its name because it's one of the required materials for Telemann's Kaleida Heart. Because in order to fusion summon Kaleida Heart, you need to fuse Rhino Heart in any two Aqua Monsters. It can't be fused away with your opponent's Super Poly or Telemann effect, since it can't be used as a fusion material at all, even while in the graveyard due to its condition. Now, Kaleida Heart's first effect actually has two ways it can be triggered, allowing you to target any card your opponent controls and shuffle it back into the deck when Kaleida Heart is special summoned, or if an Aqua Monster is sent to your graveyard by a card effect. This makes Kaleida Heart a premier removal tool for the strategy, since you're always going to be milling Aqua Monsters anyway in order to make your plays, so this gives you a free way to remove your opponent's cards in the field without triggering any potential graveyard effects. And because this effect can also be used on summon, you can fuse into Kaleida Heart during your opponent's turn with your Tealment Monsters to use its removal as interruption for your opponent's combo. But, like with the main deck cards, Kaleida Heart also has an insanely powerful graveyard effect when it's sent there by a card effect, and allows you to special summon Kaleida Heart from your graveyard and then send a Tealment card from your deck to the graveyard. This effect is absurd, because not only do you get the opportunity to send any Tealement monster to the graveyard to continue fusion summoning, but you also have the option of sending any Tealement spell or trap card, and by having a choice of what you send, the deck's consistency goes to the roof to trigger whatever graveyard effect you need at any given time. Especially since Cloud of Heart is so easy to trigger, since it can be done with either Kid Kallus' effect, or even popping it with your own Paler Rhino. One of the best targets you can send with Cloud of Heart is Tear Limit Scream, because if Scream is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can search out any Tear Limit's trap card. But even Scream's on-field effect is amazing, because while you control it, whenever a monster is normal or special summon, you can send the top three cards of your deck to the graveyard. And then it applies a lingering effect, which reduces the attack of all monsters your opponent controls, and will control by 500 until the end of the turn. So even if a monster isn't on the field by the time Scream is activated, it will still have its attack reduced. This attack modification is actually quite relevant. Because with the likes of Pillar Rhino, it makes every one of your monsters even more difficult to out. Especially when paired with Pillar Rhino's buff. But it's the first part of this effect that makes this irrelevant, because on your turn it's an extender that can mill extra cards so you can seed your graveyard and make your plays. But because Scream triggers when any monster is normal or special summoned, it can be used to punish your opponent for trying to combo off by acting as interruption, milling three cards and allowing you to potentially start your combo on their turn. And because its graveyard effect is so versatile, Scream is often played at multiple copies so you can take advantage of its on-field effect and graveyard effect at the same time, since the Telemet trap cards are so powerful they're worth searching. The worst of these traps is Telemet's Meta Noise, a Book of Moon that allows you to foolish any Telemet monster directly from your deck. And when it's milled, you get to target a Telemet monster in your graveyard and add it to your hand. Even for being the worst of the Telemet trap cards, Meta Noise is still absurd and could potentially be game-winning certain matchups like Sprite or Kashtira. The only reason it never saw as much play as the others is because the strength of its effect is really dependent on the decks that existed in the meta that weren't tier, since Meta Noise was never really that strong in a mirror match. Combined with the fact that its graveyard effect is kind of mediocre, it meant that Meta Noise is more of an option rather than a must include. Crime's graveyard effect also isn't the best since it can only add a banished Tealment monster to your hand. This can be useful alongside Tealment Cash Tira, or if your opponent has been using Bestials to banish your tears, but when compared to other graveyard effects in the deck, it's not really a card you'd want to mill. But Crime still saw a ton of competitive play, and a huge reason for that was because of its primary effect. Since Crime is a counter trap card that lets you negate the activation of any spell or trap card or monster effect while you control a Tearmit monster, then shovel that card into the deck, and then send a monster from your hand to the graveyard. Sending a monster for effect from the hand isn't really a cost for tier limits at all, so Crime was basically a free Omni Negate that allowed your deck to easily beat board breakers such as evenly match for free. And if it wasn't being used to stop board breakers, it was an insane interruption for combo strategies that was hard to interact with. But out of all the tier limit trap cards, the most powerful one you usually be searching for is tier limit Suliac. Suliac strikes the perfect balance of having an insanely powerful on-field effect as well as an amazing graveyard effect. Its field effect can only be activated while you control a tier limit monster or Visa Starfrost. It allows you to target and affect monster opponent controls to negate its effects permanently, but then you have to send a monster you control to the graveyard. And if it's sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can add any Telemet monster from your deck to your hand. Both of these effects are absurd and give Suliac an insane amount of versatility. With its on-field effect, you're getting a free interruption every turn since it's a continuous trap card that stays in the field, allowing you to keep permanently negating your opponent's combo pieces and boss monsters. All the while, sending Telemet monsters you control to the graveyard so you can trigger their graveyard effects, letting you get yet another way to perform fusion summons on your opponent's turn. And if you happen to mill Suliac off of any other Tealman effect, it has the strongest effect of all three of the Tealman trap cards. 
basically being an extra rota that allows you to search for whatever Tillamook monster you need at any given moment. In terms of the other Tillamook spells and traps though, they're usually not played unless a specific meta calls for the use. For example, Tillamook's Heartbeat was used during the time Mystic Mind was legal, as it gave the deck a searchable way of adding your opponent's floodgates. Perlugia saw minor experimentation to send King of the Swamp to the graveyard after Tear was hit in the OCG and TCG, and while Grief never saw that much competitive play, it's still a decently strong extender that can be used to trigger your Tillamook graveyard effects. The issue with these cards was never that they were bad, it was just that Tillamook had so many insane cards that they could play that it could never find room for cards that were just good or okay. And even right now, with all the restrictions placed on Tillamook, the deck is still rogue relevant in the OCG and TCG with different builds being made viable with the help of Cash Tear and Lunalite engines, alongside its legal fusion boss monsters like Kaleido Heart and Tillamook Rukalos. Especially Rukalos, a boss monster that's so strong, even with one of its materials banned, it still sees consistent play in Tillamook strategies. In order to fuse into Rukalos, you need Tillamook Kid Kalos and any other Tillamook monster, making it real easy to go into in a format where Kid Kalos is legal, but even in formats where Kid Kalos is banned, Tillamook strategies just play King of the Swamp in order to access a fusion substitute so they can still access Rukalos. And it's more than worth it to summon it in either instance, because Rukalos has three crazy effects. Its first effect protects all of your other Aqua monsters from being destroyed by battle, making it impossible for your opponent to try to beat over the likes of Shiran and Merely. This was especially important in Tillamook builds that played a heavy sprite package, as it meant that Rukalos could protect your Dupe Frog and Totally Awesome from being destroyed by battle or something like a Bistial. Speaking of which, Rukalos' second effect was also the perfect way to deal with Bistials, because whenever your opponent activates a card or effect that would special summon a monster, you can negate the activation of the effect, destroy that card, and then send a Tillamook card from your hand or face of field to the graveyard. This effect was insanely important in the post DABL format of the TCG, because it put a stop to the recently released Bistials, and even one of the deck's biggest counters, Nibiru the Primal Being which is why you'll often see Tillamook decks racing to reach Rukalos as quickly as possible. Especially because this effect as an interruption during your opponent's turn is really solid. And like with every other Tillamook's card, Rukalos sends for effect and not for cost. Which means the downside of this effect is also a benefit, because you can use it to trigger the graveyard effects of your Tillamook cards. But you can even just send Rukalos, as if a fusion summon Rukalos is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can special summon it back to the field. Now, you can only revive Rukalos once, because after it's been brought back by its own effect, it no longer counts as being fusion summoned, so if it's sent to the graveyard again, you won't be getting it back. But regardless, this effect is still a great tool for recursion that you'll be using alongside Rukalos' second effect, as well as after it's sent it to the graveyard with the effects of Tillamook Suliac. And the best part of it is, because Rukalos is one of the few water monsters in the archetype, your opponent won't be able to stop it with the likes of Abysteel, but it is at least still vulnerable to the likes of Ghost Spell and Deity Crow. In general, Rukalos is a powerhouse of a card that helped turn Tear from powerful to nearly invincible since it managed to deal with a ton of its biggest counters. And if it's ever accessible, Tulemints is always in a decent position. But the card that, more than anything else, allowed for Tulemints to reach its Tier 0 status in multiple different formats is Tulemints Kit Kalos, the craziest card in the archetype that's currently banned in the TCG and OCG it was pre-hit to be limited in Master Duel. Now, you can access Kid Kalos by fusing together any Tillamook's monster with any Aqua monster, which just means a single Rhino Heart summon gets you Kid Kalos. And every one of its three effects is absurd. Its first effect happens on Summon, which lets you either add a Tillamook card from your deck to your hand, or send that Tillamook card from your deck to the graveyard. This effect has a ton of versatility in how it can be used, because during your turn, when you fusion summon Kid Kalos, you can use it for an insane consistency boost to add whatever card you need at any given time, not just monsters which made Kid Kalos great for searching out your busted Chilma Trap cards like Suliac or an interruption like Crime to beat Board Breakers. But during your opponent's turn, you can instead use Kit to send a Chilma Monster to the graveyard, allowing you to more easily combo on turn 0 and during your opponent's turn, by letting you fuse multiple times if your Havness happens to hit a Chilma. This even gives you insanely access to Rikalos before you hit your first main phase. If Kid Kalos had this effect, it would still be nearly banally strong, but it has two other effects which really drive it over the top. Its second effect is a form of extension that allows you to target any monster you control, special summon a Tillamook monster from your hand or graveyard, and then send the targeted monster to the graveyard. Usually, you'll be using this effect to bring out the likes of Tillamook's Rhino Heart or Merely to trigger their on summon effects, while targeting Kid Kalos itself to be sent to the graveyard. Because if Kid Kalos is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you get to mill the top 5 cards of your deck for free. This is just absurd even just generically, because milling a ton of cards from your deck can give you access to a ton of insane graveyard effects, and is why cards like Chaos Ruler are banned, but in decks like Tillamints, the effect is overpowered, as it basically gives you access to your entire deck. By milling a Tillamint monster, you can combo off and start fusion summoning, and milling in a Shizu card can mill even more cards to get you access to other powerful graveyard effects, or to just shuffle back cards in your opponent's graveyard. This effect combos incredibly well with the second effect of Kid Kalos, since you can use the second effect to trigger this one, all while summoning out a Merely so that you can actually end up milling 8 cards in the same chain. And if you have a Tillamint Scream Up, you can actually end up milling 11 cards in the same chain, 
which is over a quarter of the minimum deck size. And if you throw in potentially milling two Ishizu millers, as well as the effects of Shiren and Havnis, the average Chilamid's deck is capable of milling over half of their deck in a single turn. While every Chilamid's card enables in some way, it's Kid Kalos that provides the deck with an insane amount of consistency, power, and extension. There's a reason why it's banned in both the OCG and TCG, and for as long as it's legal in Master Duel, Chilamid's are going to terrorize the format. Especially since there are a number of powerful cards in the way that are going to make the deck even stronger. One of those cards being Chilamid's Kashtira. You can activate Tier Limits Cast Tier at any point during either player's main phase to special summon from the hand, then when it's summoned you get to mill three cards off of either player's deck, giving it similar utility to Tier Limits Halfness if you choose to mill your own deck. It's a bit more costly to use than Halfness though, because after you summon Tier Limits Cast Tier, you need to banish a Tier Limits or Cast Tier card from your hand or graveyard, which means that in order to use TK on turn 0, you need to go minus 1. And when TK is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can mill another two cards on top of your deck, meaning that off of just one TK you end up milling five cards. Its summon being a quick effect basically gives the strategy three more copies of Havness that allow you to control the exact moment you interrupt your opponent, rather than relying on them activating their on-field monster effects. This is huge for the deck, because it gives you a way to combo on turn zero, even if your opponent is chain blocking their monster effects. Its banish isn't even that bad of a cost, and actually proved to be a vital benefit of the card during the time Tulemint's biggest counter, the Bistials, were seen competitive play, as whenever your opponent targeted Tulemint monsters in the graveyard to banish it and summon out their Magma Hut or Druid Swarm, you could chain Tulemint's Cash Tier to banish the monster they target instead. This is why, during the short time full power Tulemint's and Tulemint's Cash Tier were legal at the same time, most Tulemint strategies play three copies. Some would even play Cash Tier Fenrir to take advantage of their cross archetypal status by using Fenrir to search for TK. Meanwhile, in Cash Tier strategies, TK isn't played as much, but still has occasional use as a decent level 7 extender to complete the Cash Tier zone lock that can be used to attach more materials to your Cash Tier Rise Heart by milling cards and triggering a Rise Heart's mandatory attach effect. Jinzo simply has the effect where it's a 2400 attack level 6 monster that negates the effects of all trap cards while it's on the field, and prevents the activation of trap cards. Now, what's unique about Jinzo was that it came out so early in the game's lifespan, all the way back in 2002, which was the year Yu-Gi-Oh! launched in the TCG. In that time period, the maximum attack for level 5 or 6 monsters was 2500. And 1 tribute monsters were kind of the king of early Yu-Gi-Oh! As you can get a really high attack monster on the field for only one resource, instead of spending a massive 2 resources on a tribute summon a level 7 or higher monster. Where at the time, there were almost no good targets where it was viable to tribute 2 monsters. So, the name of the game in early Yu-Gi-Oh! were single tributes, and Jinzo, with its 2400 attack, was one of the strongest single tribute monsters. Not the strongest, that was definitely Summon Skull, with its impressive 2500 attack point value. But for only being slightly weaker than the Summon Skull, Jinzo had an incredibly power effect, where it just shut down one third of the cards in the game. Getting a Jinzo on the field could sometimes just win you the game, if your opponent didn't have a non-trap card out to it. So immediately upon its introduction to the game, it saw competitive play. The decks that it saw play in were so numerous that it was kind of a staple card, in the same way as Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring. If a deck had the capabilities to support one tribute, they would probably play a copy of Jinzo. If not in the main deck, then at least in the side deck against a trap-heavy deck. And as the metagame progressed, Jinzo didn't really stop seeing as much play until the Synchro era, where decks were moving away from getting out big boss monsters from the main deck, and moving into the modern era of special summoning a whole bunch of smaller monsters in order to combo out extra deck monsters. But even then, it would still occasionally see play in Frog Monarch decks, Gadgets, and Mermels, all the way until 2014, when they released a new card at the end of the year called Denko Seka. Denko Seka is a level 4 monster which has the effect where this card cannot be special summoned, and while you control no set spell or trap cards, neither player can set spell or trap cards nor activate set spell or trap cards on the field. So basically, Denko Seka was a level 4 version of Jinzo that didn't require a tribute summon. It could also shut down trap cards completely, since trap cards do need to be set on the field first before you can activate them, and was a lot easier to use in most decks, as its restriction on you was pretty easy to play around if you didn't use trap cards. And if you were going to play Jinzo, Jinzo would lock down your trap cards anyway, so it's not really any worse than what Jinzo already did to you. And Denko Seka immediately saw competitive success as soon as it came out, and just like Jinzo, kind of never stopped seeing competitive play ever since it came out. However, with an obviously power crept version of Jinzo in the game, it's kind of surprising that Jinzo did not stop seeing play as well. And funny enough, rarely were Denko Seka or Jinzo played alongside each other. Most decks that would play them would play one or the other, but not both. However, even though Jinzo was still seeing competitive play, it drastically fell in popularity in comparison to Denko Seka, 
and was kind of slowly being phased out of the meta until 2017. At the tail end of 2016, Paleozoic Dynamiscus and Totally Awesome were released. Paleozoic Dynamiscus completed the Paleozoic engine of being a really good card in their deck, which allowed you to discard a card in order to banish one face of card in the field. And then if it was in the graveyard, it could be special summoned later as a level 2 aqua type monster. Totally Awesome is a rank 2 monster that requires two level 2 aqua monsters as its materials, and basically has an effect where it can negate the effect of a spell, trap, or monster effect by sending an aqua monster from your hand or field to the graveyard, which will then destroy that card and then set it to your side of the field. So Totally Awesome was a really good Omni Negate, and Paleozoics were a really good trap deck that could easily facilitate Totally Awesome. And what was the best counter to this pure trap deck? Well, a couple of side deck additions of Jinzo. As also in 2017, Zodiacs were a very popular deck and could pretty easily side in Jinzo with how much tribute fodder they can unintentionally throw in the field. Although it wasn't just Zodiacs, Burning Abyss could make use of it as well, as could Infernoids and Monarch decks. So it was a one-stop shot to shut down a brand new, heavily trap-focused deck. And what about Denko Seka? Well, in the same time period in which Jinzo shot up an incredible popularity, Denko Seka did the exact same thing. It saw about three times as much play as Jinzo in that time period, actually, for basically the exact same reason, and was even played alongside Jinzo occasionally in the side deck. Although after 2017, with the Link era coming in, Jinzo shot down in popularity, still seen competitive play, but nowhere near as much as early 2017. And that was kind of the history of Jinzo. Every year it still sees competitive play as a side deck option, but it's pretty rare, and nowhere near as widespread as it used to be, and generally that's because Denko Seka exists as it kind of takes up the spot as the monster to stop trap cards, if you need to bring out a monster to stop trap cards. Although Jinzo is still pretty impressive for still seeing competitive play after it was power crept. This is something that rarely happens, which is just a testament to how good the original card was. Excellent for pretty much its entire competitive history, but never overpowered enough for the card to need to be banned, as it was only lightly restricted on the ban list every once in a while. And now, let's go over combos with Jinzo, from the tip section of Yugipedia. Did you know, if you use the spell card Future Fusion targeting Chimera Tech Overdragon, you can send as many machine type monsters as you want from your deck to the graveyard. So, if you're able to send three copies of Jinzo and three copies of Jinzo Returners, then the field can be swarmed with three copies of Jinzo, as Jinzo Returner has the effect where it can special summon a Jinzo from your graveyard when it's sent to the graveyard. However, the Jinzos will be destroyed during the end phase, so you better find some way to make use of them. Therein concludes tips and combos from the tip section of Yugipedia. Now, let's go over some fun facts about Jinzo. Did you know Jinzo was the first ever Effect Legend Monster card added to Yu-Gi-Oh! Rush Duels? A Legend card in Rush Duels is one that can only be played at one copy per deck. Think of it like a permanent limited restriction, and it basically has the same effects and stats as the original. One Tribute Monster, 2400 Attack, and negates the effects of all trap cards. Jinzo also makes an appearance in Yu-Gi-Oh! Speed Duels. There's a card for Esperoba, which activates as soon as the duel starts, and gives you the passive effect where your Jinzo monster are unaffected by your opponent's skill cards, and also gives you an effect where once per turn, if you control Jinzo, you can look at one of your opponent's face-down cards in their spell and trap card zone, and if it's a trap card, you get to draw one card. However, this isn't the only place where Jinzo gained special attention with Esperoba. Seen as it originally belonged to this character in the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, and was subsequently taken from him during a duel with one of the main protagonists of the stories, Joey Wheeler, after it was taken from him, this became the most used card that he obtained from another player during that arc of the anime, and it's pretty easy to see why with how powerful Jinzo is. Even in the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, they had to admit Jinzo was powerful, so he made lots of appearances. In Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, there are a grand total of five skills that directly interact with Jinzo. There's Cosmic Enlightenment, which can be activated each time your life points decrease by 1,000, where during your next draw phase, you get to draw either a random Psychic-type monster or a Jinzo monster from your deck instead of your normal draw. Then there's Cyber Energy Amplified, which has the effect when the Amplifier Equip spell card is equipped to Jinzo, it increases that monster's attack by 500, and allows you to once per turn increase his attack by another 300 points for each equipped spell card attached to it. This is supposed to make Amplifier work more like its anime version, which basically has that same effect. Next, we have Trap Search. This is a skill that can only be used when you control a face-up Jinzo, in which case you can destroy all of your opponent's trap cards. This skill is just like the Amplifier one. It's meant to simulate Jinzo's effect in the anime, where in addition to being able to negate trap cards, 
it could also destroy trap cards that were on the field. And Trap Search was one of the names of his attacks that did this. Then we have Psychic Onslaught, which is a skill that simply adds one to two Jinzos to your deck at the beginning of the duel, which can allow you to have more than three copies of Jinzo in your deck, or to just have any copies at all because a card is kind of hard to get a hold of in that game. And lastly, we have Friends and Foes. This is a skill that is only usable by Dark Side of Dimension Joey, which allows you to increase the attack of Jinzo by 300 points times the number of cards which are also mentioned in this skill with different names. This effect increases permanent and can only be used two times per duel. The other two cards mentioned are also cards in which the anime character Joey won from other duelists during the anime which is why Jinzo was randomly included alongside the Red-Eyes Black Dragon and the Legendary Fisherman. Jinzo also has a lot of specific support in its own little small archetype. Jinzo has a grand total of four different versions, two of them retrains, a level 7 and rank 6 version of Jinzo, as well as two other versions that are both a stronger and weaker version of itself. In addition, it also has a card which can treat its name as Jinzo and help search the card out of the deck. Jinzo also has a handful of spell cards which interact with it by either searching it out or requiring it to be on the field in order to use their effects, with one of the more infamous ones being Amplifier. Amplifier is a spell card which can only be equipped to Jinzo, its activation and effect cannot be negated, and simply changes the effect of the monster so that it only negates the effects of your opponent's trap cards instead of all of them on the field. So Jinzo equipped with Amplifier allows you to actually use trap cards yourself. However, that's all it does. In the anime, it also provided Jinzo some extra attack power, which the Duel Link skill helps simulate. However, even though Amplifier is kind of weak as an incredibly specific equip spell card support, it has caused a lot of illegal loops in the past. You see, in Yu-Gi-Oh, if a loop is happening which doesn't result in a change in game state, then whatever you did which would cause that loop would be ruled as an illegal move. Although recently, they kind of changed the rules on that so you can just destroy whatever card is causing the loop. But before then, since Amplifier changed the effect of Jinzo itself, what this would mean is if you had Amplifier on your side of the field equipped to a Jinzo, and your opponent stole your Jinzo with some kind of equipped spell card like Snatch Steel, for example, then once they gained control of your Jinzo, your opponent would immediately gain its new effect provided by Amplifier, which would make it so they could use trap cards. So if they then activated a continuous trap card that negates all spell cards, like say Imperial Order, or in the example we'll be using Talisman of Spell Sealing, this would then negate the effect of the equipped spell card and send it back to your opponent. And then as soon as it went back to your opponent, since Amplifier has an additional effect where its effects cannot be negated, it would then cause Jinzo to negate your opponent's trap cards again, which would then turn their Snatch Steel live again, and cause them to steal Jinzo again and then it would just repeat infinitely. The reason is because this loop is done in a way where there's no conflicting card effects. It's a pretty linear step of cards negating each other. It just happens in a way that it forms a perfect circle, and will just repeat the same lines of effects going off forever. And since there's no stop to this loop, you can't continue the game, which is what causes the loop to be an illegal loop, because there is no player interaction that happens. This is literally just passive effects interacting with each other. So in the past, you'd have to literally rewind the game before the loop happened, and then you'd be told not to do the loop. However, today you would just destroy Snatch Steel, or whatever was the last card play that caused the loop, and would subsequently break the loop. Although since Amplifier is not a very good card, no one really had to worry about this loop in the actual game, and it was always more of a theoretical thing. Now, for this final section, how could Jinzo be fixed in order to see competitive play in the modern era? The answer to this question is that it does kind of see competitive play. But if we were to change it so that it would see even more play, I think the best way to do that would be to give it some kind of way to special summon itself from the hand. Similar to what the retrain Jinzo the Machine Menace does, where if there is simply a trap card on the field or in either player's graveyard, you can special summon this card from your hand. However, Jinzo the Machine Menace does have an effect to tribute itself in order to special summon a Jinzo from your hand or graveyard, so it can potentially allow you to go into Jinzo faster, but you still need to search out Jinzo in some way, and Jinzo the Machine Menace doesn't have the effects to negate trap cards itself. It's simply a middleman into going into Jinzo. So if Jinzo instead just had Jinzo the Machine Menace's summoning condition, that would make it 10 times better. As currently, the biggest limitations on Jinzo is the fact that you'd need a tribute to bring it out normally, or you need to cheat it out in some other way, which is why Denko Seka usually sees a lot more play over Jinzo, even though Denko Seka cannot be special summoned at all, and has restrictions on how you can even activate its lockout effect. And with this new effect to special summon itself from the hand, Jinzo would probably get banned because that's too good. 
The Dogmatica engine is a series of five main deck cards which can allow you to do the following things without using your normal summon. Non-target negate during your opponent's turn with Dogmatica Flirtilis, a plus one Raigeki break with Dogmatica Punishment, which gains you advantage instead of losing it, a straight plus two in card advantage with Dogmatica Maximus, by sending two extra deck monsters of your choice to the graveyard, a searcher which is also a plus one similar to engage, and the main search of the archetype which can set the whole ball rolling without using your normal summon. In order to play this engine, all you need are up to three copies of Ecclesia, as many copies as Nadir Servant are currently legal, one Maximus, one Flirtilis, and one Shadal Schism if you're playing the Shadal engine alongside it, and if you can afford the restrictions, up to three Dogmatica punishments, usually one. Now, the extra deck is equally as important as the main deck, where you want to play Elder Entity Natis and Tatini Clan the Ash Dragon. And if you're playing the Shadow Engine, you also want El Shadow App Cologne, Construct, and Window. And then you're pretty much good to go. Now, let's go over what all these cards do. The main combo for all the Dogmatica Engine pieces are Dogmatica Ecclesia, which can special summon itself from your hand if there's an extract monster on either player's side of the field. So this engine can be used without taking up your normal summon, and simply adds any Dogmatica card, monster, spell, or trap when it's normal or special summon. However, with the caveat where you cannot special summon monsters from your extra deck for the rest of this turn, an effect a lot of the Dogmatica cards have. This restriction can be entirely avoided if you simply summon Dogmatica Ecclesia last, after you've done all your plays already, since the restriction does not care if you summon from the extra deck before you use the effect. And in fact, in most cases, is kind of required in order to special summon her from your hand. So Ecclesia allows you to search a card on its special summon with its special summon that's incredibly easy to activate, and having a restriction that's very easy to play around makes it pretty obvious why this card sees so much play as an engine piece in all kinds of different kinds of decks that are able to play it, as it just adds immediate value to a lot of decks because of a lot of the targets Ecclesia can search out. One of those targets is Dogmatica Maximus. This card has the effect to send two different monsters from your deck to the graveyard, However, your opponent must also send two monsters from their extra deck to the graveyard, which means its effect does not work on players who do not use an extra deck, although this is generally beneficial, as a lot of decks don't play cards with good floating effects like yours will. In order to bring up Maximus, you do need to banish one extra deck monster from your graveyard though. Dogmatica Fleur de Lis can special summon itself from your hand if there is simply an extra deck monster on the field, similar to Ecclesia. It also has an extra effect if there's already a Dogmatica monster on your side of the field when it's summoned, where you can non-target negate the effects of a monster on the field until the end of the turn. And its special summon is a quick effect from your hand, which means you can actually just hold on to Fleur de Lis until your opponent is about to use an effect that you want to interrupt. However, since the card requires two conditions for its negate, i.e. a special summon monster on the field and a Dogmatica card on your side of the field, it can be excluded from some Dogmatica engines if all you care about is sending monsters from the extract to the graveyard and not this card's in a gate. There's also Nadir Servant, which allows you to send an extra deck monster to the graveyard in order to search out a Dogmatica card with less attack from either your deck or graveyard. And finally, there's Dogmatica Punishment, which allows you to send a monster from your extra deck to the graveyard to destroy a face-up monster your opponent controls with an equal to or less attack than that monster's. However, it then locks you from special summoning from your extra deck until the end of your next turn, which means a lot of people opt to not play Dogmatica Punishment at all, because it does completely lock you out of your extra deck during your next turn, so it's not as easy to play around as a lot of the other Dogmatica restrictions, even if the effect itself could potentially be a plus one in card event. And finally, there's the best targets to send to the extra deck to the graveyard. First up, we have Elder Entity Tiss, which has a floating effect to destroy any card in the field, and is not once per turn. So if you send this card to the graveyard with Dogmatica Punishment, you can basically destroy two of your opponent's cards during their turn, which is a straight plus one in card economy just as long as the target Dogmatica Punishment has 2,500 or less attack. Next up, we have El Shadal Apcolone. This card's floating effect allows you to search any Shadal card from your deck or graveyard, but then requires you to discard one. This gives you access to the Shadal Extra Deck package, as long as you're playing a single copy of Shadal Schism in your main deck. And Shadal Schism will allow you to use Apcolone in your graveyard, plus a light or dark monster, in order to bring out El Shadal Construct or Winda, which are two really good cards to go into, especially since you only have to play a single extra main deck card in order to gain access to these cards. So this is why the Shadow Package is usually played alongside Dogmatica Engines. Although not always, because it does require three extra deck spaces and one more additional main deck space. Next, we have Titanic Clad the Ash Dragon. This card's floating effect is during the end phase, you can add to your hand or special summon from your deck a Dogmatica card. So you can use this card to special summon Dogmatica Ecclesia, who will then search out a Dogmatica card, making it essentially a plus two in card advantage. And if you search out Dogmatica Ecclesia and add a Dogmatica Flirtilis, this basically sets up a monster negate during the end phase. 
You may notice that the three best targets to send from the X deck to the graveyard all have 2500 attack exactly. Which means decks that have monsters with over 2500 attack can innately play around Dogmatica Punishment a lot easier. Now, there are three other cards worth noting. There's Fossil Warrior Skull Knight, which has an effect in the graveyard where you can banish it to destroy one monster in the field. Win Pegasus at Ignister, which has a graveyard effect that if a card you control is destroyed, you can banish it from your graveyard to spin one of your opponent's cards. And finally, Herald of the Arc Light, which has a floating effect to search out any ritual spell or monster card from your deck to your hand. And there are other more niche targets, but these are generally the best ones. Now, which decks can play the Dogmatica engine? Well, the engine can fit in pretty much any deck that has the space for the engine in their main deck or extra deck. If you absolutely have no free spaces in your extra deck, which some archetypes definitely fall under the threshold, then you can't really play the engine because part of its benefits are being able to send choice extra deck monsters with powerful floating effects to the graveyard, and not whatever your main engine pieces are. If you're not able to take advantage of cards like Elder Entity Natiz, Titini Clan, or Apcolone, then it's not really worth running the engine. If your deck doesn't use the extra deck at all, then it's the perfect inclusion as you can just add all of the best extra deck floating effects you want. The engine doesn't take up your normal summon and has a restriction that's easy to play around outside of Dogmatic of Punishment. So, if you need some on-demand destruction, negation, or just extra card advantage, and don't want to play a whole bunch of complicated combos, it's basically just free advantage in any deck that's able to comfortably fit it in. Which is why the Dogmatica engine has seen so much success in competitive environments. Tour Guide from the Underworld is a level 3 fiend monster which was released in 2011 at the height of the Synchro era, and the beginning of the Xyz era, which simply has the effect to special summon another level 3 fiend monster from your hand or deck on its normal summon. But with the restrictions that the card it brings out, it has its effect negated and cannot be used as a synchro material, which was a pretty standard effect on cards in the time period in order to try to balance them with the plethora of good synchro monsters. Now, Tour Guide from the Underworld was a TCG exclusive card, which was kind of made in order to make going into the brand new Xyz monsters a lot easier. And I'm sure most of you know, in order to go into an Xyz monster, you need two monsters of the same level in the field which is a lot easier to accomplish than a Synchro Summon which requires a specific type of monster. So, since Tour Guide could easily bring out a level 3 Fiend from your deck, it was a 1 card rank 3 Xyz, and this is precisely why it saw play in the beginning. And its best target to bring out from the deck was easily Sangan. Sangan is a level 3 Fiend type monster, which has the effect that when it's sent from the field to the graveyard, you get to add 1 monster with 1500 or less attack from your deck to your hand. So you could use Tuber Guide in order to pull a Sangan directly from your deck, go into an Xyz monster, and then just detach Sangan in order to activate its effect, in order to search with that Sangan. However, Konami, or whoever runs the TCG side of Yu-Gi-Oh, quickly put out a ruling stating that cards that are detached from Xyz materials don't count as being sent from the field to the graveyard, precisely because Tuber Guide Sangan combo was just so good. And even though this combo no longer resulted in a search from Sangan every time, Sangan remained the premier tour guide from the Underworld target search until it was banned and eroded, which would not happen for quite a while. Now, like I said, tour guide basically saw play as soon as it came out, but it wasn't really that prevalent or game-changing, after they fixed the ruling on detaching Sangan anyway, and the main reason for this is that the early Xyz monsters kind of sucked. But even with the kind of lackluster first wave Xyz monsters, the ability to summon a monster from the deck of normal summon without a cost was still good enough that it was played alongside synchro decks, even if not really used to combo with them. But then towards the end of 2011, a few pieces of new support were released from an unexpected archetype, which really shot Tour Guide from the Underworld up to actual powerhouse competitive status. Towards the end of 2011, a new card was released called Rescue Rabbit. Rescue Rabbit was supposed to be a balanced version of Rescue Cat, where as Rescue Cat allowed you to special summon two different monsters with effects, and even allowed you to use those effects the turn they were summoned from the deck. Rescue Rabbit was supposed to be balanced by the fact that it could only target normal monsters, and could only special summon two normal monsters of the exact same name. So no pulling out a tuner and a non-tuner for synchro plays. In addition, Rescue Rabbit could not be special summoned from the deck, banished itself in order to activate its effect so it couldn't be brought back from the graveyard and reused easily, and finally had a hard once per turn. There was no way Rescue Cat could possibly be broken in comparison to its way less restrictive Rescue Cat, which was banned at this point. But in the exact same set which brought us Rescue Rabbit, they also released Evil Sword Logia and Dalka. These are two Dragon Rank 4 Xyz monsters which simply require two dinosaur type monsters as their materials, and each one has a really good Omni Negate, where Elagia allows you to detach two materials to stop a spell trap or summon of a monster, 
and Dalka allows a Detach 1 material to stop a monster effect, as well as destroy those cards afterwards. And you know what? Rescue Rabbit was a one card Dalagia or Dalka as long as you played normal dinosaur type monsters in your deck. And since Rescue Rabbit banished itself to activate its effect, the deck could easily play Macrocosmos and Dimensional Fissure in order to shut down the graveyards as well. And then Tour Guide and Sangan came in to just kind of complement the rest of it. Tour Guide could allow you to go into Levier the Sea Dragon in order to reuse Rescue Rabbit on a different turn. And Sangan could be used in order to search out Rescue Rabbit if it wasn't used to go into an XC summon. And Dino Rabbit decks really show the power of cards that can special summon other monsters from the deck too easily, like Rescue Rabbit or Tour Guide from the Underworld. So both of them got hit on the ban list in order to try to curtail this really dominant deck. Although it wasn't just Dino Rabbit that saw the potential of Tour Guide. It started to just be a plain staple in pretty much everything else. It was also played in wind-up decks, chaos decks, and Zector decks, any meta deck that had a pulse, really. It wasn't until 2012 when Dino Rabbit got hit even further that Tour Guide from the Underworld finally stopped being as prevalent in everything also being restricted on the ban list herself. Although I should say, it still absolutely saw play even after being restricted. It never really stopped seeing play in the history of the card existing, but it didn't really make a huge resurgence until 2014. In 2014, the Burning Abyss archetype was released. This is an archetype that revolves around level 3 fiend type monsters, who have the special distinction that they have the ability to special summon themselves from the hand, as long as you don't control any spell or trap cards. They also all have graveyard effects, except for their tuner monster, which can't be activated if they use their effect to special summon themselves from the hand. So, they're bounds around the notion that you could either bring them out from your hand, or use their graveyard effects. And also, they have a really harsh restriction on them, where they immediately destroy themselves if there's any other non-Burning Abyss monster on your side of the field. And Tour Guide kind of works with them perfectly. She can search out any Burning Abyss monster from your deck on her normal summon, and the downside where she negates the monster effects actually ends up being a benefit for the Burning Abyss monsters, because it means it won't destroy itself being on the field with Tour Guide. Then you can use them in order to go into Dante, their really good rank 3 XCs monster, that allows you to detach that Burning Abyss monster in order to activate its graveyard effect, also milling three other cards from your deck. And the Burning Abyss monsters were created in a way where they do gain effects from being detached, unlike Sangan. And Burning Abyss have been one of the longest living archetypes currently in the game. They're kind of akin to cockroaches, in that no matter how they're hit on the ban list, you can guarantee them to see play anyway. And since Tour Guide fits so well in Burning Abyss, that also meant Tour Guide was always going to see play as well. And that's kind of been the fate of Tour Guide from the Underworld all the way to the modern era. It's kind of just a staple in Burning Abyss decks, and Burning Abyss have not stopped seeing competitive play since 2014 only getting more and more support even after some of their cards were placed on the ban list as well. Like the entire Phantom Knight archetype being released in 2016, which just kind of helped fuel Burning Abyss into the modern era. Which basically concludes Tour Guide's competitive play history. It was on and off the ban list at limited, semi-limited, is currently unlimited, but who knows how long it will last and stay off the ban list this time. Tour Guide from the Underworld is also used as a mascot in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links as the NPC you talk to if you wish to learn the ins and out of the game, perform duel puzzles, or for special events where you talk to her in order to play a tic-tac-toe game. And what's funny about Tour Guide being in Duel Links is that despite the fact that she's a mascot character and an NPC you can interact with, you can't actually use her card in the game because it's still a little bit too good for Duel Links. Tour Guide from the Underworld also has a couple of other retrains. It was almost immediately given a card called Tour Bus from the Underworld, which is a level 3 Dark Fiend monster which has the effect that if it's sent to the graveyard, you can shuffle a monster in either player's graveyard back into the deck. It literally just has Tour Guide from the Underworld in its artwork, although one can assume she's just working on a different bus. And because of Sangan's history with being used alongside Tour Guide from the Underworld in its early days, there's a lot of cards which feature Sangan and the Tour Bus. As in the artwork for Mistake, you can see Sangan getting on the Tour Bus to the Forbidden Realms, which features him in the card Tour Bus to the Forbidden Realms and then later being sent to prison alongside Witch of the Black Forest in Mistaking Accusation, simulating both of their times on the Forbidden List, before both of those cards got an errata that allowed them to be taken off the ban list. Tour Guide also has a Link version called Beat Cop from the Underworld, which features a cop in a similar style to Tour Guide, but doesn't really have any effects similar to Tour Guide. Now, let's go over some combos you can perform with Tour Guide from the Underworld, from the Tips and Tricks section of Wikipedia. If you use the effective Tour Guide from the Underworld to special summon a monster from your deck, 
You can use Genex Ally Birdman from your hand in order to return to Regine back to your hand, and then special summon Birdman. Birdman is also a level 3 monster, so they can just be used for a rank 3 XC's monster if that was your goal. And this can also allow you to save to Regard from the other world to be used on a subsequent turn. And therein concludes Tips and Tricks from Yugipedia, featuring Tour Guide from the Underworld. And finally, to end this off, how could Tour Guide from the Underworld be fixed in order to be played in the modern era? Well, the answer to this question is that it already is played, so they don't really need to change anything. Generally, the point of featuring cards in the series is to talk about cards from the past which don't see competitive play currently, although I kind of forgot that Burning Beast monsters never stop seeing play. So by extension, Tour Guide will always see play, so there's no real need to try to fix its effect. In the future, I shall try to pick cards which are not used in Burning Abyss decks, because I think that's the only archetype where this is a problem. Here's how the Runic Engine works. Every Runic Quick Play spell has its own unique beneficial effect that also banishes cards at the top of your opponent's deck. Freezing Curses is a Forbidden Chalice that banishes 3, Flash Fire is a Pop that banishes 2, and Destruction is an MST that banishes 4. But, instead of using their unique effects, you can instead use the shared effects of the runic spells, allowing you to instant fusion out any runic monster from your extra deck to your extra monster zone. You have a variety of choices of runic monsters to summon, but you're usually bringing out Hugin the Runic Winks, because when Hugin is summoned, you can discard a card to add a runic field spell from your deck to your hand. This gives you access to Runic Fountain, which lets you use your runic quick play spells from your hand during your opponent's turn, and lets you draw up to 3 cards after you activate a runic quick play spell by putting those spells from your grave into the bottom of your deck. This means that not only do you get to use your Runic Quick Play spells as if they were hand traps, you get to refill your hand and draw a ton of cards during both yours and your opponent's turns. And as a result, Runic has been used in a ton of different strategies because of the strength of its interruption, its consistency, and for the free draws and bodies it gives you. But there is a catch, because even though the Runic engine is incredibly strong, every time you activate a Runic Quick Play spell, you're forced to skip your next battle phase. Because of the way the runic engine works, it's actually really difficult to play as a small engine since you want to access as many runic spells as possible to ensure that you're drawing a ton of cards per turn. So as a result, the runic engine in the TCG is usually quite big and is typically made up of two fountains, three tips, three flashing fires, three freezing curses, three slumber, and three destruction. But in Master Duel, some of the runic spells are actually currently simulimited, so you're stuck playing two fountain, tip, destruction, freezing curse, and slumber. Though, no matter the format, you also have to dedicate quite a few extra deck spots for the Runic Monsters too. With most decks playing 0 to 1 Freki, at least 1 Gary and Munin, and 2 to 3 copies of Hugin. But, if you wanted to rely on even a bigger Runic Engine, you also have the option of playing an extra Fountain and a few copies of Dispelling, Smiting Storm, Golden Droplet, and potentially even a Runic Allure if you want to rely on a deck out as your main win condition. Now let's get into what the Runic cards actually do, starting off with the secondary effect that's shared by every Runic Quick Play spell. This effect lets you summon out any Runic Fusion monster from your extra deck, but only to your extra monster zone. Now, while this effect is simple, it's actually integral to the Runic strategy, because in order to fuse in your extra deck with Polymerization, you would need to fuse two Runic monsters together, which is an issue considering there are zero main deck Runic monsters. So, this effect is the only consistent way of actually summoning these monsters and getting access to the rest of your engine. This is one of the key parts that makes the Runic engine unique and interesting, because your Quick Lay spells have a lot of versatility in how they can be used. When going second, your Flash and Fire and Destruction are going to be a great way to break your opponent's board. But when going first, you can instead use them as engine pieces that get you free bodies on the field. This has made Runic really appealing to a ton of different strategies that can benefit from the body that you summon. Sprite benefits a lot from having Hugin being a level 2 monster, Fur Hire appreciates the fairy typings of the Runic Wings, and the Plunder Patrol can use any body to link off with Plunder Patrol monsters to go into Blackbeard. The monster that you'll see summoned most of the time, though, is Hugin the Runic Wings because when Hugin is summoned, you can discard a card for cost to add a runic field spell from your deck to your hand, with your only option currently being Runic Fountain. This gives you access to the most important card in the engine, and is why Hugin is the most summoned runic monster in both combo and stun variants. Its cost is even a benefit of the card too, allowing you to discard cards with amazing graveyard effects like Nimble Angler or Nature's Sacred Tree, or even other runic cards to be shuffled back later with Fountain. But that's not where Hugin's utility ends. In combo variants, its stats made it a really beneficial body that can be used for extra deck plays in a ton of strategies, and with its most famous use being sprite variants because Hugin just so happens to be level 2. This allowed for every runic spell to be a great extender for sprite, since it puts a free level 2 monster in the field without committing a normal summon, which lets you special some of the sprites from your hand. And use Hugin for your extra deck plays since it was the perfect level for elf, sprint, and gigantic. It being level 2 also benefited Naturia a ton, as it gave the deck a lot of access to level 6 synchros with its level 4 tuners, which they could use to synchro climb into Baron de Fleur. 
But even stunned variants of Runic found Hugin on the field to be really useful because of its second effect, which allows you to banish it from the field to prevent any other card or cards you control from being destroyed by card effect. This makes it so that you can protect your fountain and back row from any kind of common spell and trap card removal, like Twin Twisters and Lightning Storm. Either keeping your Runic Engine online or trapping your opponent under an oppressive floodgate. And because this effect doesn't activate, it can be used mid-chain. This gives the engine access to one of its coolest plays, allowing you to chain a runic spell to the effect of your opponent's spell and trap card removal to summon Hugin to protect your back row. And finally, Hugin's third effect allows for some neat recursion, since if it's ever destroyed by battle or card effect, you have to shuffle it from your graveyard back into your extra deck. But there's no denying that Hugin's strongest effect is by far its first, as it's one of the key linchpins that holds the strategy together since it searches the most important card in the strategy, Runic Fountain. Runic Fountain is currently the deck's only field spell, and allows you to activate Runic Quick Play spells from your hand during your opponent's turn. This is already a strong effect, but its second effect is the one that gives Runics its main payoff, as on a soft once per turn, after you've activated a Runic Quick Play spell, you can target up to three Runic Quick Play spells in your graveyard, put them on the bottom of your deck in any order, and then you get to draw cards equal to the number of cards you put back. Fountain is the reason to play Runic. Its draw effect is absurd. Usually when you activate a runic quick play spell, you're either going minus one or net neutral in card advantage depending on the effect you activate. If you're summoning out a body, you're trading the runic spell for whatever you summon out making it card neutral. And if you activated something like freezing curse and again opponent's card, it's technically just a minus one. But with fountain up, you get to refill your hand to make up for this loss in card advantage, making it so you actually end up going plus one in this scenario while still interacting with your opponent and stopping their plays. Which means that with just a single copy of fountain and some runic spells, you can end up drawing six cards before you even reach your second turn by using its draw effect on both your turn to extend and your opponent's turn to interrupt. The best part of this is the effect actually has a ton of synergy with its first effect, allowing you to use whatever runic spells you draw on your opponent's turn as if they were hand traps, converting those free draws into even more ways to interact with your opponent and stopping them from popping off. And because every runic spell can summon Hugin, which can get you access to Fountain, the engine is hyper consistent, making it so you're always going to have access to your busted field spell. It's also a soft once per turn. So if you have multiple copies, you can potentially end up drawing six cards in a single turn, which is really useful if you happen to draw a fountain, or if you have one in your graveyard and add it back with Gary the Runic Fangs. Because whenever Gary is summoned from the extra deck, you get to target any Runic spell in your graveyard that isn't a quick play spell and add it to your hand. Gary also can't be destroyed by card effects, and if it's destroyed by battle, you can destroy any card on the field, which is a nice bonus effect. Most of the Runic Engine is generally fairly recursive because of the effect of fountains, since you'll always be putting back used Runic spells in order to draw cards and Hugin can return itself to the extra deck when destroyed. But without Gary, it's very difficult to recycle your already used fountains, and can potentially even cost you games if your opponent manages to run through every one of them with a back row removal. Which is why Jerry is usually a mandatory inclusion in most Runic strategies, as it ensures that every aspect of your engine is recyclable, making it almost endless. But like Hugin, Jerry is also a strong body because it happens to be level 4. This makes it a great tool for Xyz plays like Exciton and Dugares, but also makes it a very interesting for synchro strategies like Nateria, which can easily make the level 6 Synchro Tuner monster to then climb into Baron de Floor. Now, the other Runic Extra Deck monsters have less utility than Huge and Jerry, but are still strong tools that can be useful in certain situations or builds. For example, in heavier Runic Engines, Summoning Mutant lets you search for your Runic Continuous spell rather than a field spell, which can be used to add Runic Allure to banish more cards from the top of your opponent's deck. It also has a protection effect like Huge, but Mutant's effect works a bit differently. You can only activate it whenever your opponent targets a Runic card or a set card, in order to banish Mutant for cost and negate the activation, destroy that card. So it's not really useful against Lightning Storm, but it's a great tool to counter Cosmic Cyclone. And the life point gain can be very useful for ensuring that you're never getting OTK. Meanwhile, Frecky is probably the least useful of all of these extra deck monsters, because whenever an attack is declared involving Frecky while it's in the extra monster zone, your opponent must banish another two cards from the top of their deck. Neither player takes damage from battles involving Frecky, and if it's destroyed by battle or card effect, you can add a Runic Quick Play spell from your graveyard to your hand. All of these effects are technically beneficial, but when compared to the other Runic Extra Deck monsters, they're much harder to use and come up less frequently. Especially because its first effect happens to be reliant on either your opponent performing an action or use of your own battle phase to crash Freki. However, every one of your Runic Quick Play spells, as well as sharing their instant fusion-like effect, also cause you to skip your next battle phase. Thankfully, this doesn't stack, so if you activate 5 runic spells in one turn, you're only skipping your next battle phase and not the next 5. But this still presents a really unique trade-off, and is part of what makes the runic card so interesting as an engine. With them, you have access to constant recursion, consistent powerful interruptions, and free bodies to extend. But in order to use them, you have to continuously give up your battle phase. And this is actually a huge downside, 
because even in the modern era, the battle phase is one of the most important phases in the game. Because not only is it a way to end the game by OTKing your opponent, the battle phase is an important resource for removing your opponent's monsters in the field that you might otherwise be struggling to buy other card effects. A Borlode Savage Dragon is going to be able to contest a Red-Eyed Stark Dragoon with the battle phase, but you're going to struggle with dealing with a lot of other card effects, especially with the runic spells since the likes of Freezing and Flashing both target. And because powerhouses like Zeus and Evenly Match need the battle phase in order to function, giving it up is actually a huge sink of resources. This is why most runic variants really value cards that can act as forms of removal, since they're constantly skipping the battle phase and need some way of dealing with your opponent's monsters. This means that losing on your battle phase isn't the end of the world, but it takes some smart deck building to properly take advantage of the engine and recognize its weaknesses. In Naturia, you'll see Coral Dragon and Changing being played. In Sprite variants, you'll see Onibimaru, and other variants, you're likely to see Excited Knight to act as a pseudo Zeus. However, the deck still does have its own ways of removal and interaction in Archetype, and it does so quite well with Flashing Fire, Freezing Curses, and Destruction. All of these are quick play spells which share the effect to skip your next battle phase and a secondary effect to summon out a runic fusion monster from your extra deck to the extra monster zone. But Flashing Fire's unique effect allows you to target an opponent's spell to summon monster, destroy it, then banish the top two cards of your opponent's deck. Freezing Curses, on the other hand, lets you target an effect monster your opponent controls, negate its effects until the end of the turn, and then banish the top three cards of your opponent's deck. And Runic Destruction lets you target an opponent's spell or trap card, destroy it, and then banish the top four cards of your opponent's deck. These three quick plays act as the main interaction the engine has available to it and are the cards that you want to have consistent access to at all times, because they're going to be great ways to stop your opponent from making a board, and great when going second in order to break a board. And it's a good thing the runic decks have tools like these available to them because of the engine size. You see, because of how big the runic engine actually is, most decks had to give up deck space that would otherwise be used for hand traps and board breakers for runic spells. This would usually be a big issue, as playing fewer hand traps and going second tools usually makes the deck incredibly weak when they lose a die roll. But because flashing, freezing, destruction exists, you're not really giving up on going second tools for engine space. It's just that the engine pieces you're playing also happen to be board breaking tools themselves. And as a result, these are the runic spells that are placed in every variant of the engine, because they provide the deck with solid forms of interaction that make the engine more than just a tool to draw cards. Slumber also sees play in just about every runic deck, but not because it's a stellar interruption, but because it's really easy to use its effect on the first turn of the duel. Slumber's unique effect lets you target a face-up monster in the field and protect it from being destroyed by battle or card effects one time for the rest of the turn. The monster you target also can't attack for the rest of the turn, then you get to banish the top three cards of your opponent's deck. Now, Slumber's interruption isn't the worst in the world and can absolutely come up if you're trying to stop a Zeus line, an OTK, or even just the battle phase effects of Kashtira. But when compared to Flashing, Freeze, and Destruction, it's a much weaker interruption. However, Slumber is still an incredibly useful tool. You see, on the first turn of the duel, it can actually be difficult to siege your graveyard with multiple runic spells because you can only ever use one extra monster zone at a time, and every runic quick play spell secondary effect has to summon out to the extra monster zone. So, if you draw Flashing, Freezing, Destruction on turn 1, you're only going to be able to use one of those runic spells since your opponent hasn't committed a monster or a back row to interact with you yet, meaning that it can be difficult to draw cards on turn 1 with Runic Fountain. Now, most combo variants usually solve this issue by clearing away the extra monster zone for XEs or synchro plays so they can keep summoning out more runic bodies. But Runic Slumber's primary effect is also useful for this, as its effect is immediately usable without your opponent needing to commit anything to the board. So you can activate a runic spell, summon Hugin, search Fountain, and now, even if you don't have a way to clear your extra monster zone, you can still activate Slumber for a draw 2, which is a boon for an engine's first turn consistency. Smiting, Dispelling, and Droplet, however, are probably the worst of the quick play spells in the engine, because their effects don't do enough as interruptions and are kind of awkward to use. Which is why, in most combo variants of runic, you'll only see them play one or two copies of these cards. Golden Droplet's unique effect lets your opponent draw a card, and then you get to banish the top four cards of their deck. This pairs well with Dispelling, which allows you to discard a random card from your opponent's hand, but only if a card is added from their deck to their hand during any of the phases that isn't the draw phase. And then you get to banish the top two cards of your opponent's deck. And then there's Smiting Storm, which just vanishes cards from the top of your opponent's deck, equal to the number of cards they control. Now, each of these spells has some kind of disadvantage, which holds them back from seeing widespread play in multiple copies. Droplet just generates your opponent advantage. Smiting Storm's effect isn't immediately useful, and Dispelling can only be activated at a specific time. But these quick play spells aren't completely useless either, and do still see play at fewer copies and combo variants because, at worst, they're just extenders with their secondary effects. But even their primary effect has a home in more deck out focused builds. Because in these builds, you want to be banishing cards atop your opponent's deck as much as possible. So even though Golden Droplet lets your opponent draw a card, banishing four cards on top of their deck becomes really valuable, as it just gets you closer and closer to your win condition. The same is true of Runic Allure, the only continuous spell in the archetype that can be searched off of Munin. 
Allure is a continuous spell that only lets you control one copy of it, but while it's on the field, every time you activate a runic quick play spell, you get to banish another card from the top of your opponent's deck, with this effect having no ones per turn. This is really useful in deck out focused runic strategies by getting you closer to your win condition, but very rarely sees playing combo oriented runic decks because it just doesn't do enough when compared to the runic quick play spells. Because even Golden Droplet and Smiting can be used as a way to get your extract monsters, while Allure can be a dead card in hand if you don't already have your runic engine online. And speaking of getting your engine online, one of the best ways to do that is with the runic tip, the final card in the archetype and one of the strongest. Because runic tip's unique effect lets you add any runic card from your deck to your hand then banishes the top card of your opponent's deck. Now, this effect is obviously strong, because it acts as the key to your entire engine. If you don't want to discard a card for Hugin, or don't want to block up your extra monster zone, you can instead just use Tip to search for Runic Fountain for free. Or if you already have Fountain, you can instead use Tip to search for whatever quick play spell you need at any particular time. If you need to clear away your opponent's Arise hard, then you can instead just add Flashing Fire. If you want to interrupt the combo, you can add Freezing Curses, or if they're close to deck out, you can add Golden Droplet to get rid of the last remaining cards in their deck. But as well as being the key engine piece, Tip is also extremely important because it's a great way of putting runic spells in your graveyard while retaining advantage, without summoning to the extra monster zone or relying on your opponent. If you have a fountain and runic slumber in hand, you can activate the slumber to summon to the extra monster zone, then use your fountain to draw a card. But if your hand is instead fountain to tip, you can use that tip to search out slumber, activate slumber to summon, and then instead of drawing one, because you started off with tip, you end up drawing two. This just makes tip a great consistency tool and one that ensures that you're always going to be drawing multiple cards every time you use Fountain whenever it's in hand, which, with its ability to represent any runic card, makes it the strongest card in the entire archetype, and one that just about every runic deck should be running three copies of. Here's how the Bistial engine works. Bistials are an archetype of dragon monsters based around banishing light or dark monsters from either player's graveyard to special summon themselves to the field. Usually, the effect is spell speed 1, but it becomes a quick effect when your opponent controls a monster. This lets Bistials interact with your opponent's graveyard in a very similar way to DD Crow. Each bestial also comes with its own beneficial effect, either when on field or in the graveyard. Say Rainier is a foolish burial for branded spells, traps, and bestial monsters. Druid Swarm and Baldrake are removal for your opponent's monsters, and Magnema Hut, the best of them all, lets you search for any dragon monster during the end phase after its special summon. But as well as the regular bestial monsters, there's also THE bestial monsters. These monsters aren't DD Crows, but come with their own powerful effects, with the most important one being the bestial Lubelion. Lubelion lets you search for any bestial monster can also be used to place a branded continuous spell trap to your field. This usually grabs branded beasts for removal or branded regained for free advantage. Bestials are currently seeing play for how effective they are at countering tier limits, a strategy filled with dark monsters that have graveyard effects to fusion some of the bestials can put a stop to. As a result of the bestials you play and their ratios are very dependent on how much you want to counter tier limits and how much the bestial synergize with your own deck. The smallest bestial package people play is three magma huts and one druid swarm. This gives you a small hand trap engine that counters tier limits without having to dedicate too much of your deck space to it. Although if you want an even bigger engine to counter tier, you can play extra copies of Jura Swarm alongside multiple copies of Serenir and or Baldrake for a maximum of 12 bestial hand traps. But as well as the regular bestials, some decks will choose to play 1-3 to three copies of the bestial Lubelion. And when you're playing Lubelion, you can choose to expand your bestial package even further to get the most amount of advantage possible from the engine by playing a copy of Branded Beast and or copies of Branded Regain. Now, let's talk about what the engine actually does, starting off with the hand traps. Every one of the regular bestial monsters is a level 6 dark dragon with 2500 attack and 2000 defense that all share one effect. This lets you target a light or dark monster in either player's graveyard and banish it so that you can special summon the bestial you activated to your field. This effect is already decently strong and can be used to deprive your opponent of some graveyard resources. But the reason why this effect is so powerful and why all the bestials have managed to see common competitive play as an effective engine is because this effect becomes a quick effect while your opponent controls a monster. This means that every regular bestial monster you play acts as a hand trap that you can use on your opponent's turn in order to interact with their graveyard, and it is currently commonly used to banish an activated tier limit monster when your opponent tries to perform a fusion summon, cutting off tier decks from some of their powerful fusion boss monsters. And their stats mean that while they're on the field, every bestial monster is a threat to your opponent, because you can either use the bestial monsters that threaten your opponent's boss monsters with the battle face to remove them from the field, or you can take advantage of the bestial typing, attribute, and level to access a ton of powerful extract pieces, from Dark the Dark Charmer, or Heractic Seals, to Wallow and Beatrice. But despite all the common traits shared by the bestials, they aren't all created equal. Magma Hut is the best out of the regular bestials. Its unique effect triggers whenever it's special summoned, and lets you search for any dragon monster from your deck or graveyard during the end phase of the turn. The effect is a huge reason why the bestial engine works so well. 
Because with Magma Hut, your hand trap lets you search for another hand trap for free, even if your Druid Swarm happens to be already in the graveyard. In fact, this search effect is so strong that Magma Hut is currently limited in the OCG, and is even considered an active detriment to have Magma Hut in your graveyard, because your opponent can use the effect of Dark the Dark Charmer to summon out your Magma Hut and turn their Bistial Engine online. But Magma Hut isn't just limited to searching Bistial monsters, it can also search for any other dragon in the entire game. So a lot of decks that play powerful dragon monsters like Branded and Dragon Link will take advantage of Magma Hut as a consistency tool as well as a hand trap, so they can grab cards like Fallen of Albaz or Star Leech Seyfert. Although most decks that don't play dragons will usually use Magma Hut to search another bestial name, with the most common name being search being Bestial Druid Swarm. Druid Swarm's unique effect makes it incredibly powerful as a removal option, because whenever Druid Swarm is sent from the field to the graveyard, you get to target a special summon monster opponent controls and send it to the graveyard, bypassing any kind of destruction protection. This means that even if your opponent isn't playing any light or dark strategies, Druid Swarm can still be an effective tool at clearing away an opponent's board, provided you can summon it to the field. Especially because, like all of the bestials, Druid Swarm's stats and typing make it a perfect body for link plays, since you can link it off and trigger its effect. The only downside to Druid Swarm is that the effect only triggers when it's sent specifically from the field to the graveyard, and so you won't be able to activate if your Druid Swarm is destroyed in hand or detached from an XC's monster. This actually contrasts with Serenir's unique effect, which triggers whenever it's sent to the graveyard by any means, and allows you to foolish any bestial monster or any branded spell or trap card. This effect is actually incredibly strong in branded decks, or decks willing to play an expanded bestial package. Because in branded decks, you can use Serenir to send a spell or trap with strong graveyard effects to the graveyard, like branded retribution in order to recur your spell and trap cards, or branded opening to protect your fusion monsters from destruction. Or in non-branded decks, by playing other bigger bestial packages, you can send the bestial Lubelion so you can summon it from the graveyard, or send branded regain so that later you can place it onto the field with branded beasts. But when compared to Magma Hut, Druid Swarm, and any of the other bestials, Serenir is ran the least because its effect is a lot less generically powerful. So a lot of decks that run it only really play it as an alternative search of Magma Hut in case they are already drew into Druid Swarm. However, come Photon Hypernova, Sayernir may see even less play because of the release of Bestial Baldrake, another Bestial monster with a powerful form of generic removal. Baldrake's unique effect triggers whenever your opponent summons out a Ritual, Fusion, Synchro, Xyz, or Link monster, whether from the extra deck, Graveyard, or Banished pile, and lets you tribute another Light or Dark monster you control to banish that special summon monster. This effect can be difficult to trigger since you need to control another Light or Dark monster to tribute for the Baldrake, but it pairs excellently with the other Bestial monsters, especially with Sayernir or Druid Swarm. Because if you tribute either Serenir or Druid Swarm, not only is Baldrake removing your opponent's extra deck monster from the field, it's also triggering your other bestial graveyard effects, and will either give you a free foolish for Serenir, or another way to remove your opponent's monsters in the field with Druid Swarm. This means that on your first turn, drawing Baldrake and Druid Swarm is equivalent to four interactions by themselves. These bestial monsters all form the basis of an incredibly strong and game-warping ham trap engine that's sometimes even capable of winning games all on its own. But, if you want your bestial engine to have a stronger payoff, there are a number of non hand trap bestials and branded cards that you can play. The Bestial Lubelion is a really important card for expanded bestial packages, with three incredibly strong effects, with each one being a hard once per turn. Unlike the other bestials, Lubelion isn't a dark monster, it's light, and it doesn't have an effect that lets you summon it out by banishing a light or dark monster. Instead, Lubelion has its own summoning condition. It must be special summoned from your hand or graveyard by tributing a level 6 or higher dark dragon monster you control, which just also happens for the criteria of every other regular bestial monster. And while it's on the field, you can place a branded continuous spell or trap card to your field for free. But Lubelion isn't useless in the hand either, as you can also discard it to search out any bestial monster from your deck to your hand, except for itself. This search effect is actually so strong that people choose to play Lubelion just so they can have easier time accessing bestial Magma Hut. You see, one of the only issues with Magma Hut as a searcher is that it can't search for other copies of itself. This means that your bestial engine isn't as recursive as it could be, but even though Magma Hut can't search for itself, it can search for bestial Lubelion. And the Bestial Lubelion can search for Magma Hut, so in a way, by playing Lubelion, your Magma Hut searches for Magma Hut. Its summoning condition is also quite strong, specifically because you can bring it out from the graveyard. This means that if you can send Lubelion to the graveyard in some way, like with Serenir's effect or Lubelion's in hand effect, you can bring it back later on in the turn to bring it onto the field. In fact, current branded Bestial decks use branded Fusion to send Lubelion from the deck to the graveyard so it can tribute their Fusion summoned Albion to put into the graveyard for its end phase effect. And its other effect to set a branded Spell or Trap card is absolutely absurd, and gives the Bestial package an insanely strong payoff, with three different commonly played targets. Branded Regained is the strongest of the three and generates an insane amount of advantage with its two effects. The first effect is a hard once per turn, lets you draw a card if a light or dark monster is banished, as long as you place the monster at the bottom of the deck. This effect activates from every bestial hand trap, and works with your opponent's cards too. So if you banish your opponent's monster, you can put it at the bottom of their deck so that you can draw a card. 
This effect makes the Bistils an insane advantage generator in a similar way to Decode Talker Heat Soul, because now every turn you interact with the graveyard, you're getting a free draw. This turns Magma Hut from just a plus one in terms of card advantage into a plus three, since the Bistils you can search can banish another card for another draw. But that's not all, because Regained also has another effect, where on a soft once per turn, but hard once per chain, whenever your opponent normal or special summons a monster, you can target a Bistial monster in your graveyard and special summon it. This gives your Bistial engine an insane amount of recursion, because you can use it to keep summoning back your copies of Magma Hut to keep searching during each end phase, or alternatively, you can even bring back Baldrake or Drusorm if you want to use their removal effects. As well as Branded Regained, you can also play Branded Beast, which, like Regained, also has two effects. Its first effect is actually an incredible form of disruption, because in the main phase, while you control a Bistial monster, you can tribute a dragon monster you control to target any card your opponent controls and destroy it. This pairs really well with dragon decks that happen to play Bistials, because beasts can tribute any dragon monster, letting you tribute off cards like Heratic Seals on your own turn, so you can use effect for extensions or to just send a card like Albion to the graveyard to use its effect in the end phase. All the while, getting to pop your opponent's field and deal with their potentially problematic boss monsters and floodgates. It also pairs well with the Bistial monsters, because you can use beasts to tribute off a Druid Swarm or Serenir to use their graveyard effects. With Druid Swarm, you're getting to remove another one of your opponent's cards, but Serenir's effect is particularly strong synergy with Beast because of its second effect. Because during the end phase, Beast lets you place any branded continuous spell or trap card that's in your graveyard to your field face up. So with Serenir, you can send a copy of branded regained or branded loss, so you get access to two insanely strong cards for the price of one. Speaking of branded loss, this also just so happens to be the third most common target for the Bistio Lubelion. While branded loss is face up on the field, the activation of your cards and effects that cause a fusion summon can't be negated. And when a monster is fusion summoned, your opponent can activate any cards or effects. It's important to note that it's specifically the activation of those cards and effects that can't be negated. So your opponent can still use Ash Blossom to negate your branded fusion, since Ash doesn't negate activation, but something like a Borolode Savage Dragon is made almost useless when branded loss is on the field. Especially because your opponent isn't able to respond to the resolution of a fusion summon happening. So if you summon out a Mirror Jade and immediately activate the quick effect, that counts as being in response to the resolution of its fusion summon allowing you to banish any one of your opponent's monsters without them being able to interact with it at all. And, like Regained, Lost has an effect which in branded decks lets them generate a ton of advantage. This one is a hard once per turn and happens whenever you fusion summon and lets you either add Fallen of Albaz or a monster that mentions Fallen of Albaz from your deck to your hand. And there are a ton of great targets for this. Fallen of Albaz is basically just super polymerization and can be used to wipe your opponent's field. Spriggan's Kit lets you search for a branded spell or trap card. And Tribrigade Mercurier is a hand trap monster to gate while you control a fusion monster that mentions Fallen of Albaz as a material. But for as strong as these effects are, you're only ever grabbing loss with Lobelion if you're playing a dedicated branded strategy. So if you're playing a rogue deck that just wants to use a big Bistial package, you're better off just playing Regained or Beast. So why is this engine so strong right now? The reason why a ton of decks are dedicating a lot of space to the Bistial package is because of how capable they are against the tier 0 tier limits. You see, when tier limits Merrily, Havnus, or Shireen are sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can trigger their effect to perform a fusion summon by shuffling back materials into your deck from your hand, field, or graveyard. But this effect also specifically mentions that the monster you activate has to be one of the materials you use to fusion summon. So if that monster happens to be removed from the graveyard before that fusion summon goes through, then the effect resolves without performing a fusion summon. This means that the Bistials are great hand traps right now because of the way they can put a stop to tier limits' turns and potentially put a stop to this game warping strategy. But the Bistials themselves are also just as game warping as tier limits, if not even more so, because of the way they pushed out a ton of light and dark strategies like Drytron and Mathmech from seeing competitive play because of how easy it is to shut their turn down with the Bistial. In fact, the best rogue decks right now are ones that are capable of dodging Bistials entirely, with decks like Nycteria being composed of mostly earth monsters, and decks like Sprite which can lock your opponent under Gigantic before a dark monster ever hits the graveyard. Photon Hypernova may change this, however, because tier limits get access to two different cards, which completely counter Bistials and may even push them out of the format. Tier limits catch Tira can banish whatever tier limit monster that your Bistial monster targets, and because your Bistial didn't banish a monster, you don't get to summon it, leaving it stranded in your hand. Then, because tier limits catch Tira was summoned, your opponent can use this effect to mill three cards and extend even further. And the other card which might just pacify the Bistials is Triple Tactic Tasking, a very similar card to Triple Tactics Talents that's used to punish your opponent from activating hand traps and monster effects on your turn. But Tasking is a bit different from Talents because instead of only being able to use it if your opponent has activated monster effect during the main phase, you can use Tasking if your opponent has activated monster effect at any point during the turn. And if you use it, you can just set any normal spell or trap card to your field, but you can't use it this turn. Usually, Chillaments will use it to set Meta Noise or Infinite Impermanence, which doesn't sound that bad, but the scariest part of Tasking comes if you control a monster. 
because instead of setting that normal spell or trap card, they can just add it directly to their hand and can still activate it this turn. So, if you use your bestial monsters to stop an opponent's fusion summon, and then summon it to your field, your opponent can then activate Tasking and add anything from instant fusion to terraforming, making it so your bestial activation actually helped your opponent more than it hurt them. And with the release of the Castura cards, a deck which doesn't play a mass amount of light and dark monsters, is focused on banishing, and trades very profitably with bestials when they're activated, there's a very reasonable chance that these game warping cards will see a lot less play. Here's how the sprite engine works. Every single sprite card revolves around the number 2. Level 2, Link 2, and Rank 2. By controlling any level 2 monster, you can special summon any sprite monster from your hand, or you can special summon them from your deck using Sprite Starter, and each sprite monster has a different on-field effect. Red and Carrot protect you from hand traps and add to your end board, since red can negate monster effects and Carrot can negate spell and traps. Meanwhile, Blue and Jet search for any sprite card in your entire deck upon their special summon. Blue allows you to search for any sprite monster, and Jet allows you to search for any sprite spell or trap, usually a sprite smashers or sprite double cross to strengthen end boards, or sprite starter if you need access to more level 2 bodies. And these bodies can be used to facilitate the sprite extra deck monsters. Sprite Elf, which can revive any level, link, or rank 2 monster from the graveyard at quick effect speed. Sprite Sprint, which can foolish any level 2 monster, and Gigantic Sprite, which can special summon any level 2 monster directly from your deck. What's done with these extra deck pieces will often depend on what deck they're placed in, but a single sprite starter gives you enough level 2 bodies to go into any of these extra deck monsters, making it really valuable for decks that have specific level 2 monsters they want to summon or foolish. The sprites engine's ratios are fluid and will often vary on the deck using them. Some decks run a very expansive sprite engine, consisting of 3 blue, 3 jet, and 3 starter for consistency, as well as 1 red, 1 carrot, and 1 smashers and or double cross to strengthen end boards, alongside multiple gigantic, elf, and or sprints in their extra deck. Other decks will sometimes run a smaller sprite package, however, consisting of only 1 jet, a smashers, and sometimes 1 blue. This is to take advantage of Dahark, the Dark Charmer, which can revive an opponent's sprite blue while giving you something beneficial to search. And some decks will only run sprite monsters in the extra deck. This is because most of the main decks don't synergize with level 2 monsters, but level 2 monsters are still beneficial in some way to the strategy. Now, let's get into what sprite cards can actually do. Starting off with the monster card lineup. Sprite Blue is a dark level 2 thunder monster that can be special summoned from the hand by controlling either a level or rank 2 monster once per turn. And when it's special summoned, you can add any sprite monster from your deck to your hand. Essentially, Blue acts as one of the keys to the entire engine, in a similar way to how Stratos acts as the key searcher for hero decks and gives Sprite a ton of consistency which is why decks that rely on sprite engines will run blue at 3 copies. What sprite monster you search will depend on your current situation, as sprite has a number of versatile options to suit your hand and the game state. You could search for sprite red. Red, like blue, is a level 2 thunder monster that can special summon itself from your hand once per turn, provided you control a level 2 monster. But unlike blue, red is a fire monster, and you can also summon itself out if you control a link 2 monster, but not a rank 2 Xyz monster. The reason why you'd want red specifically is because it's a really effective tool at playing around common hand traps, such as ash blossom and effect veiler. You see, red's on-field effect allows you to tribute a level, link, or rank 2 monster you control when your opponent activates a monster effect in order to negate that effect, and if you tributed a link or rank 2 monster, you get to destroy that monster as well. This makes it an incredible end board tool, as not only does red provide you with a monster negate for your opponent's turn, it can also be used to remove bodies from your opponent's field. This is particularly important when facing other sprite decks, as by removing a level 2 body from the field, you can cut off access to all of the sprite monsters in their hand and prevent them from comboing. But if you're less worried about Ash Blossom and Effect Veiler, and are more worried about Imperm and Evenly Matched, you can instead choose to search for Sprite Carrot. Carrot has the same summon condition as Sprite Red, unless you need to summon if you control a level or link to a monster, and its on-field effect is quite similar, but instead of negating monster effects, Sprite Carrot can instead tribute a level, link, or rank 2 monster to negate the effect of a spell or trap card, and just like with Red, if you tributed a link or rank 2 monster, you get to destroy that card. Essentially, Carrot is another excellent piece of end board interaction that also plays around a few common hand traps and board breakers, and being able to destroy the spell and trap card makes an effective counter to cards like Mystic Mine. In general, Red and Carrot are excellent pieces to the sprite engine that makes the deck's end board a lot stronger, but in the TCG, you only ever see them played at around one copy each, if at all. This is because of how searchable red and carrot are, as blue, starter, and gigantic can get you either one or both very easily, allowing you to customize your end board depending on the matchup. And decks that run a smaller sprite engine will often choose not to run either, because they don't search the deck like blue or jet do. But in the OCG, sprite red and carrot are run at three in sprite decks. This is because a recent limitation of both jet and starter on the ban list, which makes the deck a lot less accessible. So you have to play more copies of red and carrot to guarantee that you see them in order to play through hand traps while also letting you use your blue to search and find jet specifically. But even in the TCG, there is still one more sprite monster which is played less often than both red and carrot, Sprite Pixies. It has the same summon condition as blue, so it can be brought up by controlling a level or rank 2 monster, and its effect is the least relevant of the entire sprite monster core. During damage calculation, where a link, rank, or level 2 monster you control battles, you can send sprite pixies from your hand or field to the graveyard to increase the attack and defense of your link, rank, or level 2 monster by the attack of your opponent's monster until the end of the turn. 
with this effect being a hard once per turn. Most decks that use a sprite engine will disregard pixies, especially something like Runic Sprite, which rarely gets the chance to use the battle phase. But even though it's definitely the worst sprite monster in the engine, Pixie still has a fair amount of utility. And this is because one of the key issues with sprite is how weak their stats are, as their low attack can make it difficult for sprite to get over problematic boss monsters and OTK your opponent. Pixie solves that issue by ensuring that your sprite monsters are always going to be able to beat over something with a high attack stat that sprite would usually struggle with by battle. It can even be used defensively. As your opponent goes to the battle phase of their turn with the intent to beat over your IP Mascarina, you can use Elf and Starter to special summon blue to search pixies and have them waste their battle phase. Although most decks will usually skip out on Pixies as an engine piece in Sprite, since like Red and Carrot, it doesn't search the deck and it can't interact with your opponent's cards. Sprite Jet, on the other hand, is one of Sprite's key combo pieces and is currently limited in the OCG for how strong it is. Like Sprite Blue and Pixies, Sprite Jet can be special summoned from your hand once per turn by controlling a level or rank 2 monster. But when it's special summoned, instead of searching for monsters, Jet searches for Sprite spells and traps. This is the second key to the entire engine, as every single sprite spell or trap card is very powerful and can even get you to your other sprite monsters. But like with sprite blue, the spell and trap cards you might search will depend on your situation. If you're in need of an extra level 2 body, you might choose to grab sprite starter. Starter is a quick play spell card which acts as an emergency teleport for the archetype and is the third key to the sprite engine, allowing you to special summon any sprite monster from your deck but with two main drawbacks. The first is that you must take damage equal to the attack of the monster you summon, and the second is that you're locked into only being a special summon level, link, and rank 2 monsters for the rest of the turn. Essentially, Sprite Starter represents an extra 3 copies of any sprite name, and you don't even need to control a level 2 monster for it to summon out a sprite, allowing it to be used as a 1 card starter which can get you to blue, and then to any other sprite name, which provides enough material for any other 3 sprite extra deck monsters. Not every deck that plays the sprite cards chooses to play Sprite Starter, since it's one of the only sprite cards that actually locks you in any way. So some decks will only play 1 copy as a jet search. Although, if you already have a starter in hand, there are plenty of other great search targets for Jet, such as Sprite Smashers. Sprite Smashers has three effects, but only one of those effects is relevant for the Sprite strategies. By banishing a Therion, Sprite, or Spriggan's card from your graveyard, you can either special summon a Spriggan's monster from your deck, special summon a Therion monster from your graveyard, or lastly, you can banish any level, link, or rank 2 monster you control to banish one card your opponent controls. The third effect is one that sees the most play and is a key part of the most end boards that use Sprites. Being able to banish any card your opponent controls at quick effect speed makes Smashers extremely versatile, as you can either use it to interrupt your opponent by banishing their key combo pieces and boss monsters, or you can deal with an opponent's problematic floodgate like There Can Be Only One or Mystic Mine. In theory, you're giving up a lot with Smashers, as not only do you need to banish a sprite card from your graveyard, you need to banish a Link, Rank, or Level 2 monster on field too. But with how recursive the sprite engine is due to Sprite Elf, and how much advantage a single jet or blue can generate, this drawback very rarely impedes its use. But if you can't spare a monster to banish, Sprite Double Cross also acts as an incredible end board piece to search off of Jet. Unlike Smashers, it's incapable of outing problematic floodgates, but each of its three effects provide with a ton of versatility, since every effect of Double Cross is useful. In order to activate Double Cross, you need to target a monster in the field, or in either player's graveyard, and apply one of the following effects. The first is an archetypal XYZ import, or a pseudo DD Crow, allowing you to attach the monster you targeted to an XZ monster you control as a material. The second is an archetypal crackdown, which allows you to steal your opponent's monster by placing it to a zone where a link to monster points to. And the third allows you to special summon the targeted monster to a zone where a link to monster points to, like a Call of the Haunted, which lets you target your opponent's monsters as well. Individually, every one of these effects is stellar, as Double Cross gives you a way to remove your opponent's monsters on field. But what it has over Smashers is that it can also interrupt graveyard effects, allowing it to be much stronger when facing a deck like Tier Lament, which is very reliant on its graveyard. Double Cross has a similar role to Red and Carrot in that they strengthen the sprite end board, but are only played in decks which use an extended sprite package, rather than a smaller one which would rather have Smashers instead due to its versatility as a quick play spell and as an out to floodgates. But like with the monsters, there is still one more lesser played sprite back row. Sprite Gamma Burst is the least played of every sprite card. It's often not played in even the most expanded sprite strategies, as it has less versatility than even Pixies, as at least Pixies is a level 2 body. But being the worst sprite card still makes Gamma Burst decent as it is still a sprite card and can be searched off of Jet. It's a quick play spell which allows you to increase the attack and defense of all of your level, link, or rank 2 monsters you control by 1400. And then, while it's in the graveyard, you can banish Gamma Burst to increase the attack of all level, link, or rank 2 monsters by 1400 but you can only use one effect of Gamma Burst per turn, so you can't stack them for 2800 attack boost to one of your monsters. Basically, Gamma Burst is only really useful as a battle trap to surprise your opponent like Pixies, or to establish OTKs quicker on an open board, which is still pretty useful, and why very expanded sprite engines might play a copy of Gamma Burst in the side, but it's by far the least useful card in the engine, since it doesn't provide the deck with interruption or level 2 bodies. 
And level 2 bodies are really important for reaching the sprite extra deck monsters, which are arguably the strongest cards in the engine. So much so that they're even run in lists that don't have a single sprite card in their main deck such as Sprite Elf. Sprite Elf is a Link 2 monster that can be Link summoned by using any two monsters, provided at least one of them is a level, Link, or Rank 2 monster. It can't be used as a Link material to turn it summon, but it has two very powerful effects to make up for that. The first protects every monster it points to from being targeted, stopping your opponent from being able to negate your boss monsters with something like an Imperm or Chalice on both your opponent's turn and your own. And if it wasn't valuable enough, Elf can also summon out any level 2 monster from your graveyard as a quick effect speed during the main phase, with this effect being a hard once per turn. Essentially, Sprite Elf represents two bodies on board, one that you summon out during your turn, and one that you summon out during your opponent's main phase. Meaning that even though you need two monsters to summon it, basically getting those two monsters back, making it really valuable to summon, especially when you get the chance to trigger Blue and Jet to search on your turn and your opponents. But that's not all, because if your opponent controls a monster, instead of having to target a level 2 monster in your graveyard to summon, you can instead target a Link or Rank 2 monster in your graveyard instead. This is how Sprite is capable of setting up a board of two negates with only one totally awesome. Sprite Sprint is a card with similar utility to Elf. Like Elf, Sprint can be summoned with any two monsters, provided that at least one of those materials is a Link, Rank, or Level 2 monster, and it can't be using Link material to turn its Link Summon. But when it's Link Summoned, you can send any Level 2 monster from your deck to the graveyard. A free foolish for any deck that uses level 2s is absurd, especially given the number of level 2 monsters with excellent graveyard effects. Nimble Angler is one such card, as when Nimble Angler is sent from the hand or deck to the graveyard, you can special summon two level 3 or lower Nimble monsters from your deck. And a lot of sprite decks already play multiple copies of Nimble Beaver, since it's a great normal summon that can summon another copy of itself from your deck or graveyard. But, like with Elf, there are plenty of non-sprite decks which can take advantage of Sprint. Most notably is Tier Limits, which can use the effect of Sprint to send Tier Limit merrily to the graveyard. And that's not all, because Sprint has yet another effect which really boosts its power. When another monster is special summoned while you control Sprint, you can detach material from an XE's monster you control to target any monster on the field to return it to the hand. Now, you can only use one effect of Sprint per turn, and only that turn, so you have to choose which effect you want to use on a particular turn. On your turn, you would use Effect of Foolish, but on your opponent's turn, you would use the Bounce. This effect makes it so it doesn't really matter that you can't use Sprint as a Link material on the turn you summon it, because you actually want it on the field. Especially because it gives you a downward facing arrow for double cross. Gigantic Sprite is the final card in the Sprite engine, and it's one of the best tools that Sprite has available. It's a rank 2 monster, and usually requires two level 2 monsters to make. However, Gigantic Sprite also allows you to use any Link 2 monsters you have as materials as if they were level 2. And if Gigantic Sprite happens to have a Link, Fusion, Xyz, or Synchro Monsters material, its original attack is doubled to 3200. But it's not just a generic beat stick. Gigantic's effect gives you access to any level 2 monster in the game, but the strongest lock of any of the sprite cards. During the main phase, by detaching Xyz material from any Xyz monster you control, you can special summon any level 2 monster directly from your deck. But for the rest of the turn, neither player can special summon any monsters other than Link 2, Rank 2, or level 2 monsters for the rest of the turn. Now, this lock is very harsh and it's what gatekeeps a lot of decks from using Gigantic, even if they play level 2 monsters. But this lock also applies to your opponent. This means that once Gigantic has resolved, you are completely protected from Nibiru, Cypher and Gamma, and Bistial monsters. So even with its particular lock being strict, it ends up being a direct benefit of the card. And getting access to any level 2 monster in your deck is absolutely absurd, and is why Sprite has become such an incredible engine. Evil Twin Sprite can make use of it to grab Key Sakil or Leela, Frog and Paleo Sprite can use Gigantic to bring out Swap Frog to go into Totally Awesome, and some Sprite variants even use Gigantic to bring out Nightmare Corruptor Ebly to the field, so they can use it to Floodgate your opponent and to special summon any monsters that aren't in Lynx. Now, Gigantic does have its downsides, its lock is still restrictive and detaches for effect and not for cost, so if all of your Xyz monsters are removed from the field before you can resolve Gigantic, you don't get to summon out your level 2. But the downsides are minor when compared to what Gigantic does for the sprite engine, and it, alongside Elf and Sprint, are integral to the reasons as to why the engine has seen so much competitive play. Sprites are an archetype of cards recently released in the TCG by the Power of the Elements that focuses on supporting level, link, and rank 2 monsters. Due to the archetype strength and consistency, it's currently taken over as one of the best decks, if not the best to play in the current format. And in this video, we're going to be focused on some of the best cards you can tech into your sprite deck, why they're so interesting, and what they do for the deck. And at number 10 on this list, we have Nightmare Corruptor Ebly, a dark cybers monster that has seen a minor amount of experimentation in sprite decks for each of its strong effects. When it's normal summoned, you can target a Link 2 monster in your graveyard and special summon to your field so that at least one of its Link arrows points to Ebly but that Link Monster's attack becomes zero and its effects are negated. Depending on your extra deck choices, this effect can be relevant, as you can use Ebly to bring back something like Nightmare Cerberus to go into Nightmare Unicorn for a really easy way to Link Climb. But the actual reason Ebly has seen experimentation is due to its second and third effects. While Ebly is face up on the field, whoever controls it cannot special summon monsters except Link Monsters. 
And if that were all, Ebleet would be a terrible choice for sprite decks, as you'd be locking yourself out of some of your best monsters, including your rank 2s like Gigantic Sprite or Mannequin Cat, and even out of special summon the sprites themselves. But if Ebly goes to the graveyard while on your side of the field, you can special summon it to your opponent's side of the field in defense position. So if you can bring Ebly to the field, such as by the effect of Gigantic Sprite, you can then link off Ebly for a Sprite Elf to summon out to your opponent's side of the field and lock them out of everything that isn't a Link monster. This is particularly potent against Terra Laments, another all-star from the Power of the Elements, whose comparative strength allows them to be a great counterpick to Sprite due to their powerful fusion monsters and great use of XC's monsters. As a result, if you're playing Sprite and want to counter Terraman builds, you use Ebly in order to lock them out of their fusion XC's boss monsters and force them to go into the battle phase to crash Ebly into one of your monsters if they really want to break the lock. Yet despite this interesting counterplay, Ebly only makes its number 10 spot on this list because it hasn't really taken off in Sprite lists for a number of reasons. Firstly, Sprite is one of the most popular decks in the current format, making a mirror match a fair possibility. And with Ebly, you'd essentially be giving your opponent a free level 2 monster which they can use as link material for something like Sprite Elf. But more importantly, Ebly doesn't really do anything to stop the other best decks of the format, since link monsters are so common. And while tier elements mainly rely on XCs and their fusion boss monsters, and some builds only rely on fusion monsters, most tier element builds also have ample access to link monsters, and so will often play cards like Ivy Mask Arena or Curious in their extra deck, meaning that Ebly just becomes free link material for your opponent. Ebly may have had its place someday against some strange strategies like Branded or Sword Soul, which heavily rely on specific types of extract monsters, and it can win games on its own, but for the current meta it should only be really considered as a potential option rather than a game-winning choice. And at number 9 we have Diviner of the Herald, a light fairy monster that enables some interesting sprite builds. Both of its effects are hard once per turn, and if it's tributed by any means you could just special summon any level 2 or lower fairy monster from your deck except Diviner. And whenever Diviner is normal or special summon, you get to foolish any fairy monster from your deck or extra deck to the graveyard, and then increase Diviner's level by the level of the monster you sent until the end of the turn. While not a standard choice by any means, Diviner is an excellent pick for sprite decks, which hope to splash some kind of ritual package into their main deck. For example, both Neftis and Megalith are ritual decks capable of harnessing a sprite package to the strength and archetypal level 2 monsters. Diviner acts as a key consistency tool for these ritual decks, as you can use it to send Herald of the Arc Light to add any ritual monster or spell card from your deck to your hand, making the ritual portion of the deck a lot more consistent. And the fact Diviner can be summoned off of both Gigantic Sprite and Christian Hockey Fibrax means that you always have access to the card in some other way. Both Diviner's main strength in Sprite comes from its use alongside Sprite Elf. You see, being able to revive Diviner on your own turn allows you to summon out the Diviner with Hockey Fibrax, which stops effect activations, Link them both off for Elf, and then summon a Diviner so you can actually use her effect to send Herald the Arc Light to get your search off. And because Elf doesn't lock you in any way, unlike Gigantic Sprite, you can usually use this to summon out strong ritual boss monsters. But that's not all, as Sprite Elf's effect to revive is quick effect during the main phase, which means that during your opponent's turn, you can summon out Diviner, which actually acts as a form of interruption, as you can choose to send Elder Entertain to Tiss to the graveyard in order to pop a card in your opponent's possession, allowing Diviner to act as both a consistency tool during your turn and as an interruption during your opponent's. Diviner does, of course, come with its downsides, the main one being that Diviner can be somewhat awkward to use as a normal summon for sprite decks due to its mandatory level modulation when you full Shafari, which changes her level to something other than two and can make it harder to summon out sprites. And the second is that it doesn't really have a home in most sprite deck lists as most of them are not ritual focused. However, even non-sprite ritual decks such as Libermancers have taken to using Sprite Elf for its particular synergy with Diviner. And at number 8 we have Cyberstein, a dark machine monster that's currently limited in both the OCG and TCG for its simple but almost game-breaking effect. With no once per turn, you can pay 5000 life points and summon out any fusion monster from your extra deck in attack position. Now in the TCG, Cyberstein being limited is a huge deal as it being at 1 prevents Sprite from being able to consistently use Stein as a normal summon, and summoning it off of Gigantic makes Stein pretty bad, as you're locked into only being able to special summon level 2 fusion monsters. But in the OCG, they have access to Sprite Sprint, a Link 2 monster which lets you send any level 2 monster from your deck to the graveyard. So you can use Sprint to send Cyber Stein from your deck to the graveyard, then you can make Sprite Elf in order to revive that Cyber Stein and then gain access to some of the best fusion boss monsters in the game, since you won't be under any locks. But that's not all. All because Stein is a level 2 monster, you can then use it to go into Gigantic Sprite to summon out another level 2 from your deck, making it a card that adds to your end board while also being compatible with your main engine. This build of the deck was actually a fairly popular choice in the OCG after Totally Awesome. One of Sprite's main end boards pieces was Ban. Stein helped provide the deck with an alternative choice for a boss monster. 
Stein has its issues, of course. The amount of life points you have to pay alongside a card like Sprite Starter can potentially put you at risk of easily being OTK'd. And Stein itself can be awkward to use, given cards like Start and Gigantic can lock you from getting most out of your Stein's effects. But it's proven to be a great choice for Sprite decks in the OCG, and although it's currently not as usable in the TCG as it is in the OCG, Stein will more than likely prove its worth once Sprint is released. And at number 7, we have Nemesis Flag a level 2 fire pyro monster that has the potential to lock your opponent out of plane entirely. Both of its effects are hard once per turn, and you can special summon it from your hand by shuffling one of your banished monsters that isn't Nemesis Flag. Then, during the main phase, you can use its ignition effect on Nemesis Flag in order to add any Nemesis monster from your deck to your hand except another copy of itself. And the card you usually be adding is Arch Nemesis Escados, a level 8 dragon monster and the counterpart to Arch Nemesis Protoss, a card currently on the ban list for its ability to floodgate your opponent out of entire attributes. And Escados happens to have an extremely similar effect, as you can use it to lock your opponent out of any monster type, providing it's face up on the field. What Sprite lists using Flag and Escados would do when going second against other prominent strategies like Terra Elements is call their main monster type, so against Terra Elements you would call Aqua, and this would prevent cards like Terra Elements Lulucaros and Kaleida Heart from reviving themselves from the graveyard after being sent to the graveyard by a card effect. And when going first, they can use Repodocus in order to change the type of Escados to whatever their opponent is playing, making it an incredible tech choice for games 2 and 3, and even game 1 during tier 0 formats, like the OCG is currently experiencing with Terra Elements. Nemesis Flag just so happens to be the perfect level to synergize with the Sprite strategy while also being able to add Escatos, and because Sprite is more than capable of going through multiple monster types, it's really easy to bring to the field to lock your opponent out of the game. Just like with Cyberstein, Flag and Escatos are being supported by new cards yet to be released in the TCG yet, notably Bisted Magnumut, a DD Crow for light and dark monsters that also adds a dragon monster during the end phase of the turn that it summoned, making Escatos an even better tool when going second since it's a dragon monster. Now, while the TCG doesn't have access to Magnuma yet, Flag and Escados are still really decent choices for Sprite lists, which wish to blind second, but is mainly held back because it's not that good when going first in the current TCG format, since the format is surprisingly diverse. You could lock your opponent out of Aqua only to discover it's another Sprite player, or lock them out of Thunders to see they're actually playing Mathman. Still, for what it's worth, Flag and Escados are great choices and should definitely be considered as options in the side deck, there are just better options for the side deck cards at the moment. And at number 6, we have Gale Dagra, which funnily enough, happens to be only the second best level 2 Earth Insect you can play in Sprite. Like Cyberstein helped Sprite decks to survive the totally awesome ban in the OCG, but unlike Cyberstein, Gale Dagra has also proven itself useful in the TCG as well. And it has a really simple effect too. By paying 3,000 life points, you can send one monster from your extract to the graveyard, with no once per turn limit to its strength. One of the key weaknesses of Cyberstein is that while the end board provides can be absurdly strong, it can be somewhat awkward to try and play around the locks that sprite decks have. On the other hand, while Gale Dogger provides a more limited selection of boss monsters it can reasonably summon, being able to send any monster from your extra deck to the graveyard enables you to bring out one of the strongest boss fusion monsters in the game. You do this by sending El Shadal Apcolone from your extra deck to the graveyard, which then allows you to add Shadal Schism from your deck to your hand. Then, by using Schism on your opponent's turn, you fusion summon out El Shadal Winda during your opponent's turn at an opportune moment by banishing that Epcolone alongside a dark monster from your graveyard, which a lot of the sprite monsters happen to be. This particular line of play also helps sprite decks by providing a key answer for one of their silver bullets, Dark Ruler No More, as you can summon out Winda after they've used Dark Ruler No More to try to out the rest of your board, leaving them stuck with only one special summon for the turn, and has seen a lot of experimentation in the TCG for this reason. Geldagra is even at 3 in both the TCG and OCG, making it more consistent of a normal summon when compared to the limited Cyberstein, and enables it to be more easily paired with other sprite packages like the Frog Packet, as both can either consistently be normal summoned or summon out of the deck with gigantic sprite without locking you in any meaningful way. Overall, Geldagra is a pretty interesting choice for sprite decks that allows them to have access to more diverse end boards in a similar way to Cyberstein, but without the awkwardness Cyberstein can bring to the table. And at number 5, we have Nimble Beaver a water beast monster that lets you special summon out any level 3 or lower nimble monster from your deck or graveyard, including other copies of nimble beaver when it's normal summon. Now, there's a fair amount of debate as to the best level 2 normal summon for sprite decks to play, with a fair amount of decision making between playing Deep Sea Diva, the Live Twins, and of course nimble beaver as supplementary side engines. Like Diva and the Live Twins, nimble beaver is capable of summoning out another level 2 monster from your deck, which is quite good for sprite decks, as that's an extra level 2 body that can be used for gigantic, elf, or any of the other kind of Linker XC's plays. Unlike these other choices, however, Nimble Beaver helps to improve Sprite's grind game, making it stronger in longer games. In the case of something like Deep Sea Diva, you can only summon from the deck, 
meaning that once you use the effect of D.Va once, you'll only have one D.Va left in the deck, which would be incapable of summoning out another copy of itself. Meanwhile, because Nimble Beaver can also summon from the graveyard, every time you normal summon Beaver, you're guaranteed to always be able to summon out an extra level 2 body, which can be a key difference maker in long games. And while this has already proven itself as a decent choice in the TCG, Nibble Beaver is now the prime choice level to normal summon in the OCG. This, once again, is due to the dominance of tier limits, which is aided partly by the new Ishizu support, which is capable of milling out your opponent's deck as well as your own. This is an issue for decks running cards that they want to summon from their deck, as if your opponent happens to mill your Deep Sea Divas, your engine is offline. But with something like Nimble Beaver, you can still special summon out another level 2 body, even if two copies of it have hit the graveyard. OCG lists have even started using Nimble Angler alongside Beaver in order to counter the Ishizu decks while also having a powerful send for Sprint. Overall, while Beaver isn't the most popular choice in the TCG at the moment, it's bound to grow more popular as the metagame evolves and as new support releases, and is only so low on this list due to the relative power of the available sprite text at the moment. And at number 4, we have Cyframe Gear Gamma, a level 2 monster that also happens to be one of the strongest hand traps in the game. Gamma can't be normal summoner set and instead must be special summoned by any card effect. And when your opponent activates any monster effect while you control no monsters, you can trigger Gamma's effect to negate and destroy that monster, while also summoning itself up from the hand and Cyframe Driver from your hand deck or graveyard, but you must banish the monsters you summon with this effect during your end phase. Gamma's utility as a hand trap is unparalleled. Being able to negate any monster effect in hand, field, or graveyard allows for Gamma to be used as a going second tool in almost every matchup. You can negate a Terra Lament's Graveyard Effect to Fusion Summon, Mathmax Circular's In-Hand Effect, or a pivotal on-field effect like Swap Frog. And the fact that it's also capable of destroying the monster in the gates makes it even stronger as it removes the body on the field. This is what's great when dealing with tons of decks as it gets rid of monsters that otherwise would have been used as fodder for something else like an extra deck summon. What makes Gamma so powerful in Sprite specifically is that it's a level 2 monster, allowing it to be used as a great hand trap and a good going second tool and even a starter. You see, while Gamma may not be able to be normal summoned, if you can summon it out during your own turn, you can get an easy level 2 body on field. And there are multiple ways of doing this. One of the easiest is by using Emergency Teleport, letting you summon out a copy of Gamma directly from your deck in order to summon out your sprites from hand, much in the same way as Sprite Starter, and can even be integral for allowing you to play through Interruption just by virtue of putting another level 2 body on the field that doesn't use your normal summon. The other way you can summon out Gamma during your own turn is by negating an opponent's monster effect that triggers on your turn, not only will this negate your opponent's effect, this also gives you Gamma and Driver on your field, which is all the materials necessary for a great number of extra monsters, allowing you to go into Christian Hockey Fireback since Gamma is a tuner, Sprite Elf since Gamma is level 2, or even a level 8 Synchro monster depending on your extra deck. All in all, Gamma by itself is already an amazing card, but Sprite specifically gains a ton of advantage by using Gamma as a hand trap as it opens up an array of deck building choices while also giving you a powerful hand trap. And at number 3, we have Live Twins Kisa Kill and Leela, a pair of light and dark cypress monsters which have enabled a fairly successful sprite hybrid build. Each of the twins has an effect to manipulate life points whenever an opponent's monster declares an attack, but also has the effect to special summon out their respective twin whenever they're normal or special summoned, provided you control no other monsters. Leela can summon out a Kisa Kill monster from your hand or deck, and Kisa Kill can summon out Leela monster, with their effects being a hard ones per turn. Like with Nimble Beaver, being able to summon an extra level 2 body from the deck is a boon for sprite decks, as it provides them with extra material that they can use to link or XE summon. And your choice of normal summon to get the extra level 2 body will come with its own upsides and downsides that will impact your deck building. The main downside of the Live Twins is that they're not water, so they can't be discarded to summon out Swap Frog, and that they can take up a lot of deck building space since you need to play at least one of each twin. Meanwhile, both Deep Sea Diva and Nimble Beaver can be ran on their own, giving room for more generics. Yet despite these downsides, the Live Twins provide a lot of advantages in deck building choices which have allowed them to be fairly popular build in the deck. Getting access to evil twin extra deck monsters gives sprites extra follow up with the effects of Keys to Kill to draw a card, and a more diverse end board with Leela, which allows you to destroy any card in the field. Giving sprite a more proactive card they can use to clear problematic cards on your opponent's field, or can even be used to pop your own cards, like a set artifact scythe to lock your opponent out of their extra deck. It also allows you to natively play Trouble Sunny, which is effective as an end board boss monster to summon out both Kisa Kill and Lee Law during your opponent's turn, but is also great as a target to send with Ultimate Slayer, allowing you to shuffle back one of your opponent's link monsters with Ultimate, and then you can use the effect of Sunny to send one card in the field to the graveyard by sending an evil twin from your hand filter deck to the graveyard. The twins themselves are even excellent when facing hand traps or forms of removal, as if one twin is removed from the field before its effect resolves by something like a DBE, you'll have no other monsters in the field, allowing you to trigger the effect of the other twin, so you'll still get two bodies on the field. 
Or alternatively, if your live twin is hand trapped by something like an infinite impermanence or an ash blossom, you can use the effect of Sunny Snitch to add one of the holiday variants of the twins to extend. In essence, the live twins, like Nimble Beaver, allow sprite decks more bodies in which to perform their plays, but also allow for sprites to have access to interesting end boards or plays that they wouldn't be able to use otherwise. And although it requires a fair amount of deck space, the twins have proven themselves to be a strong choice for sprite decks. And at number 2, we have Deep Sea Diva, a level 2 water sea serpent that provides extra level 2 bodies for sprites. When Diva is normal summoned, you can summon any level 3 or lower sea serpent monster from your deck. This includes Diva herself, which means that you have what is a brickless engine to summon out level 2 bodies for sprite plays, and it has a few factors which makes it slightly better than Beaver and the Live Twins for the current format, with the main one being that Diva is a tuner. This means Diva can act as a 1 card crush on Halky Firax, opening up a ton of options for sprite lists. Having access to Halk allows you to summon out any tuner from your deck, allowing you to special summon out strong tuners like Red Resonator or even Diviner the Herald, that you can then link off and resummon with Elf in order to use their effects. Or you can summon out a stronger tuner hand trap like Effect Veiler, Ghost Ogre, or Gamma to bounce back to your hand with the effect of Swap Frog. Or it could be used to link climb into a strong Link 3 like Nightmare Unicorn. All that by itself is really strong, but Halk also has a second effect which allows you to summon out any tuner synchro monster during your opponent's turn by banishing it with the main choice of which is Formula Synchron, which is a level 2 synchro monster which allows you to draw cards at its summon, and allows you to perform a synchro summon during your opponent's turn. And if you use Formula and any other level 2, you can go into Herald of the Arc Light for an action negate that also happens to be a macro cosmos. All of those options are enabled purely by D.Va being a great level 2 tuner, being able to take advantage of Halgi Fibrax is stellar for sprites, and like the twins, opens up a lot of lines of plays that wouldn't have been otherwise available. And unlike the twins, D.Va is a smaller engine and is also water, which allows it to be discarded for Swap Frog which brings us to the number one spot on our list. Hopping into the number one spot is Swap Frog, one of the best level two monsters ever printed and an integral piece of the frog engine. A series of cards which has helped propel sprites to their tier one success in both the TCG and OCG. You can special summon Swap Frog from your hand by discarding any water monster, and whenever it's summoned, you can send any level two or lower water aqua monster from your deck or face up field to the graveyard. Not only that, but you can also return one monster you control to your hand to gain an extra normal summon of any frog monster, except Swap Frog and you can only gain this effect once per turn. Both of Swap Frog's effects are deceptively powerful. With its first effect, you can send Ronin Toten from your deck to the graveyard, and Ronin Toten is another level 2 Aqua monster which can summon itself out from the graveyard, provided you banish another frog monster from your graveyard, which you always have the fodder for since Swap Frog isn't a once per turn. So you can use the swap with your normal summon to go into Elf to then summon back out Swap Frog from your graveyard with Elf's effect to send another Swap Frog from your deck to the graveyard in order to banish for Rodin Toten. Or you can use the second effect of Swap Frog to bounce itself to the hand and then special summon it back by discarding out a Spare Diva or Nimble Beaver to gain its effect again. Or you could summon another Swap Frog out with the effect of Gigantic Sprite since it's also a level 2. This extremely tight engine not only allows for Sprite to gain access to more level 2 bodies in a similar way to Beaver, Diva, and the Live Twins, it also allows for Sprite to gain access to one of the strongest Omni Gates in the game, Totally Awesome. Totally Awesome is a rank 2 monster, which means you can XC summon it even while under the Alox of Gigantic Sprite and Sprite Starter, and it has a number of effects which makes it one of the best cards in the game Sprite decks have access to. It can summon out any frog monster during the standby phase, it can negate and destroy any spell or trap card or any monster effect by sending an aqua monster from your hand or field to the graveyard, and set that card it destroys, and when Totally Awesome hits the graveyard, you can add any water monster from your graveyard to your hand. So in Sprite, you can use Totally Awesome to summon out a frog monster during your standby phase. Usually this will be either Swap Frog or Dupe Frog to prevent your monsters from being attacked over something like Dino Wrestler Pankratops. Then, whenever your opponent tries to activate a card, you can use the effect of Totally Awesome, sending itself to the graveyard or to negate it, and then set it to your field. This can be incredibly strong when it's something like Triple Tactics Talents or Infinite Impermanence, as it can be used during your next turn. Then, once Totally Awesome hits the graveyard, you can add Swap Frog, Deep Sea Diva, or Nimble Beaver back for a follow-up on the next turn. All of these are insanely good effects, but what really drives it over the top is that Totally Awesome's second and third effects aren't once per turn. Sprite decks specifically can take advantage of this with the use of Sprite Elf, which allows you to summon out any level 2 monster from your graveyard, or any level 2, link 2, or rank 2 monster from your graveyard while your opponent controls a monster at quick effect speed. This means you can use Totally Awesome's Negate to stop one of your opponent's board breakers or key plays, send itself to the graveyard, and then you can wait for your opponent to commit a monster to the field to use the effect of Sprite Elf in order to resummon Totally Awesome, allowing you to use its Negate once more. Totally Awesome being so strong has meant that Swap Frog and its other engine pieces have become a staple in every single sprite list in the TCG, and is what caused Totally Awesome's ban in the OCG. Since Swap Frog is so strong, and now so easily accessible due to the effect of Gigantic Sprite, 
as any two level twos will now result in Swap Frog access. Swap Frog and Totally Awesome share equal blame in bringing Sprite to prominence. And if the TCG goes the same way as the OCG and bans Totally Awesome or any of the other part of the Frog engine, Sprite becomes a significantly weaker deck. But while it's still around, there's no doubt that it's the best possible engine you can play in Sprite. Here's how the basic combo works. By activating Pressure Planted Raid Soth, you can add Castor Unicorn from your deck to your hand. Then you can spell to summon that unicorn and use the effect to add Castor Theosis. Castor Theosis then lets you target your Castor Unicorn and spell to summon out Castor Fenrir from your deck in defense position. And with the effect of Fenrir, you can add Castor Rise Heart, and then, because you control a Castor monster, you can spell to summon that Rise Heart from your hand. Then, using both Unicorn and Fenrir, you overlay for Castor Shangri Era. And after that, you use the effect of Rise Heart that's still in the field, banishing Castor Big Bang from your deck for cost, to banish three cards to the top of your opponent's deck face down while making Rise Heart level 7. This then lets you trigger both Shingra Ira to block off your opponent's zone from being used, and cast your Big Bang to special summon out either of your cast your monsters that are attached to Shangri Ira. And because you managed to use the effect of Shangri Ira, you can special summon out cast your Arise Heart using Rise Heart as a material. Then, during your opponent's standby phase, you activate the effect of Shangri Ira to special summon out another cast your name from your deck. So, with a single Rate Swath, you have Shangri Ira to block zones and to summon out another cast your name from your deck. A cast your Fenrir to banish an opponent's card face down, a cast your Unicorn to banish an opponent's extra deck card face down, a pop from Rate Sloth that have to use any of Shangri Ira's effects, and a Rise Heart, a macro cosmos that can also banish any card from the field face down at quick effect speed. The cast your engine can vary in size based on what you want from the engine. A really small and basic cast your engine is actually only comprised of 2 to 3 copies of Fenrir, and this engine gives any deck a board breaker that can also be used going first and gives you a free card in hand. But if you want more of the Castor cards, you can play a bigger engine of up to 3 Rate Soth, Unicorn, Fenrir, Arise Heart, Castor Theosis, and Birth, alongside up to one copy of each of Scareclaw Castira, Tier Laments Castira, and Castira Big Bang. The engine gives you really easy access to rank 7 monsters, as well as the main Castor boss monster, Castor Shangri Ira, and Castor Arise Heart, both of which are played at 3 copies. However, both Scareclaw and Tier Limit strategies actually cross archetypes with Castira, and as a result, their Castira engine looks a bit different to most decks. These decks can play up to three copies of the specific Castira card, and can play either Fenrir or Raid Soths to search out these cards as well. Now, let's get into what these cards actually do, starting with the main deck. Pressured Planet Raid Soth is the deck's main consistency tool. It's a field spell with the same theming as the other field spells in the Visa Star Frost lore, and as a result comes with a search, an attack boost, and a pop. You can only activate one Rate Soth per turn, and when you do, you can search any cast your monster in your deck, making it both a great consistency tool and a way to find your extenders in case your plays are interrupted. And while you control Rate Soth, all your monsters gain 100 attack and defense for every different attribute on the field. This includes your opponent's monsters. And because all the cast your monsters have different attributes, there's a really good chance that your monsters end up being boosted by 600 or 700 if there happens to be a divine monster on the field. And last but not least, on a new chain, after you've used the effect of Castor Shangri Ra, on a hard once per turn, you can target a card in the field and destroy it. This is a really nice bonus effect which you can use both on your turn to clear away your opponent's board, or even as an interruption on your opponent's turn. Provided that you banish a card face down with something like Fenrir or a Rise Heart so that you can use the effect of Shangri Ra. But the strongest aspect of Rate Soth is of course the search. Usually you're grabbing Castor Unicorn, the deck's main combo starter. Unicorn causes the summoning condition similar to Super Quanto Red Laser, where if you control all monsters, you can just special summon from your hand for free without activating an effect. This gives you access to Unicorn's two incredibly strong on-field effects. Its second effect triggers either after Unicorn has declared an attack, or on a new chain after your opponent has used a monster effect, and lets you look at your opponent's extra deck and banish one card of your choice from it face down. This not only gives you free information about your opponent's extra deck options, but also lets you remove those options from the game entirely, which is really useful for getting rid of cards like Zeus, which can easily deal with cast your boards or for getting rid of your opponent's combo pieces. Sniping out these options is so strong in fact that even prior to the release of the latest caster support in Photon Hypernova, Unicorn saw a lot of experimentation as a generic tool to counter tier limits since the moment your opponent activated a monster effect, you could just banish their strongest combo tool, tier limit Kid Kalos, before they had a chance to fusion summon it. And because it's a win monster, it could even be used against Fluentarese as a way to more easily outbear your statue. This tag got so popular that in order to counter it, as well as Diablosis the Mind Hacker, Tier Limits began playing two copies of Kit Kals in the extra deck just so they'd have their best combo tool in case the unicorn was activated. And this isn't even the only great effect of Unicorn, because its search effect is actually integral for Castira. You can't search Rate Soth since it's technically not a Castira spell, but you do still have two excellent search targets in both Castira Birth and Castira Theosis. Castira Theosis is the primary search target for Unicorn, and for good reason since Theosis has two great effects one that you can use from the hand, and the other that activates when it's banished. Its first effect is basically an e for the archetype, 
that lets you summon out a cash tier from your deck. But in order to activate it, you do need to target a cash tier monster you control, and the cash tier monster you summon must be a different attribute to the one you targeted. So you can't summon a Fenrir after targeting Scareclaw cash Tira, since they're both earth monsters. But you could summon out Tier Elements cash Tira, since it's water. And for the rest of the turn after you use Theosis, you're locked into only being able to summon Xyz monsters from your extra deck. With this first effect, you're usually targeting your Wind Unicorn, so you can summon out your Earth Fenrir from your deck, because Fenrir can be used to grab Rise Heart or another extender. But, Cast Your Theosis is a really versatile card, so you can target just about any Cast Your monster to bring out whatever else you need. Its second effect is just as versatile and can get you free follow up, because whenever it's banished, you can target one of your banished Cast Your cards and add it to your hand. The only issue is that it has to be banished, which sounds difficult at first, but Cast Your has a number of ways to trigger this effect from Tier Limits Cast Tira to Cast Your Rise Heart and even with their main boss monster, Cash Tier Arise Heart. If you've already got access to Cash Tier Theosis, you can use Unicorn's effect to search out Cash Tier Birth. Birth is a solid extender that also lets you interact with your opponent's graveyard. The first effect lets you normal summon out a level 7 monster without tributing. This is a really nice bonus because it means that if you've got any stray Cash Tier in hand that you can't summon because you control a monster, you can just normal summon it with Birth for free instead, making it a great way to unclog your hand. But that's not all, because if your opponent activates a spell card while you control any cast tier monsters with birth up, you can target exactly three cards in your opponent's graveyard and banish them face down. This lets you deal with some of your opponent's best graveyard resources before they have a chance to use them, like Keldo, Mudora, or Kit Kalos, that they'd want to use for a fusion summon. But the strongest effect of birth is its reborn effect, which lets you special summon any non xyz cast tier monster from either your graveyard or your face up banish zone. This acts as an archetypal copy monster reborn that summons from the banished pile as well, which is already good enough, but because it's continuous, you can use this reborn effect every turn, making it a great extender on turn 1, and free follow up on later turns. Unicorn does technically have other search targets, but they're often not as played as Cash Tier Theosis and Birth, since their effects are a lot worse and don't really help the engine. In contrast, Cash Tier Fenrir is one of the most helpful cards in the archetype because, like Unicorn, it has two strong effects one that's helpful for making your own boards, and another that's used for breaking your opponents. It also has the same summon condition as Unicorn, where you can special summon from your hand for free, provided you control no monsters. Its main effects, though, are a little bit different. Its second effect occurs on a new chain after your opponent has activated a monster effect, or after Fenrir declares an attack, just like Unicorn. But instead of banishing a card from your opponent's action deck face down, Fenrir lets you target a face-up card in the field and banish it face down. This effect is part of the reason Fenrir is often dubbed as the latest Dino Wrestler Panker Tops because a lot of decks can use Fenrir generically as a low investment tool whose effect can be used as a board breaker, a way to out floodgates, or even when going first as an extra interruption. And because Fenrir also got to search a card, this made it a really free board breaker, even in non cash tier decks, because your Fenrir could search for another copy of itself. But it's in a heavier cash tier engine where Fenrir shines, because instead of just adding another Fenrir, you have a wider array of options available to you. You can still just search Fenrir of course, but you can also use Fenrir to search for Unicorn if you have birth access to summon it out to the field. You can search for an extender like Tier Limits Cash Tira, but more likely than not, your Fenrir will usually be grabbing Cash Tira Rise Heart. Because Rise Heart has two key effects which make it an integral combo piece for Cash Tira, since it allows them easy access to rank 7th as well as their main boss monster. Its first effect locks you into only being able to summon out Xyz monsters from your extra deck for the rest of the turn, but lets you special summon it from your hand if you control a Cash Tira monster, which makes it a really free extender that you can search off of Fenrir. The only issue with Rise Heart is that it's level 4, which means that it doesn't really work well with the level 7 cast tier monsters for Xyz plays. But with its second effect, you can actually modulate Rise Heart's level, because during the turn it's summoned, you can banish a cast tier card for cost from your deck face up, so you can banish 3 cards from the top of your opponent's deck face down while making Rise Heart at level 7. This means that Rise Heart can actually be used for rank 7 plays, but this effect also does two other really important things. Because it banishes cards on top of your opponent's deck face down, you can trigger the effect of Cash Tira Shangri Ra on your first turn to block off an opponent's unused zone. This can be used to get closer to locking your opponent out of the game, but the crucial part is that it causes Shangri Ra to activate in the first place, which allows you to summon out a Rise Heart from your extra deck using just a single Cash Tira monster, making it absurdly easy to go into. And lastly, Reinhardt's cost is actually really beneficial, because you can either use it to banish a Cash Tira monster as you can summon back with Birth, or you can instead banish a Cash Tier Spell or Trap card with a beneficial effect on a banish, like a Cash Tier Theosis for a free follow up, or Cash Tier Big Bang for extension. Because when Big Bang is banished, you get to target a Cash Tier Xyz monster you control, so you can detach a Cash Tier monster from it to add it to your hand, and either keep it for follow up, or special summon it from your hand. This on banish effect pairs excellently with Rise Heart, since by banishing for cost, it's an easy way to just get another free body on field for rank 7 plays. The issues with Big Bang, however, is that it's sort of a brick, because while its on-field effect can be useful, it's somewhat niche, even despite being an archetypal evenly matched. 
You can only activate it while you control a Castor XZ's monster, and when it's used, both players are forced to banish monsters from their field face down, so they both only control one. Into strategies that swarm the field like Sprite, this effect can be solid. But because it clears your own field as well, and you need to set up with a Castor XZ's monster so it can be used in the first place, you would rather just have a big bang in deck to be banished off of Rise. But its banish effect is so good for extension that Castor players choose to play a copy of it anyways. Although, if you already have Rise Heart in hand, your Fenrir could instead search for one of the deck's alternative extenders in Tier Limits Kashtira or Scareclaw Kashtira. These cards both share a quick effect that lets you special some of them out during the main phase, but after you summon them out, you either have to banish a Kashtira card or a card from the respective archetype from your hand or graveyard. This might sound like a detriment at first, but it gives you a really easy way to banish your Kashtira spell or trap cards like Kashtira Theosis or Big Bang, so you can use their on-banish effects really easily if they happen to have found their way into the graveyard. But that's not all, because Tear Laments and Scareclaw Kashtira come with their own unique benefit. Scareclaw Kashtira gives you a monster with a high defense that can attack while in defense position and uses defense stats for damage calculation, which gives Kashtira a searchable way of easily outing Baguska. Meanwhile, Tear Laments Kashtira gives you a way of milling three cards off of your own deck or your opponents, so you can either set up your graveyard for something like Birth, or if a Rise Heart is on field, you can send cards from your opponent's deck to the graveyard instead, banishing them and potentially cutting off some of their engine pieces. But as well as in Kashtira, both Scareclaw and Tear Laments Kashtira see play in Scareclaw and Tear Laments, and these decks may even play copies of Fenrir or Wraithsoth just to be able to search these cards out. Scareclaw Kashtira sees playing Scareclaw just because it's a solid extender that you can use for the Link Summon of either Scareclaw Lightheart or Scareclaw Tryheart. But Tear Laments Kashtira is absurd in Tear Laments specifically. Its on summon effect is incredible for the deck, since you can just choose to mill three cards to the top of your own deck, giving tier limits yet another way of milling their tier names, Ishizu names, or anything with a good graveyard effect. And if you happen to mill tier limits Kashtira, you can activate its graveyard effect, which also just so happens to be another free mill, letting you send another two cards on top of your deck to the graveyard. So if you use both effects of tier limits Kashtira in a turn, you're milling five cards from the top of your deck. But that's not even the end of the tier limits Kashtira's utility, because it's not just about the number of cards it can mill, it's when it can mill them. You see, because its effect is quick effect, you can use Tier Limits Cash Tier before you've even gotten to your first turn, then you summon it to the field and mill cards as a hand trap, making it just an extra three copies of Tier Limits Halfness. This does mean that you'll have to banish a Tier Limits card from your hand, but it's more than worth it to potentially trigger your Tier Limits graveyard effects, so that you can either set up interaction or drown an advantage before your opponent has reached their first end phase. This special summon effect is also a great way to beat one of Tier Limits' best counters, the Bistials. Because whenever your opponent uses a Bistial monster to try to banish your Tier Limit monster in your graveyard after you use a fusion effect, you can chain Tier Limit's Cash Tier to summon itself out and banish your monster in the graveyard. Your fusion effect still won't go through, but you'll get to summon out a free body that mills three cards from your deck while preventing your opponent's Magma Hut from hitting the field and getting its search tier in the end phase. All of these factors are why Tier Limits run three copies of Tier Limit's Cash Tier, even if they don't run any other Cash Tier cards in their deck. But in terms of actual Cash Tier deck, it's fun at fewer copies since it's really just more of an extender in Cash Tier than it is a huge playmaker like it is in Tier. Now that we've looked into the important main deck cards, let's talk about the deck's main payoffs in the extra deck, starting with Cash Tier Shangri Ra. In terms of payoff, Shangri Ra is a good one because it has three amazing effects and is really easy to access since it only needs two or more level 7 monsters. Its first effect lets you summon out a Cash Tier monster from your deck during each standby phase. This is really helpful since you can use Ira's effect to strengthen your end board with either a Fenrir or a Unicorn to use the disruptive effects on your opponent's turn and their search effects on your turn. Ira's other effect protects it from destruction, in a similar way to Dengursu, where if it would be destroyed by battle or card effect you can detach material from Ira instead, so a lot of great board breakers like Dark Hole aren't as devastating against Kashtira as they could be. Shangri Ira's most interesting effect though is the one that blocks off your opponent's zones. Because if a card in your opponent's possession is banished face down, you can choose any of your opponent's main monster or spell and trap card zones and stop your opponent from using them at all while you control your face up Shangri Ra. This lets you restrict your opponent's options by a lot, especially because all of the cast tier monsters happen to have effects which can banish your opponent's possessions face down. So it's actually really easy to block off a ton of your opponent's zones on the first turn. And if you happen to block off all of your opponent's monster zones, they can't summon monsters at all. Or if you happen to block off your opponent's spell and trap card zones, your opponent is locked out of spells and trap cards. In fact, if you target even a single Pendulum scale, your opponent can't Pendulum Summon at all since they'd only be able to place a single scale. This effect is actually why Swords of Concealing Light and Book of Eclipse have become common staples to counter Kashtira. You see, Shangri-Ira is protected from board breakers like Regeki, and its zone locking is actually a lingering effect, so even if it's negated with Dark Ruler, the zones that were locked still won't be able to be used. However, Book of Eclipse and Concealing Light make it so that Shangri-Ira is no longer facing on the field, freeing them from the zone locking so you can actually play the game. But there's one more aspect of Shangri-Ra that makes it even stronger. Because if you manage to use any effect of Shangri-Ra, it suddenly becomes incredibly easy to bring out Kashtira's main boss monster, Kashtira Arise Heart. 
You see, a Rise Heart is basically just a macrocosmos on legs. Because, while it's on field, any card that would be sent to the graveyard is banished instead. This effect is crazy because it cuts off your opponent from using their graveyard entirely, which is especially important on graveyard reliant strategies, since while Arise Heart is on the field, a deck like Tier Laments can't play at all. But that's not where Arise Heart's strengths ends, because it also comes with removal, as on a soft once per turn, at quick effect speed, by detaching 3 Xyz materials from Arise Heart, you can target any card in the field and banish it face down. The only downside to Arise Heart is how many cards you need to summon it normally, since it requires 3 levels of a monster's materials, so it's a pretty huge investment, even for as strong as its effects are. But Arise Heart actually comes with its own unique alternative summon condition, where if you've activated an effect of Kashtira Shingra Ura that turn, you can special summon out Arise Heart using only a single Kashtira monster as an Xyz material. And this summoning condition is laughably easy to fulfill, since you can trigger the zone blocking effect of Shingra Ura with the effect of Rise Heart by using his effect to banish the top 3 cards of your opponent's stack face down. From there, you can use the effect of Ira to block off a zone, and then summon a Rise Heart on top of Rise Heart. But because you summon out a Rise Heart with only one material, you don't get access to its removal effect, because that effect requires you to detach three Xyz materials for cost. However, a Rise Heart actually has a way for you to get more materials on it quickly. Because whenever a cart is banished, including because of its Floodgate, a Rise Heart's mandatory effect triggers, and forces you to attach a banished card to it as a material, letting you choose from your own banished pile or even your opponent's. This effect is once per chain, and not once per turn, so every single chain where a card is banished, you get a free material on a Rise Heart, allowing you to quickly build up from one material to three after just two chains. This effect is also really important because of the fact you get to choose what card gets attached to Rise Heart as material, which means you can attach a Cash Tier Big Bang or a Cash Tier Theosis to it, so that when you detach them, they'll get banished again, so you can use their on banish effects again. Or if you've activated Pot of Prosperity this turn, you can use the effect of a Rise Heart to attach one of your face down banish extra cards to it as a material. And if you happen to attach an Infinite Track Goliath to a Rise Heart from your banished zone, the Arise Heart can no longer be destroyed by card effects because of the effect of Infinite Goliath, as Arise Heart just so happens to be a machine type monster. Overall, Arise Heart is an absurd card, and the reason to play Cash Tira, or any kind of Cash Tira engine, especially right now where its Floodgate is positioned to be amazingly strong against tier limits. Here's how Pendulum Monsters work. Pendulum Monsters are half monsters half spell cards that can either be summoned or placed in the Pendulum Zone as a special kind of continuous spell card called a Pendulum Scale. Unlike most monsters, whenever a Pendulum Monster card would go from the field to the graveyard, it instead goes to the extra deck face up unless otherwise stated. And when a player has two Pendulum Scales active, they can conduct a once per turn Pendulum Summon of as many monsters as they want from either the face up extra deck or the hand. However, these monsters levels must fall between the numbers listed on each Pendulum Scale and you can only special summon Pendulum Monsters from the face of Extra Deck to either the Extra Monster Zone, or Link Zones that you control. Now, at first glance, Pendulum Monsters can be spotted among other Yu-Gi-Oh cards quite easily. Like any monster, they have obvious levels, attributes, and stats, but have a mixed color border and reduced card art window to accommodate the additional Pendulum Scales and second text box. In general, Pendulum Monsters have two effects. Their monster effects are listed in the lower text box, and their spell effects are listed in the upper text box. However, some Pendulum Monsters have no effect when activated in the Pendulum Zone, while others may even be normal monsters with effects when scaled or have no effects at all. While Pendulum Monsters are often loath for their seemingly endless walls of text, you can often shortcut the amount of reading you have to do when you encounter a new Pendulum Monster by looking out for some of these common themes. First, does it restrict the player from Pendulum Summoning or Special Summoning in some way? And if not, is there a clause that changes that Pendulum's monster scale under certain conditions? Second, is it part of an archetype? Pendulum monsters with extremely unique effects often share their quirks with other monsters of their archetype, and a large part of their text is just explaining how that archetype's gimmick works. Lastly, is it a Pendulum Xyz monster? All Pendulum Xyz monsters have lengthy claws that you can skip that simply explains that it can be Pendulum summoned face up in extra deck despite having a rank as opposed to a level. Speaking of the face up extra deck, knowing where Pendulum monsters are supposed to go can sometimes be confusing, since it can change depending on how they're used and where they're moving from. As a general rule, Pendulum monsters go to the extra deck face up whenever a non Pendulum monster in the same scenario would leave the field and go to the graveyard. However, if a card like Macrocosmos that states otherwise is on the field, that card takes precedent over the default game mechanics. In this and other similar cases, any Pendulum Monsters that would go to the extra deck face up are banished instead. When using Pendulum Monsters as materials for extra deck monsters, understanding the rule that requires Pendulum Monsters to move specifically from the field to the graveyard is essential. While Pendulums intuitively go to the face up extra deck when used for Synchro or Link Summoning, when used as materials for an XC Summon, Pendulum Monsters do not go to the extra deck face up if they are detached. While this is a bit counterintuitive, it's because XC's materials are not considered to be cards on the field. 
Therefore, since these pendulum monsters are being sent to the graveyard from somewhere else that isn't considered the field, they do not go to the extra deck face up. Using pendulum monsters as fusion materials similarly requires you to pay close attention to where the monsters being used as materials are coming from. If you activate Parametalfo's Fusion to Fusion Summon a Metalfo's Fusion Monster using cards from your hand, field, or face up extra deck as material, then any monster used from the field will go to the extra deck face up. But any monsters used from either the hand or face up extra deck will go to the graveyard. The most obtuse ruling of all regarding pendulum monsters and whether they go to the face up extra deck or graveyard is easily taken by what happens to them when the summon of the pendulum monster is negated. While it may appear that a pendulum Pendulum monster in this situation is moving from the field to the graveyard, in this instance it does not go to the face of extra deck and instead goes to the graveyard. This is because a monster whose summon has been negated is considered to have never been summoned and therefore has never touched the field. Monsters in this scenario, including pendulum monsters, are immediately sent to the graveyard without the designation of having come from the field, hand, extra deck, or any other named location in Yu-Gi-Oh! This can be extremely frustrating after conducting a large pendulum summon since all of the summoned monsters will be sent to the graveyard instead of the extra deck if your pendulum summon is negated. Speaking of pendulum summoning, in order to conduct a pendulum summon, a player must have two active pendulum scales in their pendulum zones, one with a high numbered scale and one with a low numbered scale. When a player is referring to their pendulum scale, they could be referring to one of two things. Either they're referring to a pendulum monster scale in the pendulum zone, or specifically the number listed on that pendulum monster. In the first case, a pendulum scale is any pendulum monster card that has been activated or placed in a pendulum zone, and the action of activating a pendulum monster in the pendulum zone is unofficially referred to as scaling. While placed in a pendulum zone, a pendulum monster is treated as a continuous spell with the effects listed in its upper text box, with continuous effects being applied upon resolution and activate effects becoming available for activation. It should be noted that a pendulum monster being treated as a continuous spell or trap in the spell trap card zone do not have access to their pendulum scale effects unless they have been explicitly placed in the pendulum zone. While this isn't a common occurrence, it is something that can occur and that pendulum players should be aware of. In the second case, a pendulum scale refers to the two numbers on the left and right of the card next to their red and blue scale markers. While this number technically indicates the scale value the card will have in each respective pendulum zone, every pendulum monster currently released has the same number on both sides. However, there isn't any written rule that says this will always be the case, and Konami has previously shown interest in this as a potential pendulum design space. Since both a low and high scale are necessary in order to conduct a pendulum summon, a pendulum monster's scale numbers can sometimes be even more important than its effects. A scale of 8 or 9 is great for a high scale, and 1 is the golden standard for a low scale. While scales higher or lower than these do exist, they're typically considered overkill and unnecessary. Having a scale of 2, 6, or 7 is considered okay. But pendulum monsters with a scale of 3 or 5 have to have really good effects to offset their limited use in the pendulum zones. Pendulum monsters with a written or changing scale of 4 are given this scale as a deliberate downside. These cards often have incredibly powerful effects that warrant restrictions, and giving a pendulum monster's scale of 4 is often enough to balance it out. Once your scales are set, to conduct your pendulum summon, you simply have to declare it, and then special summon as many monsters as you want from your hand and extra deck, so as long as you follow a few key rules. To start, you can only pendulum summon monsters whose levels are between the numbers listed in your pendulum scales. For example, if you have Perform Pal Monkey Board and Perform Pal Celestial Magician scaled, you can pendulum summon monsters with levels between 2 and 7, since Monkey Board scale is 1 and Celestial Magician scale is 8. This is why having a pendulum scale of 4 is so bad, since it prevents you from pendulum summoning level 4 monsters, the most commonly used level in the game. Next, pendulum monsters being summoned from the extra deck must be summoned to either an unoccupied extra monster zone you can summon to, or to link zones that you control, with a link zone being a zone that a link monster points to. This is a restriction left over from Master Rule 4 and used to apply to all extra deck summons, but now only applies to pendulum and link monsters as of the introduction of Master Rule 4 revisions. Lastly, monsters from the hand cannot be pendulum summoned to the extra monster zone, and the monsters you pendulum summon must be generically special summonable. While there are edge cases where this won't be true, in general, if you special summon a monster using Monster Reborn, that monster can also be pendulum summoned. This rule works for almost any monsters being summoned from the hand, and extra deck pendulum monsters being summoned from the extra deck. Since, just like a normal extra deck monster being special summoned from the graveyard, extra deck pendulum monsters must be properly summoned before they can be pendulum summoned from the face up extra deck. Similarly to built in special summons of cards like Cyber Dragon and Kashtira Fenrir, pendulum summons don't activate and therefore don't start chains until the summon is complete and the monsters are already on the field. Due to the quirks of pendulum monsters in pendulum summoning, finding the best ratios for cards in pendulum decks can work a bit differently compared to non-pendulum decks. There are two general philosophies that have emerged regarding how pendulum decks should be built. While you should always play your starters at 3 just like any other deck, the ratios of which extenders, consistency tools, and non-engine staples should be played is where the two ideologies diverge. 
On one hand, you have the standard deck building practice of including all of your best cards at three to maximize the probability that you draw into those cards in the first turn. Pendulum decks built this way are incredibly consistent at performing their main combo lines and building end boards, but are unable to play more than a handful of non-engine staples, if any at all. This is because Pendulum Summons are three card combos by design, and most Pendulum combos require you to start with at least two different Pendulum monsters in hand. However, the best boards are often built by three, four, and even five card combos that utilize most or all of the cards in your starting hand, setting up loads of interaction to protect your board while constantly interrupting your opponent. While the consistency boost provided by opening five engine pieces is great for playing through interruptions when going first, Pendulum decks built this way are an immense disadvantage going second, and often struggle to break boards when left uninterrupted. On the other hand, Pendulum decks can also be built on the other extreme by focusing on the amount of advantage a single card can generate. These decks leverage the few one-card Pendulum starters that are available by maximizing their starters, minimizing their extenders, and jam-packing the rest with non-engine staples in an attempt to increase their consistency going second. While this style of deck increases combo fragility and reduces the ceiling of your end board compared to a pile of three of engine pieces, it's balanced by the sheer power of non-engine staples, like Nibiru and Kurikara that have the potential to win you the game on their own. While both styles of pendulum deck building have their pros and cons, in the end, which style you pursue really comes down to either metagaming the current format or personal preference. Regardless of what pendulum deck you're building or how you're building it, there are a few generic pendulum and anti-pendulum staples that you should be aware of. Beyond the pendulum is a link to spellcaster with the effect to search any pendulum monster from your deck when link summoned to the extra monster zone, and can target and destroy any two cards of the field when two monsters of different levels are pendulum summoned to zones that it points to. This card is so good in pendulum decks that they usually played at two copies, both to insulate against extra deck ripping effects and to aid in rebuilding the board on turn three when going first. Arc Fiend Eccentric is level three fiend that has the pendulum effect to destroy itself and any other spell trap on the field, and the monster effect to attribute itself to target and destroy another monster on the field. The ability to flex between monster and back removal is so good that non-pendulum decks will sometimes include Eccentric on the side, but its pendulum scale of seven makes it even better in pendulum decks as a way to either play through interruption or break your opponent's board. While currently banned in the TCG, Master Duel players specifically need to be wary of Heavy Metal Foes Electromite, a Link to Psychic monster that functions both as a generic consistency tool and extender for Pendulum decks. Upon Link Summon, it has the effect to add any Pendulum monster from your deck to your extra deck face up, and has the activate effect to destroy any card you control to add a Pendulum monster from your face up extra deck to your hand. Both of these effects are soft once per turn, with the only hard once per turn being its mandatory draw upon a card leaving your Pendulum zone. Moving on to the anti Pendulum staples. Anti-Spell Fragrance is a continuous trap that requires both players to set spell cards before activating them, and prevents spell cards from being activated until a player's next turn after they were set. Since Pendulum Monsters can only be activated in the Pendulum Scales and cannot be set, Anti-Spell Fragrance is often seen as an instant win card against Pendulum decks, locking them out of their Pendulum Effects and Pendulum Summoning. Dimensional Barrier is a normal trap card that requires you to declare either Ritual, Fusion, Synchro, Exes, or Pendulum to negate that type's effects on the field and prevent either player from special summoning monsters of that type for the rest of the turn. Similarly to Anti-Spell Fragrance, flipping Dimensional Barrier and calling Pendulum is actually even better than the currently banned Vanity's Emptiness against Pendulum decks, effectively skipping their turn entirely by locking them out of special summoning. Eradicator Epidemic Virus is another popular normal trap that, by attributing a dark monster with 2500 or more attack, allows you to declare either spell or trap to look at your opponent's hand, all spell traps they can control on all cards they draw until their third turn after its activation and destroy all cards of the declared type. While this seems like it wouldn't hurt Pendulum decks very much since they're primarily made up of Pendulum monsters, this is far from reality as Pendulum monsters in the scales are considered to be continuous spells. This allows Eradicator to destroy your scales at any time as well as any other starters or extenders you might be holding on for later. In general, Pendulum decks also have a hard time in formats where main deck spell and trap card removal is viable and having an important summon on your Pendulum Summon negated by a well-timed Solemn can be devastating, since Pendulum Monsters will go to the graveyard if their summon is negated. Overall, Pendulum Monsters are an extremely unique design space that is exclusive to Yu-Gi-Oh, and can lead to fun and interesting situations that are vastly different from what non-Pendulum decks provide. Despite their lack of recent meta relevance, they should still be kept in consideration as a potential contender in the future on the advent of new support. The Cupid Pitch combos allow you to end on three negates if you're able to summon out Haki Fibrax, but does require you to play three Garnets in your main deck. The combo starts off with any two monsters in the field with at least one of them being a tuner, where you then use both of them to go into Crestron Haki Fibrax. Then you use its effect to special summon out specifically Despot 001 from your deck. Then you use those cards in order to link summon out Mecha Fiend and Beast Aurora Dawn, and you use its effect to summon three tokens to the field. This will activate the effect of Deskbot 001 in the graveyard, where its special summons itself if two or more machine monsters are summoned at the exact same time. Then you just use Deskbot plus one of those tokens summoned by Roradon in order to synchro summon out Cupid Pitch. 
Then you use the effective Cupid Pitch in order to increase its level by 1 to 5 so you can use it for future synchro plays. Next you activate the second effect of Aurora Dawn in order to tribute your two remaining tokens in order to special summon out Mecha Phantom Beast Coltwing from your deck. When Coltwing is special summoned, it lets you special summon two tokens, which will then activate the effect of Despot from your graveyard again to come back out. Then you use one of your new level 3 tokens with your level 5 Cupid Pitch in order to synchro summon Borlode Savage Dragon, equipping Crystron Haki Firebacks to your dragon so it gains two counters. Then you use the floating effect of Cupid Pitch in order to search out a monster with 600 defense from your deck, this being Creation Resonator. We then use the effect of Creation in your hand in order to special summon it since you control a level 8 synchro monster. Then you use the new level 7 Mega Phantom Beast Coltwing and the Creation Resonator to synchro summon Baron de Floor. And finally, you use the remaining level 3 token and the Death Spot 001 to synchro summon out Herald of the Arc Light. And there you have it, 3 negates on board all starting from a simple 2 card combo on the field, and 3 Garnets being in your main deck. Now, I know the Cupid Pitch combo is incredibly wordy and seems pretty complicated, but seeing as you do the exact same line of combos every time you do the combo, it's actually really simple once you get the hang of it. You don't really deviate from the formula too much, unless you're playing some other kind of combos you want to go into, or if your opponent disrupts you at one of your points. But usually, they'll be able to disrupt you before you're able to get the combo going in the first place. Now, the cards necessary in order to accomplish this pretty lengthy combo are the three main deck monsters, Despot 001, Mecha Phantom Beast Coltwing, and Creation Resonator. And the six extract monsters you need are Christon Haki Fibrax, Mecha Phantom Beast Aurora Dawn, Cupid Pitch, Borlode Savage Dragon, Baron de Floor, and Herald of the Arc Light. So a pretty lengthy lineup of extract monsters, and of course running three main deck Garnets that you never want to draw into. Definitely means there's a lot of points in which you can screw up the combo if you simply draw the three Garnets from your deck. Although the Garnets required is basically the same amount as playing the DPE engine, so a lot of people opt to use this if they have any kind of tuners in their deck at all, and just accept the risk of running a handful of Garnets for the incredible payoff you can get from having those six extra deck monsters ready to go. So first up, let's go over the main monsters in the combo. Christron Halky Fibrax requires any two monsters, including the tuner monsters, as two materials, which can just be two tuner monsters. So if you have something like Deep Sea Diva to special summon another Deep Sea Diva from your deck, you can use both of them to go into Christian Hockey Fibrax from one card in your starting hand. Then you use the effect of Christian Hockey Fibrax to simply special summon a level 3 lower tuner monster from your hand or deck, but it can't activate its effect this turn. It also has another effect where it can banish itself during your opponent's main or battle phase to special summon a tuner synchro monster from your extra deck and treat it as a proper synchro summon, which isn't really used in this combo, but is sometimes useful for certain kinds of synchro decks, which you might run if you're playing the tuner monsters required to do this combo in the first place. Next up we have Mecha Phantom Beast Aurora Dawn. This card is currently banned in the TCG, so all of these combos is only really possible in Master Duel, because Crystal Hockey Fibrax is currently banned in the OCG as well. And what Aurora Dawn does is it requires two plus machine monsters as its materials, and when it's Link Summoned you can special summon three Mecha Phantom Beast tokens, each one's level 3 and has no restrictions on what you can do with them. However, when you bring out Mecha Phantom Beast Aurora Dawn, it does have the restriction where you cannot Link Summon for the rest of the turn. Which doesn't matter because you just start only doing synchro plays once Aurora Dawn comes out. Then Aurora Dawn has three effects you can pick from based on the amount of cards you tribute for its cost. Or if you tribute one, you get to destroy one card in the field. If you tribute two monsters, you can special summon Mega Phantom Beast Monster from your deck, which is the effect you'll be using most of the time. And also, a special thing to note is that it does not allow you to special summon the monster from your hand. It's only the deck. So if you draw in two Mecha Phantom Beast Cult Wing, that's a huge detriment to the combo. And finally, if you tribute three monsters, you can add a trap card from your graveyard to your hand. An effect almost nobody ever uses, so people forget that Aurora Dawn can even do this. Basically, Aurora Dawn is only ever used to bring out three tokens, then special summon Cult Wing from the deck, or use Mecha Phantom Beast O-Line if you're going for a less Garnet filled combo, and also play Master Duel since Mecha Phantom Beast O-Lion is banned in the TCG. However, just to note, the combo lines with Mecha Phantom Beast O-Lion are different than the ones explained in this video, so you can't just slot it in as a replacement. Next up, we have Deskbot 001. This card really pulls all the combos together, as it's heavily used in pretty much every step of the way. It's a level 1 tuner, which has the effect, where it gains 500 attack and defense for each machine-type monster you control. And then it has a graveyard effect, where if two or more machine monsters are special summoned at the exact same time, you can special summon this card from the graveyard. And its effect is not once per turn, which is definitely notable because you use the effect two times during the combo. And since Despot 001 itself is a machine type monster, it combos perfectly with Christian Hockey Fibrax in order to bring up Mega Phantom Beast Aurora Dawn. Next up, we have the main playmaker of this combo, and that's Cupid Pitch. This is a level 4 synchro monster which has the effect where when it's synchro summoned, you can choose to increase or decrease the level of this monster by the level of the tuner monster used for its summon. 
So in the case of this combo, where you're using the level 1 Despot 001, you can increase its level by 1 to make it level 5, which is perfect because Cupid Pitch is also a tuner monster. So you can use it as a level 5 monster plus one of the level 3 tokens in order to bring out a level 8 synchro monster, which there is a very powerful lineup of cards to go into. In addition to being able to change its level to a more agreeable level to work with the tokens on the field, it has an effect that if this synchro summon card is sent to the graveyard as a synchro material, you get to inflict damage to your opponent equal to the new synchro monster's level times 100. Then you can add a level 8 or lower monster with exactly 600 defense from your deck to your hand. And also, Cupid Pitch gains attack equal to its level times 400 which isn't super relevant because the card isn't really used for that effect. And since Cupid Pitch allows you to search out any monster that has exactly 600 defense, and of course is level 8 or lower, there's a wide range of cards you can actually search out. For this combo, we're specifically going into Creation Resonator, but you can also choose to go into Nemesis Corridor, which can be used in order to bring out Thunder Dragon Colossus. Although again, this is a combo only from Master Duel, where they have Thunder Dragon Colossus unbanned. Next up, we have Creation Resonator. This is a level 3 tuner monster, which has the effect where if you control a level 8 or higher synchro monster on the field, you can special summon this card from your hand. Normally, this card is not very good, but the fact that it has exactly 600 defense and is a tuner, and can special summon itself from your hand, is exactly why it's played in this combo. Then we have Mecha Phantom Beast Cult Wing. This is the main deck Mecha Phantom Beast monster you'll be special summoning with Mecha Phantom Beast Aurorodon. This card has the effect where if it's special summoned and you control another Mecha Phantom Beast monster, you get to special summon two Mecha Phantom Beast tokens which are level 3 monsters with no stats. And additionally, Cult Wing has a few effects that are shared amongst a lot of the other Mega Phantom Beast main deck monsters, where its level is increased by the level of all Mega Phantom Beast tokens you control, and while you control a token, it cannot be destroyed by battle or card effects. Additionally, it has an effect where once per turn, you can tribute two tokens you control in order to destroy one card your opponent controls and then banish it. The main use of Cult Wing is the fact that it can special summon two tokens, so it can be used in order to proc Despot 001 to come back from the graveyard. And also, its level increase is used after one of the tokens is removed from the field because of the single token out becomes level 7, which makes it a more agreeable level for high-level synchro monsters. Another popular target for Rorodon is Mecha Phantom Beast O-Lion, which can allow you to go into Borlode Savage Dragon and Herald of Arc Light with Crushdron, Hockey, Firebrax, or Rorodon combos if you don't want to have to add one extra Garnet to your deck, or play a few extra extract monsters in the form of Cupid Pitch or Baron de Floor. Though this video is going over the long form combo and not the short one that involves Old Lion, which again is only possible in Master Duel along with all this other stuff. This is basically a Master Duel video, or a historical video explaining how this used to be possible in the OCG and TCG. There's a reason they banned a lot of the cards involved in this combo. Next up, we have the first negate monster you go into, Borolode Savage Dragon. This is a level 8 synchro monster with generic materials that has the effect that when it's synchro summoned you can equip a link monster from your graveyard to it, then place a number of counters on equal to that monster's link rating. Where Borolode Savage Dragon gains attack equal to half the attack of the equipped monster, and gains an Omni Negate that's fueled by the counters it plays on itself. Where if your opponent activates a card or effect, you can remove one of the counters in order to negate the activation. However, the negate of Borolode Savage Dragon does not also destroy the card, which is a thing to note when using negates properly, and you can only use the negate once per turn. Next up we have Baron de Fleur. Baron is a level 10 synchro monster with generic materials, which has three effects. The first one is that on a soft once per turn, you can target any card in the field and destroy it, which is a really powerful effect to have for no cost, and that's not even the best effect of the card. Its second and best effect is its Omni Negate, where if a card or effect is activated, you can negate the activation, and if you do, destroy the card. However, this effect is once per turn total while it's face up on the field, kind of like a wind up monster, where it doesn't reset during your opponent's turn or next turn, it's just a once and done effect which can be confusing if you're using the card for the first time because it does have a soft once per turn effect to target and destroy cards. However, even just having a single Omni Negate is pretty good, especially when attached to a monster who can also just pop cards every turn. And finally, it has another effect, which is rarely used, where during the standby phase you can special summon a level 9 or lower monster from your graveyard by returning Baron to your extra deck. So if you want to reset the card back to your extra deck to have its negate live again later, it has a built-in way to do that. Although generically, just being able to destroy one card every turn is worth having the card stick around, even if its negate is no longer available. And finally, we have the Herald of Arc Light. This is a level 4 synchro monster with generic materials that has a light floodgate on the field, where any monster sent from the hand or main deck to the graveyard is banished instead. Which can actually prevent some cards like hand traps or discard effects from taking place, because some of them require you to send cards to the graveyard specifically, like Forbidden Droplet. And more importantly, it has an Omni Negate, where if a spell, trap, or monster effect is activated, you can tribute the Herald of Arclight in order to negate the activation and destroy that card. And finally, if this card is sent to the graveyard in any way, you can add any ritual monster or ritual spell card from your deck to your hand. 
Now, you won't really be using this effect in this combo, but sometimes Herald of Arclight is played in the extra deck specifically to be sent to the graveyard in order to activate the search with cards like Diviner the Herald or Necroz Kaleidoscope. And with that, we have all the cards in the combo, as well as the combo itself explained at the beginning of the video. Again, this is a pretty long combo, but it's basically the same time every time you do it. So once you learn its combo, you'll be able to do it in your sleep every other time. And since you're able to get out three negates on your field from just being able to get a tuner monster in the field plus any other monster, you can kind of see why a lot of the cards in this combo are banned in multiple other formats. The combo goes as follows. Get any two effect monsters on the field. Use them to go into Predator Plant Verte on Aconda. Use Verte to copy the effective fusion destiny from your deck by paying 2,000 life points to bring out DPE using the materials from your deck. Now, Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer, or DPE, can non-target destroy one of your opponent's cards on a quick effect while also destroying itself if it chooses, which allows it to have disruption and the ability to dodge a whole bunch of different kinds of removal effects, since it can just destroy itself in response to your opponent trying to remove it. And if it's destroyed, it just comes back during the next standby phase, so it's an incredibly hard to get rid of card and allows you to destroy one card for free every turn. And this amazing boss monster can be brought out for the low, low price of just activating Fusion Destiny, which allows you to use its fusion materials from your deck with just the drawback of not being able to special summon monsters for the rest of the turn except for dark hero monsters. And it destroys the card during the end phase of the next turn. And you can activate Fusion Destiny directly from your deck if you go into Predator Plant Verte on Aconda, which isn't possible in the TCG, but is still possible in Master Duel. The normal ratios for this engine are as many copies of Fusion Destiny as you can fit in. One copy of Destiny Hero Dasher, and one copy of Destiny Hero Celestial, and one copy of Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer in your extra deck. Alternatively, if you have access to Predator Plant Verte on Aconda, you want to include one of those as well. And also alternatively, instead of playing Dasher or Celestial as your two main deck cards, you can play two copies of Malicious and one copy of Denier instead. Now I'll go over the main cards in this engine. The main card here is Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer. This is a fusion monster that requires a level 6 or higher hero monster, plus any Destiny Hero monster as its two materials. It has a passive effect where your opponent's monsters lose 200 attack for every hero card in your graveyard, which actually comes up quite a bit as a useful effect. And then it has two other effects, where on a quick effect you can destroy both one card on the field and one card you control. And its other effect is that if this card is destroyed by battle or card effect, you can special summon a Destiny Hero monster from your graveyard during the next standby phase which does include your opponent's standby phase too. So if you simply use this destruction effect to select itself, it can activate its own floating effect to bring itself back during the next standby phase. And its destruction effect is a non-target, so your opponent can't preemptively activate cards that you're trying to get rid of in the back row. And also, it can use the effect to destroy itself in order to dodge any kind of removal effect that might make it so this card will not come back next turn. Additionally, if you don't actually care about destroying itself in order to dodge an effect, because maybe you just want to keep it on the field to dodge the effects of Called by the Grave, which might get rid of it, you can just destroy any other card you want, which is usually combined with Artifact Scythe in order to lock your opponent on their extra deck for a turn. Next up, we have Fusion Destiny. This card allows you to fusion summon a monster from your extra deck using cards from your hand or deck as materials, as long as the fusion monster you bring out has Destiny Hero Monster as one of its materials listed. However, the card is then destroyed during the end phase of the next turn, and you can't special summon monsters for the rest of the turn except for Dark Hero Monsters. Additionally, the effect of a card is a hard once per turn, which means you can only ever use one copy of that card's effect per turn. Now, the downside of the card being destroyed during the end phase of the next turn does not bother DPE at all, because it'll probably have destroyed itself by then anyway. And if it's destroyed, it's just going to come back to the next standby phase immediately. And because Fusion Destiny allows you to use materials from your deck, there are four cards that are heavily considered when people use the DPE engine. And we'll go over the four main deck ones in this video. But they all share the common sentimentality of having graveyard effects that give you some kind of advantage. First up, we have the premier target for Fusion Destiny, Destiny Hero Celestial. It has the graveyard effect, where it can banish this card and another Destiny Hero monster from your graveyard in order to draw two cards, assuming you have no cards in your hand, and it's a different turn that this card was sent to the graveyard. So, being able to banish the other card sent to the graveyard after Fusion Destiny basically turns going into DPE a plus two in card advantage, assuming you're able to get rid of all the cards in your hand, which most meta decks are able to do pretty easily. Celestio is what really turns this engine into having advantage because DPE can generate a whole bunch of advantage over the course of a duel by just destroying one card every turn, while Celestial can guarantee that by going to DPE, you're going to at least get the advantage back for using the Fusion Destiny if you used it from your hand, or to just go plus even further if not, which is why this card was hit in Master Duel to rein in DPE's power. Next up, we have Destiny Hero Dasher, which is usually played alongside Celestial. Its graveyard effect is that if you draw a card during your draw phase and it's a monster, you can special summon it. 
However, you can only use this effect once while this card is in the graveyard. Now, this effect isn't the greatest graveyard effect in the world, and is usually played alongside Celestial because it's the only useful level 6 to higher Destiny Hero effect you can play that only needs one copy of itself to actually do something from the graveyard. Generally, it's played alongside Celestial just to be banished alongside Celestial in order to draw two cards, and maybe gain you advantage of being able to special summon a monster with its graveyard effect. Which is a beneficial effect because it allows you to free up the resource of having to normal summon a monster to get on the field. But it's also not a super crucial effect that you want to keep in your graveyard, so it's perfect to be banished with Celestial at any point in order to draw two cards. Next up, we have Predator Plant Verte Anaconda. This card is currently banned in the TCG, but still available in Master Duel, as of making this video anyway. And basically, if you have a way to get any two effect monsters on the field, you can go into Predator Plant Verte Anaconda from your extra deck, which then allows you to pay 2,000 life points to send Fusion Destiny from your deck to the graveyard in order to gain its effect, which gets DP on the field. And with the simple condition of just having any two effect monsters on the field, Predator Plant Verte Anaconda made it way too easy to go into DPE, and a lot of other good cards that came out later, which is why it's definitely banned in the TCG, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was banned in all formats sometime in the future. Especially since people still play the DPE engine after Predator Plant Verte Anaconda was banned, just by hard casting Fusion Destiny from their hand. Next up, we have the two alternative cards that can be used instead of Dasher or Celestial. Destiny Hero Malicious is a level 6 Destiny Hero monster, which can banish itself from the graveyard to special summon another copy of itself from your deck. This card is historically semi-limited to two copies, because having three copies of this card in your deck means it's a plus two in card advantage if you're able to get a single one of them into the graveyard. However, you can still gain that plus two with just two copies of Malicious thanks to the next card on this list that's usually played alongside it with the Fusion Destiny in. Destiny Hero Denier has the graveyard effect, where if you have a Destiny Hero monster in the field, it can special summon itself from the graveyard once per duel. And then it has an effect that if it's normal or special summon, you can take a Destiny Hero monster from your deck, graveyard, or that is banished, and place that card on top of your deck. So, if you have both Denier and Malicious in the graveyard, what you do is use Malicious' effect first in order to special summon itself from the graveyard by banishing another copy of itself from your deck. And now that you have a Destiny Hero monster in the field, you can use Denier's graveyard effect to special summon itself as well, which will then activate its on summon effect to take that newly banished Malicious and place it back on top of your deck where you can then immediately get your Malicious into the graveyard by going into some kind of extra deck play. You can use its effect a second time, since it technically has another copy in the deck now. So playing Malicious and Denier can allow you to get three bodies in the field with extra steps from the graveyard, which is actually a little bit more advantage than Celestial just drawing you two cards. However, the reason Celestial is largely played over the Denier Malicious engine is because you have to play one more main deck Garnet card, and some decks would rather just draw two cards rather than get three bodies in the field anyway. So you can technically gain a little bit more advantage with Denier Malicious, but you have to play one more Garnet that you'd never want to draw in your hand in order to do so, and you have to play some kind of deck that likes to have effect monsters in the field in order to take advantage of the bodies they provide in the first place. Whereas the effect of Celestial drawing two cards is usefully generic in pretty much every deck. And now for some tech options. With Master Duel banning Destiny Hero Celestial, if you want a replacement Destiny Hero monster to use, and you really don't want to use Deny or Malicious Engine for whatever reason, there is always the option of running Destiny Hero Draw Hand. This card has the effect that it will special summon itself from the graveyard during the next standby phase after it's sent to the graveyard, but it's then banished when it leaves the field. And then it has the effect that if it's summoned by the effect of a hero monster, you can make each player draw one card. So, if it's sent to the graveyard with Fusion Destiny, it will come back to the next standby phase and then draw both you and your opponent one card, which technically is a plus one in card advantage for you, even if it gives your opponent one extra card in their hand, since you get both a free body on the field plus one card draw for itself. However, giving your opponent any kind of draw is generally considered a bad effect, and the effect triggers during your opponent's turn if you're going into the DPE engine like normal, so you're giving your opponent one extra card draw in order to facilitate their combos, and your opponent can easily remove your Destiny Hero draw hand from the field, so you don't really gain too much advantage from him coming back. The only advantage you get is being able to draw one more card, which might be a hand trap to disrupt your opponent's plays. It's not the greatest card in the world to use, but it is an option to use as a replacement for Celestial, and technically is card neutral advantage with its draw effect working on both players, even if you can't use its body on the field for anything. And another funny tech option is playing the card D Tactics. This is a continuous trap card which has the effect that if a level 8 or higher Destiny Hero monster is puzzles them to the field, you can banish one card from your opponent's hand, field, or graveyard. So. If Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer comes back with its own effect, it procs the effect of D Tactics every turn in order to rip one card from your opponent's hand, or non-target remove one card from your opponent's field or graveyard. 
Additionally, it buffs the attack of your hero monsters during the standby phases, and floats into a search of destiny hero monsters from your deck on its destruction. And despite it having all of these really good effects that synergize very well with what Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer is able to do, it's not a very good card. Mainly because it relies on actually already having DP on the field in the first place, and doesn't immediately help set up the combo in the first place either. It's definitely what's referred to in the competitive sense as a win more card, but it definitely does help you win more in a very good way. So here's how the punk engine works. You use Emergency Teleport for Noah Punk Zia Min, search out Noah Punk Foxy Tune with Zia Min, and then use Foxy's effect to discard itself and send another card from your hand to the graveyard to bring out Noah Punk Dear Note. You then Synchro Summon Chaos Ruler the Chaotic Magical Dragon and Chain Block its effect with Dear Note's graveyard effect to bring back Zia Min. After resolving these two, you link them off into Crystron Hockey Fibrax to bring out a level 2 tuner from your deck, which you later Synchro off with Chaos Ruler Revive by its own effect to go into Baron de Fleur. Now, the most common ratios for this engine is the maximum number of copies of Emergency Teleport, as well as one each of Foxy Tune, Zia Min, and Deer Note. However, depending on how fine your deck is with needing to spend your normal summon on it, you could run more copies of either Zia Min or Foxy Tune, and even Noah Punk Ogre Dance to search it. For the Halky Fibrax target, you're often looking at either Plague Spider Zombie or Shinobi Necro if you want to go for Barone. Now, let's go over what all the cards in this engine actually do. Emergency Teleport is a quick play spell card, which special summons a level 3 or lower Psychotype monster from your deck, but it gets banished during the end phase. This is the best way to go into the main starter of the engine. Noah Punk Z Amin is a level 3 Psychic Tuner, which lets you pay 600 life points and add any other punk monster from your deck to your hand. It also has another effect, which rarely comes up, where when it's sent to the graveyard, you can make a punk monster you control gain 600 attack. Noah Punk Foxy Tune is a level 8 light beast monster which can either tribute a punk monster to special summon itself from the hand, or send itself from the hand to the graveyard to be able to special summon a non-level 8 punk monster from your deck while also pitching another card from your hand to the graveyard as part of its effect. Also, if it destroys a monster by battle, it lets you gain life points equal to that monster's original attack. No Punk Deer Note is a level 5 Earth Warrior monster, which while in the field can reveal itself another punk monster in your hand to special summon either itself or that monster, and then sends the one you didn't summon to the graveyard. When it's sent from the field to the graveyard, it can revive another punk monster from your graveyard except a level 5 one. Chaos Ruler, the Chaotic Magical Dragon, is a generic Synchro 8, which on Synchro Summon, excavates the top 5 cards of your deck, then you can add a light or dark monster out of those, but the rest are sent to the graveyard. It can also bring itself back from the graveyard by banishing a light and dark monster from your hand or graveyard, but it gets banished when it leaves the field. Christian Hockey Fibrax is a Link 2, which can be made with any two monsters, including a tuner. It special summons any level 3 or lower tuner monster from your deck when it's brought out, but it cannot activate its effect on the field that turn. Additionally, it can also tag itself into a synchro tuner monster from your extract during your opponent's main or battle phase. Barone de Fleur is a generic level 10 synchro monster, which has a costless Omni negate once while it's face up on the field. It can also pop a card in the field on a soft once per turn, and it can also tag itself out into a level 9 or lower monster from your graveyard during either player's standby phase. Plague Spider Zombie is a level 2 dark zombie tuner that can special summon itself back from the graveyard by making you put a card from your hand to the top of your deck, but it banishes itself when it leaves the field. Shinobi Necro, the other level 2 tuner option, can special summon itself when it's banished from the graveyard to activate an effect, but it banishes itself when leaving the field. This makes Shinobi Necro work pretty well with Chaos Ruler's revival effect, since it'll come back for free. Now, this engine can be used in most decks that have the space and don't have any meaningful summoning locks. It's usually way better in decks with tons of graveyard effects due to Chaos Ruler, though. In the current format, both of the top decks, in Tier Elements and Sprite, could make use of Punks, but it was generally preferred in Tier Elements. This is because Chaos Ruler, Foxy Tune, and even Baron de Fleur all give you very good ways to send monsters from the deck, hand, and field respectively to the graveyard by a card effect, which triggers the floating effects of the Tier Element monster's Diffusion Summon. It also helps making the deck a bit more resilient to hand traps like Nibir the Primal Bean, which the deck could struggle with otherwise. The synergy with Sprite comes with most of the main deck Sprite monsters can be fetched with Chaos Ruler due to being Darks. Additionally, Halky Fibrax bringing out a level 2 tuner from the deck represents full sprite combo by itself, since you can overlay both of them into gigantic sprite due to its unique summoning condition. That deck's locks through either gigantic or sprite starter don't matter if you use the punk cards before resolving those effects. Before either of those were popular though, this engine was really popular in Synchro Adventure and Therion decks, but in a slightly different way, and usually with Jet Synchro as the target for Halk. Jet Synchron is a level 1 fire machine tuner monster with the ability to special summon itself back from the graveyard by discarding one card from your hand but it banishes itself when it leaves the field afterwards. It was a more valid option in adventure decks, since they had other ways to go into Baron de Fleur, such as Rose Dragon Engine, as well as not needing their negate to come down so urgently due to the backing up of Griffin. The discard cost made it way more appealing than Plague Spreader for these decks, since they do have way more graveyard effects that could trigger off of Jet. Not only that, but since Jet Synchro's level 1 monster, that means you can link it off into a Link Rebo after it's been brought up by Hauk, 
and then revive with its effect to use itself and the Link Karibo into an artifact Dagda. Dagda can set an artifact scythe straight from the deck, which works really well with Halky Fibrax, as it can banish itself to summon TG Wonder Magician during your opponent's turn to pop the scythe and lock your opponent out of the extra deck for the turn. This scythe lock, as it was called, was one of the biggest threats of the past few formats, and that's no small part in how easy it was to get into it through combos like this. In theory on decks, you'd often use Deer Note to bring back Foxy Tune instead of Zia Min, so that you could use that and Chaos Ruler to go into a rank 8. The Zombie Vampire was pretty much always the choice, as it can detach a material from itself to mill the top 4 cards of both players' decks, and then it gets to special summon one of the monsters sent to the graveyard in this way. Milling is a very important part for Theron decks, since you need specific monsters in your graveyards to be able to summon your Therions in the first place. However, it's way too risky to go for that play in the current metagame, since milling your opponent's tier elements with Zombie Vampire can easily make you lose the duel on the spot, and even in the previous meta, going for that effect could still be risky due to how prevalent graveyard effects are in the modern metagame. Now, let's go over some variations to the engine. Because you're already running Emergency Teleport, it's not a bad idea for decks running this engine to include a copy of Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit as a possible target. Uniquely, Ghost Ogre is one of the only Ghost Girl hand traps that can activate its effect on the field and not just in the hand, which can make Emergency Teleport into a quite decent going second option against something like Appaloosa Above the Goddess, or even an extra layer of interruption, if you set E-Tally when going first. This engine does allow for quite a large degree of customization, since there's really no restriction to the bodies of the punk cards put out. You can technically go into any generic Synchro 8 to Link 2 or Rank 3 with these cards depending on your ratios. The only thing stopping this engine from being used from a wide variety of plays is how powerful Chaos Ruler lines are, as that card is easily the best level 8 Synchro monster of the game when it comes to how much advantage it generates you. However, there have been a bunch of tech options which people have ran alongside that card. For a dex running Jet Sync Run, a Hot Red Dragon Archivine Abyss was a pretty common card to see, since it can be made with Chaos Ruler and Jet to give you a targeted negation during your opponent's turn. Psychic and Punisher is also often seen alongside Punks, since the card becomes unaffected by card effects and you can gain a lot of attack as long as your life points are lower than your opponent's, which will always be the case before the first battle phase even happens, due to the cost paid for Zia Min and the like. Additionally, if the time of the round is almost up, you can go for a Scarlet Red Dragon Fiend Archfiend to inflict burn damage to your opponent. In official tournaments, the player with the highest amount of life points will win when the game time is up, so it can be pretty valuable to be able to deal damage or gain life through the extra deck. Before No Punk Deer Note came out, a different kind of punk engine sometimes saw play with Halkadon and Adventure decks. The engine was comprised of just three emergency teleports, a couple of Zia Mins, and one Foxy Tune. Because there wasn't any better target to bring out from your deck, you'd just bring out two Zia Mins through the cards, and then have a couple level 3 tuner bodies on the field. Halkadon Dex would then use it to go into Halk to bring out Despot 001 and go about their Aurora Dawn comp. Adventure Dex would just link him off to go into Cherubini, Ebon Angel the Burning Abyss. Cherubini gets to send any level 3 monster from your deck to the graveyard through its effect, and since sending a monster is considered the cost for what it does, it can't be negated by something like Ash Blossom or Infinite Impermanence. By sending Water Enchantress to the temple, you can use its graveyard effect to get into your adventure engine by searching Rite of Iron Messier. In either case, you could also choose to run Jory Punk Madame Spider instead of the Zia Min, because it can search you Jory Punk Dangerous Rabu, a targeted negation as long as you're okay with running an extra deck break. Another main deck punk monster you can run is Ukiyoi Punk Sharakusai. While drawing into Zia Min gives you full combo by itself, Foxy Tune does not by itself. However, if you run Sharakusai, you can use Foxy to bring out Zia Min and search Sharakusai to then normal summon it and use the effect to fusion summon Ukiyoi Punk Rising Carp and that card can then tribute itself to summon two non-level 8 punks from your deck, those usually being Zia Min and Deer Note, which you can then seek her off into Chaos Ruler and continue the combo as usual. However, since this requires at least two Zia Mins in the deck as well as another extra deck, it's usually reserved to only decks with heavy punk engines. With the release of the September 2022 Forbidden Limited list, this engine has received two major hits. Both Christian Hockey Fibrax and Chaos Ruler have been put on the Forbidden list, heavily limiting the smashability of punks in almost any deck. While there are still some other good enough extract monsters to go into, there's simply no other monsters which does the same thing as these two did together currently in the game. You can still use the punk cards to go into Cyframe Lord Omega for a hand rip, or Punk Jam Dragon Drive to search Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit, but neither of those are giving you even half the card advantage of a Chaos Ruler into a Halk play would. As of now, there's probably no deck which would want to play these cards outside of dedicated punk strategies, which is also several times less competitive due to those hits. It's very unlikely for either of these cards to leave the list anytime soon, so unless they release more punk support which makes this worth running soon, this engine will likely not see playing competitive decks in the near future. In Master Duel, this engine's use for making Chirabini has almost always been a bit more valuable since Adventure Engine was already on the list by the time it hit the game. However, it's about to get knocked down a peg due to the banning of Christian Hockey Fibrax in there as well. 
Because of Master Duel's unique card release schedule, the Punk Engine will never be able to be used to its full potential there, since Deer Note was never legal at the same time as Halky Fibrax. The engine starts off with Zia Min on the field. Use it in order to search out Foxy Tune from your deck. Then you use Foxy Tune in your hand in order to summon Deer Note from your deck to the field. You use the tune to go into Chaos Ruler and mill 5 cards. Deer Note will activate in the graveyard to bring Foxy Tune back to the field. Then you use the two monsters of the field in order to go into the Zombie Vampire, which allows you to mill 3 more cards. This engine will mill a total of 8 cards, and a potential 10 more if you hit the two Ishizu millers, making it a great engine for mill decks. The ratios for this engine are 3 Zia Min, 1 Foxy Tune, 1 Deer Note, and 2 Emergency Teleports. Additionally, if you have the room, you can play up to 3 copies of Punk Ogre Dancer in order to search out Zia Min to start the combo. You can also play the full Ishizu engine and great generic graveyard effects like Fairy Tale Snow or Destrudo. So here's how the adventure engine works. Basically what you do is summon an adventure token which the entire engine revolves around. The way to do this is with the card Rite of Aramisir, which can be searched from your deck using Water Enchantress of the Temple from your hand or graveyard. Then once you have your adventure token out, Rite of Aramisir also allows you to activate Fateful Adventure directly from your deck. You then use the effect of Fateful Adventure in order to add Wandering Griffin Rider to your hand, discarding something else. Then simply special summon Wandering Griffin Rider from your hand with its effect. This should activate the other effect of Fateful Adventure in order to equip Drago back the Rideable Dragon directly from your deck to your adventure token, or add it to your hand to save it for a future turn. So, with a single activation of Rite of Aramisir, plus a discard of one other card, you get a 2000 attack token on the field, an Omni Negate with 2800 defense, and an equip spell card that allows you to bounce any card your opponent controls, including Floodgates and boss monsters. So this engine excels at getting you a very valuable Omni Negate and a very valuable going second tool, all at the same time while not using your normal summon and letting you go plus two in card advantage, all for the low, low cost of not being able to activate the effects of normal summon monsters during the turn you activate the effect of Rite of Aramisir, which is the restriction that keeps this engine from being played in literally every single deck. The ratios for this engine is to play as many copies of Water Enchanters of the Temple and Rite of Aramisir as possible, then play one copies each of Wandering Griffin Rider, Fateful Adventure, and Drago Back the Rideable Dragon, since all of them are searchable. And finally, you can play one copy of Foolish Burial in order to get the engine going, since Water Enchanters of the Temple can search out Rite of Armasir from the graveyard. Now let's go over the main cards in this combo a little bit more thoroughly. First up, we have Rite of Armasir. This is the main card you want and simply has the effect to special summon an adventure token if you do not control an adventure token already which is a Fairy Earth monster that's level 4 and has 2,000 attack and defense. Then it allows you to activate Fateful Adventure directly from your deck, which is going to set up your other plays. And lastly, it has a restriction where you cannot activate the effects of monsters that were normal summon this turn. However, you can activate the effects of special summon monsters as much as you want. So if you're playing an archetype that really needs the effects of the normal summon, like Alistair the Invoker as a classic example, then you might not be able to play this engine because you won't be able to do both in the same turn. However, there are a lot of archetypes that don't really need their normal summon effects, and simply normal summon a monster in order to use it for link plays or for other things. Like how virtual world decks only normal summon their monster just to have a virtual monster on the field, so they can activate all their other virtual monster effects in their hand. A deck like that, which can't even activate the effects of their monsters if they're normal summon, can easily slot in the adventure engine. Next up, we have Water Enchantress of the Temple. This is the main searcher of the archetype, and a big reason why this engine is so splashable. You can banish this card from your hand or graveyard in order to add Rite of Aramisir from your deck or graveyard to your hand. Now, since it can use its effect from the graveyard, this allows you to use the card in your hand in many beneficial ways and then gain advantage from it later. You can simply send it directly from your deck to the graveyard with something like Foolish Burial, and then immediately gain the full advantage of the Adventure Token Engine. Or you can discard it from your hand to activate the effect of something like Forbidden Droplet or Twin Twisters, and then still gain the full advantage of its effect. It also allows you to recur Rite of Aramisir from your graveyard, so it can allow you to have a little bit more longevity with some more adventure tokens later on in the duel. Now, Water Enchantress of the Temple also has another effect, which is not used at all in the engine, where if it's face up on the field and you control an adventure token, you can cheat out one of the field spell cards from your deck that mentions adventure token in its text. Although, currently the field spells for adventure token are kinda mediocre, so there's no reason to play them as you never summon Water Enchantress of the Temple anyway. Next up, we have Wandering Griffin Rider. This card is basically the reason the adventure engine is good. It has the effect that if you control an adventure token and a card or effect is activated, you can shuffle this card from your field back into your deck in order to negate the activation of the card and then destroy it. And also, it can special summon itself from your hand as a quick effect during the main phase, as long as you either control no monsters or control an adventure token. 
So when the adventure token is out, you can special summon the Griffin Rider in order to have a free negate. And it also has really good stats for no reason. So you can just bring it down defense position, and it'll be pretty hard for your opponent to destroy it by battle, if they're able to get that far before you use its negate to shuffle itself back into your deck. And you can also just summon it into attack position for 2,000 points of damage. And since it's a quick effect to summon the card, if for whatever reason you're locked out of summoning during your turn, you can just wait until the start of your opponent's main phase to bring it out from your hand, as long as you have an adventure token for its negate to be alive. Next up, we have Fateful Adventure. This is a continuous spell card which will be activated directly from your deck with the right of Armaseer, but is also a good way to get the engine started in case you draw into it first. It has an effect where once per turn you can add a monster that mentions adventure token its text from your deck to your hand, then you have to send one card from your hand to the graveyard. So what you do is add Water Enchantress of the Temple to your hand, and then simply discard it to get the whole ball rolling. As you can then just banish it from the graveyard to add Rite of Armaseer from your deck to your hand, and then get your adventure token. Although you won't be able to search out Griffin Rider, you will still be able to gain access to Draco back. Ideally, you want Fateful Adventure to be activated off the effect of Rite of Armaseer. That way you can search out Griffin Rider and actually have your negate live. Additionally, the card has two other effects, where the first time a monster you control that is equipped with a card would be destroyed by battle, it's not destroyed, which can give some pretty decent protection to your adventure token if you equip it with Draco back. And lastly, if a monster is normal or special summoned to either side of the field, you can trigger its effect in order to take an equip spell card from your deck that mentions adventure token, and then either add it to your hand, or equip it to an adventure token you control. The effect is a hard once per turn, but it also activates from your opponent summoning a monster. And since it's a continuous spell card, you can use Fateful Adventure in order to infinitely recycle Wander and Griffin Rider from your deck, since its cost is to return itself to the deck for its negate. So as long as you have another card to discard, Journey of Destiny will allow you to have your negate live every turn, which is just another added layer to this engine's already strong repertoire. And lastly, we have Draco back the Rideable Dragon. This is an equip spell card which has two effects. If it's equipped to a non-effect monster, which the adventure token is, then once per turn you can return any card your opponent controls to their hand. This effect does target, but it allows you to target any card your opponent controls and not just their monsters. Usually the ability to bounce your opponent's cards is limited to your opponent's monsters, and the versatility of being able to target spells and traps is actually the biggest benefit of Draco back, because it gives the adventure engine an out to floodgates. If your opponent's using something like Skill Drain, for example, you can use the effect of Draco back to bounce it to their hand for the turn, so that you can have your effects live, and then maybe negate it if your opponent tries to use it next turn with your Griffin Rider. And because of this bounce, this gives the adventure token some going second power, as it allows you to clear threats your opponent might have built up on their first turn, instead of the adventure engine being a purely going first tool to try to set up the negate with Griffin Rider. So it's one of those few engines that is good going both first and second, which is not the norm. And it's entirely thanks to the power of Draco back. It also has another effect, where if it's sent to the graveyard in any way, you can equip it from your graveyard to an adventure token you control. This effect is a hard once per turn and very reminiscent of the Noble Arms equip spell cards, except that it also activates if it's sent from the hand. So if you have a Draco back in your hand, you can use it as discard needed for Fateful Adventure in order to just equip it to your adventure token anyway, without really losing any card advantage. And there you have it, the important cards of the adventure engine. A funny thing to note is that when the adventure engine first came out, they didn't actually include Draco back in the engine at first, until they finally figured out that its ability to bounce any card was super useful against Floodgates, in which case it retroactively became included in the engine itself. Whereas previously, the engine only cared about going into Griffin Rider for the negate, and didn't really care about the bounce effect of Draco back at all. The Ghost Trick engine goes as follows. Get any two level 1, 2, or 3 monsters on your side of the field. Then use them to go into one of the Ghost Trick XC's monsters. Then use the effect of Ghost Trick Angel of Mischief to rank up on top of one of them, and immediately use this effect in order to detach its Ghost Trick XC's material that it ranked up on top of to the graveyard in order to search out Ghost Trick Shot from your deck. Then use Ghost Trick Shot in order to special summon that XC's monster back to the field from the graveyard, and then rank up another Ghost Trick Angel of Mischief on top of it. Next you bring out Number S0 Utopic Future on top of both of the Ghost Trick Angel of Mischief, and then you bring out Number S0 Utopic Draco Future on top of that, and there you have it. You get Utopic Draco Future with any two monsters of the same level below level 4, as long as you have Ghost Trick Shot in your deck, and the appropriate Ghost Trick XC's monsters in your extra deck. The ratios for this engine are actually quite extensive when it comes to the extra deck space, but only requires one main deck card. All you need is one copy of Ghost Trick Shot in your main deck, plus two copies of Ghost Trick Angel of Mischief in your extra deck, the two Utopic Future cards, and of course whichever Ghost Trick XC's monster fits the level of your deck. So either one copy of Ghost Trick Dulahan, Ghost Trick Sokyu Boss, or Ghost Trick Alucard. Now let's go over what all the cards do. 
This entire engine is possible thanks to Ghost Trick Shot. This is a normal spell card which has the effect where you can special summon any one Ghost Trick monster from your hand or graveyard. Then you can change a face down Ghost Trick monster you control to face up attack position. It also has the graveyard effect where it can banish itself from the graveyard in order to attach a Ghost Trick card from your graveyard to a Ghost Trick Xyz monster you control. And both of its effects are hard once per turn. Now, the only thing you use this card for in the Ghost Trick engine is to bring back a Ghost Trick Xyz monster. And if you only run one copy of Ghost Trick Shot, it can be considered a Garnet because you need to actually use the effect of Ghost Trick Angel of Mischief in order to get a Ghost Trick Xyz monster into the graveyard so that you can bring it back with Ghost Trick Shot. And if you already have Ghost Trick Shot in your hand, then you can't activate the effect of Ghost Trick Angel of Mischief, which means you can't get that Xyz monster into the graveyard to bring it back. So if you want to avoid this scenario at all costs, you could just play a second copy of Ghost Trick Shot as it can be used to further extend your plays if you use either Ghost Trick Alucard or Ghost Trick Dulahan, as both of these cards add the card back to your hand when you go into Utopic Draco Future. Next up, we have Ghost Trick Angel of Mischief. This is a generic rank 4 Xyz monster which has the effect where it can Xyz summon itself on top of any Ghost Trick Xyz monster you control, except another copy of itself. It also has two effects. One of them allows you to detach one of its materials to add any Ghost Trick spell or trap from your deck to your hand. You can also once per turn attach a Ghost Trick card from your hand to this card as an Xyz material, which feeds into its last effect. Where if this card has 10 Xyz materials, you automatically win the duel. Its ability to instantly win the duel is more of a gimmick and not something you'll ever be doing using it as an engine. In fact, Ghost Trick decks can hardly pull off the combo. An interesting note about this effect is that they're all soft ones per turns. So if you want, you can search out more Ghost Trick cards before you go into the Utopic combo, but that's not really necessary because you're just trying to go into Number as Zero Utopic Draco Future. Next up, we have Number as Zero Utopic Draco Future. This is a rank 1 monster which requires 3 Xyz monsters of the same ranks except for number monsters as its materials, or you can rank it up on top of Number as Zero Utopic Future you control. Number as Zero Utopic Future can be ranked up on top of any 2 Xyz monsters of the same rank except for number monsters. It also has a niche battle effect where you can take control of an opponent's monster in the battle phase until the end of the battle phase, and it has protection from destruction effects by detaching one of its materials instead of being destroyed. But generally, you just use it as a middleman to go into Utopic Draco Future. What Draco Future does is it's passively immune to destruction from battle and card effects, which makes this card incredibly difficult to get rid of, as protection from destruction effects is one of the best kinds of protection you can have, as destruction is one of the most common forms of removal. And also being immune to battle is one of the best complementary protection effects to have on top of being immune to destruction by card effects, because one of the most common ways to get rid of monsters that are immune to card effect destruction is to just destroy them by battle. So Utopic Future Draco is very hard to get rid of. But obviously, the reason you use this card is not for its durability. It also has an effect on a hard once per turn, where if your opponent activates a monster effect, you can detach one of its materials in order to negate that effect, and then take control of that monster permanently. Being able to take control of your opponent's monsters is a premium effect, as that's just a pure plus one in card advantage. Being able to negate the effect of a monster is a premium form of negation, because monster effects are the most common type of effect that activates in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! So, having both of those effects tied together on top of a very durable body makes Utopic Draco Future a boss monster that's worthy to go into. And because the Ghost Trick engine allows you access to this card incredibly easily, it basically gives a lot more decks access to this card, which was generally only available to certain types of archetypes at an abundance of non-number Xyz monsters on the field. Which is a distinction that matters because a lot of the best Xyz monsters in the game are number monsters. Next up, let's go over the three Ghost Trick Xyz monsters that can rank up into an Angel of Mischief. First up, we have Ghost Trick Alucard. This is a rank 3 monster with generic materials, meaning it needs any two level 3 monsters to go into it, and it has two main effects. It can detach one of its materials to destroy a set card your opponent controls, and if it's sent to the graveyard in any way, you can add a Ghost Trick card from your graveyard to your hand except itself. It also has a niche effect to protect your Ghost Trick monsters from attacks. Now, this card has actually seen staple play over the years for being a rank 3 toolbox card in order to pop back row, and you can absolutely destroy one of your opponent's back row cards when doing the Ghost Trick combo because you don't actually need its Xyz materials. And since it has the recover effect when it's sent to the graveyard, it can allow you to get back Ghost Trick Shop after you do the combo so that you can bring it back on a subsequent turn to just have a body on board for future link plays, or to just have an extra card in hand to discard for other kinds of effects. Basically, since it has the recoverability effect, and can situationally destroy back row before going into the combo, it's usually the card most associated with the engine, even though you can accomplish the same thing with the rank 2 or rank 1 Ghost Tricks as well. Next up, let's go over the rank 2 Ghost Trick monster, Ghost Trick So Cute Boss. This one requires any two level 2 monsters as its materials, and has the effect where you can detach one of its materials in order to destroy one monster in the field that has an attack less than or equal to the combined attack of all your Ghost Trick monsters. 
and if you do, the zone the monster was in cannot be used as long as you control a Ghost Trick monster. However, Ghost Trick Soku boss does not have a floating effect like Alucard or Dulahan, so it's generally considered not the go-to option for this combo, in lieu of just going for rank 3 strategies instead. However, it being level 2 does give it a lot of really good support cards thanks to the sprite engine and a couple of other things we'll go over later on in the video, and is a perfectly viable target in order to start the whole Ghost Trick combos. You just don't end with one extra card in your hand like you do with the other two Xyz monsters, Alucard and Dulahan. Lastly, we have Ghost Trick Dulahan. This is a generic rank 1 monster, which for a long time was the only good generic rank 1 monster in the game, which has the effect where it gains 200 attack for each Ghost Trick card you control. It has a quick effect in order to detach one of its materials to have the attack of a monster in the field until the end of the turn. And if this card is sent to the graveyard in any way, you can target another Ghost Trick card in your graveyard to add it to your hand. So if you use Dulahan to start the combo, you can end with one extra card in your hand just like you could with Alucard, in order to bring it back later on for Link materials or just to have an extra card in your hand with Ghost Trick Shock. Now that we've gone over all the cards in the main combo, let's go over some of the other cards that might enable these combos in a generic deck. Obviously, if you're playing a deck that has level 1, 2, or 3 monsters natively, you can just ignore this section and just use the extra deck monsters and Ghost Trick Shot, and you're pretty much good to go with the Ghost Trick Engine. However, if you want to add in some cards that could enable the Ghost Trick Engine in whatever deck you're playing, and you have an available normal summon, I'll go over some options that can enable the Ghost Trick Engine with one card from your hand. First up, let's go over some rank 3 engine pieces. If you play 3 copies of Emergency Teleport and Psychic Tracker or Psychic Wheel Editor, you can use Emergency Teleport to get one of these level 3 monsters in the field, or use it on a Ghost Trick and Snow Rabbit if you're playing that, and then special summon the other one from your hand. Since both Psychic Tracker and Psychic Wheel Editor have the effect that if you control any level 3 monster other than a copy of itself, you can special summon this card from your hand on a hard once per turn. So, with Emergency Teleport and playing other level 3 monsters, you can basically always have the combo ready to go and you can even do it without using up your normal summon on the combo pieces. Alternatively, there's also the Predaplant engine. Predaplant Orpheus Scorpio is a level 3 monster that can special summon a level 3 Predaplant Darling Tonia Cobra from your deck on its normal or special summon by sending one monster card from your hand to the graveyard. And then Darling Tonia Cobra can search out a fusion spell card from your deck on its special summon, which is incredibly useful for all kinds of fusion strategies, or just going into super polymerization or instant fusion if not. However, this does require you to play the Garnet of Predaplant Darling Tonia Cobra, and in Master Duel, Predaplant Orpheus Scorpio is limited to one copy, which severely limits the viability of this engine. And lastly, we have the Speedroid engine, with Speedroid Terratop and Speedroid Taka Tomborg. Speedroid Terratop is a level 3 monster that can special summon itself from your hand if you control no monsters, and then it can add a Speedroid monster from your deck to your hand. If you add Speedroid Taka Tomborg to your hand, you can just special summon it from your hand if you simply control a Speedroid monster. And this will give you two level 3 monsters in the field without using your normal summon, and only using one card from your starting hand and is absolutely the best way to add a generic Ghost Trick combo to your deck. However, Speedroid Terratop is limited to one copy. If it was available at three copies, this would be the go-to way. But it's also useful in a whole bunch of other strategies because of how useful it is at getting a rank 3 engine going. Next up, let's go over some rank 2 options. Obviously, there's the Sprite Cards, which is an archetype dedicated to getting level 2 monsters of the field, so let's go over some archetypes that aren't built around level 2 monsters specifically. First up, there's Deep Sea Diva. This is a level 2 tuner monster that can special summon a level 3 or lower sea serpent monster from your deck on its normal summon, which does include another copy of itself. So, one Deep Sea Diva enables the full combo thanks to Ghost Trick Soku Boss. And what's excellent about Diva is that since it can bring out another copy of itself from the deck, you can't really draw into a Garnet like you can with Predaplant Darling Tonio Cobra or Speedroy Taka Tomborg, as every copy of itself brings out another copy of itself, so having any copies in your hand gives you full combo. In the same vein, there's also Nimble Beaver. This card can special summon another level 3 or lower nibble monster from your deck or graveyard, which does include another copy of itself. And a little bit of utility above Deep Sea Diva is that it allows you to get a copy of itself from the graveyard, which means if you draw into your third copy, it's never a dead card. Unlike Deep Sea Diva, which most times is a dead third card, because you don't have a fourth copy in your deck to bring out. Which doesn't really matter in the first turn of the game, but does matter on subsequent turns if the game goes into the long game even a little bit. However, Deep Sea Diva is also a tuner monster, which enables Crystron Hockey Firebrax plays, which also gives a little bit of staying power as they can pivot into other strategies if you decide you don't want to go into Utopic Future. And lastly, there's the Live Twin cards. Live Twin Key Sekil and Live Twin Li La. These two level 2 monsters have the effects to special summon the other version of themselves from the hand or deck, as long as you control no other monsters when it's summoned. However, since you have to have no cards when it's summoned in order to use their effects, you can't use them to extend later on in the duel if you control other cards, which you can do with Nimble Beaver or Deep Sea Diva. 
But again, the usability of the card on your first turn whenever you have a clear field is usually the only thing that matters when you're trying to set up a board. So the downside is generally not that big a deal and still makes them worth considering. And lastly, there's level one engines, which is basically just Evil Thorn. Evil Thorn has the effect where you contribute itself in order to inflict 300 points of damage to your opponent, then you can special summon two other Evil Thorns from your deck, which will allow you to go into Ghost Strike Dulahan and then get the full combo going. And as far as I'm aware, there aren't any other level one generic cards that get out two monsters with one card from your hand. Although if I'm missing one, I'd love to hear about it down in the comments. All right. And that's it for the Ghost Trick Engine. Despite being called a Ghost Trick Engine, you don't actually need any Ghost Trick main deck monsters at all, as none of them help the combo even a little bit. But the Ghost Trick Extra Deck monsters are all incredibly good. And if you have the free Extra Deck space and don't mind running a single Garnet, you can easily gain access to number as zero Utopic Draco Future, as long as your strategy supports level three or lower monsters. To start off the combo, you need to have any two monsters on the field with at least one of them being a tuner monster. You use both of them to link summon Crystron Hockey Fibrax, then use its effect to special summon an effect Veiler specifically from your deck. Then use both of them to go into Selene, where as long as there are three spell cards in either graveyard to face upon the field, she'll be able to gain three spell counters, which you then can immediately spend to special summon effect Veiler back from the graveyard. Then with effect Veiler and Selene, you link summon into Axis Kotager, targeting the link three Selene for a 5400 attack monster that has two different attributes of link monsters in your graveyard to destroy two of your opponent's cards. Now, the main benefits of this engine is that all it requires you to play is at least one effect Veiler in your main deck, and allows you to use your Crystron Halky Fibrax to go into an Axis Kotager easily without having to play all the Garnets that are required to play all the other Crystron Halky Fibrax combos. And effect Veiler itself is probably one of the best Garnets in the game, as it's just a very useful hand trap too. So if you don't want to play Garnets required to do normal Christian Hockey Firebox plays, and you have the extra deck space for three cards, it might be worth running the Axis Code Selene engine. Now, let's go over all the cards in the combo. First up, Christian Hockey Firebox. This is a Link 2 monster that requires any two monsters as its materials, with at least one of those monsters being a tuner monster. And a thing to note about Christian Halky Firebrax is that you can use two tuner monsters in order to bring it out. So if you run Deep Sea Diva, you can just bring out another Deep Sea Diva from your deck, and you'd be able to go into Christian Halky Firebrax without running any Garnets. Or if you use Sangan, you can use it for Salmagrid Almiraz to search out Crusadia Arborea, which can then special summon itself from your hand to the zone that Almiraz is pointing to, in order to have another one for Christian Halky Firebrax. There's a few other ways to get into Christian Hockey Firebrax with only one card from your starting hand, but that's probably best saved for its own video. And the main effect you worry about with Christian Hockey Firebrax is its ability to special summon any level 3 or lower tuner monster from your hand or deck, which means if you have Effect Veiler in your hand, you can still use the combo. Next up, we have Effect Veiler, the only main deck monster you need to play for this combo. This is a level 1 hand trap which has the effect where you can negate the effects of one of your opponent's monsters during their turn as long as it's in one of their main phases. It's also a level 1 tuner, so it has the option to bring out Christian Hockey Firebrax or be used for other kinds of synchro plays. In this particular engine though, you kind of want the card to be in your deck. That way you can bring it out with Christian Hockey Firebrax to go into the next card. Next up we have Selene, Queen of the Master Magicians. This is a Link 3 monster that requires any 2 plus monsters plus at least one spellcaster, which is what Effect Veiler provides. Then on Link Summon, you get to add a number of spell counters to the card equal to the amount of spell cards in both players' graveyards and on the field. And then it has a quick effect that can be used during the main phase, where you can remove three spell counters from your field in order to special summon a spellcaster type monster from your hand or graveyard to a zone this card points to. So basically, you use the effect in order to get Effect Veiler back from the graveyard. Now, a thing to know about this card is that you do need at least three spell cards in both players' graveyards or on the field, which might be tough to do for some decks that don't play a lot of spell cards, or if your opponent isn't playing a lot of spell cards. But for the most part, since Axis Code Talker is inherently a going second card anyway, chances are there should be at least three spell cards between both you and your opponent's graveyards, so it's not that difficult to activate its requirement, but it is definitely something you should be aware of, especially if you're playing a deck that literally has no spell cards itself, as you'll be relying on your opponent exclusively to fulfill its conditions. Although it does count face-up cards too, so if your opponent has face-up field spell cards or pendulum zones, it'll be a lot easier to get the three spell counters needed. And finally, there's Axis Code Talker. This is a Link 4 monster that requires any two plus effect monsters as materials and has the innate protection where all of its effects are spell speed 4, meaning your opponent cannot respond to its effects in order to negate them. And it has two other main effects, the first one being that it gains attack times 1000 equal to the link rating of one of the monsters used for its materials. So in order to get the maximum amount of extra attack, without wasting too many resources bringing the card out, 
you want to use a Link 3 monster so that it gains 3000 attack, which is what Selene, Queen of the Master Magicians, provides. Then its other effect is, on a non once per turn, you can banish a Link monster from your field or graveyard to destroy one card your opponent controls. This effect does not target, so it gets by targeting protection, and also remember it has the form of protection from its first effect where your opponent can't negate it, unless they negate the effect before activating its effects with something like their own effect veiler. They just can't activate cards in response to its effects. However, if it uses its effect to banish a Link monster, then you're not allowed to use another Link monster with the same attribute for the rest of the turn. So effectively, you can only destroy cards around 6 times per turn if you have all the natural attributes in your graveyard, since there are currently no Divine Link monsters. And because of Axis Code's ability to destroy so many cards without being negated and gaining a massive amount of attack points, it's kind of a really good card to go into that is one of the only outs to a lot of unbeatable boss monsters like Ultimate Falcon. The Tenyi Engine allows you to get a body on board and bounce one of your opponent's cards while going plus one in card economy. As with a single Fishuda from your hand, you're able to get a Link 1 monster in the field and return one of your opponent's monsters or spells or trap cards. And all of these effects happen in the hand or graveyard, so it completely dodges on field negates like Skill Drain, and since it can target spell or trap cards, it's an out to floodgates for a turn. The normal ratios for the Tenyi Engine is actually pretty small. Basically, it's just two to three Tenyi Spirit of Shudas and a single Monk of the Tenyi in the extra deck. So if you have the space to play an extra Link 1 monster in your extra deck, then you can pretty much afford to play the Tenyi Engine. However, some restrictions and downsides to the Tenyi Engine apply. The actual benefits of the engine are almost entirely going second, because Vishuda requires there to be a non-effect monster in the field in order to use its bounce effect. So you can use it as a material during your first turn, but chances are you're going to be using your non-effect link monster for some other kind of combo to further your plays, and will no longer have a non-effect monster in the field in order to use Vishuda's effect in the graveyard during some other turn. In which case it's basically just a regular monster that you can special summon from your hand if you control no monsters, which can be used as a going turn play. Because the usefulness of the engine is almost purely a going second one, that does actually kind of lower its overall usefulness, because there are so many really good going second powerful cards in the game, whereas only being able to bounce one of your opponent's cards probably is not as useful as a Forbidden Droplet, Lightning Storm, Evenly Matched, Triple Tactics Talents, or Dark Ruler No More. However, one of the benefits it does have is granting you a free monster in the field while being able to bounce a choice card all without using your normal summon. Most of the best engines in the game don't use your normal summon. Now there are some other benefits you can gain with the Tenyi engine. It does allow you to play the parallel Exceed engine more reliably, since the main combo requires you to get a Link 1 monster with a downward point and arrow. You can easily proc the effect of Parallel Exceed to get a level 4 monster in the field to go into a powerful rank 4 monster like Baguska, Abyss Dweller, or Tornado Dragon. Additionally, if you play Paleozoic Dynamiscus for whatever reason, occasionally it will special summon itself to the field to be a non-effect monster, which will allow Vishuda to be live more often than not, rather than only relying on Monk of the Tenyi. And if your deck for whatever reason does have more non-effect monsters you can play around with, it does also give you access to Fists of the Unrivaled Tenyi, the archetype counter trap, which also has a floating effect in order to bring out the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, though that floating effect is not super useful, but it is always nice for it to have a floating effect nonetheless. There are other Tenyi cards you could play that are also beneficial, but they're not really worth talking about because they're kind of independent of the Vishuda engine. There is also Adhara, which is a level 1 tuner Tenyi, which can be used to get a free tuner on the field for Crystal Haki Firebox plays, or recycle Vishuda with its graveyard effect back to your hand although it's not necessary in the slightest to be played alongside the normal engine. And then there's also Ashuna, which can special summon a Tenyi monster from the deck with its graveyard effect. However, it also locks you out of summoning non-worm monsters for the rest of the turn, which is a bad enough downside where it's also not worth running, unless that downside doesn't really affect whatever deck you're playing the engine in, in which case it can be a good way to get Vishuda or Adhara out of the deck for extra deck plays, or alternatively, to get two Tribute Fodders on the field in order to Tribute Summon with only using a single card from your hand, since it only locks you out of Special Summons and doesn't use up your normal summon. Maxi falls into the category of Hand Trap. This card has the effect to draw one card each time your opponent Special Summons a monster. Now, most decks in general have to Special Summon a lot to do their basic combos, and drawing a single card is considered an absolutely premium effect in Yu-Gi-Oh! because the game lacks a resource system to use its cards. In fact, drawing cards is such a premium effect, there are a ton of banned cards in the ban list purely because it lets you draw cards a tiny bit too easily. So if you need to special summon at least 5 times for your basic combo, and your opponent uses maxi on you, then they get 5 extra cards in their hand to start their next turn. Or they might draw in 2 more hand traps to further stop your plays from going through. 
This potential for giving your opponent draws off of maxi is so strong that it's sometimes better to just skip your turn rather than give them extra card draw. The card is also usable no matter what your board state is, so it's good going first and second, but mostly a going second card. Maxi is one of the strongest hand traps that's ever existed, so if it's legal in the format you play in, you might want to run three copies of it in all your decks. Ash Blossom falls into the category of hand trap. This card has the effect in the hand to stop an opponent's card effect that moves a card from your opponent's deck to either their hand, graveyard, or monster zone. Now, the average meta deck is not considered consistent unless it has card effects that can search out its main combo pieces from the deck. And these search effects involve moving cards from the deck to their hand, graveyard, or field. So, Ash Blossom is useful against almost every single deck in the game, which is why it's one of the most played hand traps in history. Additionally, there's no drawbacks to using the card other than having to discard it from your hand and it's hard once per turn. So it's useful going first and second, which not all hand traps are. In fact, it's so useful, lots of meta strategies have built in ways to try and chain block the card to avoid the effect, but chain blocking is too much to explain in the short, so I'd advise looking it up on your own. Ash Blossom is one of the most useful cards in the game, and a lot of people hate the card because it shuts down most non-competitive decks on its own, and a deck isn't considered good enough if it's stopped by one Ash Blossom. You start off with Sky Striker Mobilize Engage to search out Sky Striker Mecha Hornet Drones. Then you use Drones to summon a token and use that token to go into Kagari. Then you use Kagari to bring Hornet Drones from the graveyard back to your hand. Then you use Hornet Drones to summon the token again. Then what you do is use Kagari to go into Sky Striker Ace Kaina to get a downward pointed arrow, and then use the token to go into Sky Striker Ace Hayate. And with this engine, you get two machine effect monsters on the board without any kind of lock and without using a normal summon. Plus, if you have three spells in your graveyard when you search, you actually get an extra card draw too. The ratios for this engine are as many copies of Sky Striker Mobilize Engage and Sky Striker Mecha Hornet Drones that are legal in your format, plus at least one Sky Striker Ace Kagari in your extra deck. If you want to be able to have two effect monsters on the board, you have to further add in a Hayate and a Kaina to your extra deck. And additionally, you can add one to three Sky Striker Mecha Widow Anchors as an extra card to search off of Engage later on in the duel, as it's a really good monster to gate. The engine starts with any way you go into a level 5 Synchro Monster, going into Danglong first of the Yang Zing. With its search effect, you add 9 pillars of the Yang Zing to your hand. Then you use its second effect to send Chi Win from your deck to the graveyard. During your opponent's turn, when they activate any card you wish to negate, you use the effect of 9 pillars to stop your opponent's card and destroy your Denglong. This will proc its third effect to summon B in from the deck, and the effect of Chi Win in your graveyard to bring itself back to the field. Then you use the effect of B in to synchro on your opponent's turn to bring out a Battle Immune Herald of the Arc Light. With Arc Light having an additional Omni Negate while also being a floodgate that banishes monsters sent from the deck or hand to the graveyard. This engine requires three main deck garnets, or cards you don't want to draw on your opening hand, and any way to go into a level 5 synchro summon. You can also go into a different card for your level 4 synchro summon, like the Melfi one to bounce a card, but generally Herald of Arc Light is the best option. With a single copy of Dotscaper, you can end on a Scythe Lock if you know the right combo line. First, you summon Dotscaper in any way, then use it to go into Link Disciple. Dotscaper will then activate its effect to come back to the field, where you can use it to go into Link Devotee next. Then you use the effect of Link Disciple to tribute Devotee, which activate Devotee's effect to summon two tokens. Use one of those tokens to go into a Link Kariba or a Link Spider. Then use the other token and Link Disciple to go into Artifact Dagda. Now at this point you have to activate just any other card effect you have to proc the effect of Dagda, which will set an Artifact Scythe from your deck. Now you use the Artifact Dagda and your Link Kariba or Spider to go into a Predaplant Verte Anaconda. Then use Verte's effect to bring out Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer. And then you simply pass your turn. During your opponent's draw phase, you use the effect of DPE to destroy both itself and your set artifact Scythe, which will allow Scythe to special summon itself and lock your opponent out of their extra deck for the turn, and you'll just get DPE back during your next standby phase. Infinite Impermanence is in the category of hand traps. Normally, trap cards need to be set in the filter one turn before they're usable, however, Imperm has a special effect list in its card text that allows you to use it directly from your hand if you do not control any cards on your side of the field. And its effect is to simply negate the effects of one monster in the field until the end of the turn. Additionally, if you did set it to the field and use like a normal trap card, it gains a bonus effect, where we'll also negate all spawn trap cards in the same column as the card until the end of the turn. Now, why this is good is because most meta decks are very monster effect reliant. So, being able to use this card during your opponent's first turn can allow you to stop their plays in that turn if you use it on the right monster. Additionally, its bonus effect can be useful to turn off floodgates for a turn, or to strategically negate spells and traps in the field by already placing them in the same column. Which leads to a minigame where you never want to place your spells and traps in the same columns as your opponent's spells and traps, just in case they have imperms. Imperm is one of the most useful going first and second cards in the game, and it's rare for a card to be useful for both. It's also useful against nearly every single deck too, so it's a double whammy being useful against nearly everything, and being versatile in use, it's no wonder why this is the most played trap card in the game. Called by the Grave goes into the category of anti-hand trap. It has the effect of banishing a monster from your opponent's graveyard and negate the monster's effect for two turns. Basically, if your opponent's using one of these common monster cards that activate during your turn from their hand, known as hand traps, 
You can then use Call by the Grave from your hand to banish that card from your opponent's graveyard and negate the effect, thereby letting your plays go through. And the average meta deck plays a lot of hand traps, which makes this card an absolute must-have for any combo decks that want their plays to go through. But that's not all. The card also doubles as an anti-graveyard card. You can set it to be used during your opponent's turn in order to stop the graveyard effects from going off as well. Which makes Called By one of the few staples in the game that is both a going first and second card, and absolutely deserves its multiple hits on the ban list in every format it's usable in because of how universally good the effect is. Nibiru falls into the category of hand trap. During the main phase, if your opponent is summoned five or more times, you can tribute all face-up monsters in the field, then summon the card to your field and a token to your opponent's field with the combined stats of all the tributed monsters. The main benefit to this hand trap is it gets rid of all of your opponent's important monsters during their turn. And since a lot of combo decks do not get their good boss monsters out until the very end of their combo, you can usually drop a Nibiru on your opponent mid-combo to completely ruin their turn. And since a lot of decks summon more than five times per turn, it's a card that can win you the game on its own. However, not every meta deck summons more than five times a turn on average, and some of them can even get a monster to get out before the fifth summon, which they do specifically to counter potential Nibiru. And it also tributes your monsters as well as your opponents, so it's almost exclusively a going second hand trap. So, while this hand trap is potentially game winning on its own, meta decks know this, and try to play around it as much as possible. The Gradal Engine simply starts with one copy of Gradal Impact in ending your turn. Then, during the end phase, you add either Gradle Combat to your hand to have a counter trap in your hand to reveal for something like Rebirth the Parshath, or just add another copy of Gradle Impact to your hand since it can search itself. And then that's it! You don't play any of the monsters in this very small engine. The Gradle Impacts have effects that can destroy each other in order to pop your opponent's cards, and you can use them in combat in your hand as discard fodder for other card effects. The main benefit of this engine is simply going plus one during each of your end phases for no cost with cards that can actually be used to destroy your opponent's cards instead of just useless cards that take up space in your hand. However, the engine is kind of slow as it only adds during the end phase, so it's exclusively only useful for control type decks like counter fairies for example. First you summon Psy Reflector, then use this effect to search Assault Beast from your deck, which then pitches itself to search Assault Mode Activate. Then use the second effect of Psy Reflector to summon back the Assault Beast from the graveyard and change its level by whatever level you want for a synchro. Increases level by 1 if you want a level 6 synchro monster, 2 for a level 7, 3 for a level 8, and 4 for a level 9. And there you have it. The benefits for this engine is easily going into any level 5 to 9 generic synchro monster from one summon. Psy Reflector can be recruited directly from the deck with Emergency Teleport, or through Assault Sentinel, who in turn can be searched with Fire Formation 10k. Giving your opening hand up to 9 additional ways to access Psy Reflector, depending on the banlist status of its searcher cards. Field spells have had a huge impact on the Yu-Gi-Oh! metagame throughout the years, either by being generically powerful or by being superbly strong for the respective archetypes. And in this video, we're going to go over some of the best field spells in the game's history, why they're so strong, and the impact they have on the game as a whole. And infecting the number 10 spot is Zombie World, one of the oldest field spells on this list, and the one with the simplest effect. It just so happens that its effects are very strong in the modern era. The first effect turns all monsters in the field and graveyard into zombie-type monsters. This includes all monsters on your opponent's field and in their graveyard as well as your own. The second effect is a floodgate and prevents any monster from being tribute summoned other than zombie monsters. Ever since its release, Zombie World has been a staple of most zombie-oriented strategies. This is because it allows for your cards that only work with zombie monsters to be used on monsters that usually aren't zombie-type. Mezugi is a great example. With Mezugi, you can banish it from the graveyard in order to special summon any zombie monster from your graveyard for free, effectively making it a monster reborn for zombies. But while Zombie World is in your field zone, your options are greatly expanded, allowing you to summon back cards you usually wouldn't have access to. Whether it's a good extender like Lumina, a solid interruption like Ghost Ogre, or even a powerful boss monster like Barondit Floor. All possible because all of these cards become zombie monsters, making the change of their type really valuable to zombie decks. The same is also true of Doom King Balladrach, one of the premier boss monsters for the zombie decks, and Balladrach has two effects, both of which benefit from the presence of Zombie World. The first of which allows you to summon it from your graveyard every standby phase provided there's a face-up card in either player's field zone. And the second allows you to either negate an effect or banish a card from the field or graveyard. This effect triggers whenever a zombie monster that isn't Baladrosh activates its effect. On your turn, it's really easy to trigger since most of your deck is comprised of zombies. But it's less likely that your Baladrosh is going to have a chance to trigger on your opponent's turn if they're not playing a zombie deck. Unless Zombie World's on the field. Since all of your opponent's monsters become zombies, every single effect your opponent activates on field or in graveyard becomes a potential trigger for Baladrot. In essence, Zombie World is a huge boon for zombie decks, and is something that they want on the field at all times. And while usually it would be quite difficult to activate and find Zombie World across the course of your combo, zombie decks also have access to Necroworld Banshee, 
a zombie monster which allows you to activate zombie world from your deck at quick effect speed. But as well as in zombie decks, Banshee and zombie world have seen play in numerous non-zombie strategies. This is because the type alteration effect isn't just a benefit for zombie strategies, it can also act as a floodgate for certain strategies that are based around monster types. For example, a lot of Dragon Link extra deck monsters are based around using Dragon Monsters you control as materials. In order to go into Spheres, you need to use two Dragon Monsters, and to go into Striker Dragon, you need a level 4 or lower Dragon Monster as a material. The same is also true of Tri Brigade Monsters, which each have an effect of Banished Beast, Wing Beast, or Beast Warrior Monsters in the graveyard to summon a Link Monster based on the number of monsters banished. But while Zombie Worlds phase up on the field, every monster in the field and in the graveyards becomes a zombie, preventing decks which are reliant on their typing for their plays from being able to be played at all. So when these type reliant decks are good, other decks that have ways of getting to Zombie World or putting Banshee in the graveyard will often play them in their main or side deck. Branded, for example, doesn't care about the type of monsters used for the fusion summons most of the time, and are capable of sending Necroworld Banshee to the graveyard with Branded Fusion in order to activate Zombie World from their deck. Or decks like Tier Laments, which is capable of milling a huge portion of the deck, may play Banshee in their side as an extra good mill that they can use to deal with certain strategies. But you may be surprised to know that it's not just the first effect of Zombie World that acts as an incredible floodgate. The second one is just as powerful but a lot more niche. The second effect of Zombie World may appear useless at first, because in the modern era, there are very few decks which actively tribute summon monsters. But for decks that do need to tribute summon, Zombie World basically stops them from playing entirely. This is why Zombie World is currently seen play in a ton of side decks. It completely stops Fluent Dereeds. Without being able to tribute summon their Wing Beast monsters, Fluent Dereeds lose access to M-Pen, their main boss monster, Ryza, their removal, and Apex Avian, their negation. Essentially, with Zombie World up, their entire engine is offline, and even their strongest form of removal and unexplored wins requires a tribute summon to occur, something they're locked out of while Zombie World is on the field. Technically, Flu can still normal summon out their small birds into Zombie World and lock you under a barrier statue, but all it takes is a single battle phase to deal with that statue, allowing you to play without worry about being interrupted by stronger interactions. Overall, Zombie World is an excellent card for zombie decks, but has proven itself more worthy by being a niche but excellent floodgate against certain strategies. And this Floodgate effect, combined with an ease of access with Necroworld Banshee being one of the best searches for a field spell ever, has allowed Zombie World to see competitive play despite its age, and will likely prop up again in future metagames as a tech choice. And funnily enough, it just so happens to counter the strategy that the next card on this list supports. Making its royal entrance at number 9 is Domain of the True Monarchs. This archetypal field spell for the Monarch monsters is a series of monsters based around Tribute Summoning, and Domain is an excellent piece of support for both the Monarch strategy and other Tribute Summoning strategies as a whole, with each one of its effects being extremely beneficial. While it's face up on the field on a soft once per turn, you can reduce the level of a monster in your hand with 2800 attack and 1000 defense by 2, which just happens to be the stat line of the Mega Monarch monsters as well as the Underworld and Heavenly Monarchs. This allows you to reduce the level 8 monsters to level 6 in your hand, meaning they only need one tribute to be brought on the field rather than two. And that's not all, because Domain also gives your tribute summon monsters a free 800 attack when they attack an opponent's monster, allowing your 2800 attack monsters to turn into 3600 attack goliaths, which is enough to beat over Eldritch the Golden Lord, or crash with Super Quantum Mech King Great Magnus. But Domain's strongest effect by far is its first effect, but that's also the effect that comes with the hardest condition. In order for this effect to apply, you need to have no cards in your extra deck, and be the only player to control a Tribute Summon monster. But if you fulfill these conditions, your opponent cannot special summon any monsters from the extra deck, essentially making Domain a permanent scythe lock. This is what allowed Monarchs to see Tier 1 competitive success in 2016 with the release of the Monarch Structure deck. This structure gave Monarchs a ton of new tools to compete in a modern format, as well as a cheap way to actually get access to those tools. These tools included Domain. Locking your opponent out of the extra deck was just as good back then as it is today. Even more so, actually, as Monarch was able to stop Pendulum decks like the dominant Pepe from being able to Pendulum summon out of their resources from the extra deck, which made Monarch an effective counter for the strategy until Pepe was emergency banned and fell out of favor. But even after Pepe fell out of favor, Monarch still saw a ton of competitive success, because Domain was just that strong of a card. And locking your opponent out of the extra deck was such a strong floodgate that it was worth it to play a monarch deck with zero extra deck at all since you could rely on the effects of your main deck boss monsters. One of the things that did hold the strategy back was that it was very bricky and inconsistent. This has helped out a lot with Pantheism of the Monarchs, which had two effects to make monarchs a bit more consistent. The first lets you send a monarch spell trap from your hand to the graveyard to draw two cards. And the second allowed you to banish it from the graveyard to reveal three monarch spell traps from your deck and have your opponent choose one of them to add to your hand. Which sounds mediocre at first, since it gives your opponent the choice. But if you needed Domain, for example, you could just reveal three copies of Domain in your deck with the effect of Pantheism, so your opponent is forced to let you search it. But even with Pantheism around, Domain locked with Monarchs wasn't the most consistent strategy. And when it was limited in the later 2016 ban list, Monarchs abruptly stopped seeing play, 
since domain locking became a lot more trouble than it was worth. While the Monarch strategy did fall out of favor, it was soon replaced by another Tribute Summon based control deck, the True Dracos. And Domain just so happened to synergize extremely well with the True Draco monsters, allowing you to lock your opponent out of the extra deck while you gain resources from the True Draco monsters, flood getting your opponent out of the game while you drowned in advantage. Currently though, for as powerful as Domain was in 2016, it no longer sees the amount of competitive play it once did. And that's not because the effect is bad. Quite the contrary, as Artifact Scythe has become a popular tool to flood get your opponent from playing the game, and Scythe only locks your opponent out of the extra deck for a single turn. But it's just not worth it to have zero cards in your extra deck anymore, since the extra deck has become such an important tool for most decks. Even Monarch and True Draco decks can now use the extra deck as a tool. Extra deck Monarchs was a fairly popular strategy when Pantheism was limited and saw competitive success. Or alternatively, it can be used as a resource for cards like Pot of Extravagance and Pot of Prosperity. Which is why Fluent Arise, a deck based around Tribute Summoning, doesn't use Domain, since they'd rather use their extra deck for the Pot cards. Domain may be used again someday, but even for what it is right now, it had a solid impact in the Yu-Gi-Oh! metagame and is still absolutely a card to be feared when you see it hit the field. Shining brightly at number 8 is Trickstar Light Stage. The archetypal field spell for the Trickstar is that happened to see play in countless other decks, but also elevated its archetype to tier 1 competitive success. Light Stage has three effects. Each of one has been integral for the card's competitive success. The first effect allows you to add any Trickstar monster from your deck to your hand upon activation making it a rota for the entire archetype. The second has a soft once per turn that allows you to target a set back row your opponent controls, and that back row can't be activated until the end of the turn, where your opponent must activate the card. Or if they can't activate it, they must send it to the graveyard. And the final effect inflicts an extra 200 burn damage to your opponent whenever a Trickstar monster inflicts any kind of damage to an opponent. For Trickstar, every one of these effects is valuable. The extra burn allows you to stack more burn damage on your opponent, so it's a lot easier to reduce your opponent's life points to zero, and its ability to lock back row for the turn gives it a similar utility to Mystical Space Typhoon or Cosmic Cyclone, stopping your opponent from using the back row to interact with your plays. But by far the strongest part of Light Stage was that it accessed the entire deck. It made Trickstar an incredibly consistent strategy. You see, with Light Stage, you'd usually be adding Trickstar Candina, another searcher for the deck that was capable of searching any Trickstar card in your deck, not just the monsters. This opened up the entire deck to be searched. Not only did you have access to cards like Licorice and Lily Bell, but also it allowed you to search Trickstar Reincarnation from your deck, which allowed you even greater control of the game as you could fully hand loop your opponent with Reincarnation if it was used in combination with Drone Lockbird. And for Trickstar, Light Stage was just an insane consistency tool that let you get plus two in card advantage, as well as blanking back row and causing extra burn damage. But for non-Trickstar decks, it was an engine capable of generating a ton of card advantage, all while locking down your opponent's back row, and paired especially well with Sky Striker until the release of Hayate. But it was the release of Korobane alongside Orcus Nightmare that helped to revitalize the Trickstar engine. With the release of Korobane, Light Stage not only represented a plus 2 in card advantage, it now also represented two bodies on board since Korobane could special summon itself from the hand if you either control dope monsters or only Trickstar monsters. This wouldn't have been such a big deal if it wasn't for the release of Orcus Nightmare. You see, Orcus Nightmare was an Orcus monster, which meant that it could be used for the link summon to something like Galatea, and getting on board meant that even outside of the Orcus archetype, you were capable of performing the full Orcus combo. But it was also a Nightmare monster. This meant that Orcus Nightmare could be summoned with the effect of Nightmare Mermaid, a Link 1 which could be summoned out by using any Nightmare monster, including a Link 2 like Nightmare Phoenix or Nightmare Cerberus. This meant that all that was needed in order to perform the full Orcus combo was two monsters on board with different names, which Light Stage could do with no effort at all being one of, if not the best, way to go into the Orcus engine. What's even better was that Light Stage was a going second tool against other Orcus strategies. Because Light Stage could lock back row for the turn, you could lock your opponent set Orcus Crescenta with Light Stage, which means that whenever you activated Light Stage, your opponent was basically forced to negate it, allowing you to deal with one of your opponent's strongest negates in the game with a single card and without committing any other resources to the board. Light Stage was so strong that it was eventually put on the limited list for how much it helped Orcus strategies, and made it so that Trickstar as an engine mostly fell out of favor at least until the release of Verte Anaconda, where the engine occasionally saw play as a way to access Dragoon or DPE. Light Stage was eventually put back to 3, but only when the cards it enabled, Verte and Nightmare Mermaid, were on the ban list. And in the modern metagame, a 1-card Link 2 isn't really a crazy notion anymore. But for what it is, Light Stage has had an incredible impact on the Yu-Gi-Oh! metagame and has been integral to several Tier 1 strategies. And sneaking into number 7 is Spiral Resort. Yet another archetypal field spell that bolstered its particular archetype to metagame contention being a key piece of what made Spiral a tier 0 meta threat. Resort has three relevant effects. The third effect has seen the least use and is more of a maintenance cost. During the end phase you have to either shuffle a monster into the graveyard back into the deck, or destroy Resort. The second effect allows you to search for any Spiral monster on a soft once per turn, 
and the first effect gives every single spiral card you control, other than Resort, protection from all forms of targeting. Being a soft once per turn searcher is the main appeal of Resort, as it meant that spiral decks would cycle through multiple copies of Resort for multiple searches over the course of a single turn. This is especially true when paired with Spiral Master Plan, a spiral card which lets you search out three other spiral cards, a spiral mission card with its on-field effect, as well as a spiral resort and a spiral monster when it's sent from the field to the graveyard. Essentially, Master Plan represented a search of any two spiral monsters, one with her effect and one with resort, as well as getting a spiral mission spell or trap card as well. While both of these effects seem absurd, an issue that Spiral had was committing Master Plan to the board. It could definitely be done with cards like Firewall Dragon or Spiral Gear Big Red, but it wasn't consistent and this lack of consistency meant that Spiral was initially doomed to be stuck at Rogue tier, until the release of Spiral Double Helix. Helix allowed you to add any Spiral monster from your deck or graveyard to your hand, or special summon it to a zone that Helix pointed to. This allowed you to special summon Master Plan from the deck really easily, which gave you access to three searches that Master Plan allowed, including the addition of a Spiral Resort, which would basically protect your entire turn from a lot of interaction. This protection, combined with Spiral's new insane consistency, is what made it a tier 0 strategy until it was eventually hit on the ban list, which saw Spiral Resort limited, as well as a number of the other Spiral Archetype tools. But Master Plan was left untouched. And for a while, this was a pretty effective strategy for curbing the strength of Spiral, especially the limited resort, as it meant that Spiral was far less likely to have its protection from interruption, as it also meant it couldn't be used multiple times per turn. However, in 2020, Magician's Souls was released, which happened to be an insane extender for Spiral. It could send Master Plan from the deck to the graveyard for costs, making her easy to access, and could send two Spell Trap cards from your hand to the graveyard to draw two cards. And if you just so happen to send Spiral Mission Rescue, you could use that Rescue's graveyard effect to revive your Master Plan and trigger both of her searches. But that's not all. You see, the Spiral Resort limit really hurt Spiral for a lot of reasons. It being a free search of course was excellent, but only having one made it a brick as it meant that if you drew it, Master Plan couldn't trigger her graveyard effect to search out another Spiral Monster and Resort from your deck, since you wouldn't have a copy of Resort in your deck to search. But even if you drew Resort, it wasn't the worst thing in the world, because you could put it back in your deck with the use of Nightmare Unicorn, a Link Monster which allowed you to discard a card in order to shuffle one card in the field back into the deck. Usually, Nightmare Unicorn is used to target an opponent's card to act as a form of removal, but in Spiral, Unicorn could also be used as an engine piece if you drew Resort by targeting your own field spell. This put Resort back into the deck so that it could be searched out with Master Plan later on in the combo. Unfortunately, in the April 2020 ban list, Master Plan was finally banned which meant that Spiral's strategy really fell out of favor, since its main searcher was gone and most of its arsenal was still limited. Although it does still have Master Plan available in Master Duel and is still very playable there. While Resort may not have been the heart and soul of Spiral, it certainly helped the deck a lot, especially since it was so easily searchable by one of the best cards the deck has available, and the fact that it was a card that you were willing to shuffle back with your own Nightmare Unicorn just so you could search it again is a testament to how strong Resort, Master Plan, and Spiral were as a whole. But, as it stands right now, even with Resort available to the deck, it's not going to be destroying the meta anytime soon. And chiming in at number 6 is Orchestrated Babble, a field spell for Orcus with a really unique effect. Unlike the other field spells of this list, Babble doesn't search a card, and it isn't a floodgate either. Instead, Babble has an effect which makes the effects of all Orcus monsters in the graveyard and all Orcus Link monsters in the field quick effects allow them to be used at spell speed 2 rather than spell speed 1. And its second effect allows you to add it from your graveyard to your hand, except during the turn that it was sent there, allowing for some pretty neat recursion. Now, why was Babel so good? With Babel up, Orcus gains access to a much stronger end board that allows them to use the Orcus effects on your opponent's turn. This either allows for extra follow-up or for crazy interaction. For example, on your turn, using the effect of Orcus Simple Skeleton can allow you resources, or can be used to clear up your opponent's board with the effect of Dingursu. But on your opponent's turn, Simple Skeleton becomes a lot more potent, allowing you to summon Dingursu from your graveyard at a key point in your opponent's combo to send any card they control to the graveyard and putting a stop to that combo. It also made Orcus's graveyard really hard to interact with. DD Crow and a Harp Horror or an Orcus Nightmare can be a really effective way to put a stop to Orcus's turns, since both of their effects generate a lot of value for Orcus. But while Babel is up, both the effects of Harp Horror and Nightmare become quick effects, which means that if you target the card in the graveyard with your DD Crow, your opponent can just chain their Harp Horror or Nightmare in response, ensuring that DD Crow does less than nothing to stop their combos. Another part of what made Babel so valuable was that it was so easy to access, so much so that successful Orcus lists both in modern format and in Toss only ever played one copy. Part of why is because the card is recursive, and if it was sent to the graveyard, could use its second effect to bring itself back to the field. But the main reason why was because Orcus simply didn't need to run more than one copy, as they were virtually guaranteed to find it with the effect of Galatea, which lets you shuffle a banished machine monster into your deck to set any Orcus spell trap card directly from your deck, 
Orcus has its fair share of cards, which it can set off of Galatea. Usually, Galatea is grabbing Orcus Crescendo, a counter trap capable of negating and banishing an opponent's card, and it's one of the strongest forms of negation available in the game. But, you could also grab Babel if Crescendo was already in rotation, allowing you to use your Orcus monsters as quick effects, interrupting your opponent with Gursu, or drowning advantage by being able to use your Orcus graveyard effects both on your turn and your opponent's. Babel technically isn't weaker now than it was back in 2019. In fact, it's just as strong and is part of why Orcus is still a playable deck in the modern game. It's the cards around Babel, however, which made Orcus as an engine much less worth it. Losing Mermaid meant that any two bodies could no longer do the full Orcus combos, and meant that the Orcus package and decks became a lot heavier. And losing Harp Horror meant the deck lost a ton of consistency, making it so the Orcus engine, despite still having its powerful rewards in Babel and Crescendo, was no longer worth the risk. But even despite the amount of damage the Banlist has done to Orcus, it's still a viable deck, and one that still causes debate whenever Harp Horror returning is brought up. And Babel is a huge part of what makes it so playable, while also being a really interesting effect. Drawn into number 5 is Dragonic Diagram, another limited field spell that searches, but it's the way that Diagram searches that makes it so strong. Diagram has three effects, two of which are pretty solid. The first effect increases the attack and defense of all True Draco and True King monsters in the field by 300, and the second effect protects your True King and True Draco monsters once per turn from being destroyed by battle. But it's the third effect of Diagram which makes it strong, allowing you to add any True Draco or True King card from your deck to your hand, provided you destroy one card you control, or in your hand. At first glance, it appears that Diagram's Surge effect is a lot weaker when compared to other field spells which Surge that are on this list. Bolt Spiral Resort and Trickstar Light Stays let you go plus one in card advantage for free, while Dragonic Diagram makes you destroy a card, which means you're going neutral in card advantage. But it's this destruction which made Dragonic Diagram so strong and so synergistic with certain strategies. Like in True Draco, for example, the deck Dragonic Diagram was made for. In True Draco, you can use Diagram to basically search your entire deck for your True Draco monsters by popping your True Draco spells and traps. And the spells and traps have powerful graveyard effects which allow you to easily take apart boards, with the spell cards letting you destroy your opponent's spell or trap cards, and the trap cards letting you destroy your opponent's monsters. These effects are pretty strong and part of why the True Draco spell and trap cards are so hard to interact with, but it's not like the deck is incapable of using them without Diagram, especially because the True Draco monsters can use their spell and trap cards as tribute fodder, but it's its synergy with other decks which really brought Dragonic Diagram to the forefront of the meta. One of the earliest known uses of Diagram, for example, was in True King Dinosaur, which could use the effect of Diagram to destroy Baby Sarasaurus. This allowed you to trigger Baby Sarasaurus' effect to summon any level 4 or lower dinosaur monster from your deck, usually Soul Eating Oviraptor. And you might think that playing a True Draco monster as a brick in a dinosaur deck seems pretty bad, and you'd be correct, which is why Dinosaur didn't play any True Draco monsters, they instead played True King monsters. Specifically, True King Lithosagem to destroy other copies of Baby Sarasaurus to summon out even more dinosaurs from the deck. This made Diagram an insanely powerful tool for Dinosaur but there were a few other decks which could use Diagram to even greater effect. Most famously, Zodiac and Metal Foes were two decks that could use Diagram very well. Diagram synergized with Metal Foe cards, allowing you to pop your Metal Foes spells and trap cards to use their graveyard effects in a similar way to True Draco. It also synergized really well with Zodiac cards, specifically Zodiac Ram Ram, which, similar to Baby Sarasaurus, could special summon out a card if it was destroyed by card effect, specifically a Zodiac monster from your graveyard. This enabled a ton of synergy between the three strategies, where a diagram in hand could be integral for setting up your Metal Foes or Zodiac Engine, especially with the release of Masterpiece, the True Draco Slain King. This was by far the best True Draco monster you could search with diagram, as it was a Towers that you could make unaffected by two-thirds of the entire card pool based on what you used to tribute summon with. That and the fact that it came with a free pop and had over 3,000 attack on field because the diagram made Masterpiece incredibly difficult to out and easy to bring out in Zodiac Metal Foes list. So much so that Masterpieces remain banned to this day, while Diagram has remained limited. And that's the main reason why Dragonic Diagram has fallen out of favor. The card is still absolutely absurd for some strategies to the point where dinosaurs can still play Diagram to search out Lithosagem, but it's lost its strength in being synergistic for a lot of strategies, since Diagram has become a lot harder to find with its limitation, and its strongest payoff, Masterpiece, is currently banned. If both of these bandless limitations were reverse, there would be no doubt the Dragonic Diagram would find its way into many decklists again, purely for how beneficial its search effect was. Rising and shiny to number 4 is Necro Valley, a field spell with an insanely strong floodgate and one that happens to be one of the most eroded cards in the history of the game. Necro Valley's effect has technically varied throughout the game's history based on its current errata, but it's always played a similar role in stopping effects that interact with the graveyard, no matter the errata it's using. Its current effect gives every Gravekeeper monster 500 attack and defense, and prevents any card in the graveyard from being banished. It also negates any card effects that remove a card from the graveyard to a different place, whether that's being a special summon or return to the deck, 
and it also negates card effects which change the type or attribute of monsters in the graveyard. Now, Necker Valley technically is one of the main playmakers of the Gravekeeper archetype, and is the card that the entire archetype revolves around. But despite that, the Gravekeepers were never a reason why Necro Valley ever saw any play, even though they could easily search the card. The reason why Necro Valley saw, and still continues to see competitive play, is because of its use as a floodgate. When Necro Valley hits the field, the entire graveyard is basically shut off from being used entirely. This isn't a problem for some decks which don't care about the graveyard at all, but a ton of decks use the graveyard as a secondary resource and can sometimes play from the graveyard entirely. Drytrons, Tear Laments, and Phantonipes are all great examples and are more than capable of playing the game using mostly, or sometimes only, cards in their graveyard, giving them an incredible amount of recursion and access to an amazing resource. With Necker Valley on the field though, every single one of these decks is cut off from that resource. Drytron can't spell summon its monsters from the graveyard, Phantom Knights can't banish cards to search, and Tear Laments can't fusion summon as they'd be moving a card from the graveyard to the deck. And with that resource cut off, these decks can't play. Which is why Necker Valley occasionally appears as a tech choice against these strategies. In the current format, for example, Necro Valley is an incredible silver bullet against tier limits and one that greatly aids decks like Draco Slayer, which have easy access to field spells, or decks that are willing to play metaverse so they can use Necro Valley in your opponent's turn. Not every deck can fully use Necro Valley, however. If you care about your graveyard, Necro Valley has the potential to hurt your deck more than your opponent, especially if you're playing one of the strategies above. But if your deck can play it, Necro Valley serves as an incredible counter to graveyard reliant strategies, and will likely keep seeing play as long as decks that use their graveyard as a resource are around. Swimming into number 3 is Primeval Planet Pearl Arena, the archetypal field spell for Tier Laments, the current Tier 0 meta threat as of making this video. Planet happens to be another example of a field spell that searches and has three absolutely absurd effects. Planet's first effect allows you to add any Tier Laments monster or Visa Starfrost from your deck to your hand whenever it's activated, essentially unlocking the entirety of the Tier Laments deck. Not only that, but it gives every Tier Laments monster and fusion monster an extra 500 attack while they're on the field, upgrading something like a Shiren to a massive 2300 attack. And if that wasn't good enough, Pearl Arena also acts as interruption and removal with its third effect, which allows you to target and destroy one card in the field whenever a Tier Limits card is returned from your graveyard to the deck, with this effect being a hard once per turn, as well as the card itself having a hard once per turn on its activation. All of these effects are absurd and contributed to Tier Limits' current Tier 0 status. So, let's go through what each of these effects does for the deck. The first effect of Planet ensures that Tier Limits is never bricking, because it basically represents three copies of any main deck Tier Limit monster when it's in your hand. If your current hand isn't capable of comboing, you can use Planet to search out either Merrily to mill three cards from the top of your deck, or Rhino Heart if you'd rather ensure you mill a specific tier limit name. If you already have a way to combo though, you can instead choose to add Shiren as an extra extender in case your plays are interrupted, allowing you to mill three cards when you special summon and potentially an extra five more if you sent a Kelbak or a Gido from your hand to the graveyard. And finally, if you have all these cards available to you, you can use Planet to search out Havness, which can act as an extender similar to Shiren in case your plays are interrupted by your opponents or on field monster effect. Or you could simply save Havness in your hand to have as a hand trap during your opponent's turn so you can fusion summon your tier limits on their turn as well as yours. Essentially, the reason why Planet Search is so strong is because it's capable of representing any one of the tier limit cards. And if that's where its only effect is, it would still be a powerhouse of a card, but it also comes with an extra two absurd effects. The attack boost is definitely the weakest effect of the three, but by no means makes it weak. With Planet Up, it becomes even harder to out tier limits boards simply because every card in the field is gaining an extra 500 attack for free. This turns cards like Rhino Heart and Shiran into 2300 attack beaters, while also strengthening Rue Kalos and Kaleida Heart to 3500 attack. This is even stronger when you consider Tier Limit Scream. This effect makes it so that whenever a monster is summoned, you get to mill three cards. And if you do, every monster your opponent controls, or will control, loses 500 attack until the end of the turn. This means that with Planet Up and Scream Resolve, you would need a monster with 4000 original attack to crash into Rue Kalos, which makes for even a harder time when facing Tier Limits. And last but not least is Planet's Pop. This effect serves Tier Laments in three ways. The first is that it gives your deck free removal. You can fusion summon from your graveyard to your turn to trigger Planet, allowing you to freely pop any card your opponent controls, from their monsters to their back row. They can Planet a really good way to out problem boss monsters and floodgates. Even during your opponent's turn, as the second way that Planet serves Tier Laments is as a form of interruption. You see, Tier Laments are more than capable of triggering Planet on your opponent's turn. Cards like Havness, Scream, and Sulik are more than capable of putting a tier limit in the graveyard so they can trigger their effects, allowing for tier to play on your opponent's turn while also gaining access to planet as free interruption. The Ishizu cards are also capable of triggering planet as well, as Keldo and Mudora can be used to return one of your tiers from your graveyard to your deck on your opponent's turn, which also just so happens to trigger the effect of planet. And the final way that planet helps tiers is that it's an extender. 
Similar to Nightmare Unicorn targeting your own spa or resort, Planet can be used to pop your own tier limit monsters to trigger its effects. This can be insanely useful to pop an Impermed Kit Kalos or Rhino Heart or any other tier name that you need to fusion summon with. In essence, every one of Planet's effects is amazing and helps with the tier limit game plan. The fact that it acts as interruption, removal protection, an extender, and a starter all in one shows how important the card is for tier limits. And if it were not for Planet, the deck would certainly be considerably weaker. Splashing into number 2 is Runic Fountain, another field spell with a really unique effect in the heart and soul of Runic. While Fountain is phased up on the field, you can activate any Runic Quick Play spell card from your hand during your opponent's turn, essentially turning all of your Runic Quick Plays into hand traps. And on a soft once per turn, after a Runic Quick Play spell has been activated, you can target up to 3 Runic Quick Play spells in your graveyard and put them to the bottom of your deck, then you can draw the same number of cards you put back. This effect ensures that Runic is almost never running out of resources. Because while you have Fountain face up on your side of the field, you can use your Runic Quick Play spells really liberally. You don't have to worry about losing any card advantage as Fountain basically replaces all of your Runic spells you've used in the turn with three new cards drawn from the top of your deck. This becomes excellent in long grind games. It makes it so that a single Fountain ensures that Runic is never falling behind in terms of card advantage, and allows for the deck to win games purely on card advantage even without their battle phase. And Runic is always going to have access to Fountain because every single Runic Quick Play spell has two effects. The first is their own unique effect, and the second which allows them to summon out any runic monster from the extra deck to the extra monster zone. Runic has multiple options they can use to summon with their quick plays, but if they need access to Fountain, they're likely going to go into Hugin, which is a card that searches Fountain from the deck by discarding a card. Meaning that no matter the situation, as long as a runic has a free extra monster zone, they have access to Fountain. And it sets up the graveyard with runic spells, ensuring that the next one you activate makes it so that you draw at least two cards. The best part is that Fountain's once per turn is a soft once per turn. So even if you draw Fountain, you can use Hugin to search yet another copy to use its draw effect multiple times per turn, as long as you can sub the Graver with enough Runic Quick Play spell cards. This draw effect also pairs excellently with Fountain's first effect. You see, usually drawing cards on your turn is just way better than drawing them on your opponent's turn. A card like Reckless Greed, for example, is great for card advantage, but the cards you draw can't really be used on your opponent's turn, unless they just so happen to be hand traps. Runic Fountain, however, solves this issue by allowing you to activate any Runic Quick Play spell from your hand. Not only does this allow for Runic to play around strong board breakers like Evenly Match and Lightning Storm, it means that any Runic card drawn off a Fountain can be used to interact with your opponent, not just making Fountain an excellent resource for utility, but also allows it to be great for potentially interrupting your opponent. Overall, Fountain is an absolutely excellent field spell, and one that puts Runic on the map, as the deck would be far less valuable without both of its effects. So much so that Sprite even began teching in Runic engines just so they could take advantage of the free draw 3 and level 2 body that Hugin and Fountain provided. Although, despite how absurd Fountain is as a field spell, there is still one more recently banned card that is indisputably the best field spell card that's ever been made. And digging its way to the number one spot is the now banned Mystic Mine, a card which warped the format and deck building around its existence and could win games entirely on its own. Mystic Mine, like Necker Valley and Zombie World, is a floodgate-like effect. Essentially, while your opponent controls more monsters than you do, they cannot activate monster effects or declare an attack. And the inverse is also true. If you control more monsters than your opponent, you cannot activate monster effects nor declare attacks. And if both players control the same number of monsters during the end phase, Mystic Mine destroys itself. This effect is so game-winning because of how much it can restrict your opponent's plays, especially if they're on a monster-heavy combo deck. If you control no monsters, you can just activate Mystic Mine and sit behind it until you deck out your opponent. Since Mystic Mine locks your opponent from attacking, there's no way to go for a game by reducing your life points to zero. And since your opponent can't activate monster effects, it can make Mystic Mine really difficult for monster heavy combo decks to out, as their usual answers to back row like Super Quanto Mech Beast Grampulse and Nightmare Phoenix aren't capable of even attempting to out mine. And because of this, the existence of Mystic Mine affected the deck building of almost every deck. As, in a format where Mystic Mine was legal, there was a chance that you could be caught off guard by it. This led to a ton of deck builders forcing a main deck out to mine in their deck, even if that card wasn't really that effective in the meta. These cards could range from spell trap card removal like Harvey's Feather Duster or Cosmic Cyclone, to cards that remove monsters from your own field like Dark Hole just so that Mystic Mine would out itself. In fact, it was seen as a huge bonus when a deck had an archetypal out to Mystic Mine with their own engine. Virtual World could play Shush, which allowed them to pop Mystic Mine, Eldlich has Conquistador to out it, and more recently, Sprite would play Sprite Smashers to banish Mystic Mine from the field. There were plenty of other decks, however, that were far less fortunate and had no archetypal outs to Mystic Mine, and so would either rely on those aforementioned generic outs, or would choose to risk being Mystic Mine for the sake of consistency in their engine. But if those decks ever were Mystic Mind, it was game over on the spot. The auto-win nature of Mystic Mind is what allowed it to see common play in numerous side and main decks from its release to when it was banned. 
as even in the decks that did play Native Mine outs, Mystic Mine could still be an effective counter to the strategies if those outs were baited or dealt with. But as well as in sideboards, Mine also managed to see a fair amount of competitive play as its own deck, testing the limits of Mystic Mine's nature as an auto-win card. The deck would floodgate your opponent out of the game with Mystic Mine backed up with Judgments, Field Barriers, and Dark Bribes to protect it. And these Mystic Mine variants could be quite varied, and allowed for alternative win conditions like Exodia, Last Turn, and Burn to have a spotlight in the game's meta. As a Mystic Mine hit the field, the game was turned on its head and had to be played differently from how you would face any other deck. Mystic Mine can be called many things, unfun, unfair, or even downright toxic. But there is no denying that Mystic Mine had a huge impact on the Yu-Gi-Oh! metagame and has influenced both deck building and card design, which is why there's no doubt it was the best field spell in the game's history. The Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Limit list has existed for nearly 20 years at this point. We've had 57 changes to Forbidden Limited cards since then. But instead of going over every individual card, today we'll be going over the biggest reason why cards find themselves placed on the Forbidden Limited list by Konami and why they stay there. Our first reason at the number 10 spot is that some cards are just incredibly unusual and cause all sorts of rules and gameplay execution problems. This category of cards are just cards that exist far too early on in Yu-Gi-Oh! and, while sometimes powerful, really are just inherently problematic in ways that are both hard to fix and are just not worth having around in a legal card pool. The poster child for this is obviously Last Turn, a card with more ruling nightmares than you can really count, and had a powerful enough effect to actually be relevant and force people to actually consider how this card works. Another great example is Victory Dragon, a card that interacts with the game completely outside of the game by having it affect your next game, and win you the entire match if it deals lethal damage. While a lot of folks will bring up how pointless this card is because you can just concede before it connects with an attack, that's not necessarily true in every format. In the OCG, and oftentimes in the combined OCG and TCG Worlds format, it often requires a judge approval to forfeit a game, making a card like Victory Dragon go from a gimmick to a legitimate existential rulings nightmare about cards breaking the confines of a single game and stretching over into another game. There's an entire series of promo and prize cards with Victory Dragon's effect who aren't legal to play showing how Konami just does not want that ruling's nightmare hanging around in the game for real. Some cards just cause problems by resolving in a tournament. Self-Destruct Button and Fiber Jar found themselves banned for either literally or functionally creating more games than the usual three games to a match format. The complete opposite of Victory Dragon, but a huge issue nonetheless, because constant draws could leave a match without a winner when time is called all too frequently. Another early ruling's problem that found its way to the limited list was Twin-Headed Behemoth. It had a once-per-duel effect, but didn't name itself meaning you had to track which behemoth had used its effect or not. Impossible if you have to shuffle them all back into your deck. Konami used a limited list to make it so there was only ever one twin hidden behemoth legal. So if you use its effect, there would be no other behemoths to mix it up with, and you could know not to use its effect. While these last few cards aren't nearly powerful enough in the abstract to be banned, they're just too wonky and affect the game at a level above the regular game, and it's not worth the trouble of having them legal. These are the kinds of cards that are the least likely to ever come off the list without series erratas which you can see in the effect of Twin-Headed Behemoth's errata. There aren't a lot of them, but these rule-jumbling monstrosities have been a mainstay of the Forbidden Limited list for years. And while Konami usually does a good job of not having game-breaking rulings problems printed, these few cards will serve as a historical fixture on the list for years to come as a testament to Konami's earliest mistakes and how they used banning as a solution to it. And at number 9 on this list, we have Consistency Hits. One of the main functions of the Forbidden Limited list isn't always just to ban cards that are too powerful or too degenerate to remain in the game. Konami often uses the limited and semi-limited spots to rank index that are overperforming or just have been too good for too long. On the most recent list as of this recording, Konami hit the relatively new purely archetype by limiting purely delicious memory. While people were surprised at a deck that just so recently been released to the TCG getting a significant hint to arguably its best extender, Konami has never been afraid to use these minor hits to weaken, but not to completely destroy, current meta-relevant decks. Delicious Memory's effect isn't really powerful enough to warrant to being limited to one, but it is a very impactful hit on the deck's consistency. And most of the time, when this happens, they will leave those cards limited for quite some times afterwards as a precaution. An example of that would be Salomon Great Gazelle. While Salomon Great was a great deck in Toss format, it wasn't significantly better than most of the decks around it. Though, the rest of the Toss format's headline decks also receive their own hits, and many remain on the list to this day. For instance, Sky Striker Mobilizing Gage has been bouncing up and down the Forbidden Limited list for years due to how powerful of a card it is. Though, its strength in Sky Striker as a consistency piece isn't the only reason. Aside from purely delicious memory, the other recent hits on the list to combatant meta strategies include the semi-limitation of Kashtira Unicorn, who serves as Kashtira's best starter thanks to its ability to search out Kashtira's incredibly powerful spells. 
or Sprite Starter, who, despite Sprite's other hits of the ban list like Sprite Elf, is by far Sprite's most powerful engine card, and hard drawing it can really up the deck's ceiling, as it can let Sprite Jet search Sprite Smashers instead of needing the Sprite Starter to continue their combos. Sometimes these hits can be a bit questionable though, as another new member on the semi lulu list is Runic Fountain. Fountain's ability to draw three cards in both players' turns is undeniably powerful, and the fact that it's not a hard once per turn meant that sometimes a Runic player could draw six on their own turn if they cycle through enough Runic spells. But the semi-limitation was questionable, as Runic decks rarely played more than two. And every single Runic quick play spell can search it out thanks to their ability to summon huge in the Runic Wings, who can search Runic Fountain, giving the deck upwards of 20 cards that can search Fountain. Still, when Konami sees a deck overperforming by their expectations, their first act is almost always to run out a series of limitations and semi-limitations. Maybe the best example of this in practice is the Dragon Rulers, where Konami kept hitting cards around the Dragon Rulers like all the Baby Rulers and support cards like Super Rejuvenation to keep the Dragon Rulers decks alive but severely weaken its consistency. Though, in that case, it didn't work as they eventually had to limit and then ban the Dragon Rulers for continuing to dominate for too long. Despite overpowered cards receiving bans being the highlight of most of the Forbidden Limited List adjustments, the majority of Konami's changes historically to the list actually fall within this category where they're largely limiting and semi-limiting minor problems and banning support cards. Next up at number 8, we have Searching for Cards. Searching for Cards out of the deck has been a mainstay of Yu-Gi-Oh! ever since the Warrior Toolbox days as early as 2003 with reinforcements of the army, affectionately dubbed Rota by the community. This searched out tons of powerful utility monsters like Exiled Force to threats like Don Zaluk and had such an impact on the game that basically any normal spell that can search a monster out of your deck often gets called a Rota. This kind of generic searching of one of the best creature types in the game earned Rota a long stay on the limited list, as even to this day, having multiple copies would make the limitation of powerful warriors like Armageddon Knight or Dark Refer trivial if you had three Rotas hanging around. This logic exists to fellow limited spells set rotation and terraforming. While it took longer for their power to manifest thanks to field spells being absolutely trash for years, once good field spells started being a staple of archetypes with the advent of cards like Dragon Ravine, Union Hanger, Spa Resort, and others, suddenly making all of these powerful cards go from 3 copies to functionally 6 with terraforming and potentially 9 with set rotation was an issue. It's not just generic searchers that get limited either. As Dragonic Diagram, Inferti Arc Fiend, and Gateway the Six all received a long term limitations for a similar lack of hard once per turn searching, despite being locked to their respective archetypes. Turns out, if your archetype has good cards to search, potentially unrestricted search ability is pretty great. But the real criminals of this list are the cards that search far too many cards for the health of the game or were too easily accessible. Zodiac Broadbull can only search one Beast Warrior, and while the effect was a soft once per turn, you usually only used it once a turn anyhow. The problem was twofold with Broad Bowl, as the card it searched was usually Zodiac Rat Pier, a limit and banworthy powerful card on its own right. On top of the fact that Broad Bowl was always easily accessible due to being in the extra deck and summonable off of any Zodiac normal summon thanks to Zodiac's incredible powerful cheating of the XC summoning restrictions. Other bannable cards just search way too often. Spiral Master Plan, Eva, and Block Dragon are all very similar cards in that sense. Block Dragon was quite easy to summon and quite easy to search thanks to Gallant Granite, so its graveyard effect at 3 rock monsters was an absolutely broken amount of advantage, once paired with good rock monsters in the Ad Emancipators. Eva functioned similarly, enabling a mass searching of fairy cards over 2 turns when paired with Drytron and the Herald Ritual monsters, being able to search 4 total fairies over 2 turns to set up crazy amounts of negation. Unlike those two, Spiral Master Plan was limited to searching only her archetype cards in the Spiral Missions with her on-field effect, and a Spiral Monster and Spa Resort with her second Graveyard Effect. And while her Graveyard Effect only searched two cards compared to Black Dragon's three, her on-field effect lacked a hard once per turn, which is where the real problem starts. It was very typical to see Spiral searching upwards of six cards in one turn with Master Plan. It also didn't help that Spiral had a monster that could summon her straight from the deck in Spiral Double Helix, and one of the monsters she would search off, Spiral Quick Fix, also lacked a hard once per turn on its search effect and would search upwards of six cards in a turn too making her just as accessible as other broken searchers, but also leading into bigger plays with the sheer advantage generation. Searching is a fundamental part of Yu-Gi-Oh, and basically every good deck these days searches out cards one way or another to be able to consistently implement their game plan, but some cards just do it a bit too well to stay off the forbidden and limited list. Next up at number 7, we have Making Tokens. Making Tokens has been an important part of Yu-Gi-Oh ever since Scapegoat's printing a card which has an entire format named after the pace of play that singular card sets up. 
and for a long time Scapegoat was fine as a limited card. Until the Synchro era came around. Synchro monsters were the first extra deck mechanic to really make use of tokens, loving that generic material creation. A card like Scapegoat suddenly went from a powerful defensive tool to a defensive tool that immediately sets up a huge Synchro summon on the next turn with any tuner which earned it a stint on the Forbidden list. The Synchro Era also introduced Dandelion, likely the second most prolific token generator of all times besides Scapegoat itself. Dandelion's lack of a once per turn and ability to summon two tokens into the graveyard from anywhere nearly immediately made it a candidate for the limited list, and even then Dandelion was the backbone of dozens of Synchro Era decks. But that was small potatoes compared to what happened when Link Monsters arrived. Link monsters suddenly turned any generic token creation into a swarm of crazy extra deck plays. Suddenly, Dandelion represented two Link materials, and a previously French card in Blackwing Go for the Vague Shadow became an immediate staple card in every deck that could Link Summon, as its restrictions didn't affect Link Summoning at all. While most Link monsters do prevent themselves from being summoned with tokens, either by explicitly excluding tokens, or demanding monsters with effects, or monsters with different names, the existence of cards like Link Karibo and Link Spider could transform most tokens into legitimate Link materials. Scapegoat had been unbanned for several years before the Link era, but immediately had to go back to being limited thanks to these Link 1s enabling all sorts of plays. The most problematic cards aren't main deck token creators though, but the various extra deck token creators. Link Cross and Mecha Fantabiza Rorodon helped transform basically any Link deck into a deck that could access powerful Synchro boss monsters on top of the already powerful Link monsters. While both are known for working in tandem with their overpowered partner in crime, Christian Halki Fibrax, a Rorodon on its own represented a Synchro summon thanks to its ability to summon Mecha Fantabiza O-Lion, which earned O-Lion a two-year trip on the list while Aurorodon remained legal. Representing another token generator ban thanks to O-Lion's double duty of being a tuner and making a token upon hitting the graveyard. And the problem wasn't just with excessive synchro summons either. As once the link pool expanded to be powerful enough on its own, a card like number 42 Galaxy Tomahawk went from a completely forgettable monster to a link material making catastrophe. Representing up to six total material on summon now that link monsters existed to actually do something with its previously board clogging effect. Similarly, thanks to link monsters like Security Dragon, Acoustic Magician, and Firewall Dragon's ability to bounce monsters, Grinder Golem was maybe the worst offender in the OCG of token-based link generation. It easily produced over 8 link materials in any deck, but also had degenerate infinite loops with Firewall Dragon before its errata in combination with other engines like Brilliant Fusion. If not for the slower rollout of link monsters compared to the OCG, TCG would have likely had to ban it immediately as well. And this card was basically unplayable before link monsters existed. Even smaller token link climbing engines like Sky Striker Mecha Hornet Drones combined with Sky Striker Ace Kagari for a mere two free link materials was strong enough to get Hornet Drones Limited ever since its release. While the speed of the game has allowed Scapegoat to come off because it at least has the same turn special summon restriction, and O-Lion ceased being a problem with a Rorodon gone, all of these other generic token producers are unlikely to ever escape their vacation on the Forbidden Limited list so as long as link summoning is still around. And at number 6, we have causing burn damage. For a long time in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, the most effective way to kill your opponent was to just burn them to death for a paltry 8,000 life points on your first turn, turning Yu-Gi-Oh from a battle between two players into an exciting game of coin flips in solitaire. This trend dates back to one of Yu-Gi-Oh's most powerful and abusable monsters, Magical Scientist. This card's first greatest crime was pairing with Catapult Turtle and a ton of spells meant to get both of them on the field at the same time, like Last Will. The two on the board together represented 8050 damage, even back in the early 2000s, and was TCG's first consistent FDK strategy. This would be a huge part of what got Magical Scientist banned, and got Catapult Turtle's effect in errata that gave it a hard once per turn. That said, Magical Scientist is broken enough that, even without any burn style FDKs, it would always be bannable. There's plenty of other examples of burn enablers or just plain burn cards on the ban list. Mass Driver is an obvious one as the core game-winning burn card in the infamous Frog FDK that would abuse Substitute and Ronatoad to fill up the grave over the frogs and send 20 of them in your opponent's face with Mass Driver, pulling off the FDK and earning Mass Driver's long-time tenure on the ban list. Phoenixian Cluster Amaryllis both does the summoning and the burn damage, and through an elaborate combo would set up a ton of plants in the graveyard to banish for its effects in the end phase. Then, so as long as you have Topologic Bomber Dragon on the field, Amaryllis would summon itself, get destroyed by Topologic Bomber Dragon's effect, and repeat the process a total of 10 times for 8,000 damage. This same style FDK was established with Samsara Lotus, who could infinitely summon itself with minimal setup, and only needed a burn enabler to abuse this infinite summoning, which is where Trickstar Black Catbat and Nightmare Cerberus came into play. 
Cerberus would keep Catbat alive from Tobologic's effect, and Catbat would provide the 200 burn damage every time Sansora would get blown up by Tobologic. One of the most infamous banned burning baddies is Tempest Magician, who could burn a player for 500 damage for each spell counter on your field. Spell counter strategies were never good enough to enable this as anything but a gimmick game closing finisher for over a decade until Endymion Pendulum decks came around. This created an entire meta relevant strategy around stacking tons of spell counters, turning Tempest Magician into an all time busted FDK tool overnight after a long time of being only occasionally playable. For some cards on this list, it's not even necessarily that they have effects that cause burn damage, but have the capability of copying a card that can burn. Lyrless Independent Nightingale is an infamous burn enabler whose effect is largely to blame for the banning of two cards, the Tyrant Neptune and Supreme King Starving Venom Dragon. Nightingale's effect to burn based on its level is fairly innocuous with its own total of 1 stars, but when copied by higher level monsters who lack 1s per turns, suddenly that burn damage becomes a hyper consistent FTK. Even a card like Gem Knight Master Diamond is stuck in the limited list because it can copy its fellow archetype burn damage monster, Gem Knight Lady Lapis Lazuli, and in multiples could copy the effect enough to FTK. The OCG has gone a step further, banning other burn cards that lack once per turn, like Cannon Soldier and Amazonas Archer for their history of burn FTK strategies. Burn is largely a niche effect in most Yu-Gi-Oh strategies that can employ it, but the most powerful effects with the highest potential almost always lead to degenerate strategies that end games far too fast. These kinds of effects pop up here and there throughout Yu-Gi-Oh's history, and basically every time they become too good, something gets banned or limited to stop it. Next up at number 5 on this list, we have Hand Ripping. Hand Ripping is any effect that lets you strip a card out of your opponent's hand, whether it's banishing it, shuffling it back into the deck, or the most common option, playing discarding it from their hand. Hand Ripping was exceedingly common in the early stages of Yu-Gi-Oh! Three of the core staple spells of the bygone DM era are Delinquent Duo, Confiscation, and Forceful Sentry, which all gave the first turn player an immense advantage. Delinquent Duo was a hard plus one in card advantage, often making it the best. But Forceful Sentry and Confiscation give you hand knowledge and let you avoid helping your opponent discard something that might be useful in the graveyard. Hand Control was even one of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s best early decks, revolving around cards like Dan Zalug and Spirit Reaper to strip even more cards out of the hand, and even earn Spirit Reaper a decent stay in the limited list. As Yu-Gi-Oh! became faster, shutting down your opponent's plays before the first turn became increasingly more powerful. This led to slower but still useful plays on turn 1 and Trap Dust Shoot to become highly played despite its restriction to only monsters, and only against a hand of 4 or more cards. It became such an auto include in basically every deck because of its power going first that Trap Dust Shoot joined its other DM era hand rips on the ban list. Maybe the funniest example of this is the most recent card sent for ban list in this category, a Pointer of the Red Lotus. For years, a Pointer didn't see much play because it had a significant life point cost, gave your opponent hand information as well, and returned the card back to them at the end phase. So as long as there were more than 3 turns in a game, a Pointer was a huge net negative. But, as you might be able to tell, Yu-Gi-Oh's speed has become more and more extreme with the years, and a Pointer went from a joke version of Trap Death Shoot to arguably a better card as it wasn't limited to just monsters and could still hit hands with less than 4 cards in them. A more and more common situation with hand traps being available to empty early, and that got a pointer a spot beside its spiritual predecessor in Trap Dust Shoot as one of the few banned normal trap cards. Similarly, Smoke Grenade of the Thief was an absolutely unplayable card for basically 17 years, being another DM era card that immediately became banworthy once it had a home thanks to Infernoble decks being able to loop it, and well, the second a hand rip card becomes playable, it becomes problematic. Maybe the greatest example in history of the biggest problems with hand ripping is Topologic Gumblar Dragon. While most hand rip cards on this list usually only take one card out of the hand, Gumblar was a well known linker of Yu Gi Oh for ripping four or more cards before your opponent ever had a chance to do anything. Cyframe Lord Omega is limited for a similar reason, as it lacks a hard once per turn, which meant decks would frequently summon three of them in one turn to rip three cards out of your opponent's hand. Hand ripping is one of the most powerful and hard to interact with effects in Yu-Gi-Oh, and the list has been filled with cards that do it for years. As more and more hand rip strategies become effective, more and more cards find their way onto the list. The second a card that hand rips becomes too accessible and too easy to fit into a deck, it's usually not too long before it takes a trip behind the ban curtain, never to be seen again. And on the other side of the coin, at number 4, we have drawing cards. Yu-Gi-Oh! as a game has treated card draw as the ultimate form of power for quite some time. Pot of Greed is infamous both in and outside of Yu-Gi-Oh! for its straightforward, simple, and fundamentally broken effect to draw two cards at no other cost. 
It automatically makes any hand plus one card better and is the staple among staples in Yu-Gi-Oh! And much like the hand ripping cards, there's a large group of old DM era staples that are all about drawing a bunch of cards. Joining up the Pot of Greed is the arguably more powerful card, Graceful Charity, the high risk high reward card, Mirage of Nightmare, and the near infinite value of Card of Safe Return. Pot of Greed and Graceful Charity were the true staples, with Pot of Greed's hard card advantage and Graceful Charity's ability to dig one card deeper and set up your graveyard. Mirage of Nightmare seemingly has a downside that makes it come out card neutral or even negative while getting to see more cards, but clever players quickly learned that any effect that could destroy Mirage of Nightmare before you had to pay the downside met a potential draw for. Even accounting for Nightmare and the card you destroy it with, that's still a plus two overall, making it potentially more powerful than Pot of Greed. Card of Safe Return was the late bloomer of the DM era draw machines, but its lack of a hard once per turn meant players could draw as many times as they could special summon from the graveyard. And before its ban, that was upwards of five to six cards a turn. And in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, you could basically draw your entire deck with this condition. One of the oddest things about Yu-Gi-Oh is how even cards like Upstart Goblin, Into the Void, and Chicken Game find themselves limited or banned, in the case of Chicken Game, as the card only draws one but with downsides. In the abstract, this means nothing. A one-for-one -one trade isn't usually problematic, but the overall effect to make your deck functionally smaller was the original reason for, say, Upstart Goblin being hit. A 37-card deck was that much more consistent than a 40-card deck that wasn't running three Upstart Goblins, and had to play three cards that were worse than their other 37, as some cards in the deck have to be the weakest. But a bigger problem is, if all three of these cards are unlimited, you can suddenly put together hyper-consistent decks. Playing 9 draw 1s even with downsides means any basic game winning combo can be that much faster to find. Not to mention the inherent synergy and potential to draw your entire deck these cards famously had with World Magical Library, a card that is almost only ever seen in decks that need bans for its ability to draw too many cards, but has dodged a list so far. One Day of Peace is in a similar category to these other cards, and also limited to one for similar reasons. But its ability to blank out the battle phase and force your opponent to draw cards also earned it a place in very unusual deck out style FTK decks like the Gishki FTK that was forcing your opponent to draw cards to deck them out. Card of Demise is a great example of how, even with stacking tons of downsides on a card, drawing cards is just so good it's almost always worth it somewhere. The downsides of the card compared to most card draw spells are enormous with locking out a special summon in the same turn and discarding your hand in the end phase being the most important ones. Most players want to draw more cards so they can dig to their special summon heavy combos after all. But it turns out, if you just play a lot of back row interactions, floodgate style monsters, or an entire archetype that only tribute summons and relies on back row like True Draco, then the plus two in card advantage was an enormous boon without any real drawback since they would just play multiple tribute monsters and set the rest of their cards. Sky Striker Mobilizing Gage has been on every part of the ban list at one point, and while it's currently semi-limited, it had once been banned because people would splash a mini Sky Striker engine with it, with Kagari and Mecha Hornet drones just to access and gauge potential draw one alongside its search, giving every deck a potential pot of greed level card with few downsides. Drawing cards on your own turn isn't even everything, as the infamous Maxi turns any card draw from a consistency tool to a game-breaking advantage swing by drawing you an absurd number of cards to force your opponent to spend their turn without special summoning. Short of outright winning the game, drawing cards is perhaps the most powerful Yu-Gi-Oh mechanic that players are always trying to find ways to access. And whenever something is too good at drawing cards, you're almost always going to see it find its way somewhere on the list. Next up at number 3, we have dumping cards into the graveyard. While dumping cards into the grave might seem less powerful to just drawing cards or searching them, don't let that fool you. Ever since the earliest stages of the TCG, players have been using the graveyard as a resource thanks to recursion cards like Monster Reborn. And as time has gone on, more and more cards have been given graveyard effects. So while Foolish Burial might seem like an inherent minus one for costing you a card to send a monster to the graveyard, so many monsters have incredible graveyard effects that it's almost always as good as going equal or better. Foolish Burial is close in power level to one-off searchers like Reinforcements of the Army. Powerful for its generic nature, but not so powerful that having one in the format is going to cause too many problems, as it's not like you're guaranteed to draw it, so you can't build your deck around it. Foolish Burial is only really limited because, like Rhoda, it doesn't have a once per turn. The real problem with dumping cards in the graveyard is cards that let you choose what you're sending or effects that dump a ton of cards into the graveyard. Lavalval Chain and Karis Lightsworn Dominion have taken up residence on the ban list for their capability to send anything spell trap or monster to the graveyard. 
Curious would often send incredibly powerful trap cards like Eradicare Epidemic Virus or Anti-Spell Fragrance to turn these effects into consistent strategies. Not to mention, Curious' secondary millet effect would often net you value in any deck that has graveyard synergies. Lavalval Chain was famous for powering Infernity combos, and set up a special summon lock with Jin, Releaser Rituals, and Necrots. These abilities to send any card, as well as permanent availability by beating the extra deck, is what makes them far too powerful compared to something like Foolish Burial, which earned them a well-deserved spot on the Forbidden List. Perhaps the most broken card in this category are cards that send a bunch of cards to the graveyard. Painful Choice is perhaps the most well-known graveyard setup card ever letting you bend four cards of your choice while still going card neutral in hand as your opponent gives you the worst option. A resolved painful choice was so powerful that even with the lower power card pull the DM era, it was often going plus two or three in resolution thanks to cards like Sinister Serpent or powerful recursion targets like Dark Magician of Chaos being in its piles. This mass dumping at one point extended to Future Fusion, which could send five dragon cards of your choice by revealing a five-headed dragon, which earned it a ban at one point before an errata made this effect take an extra turn. Speaking of dragons, one of the most absurd card dumping monsters ever, number 95, Galaxy Eyes Dark Matter Dragon, dumped three differently named dragons of your choice, making it nearly as good as pre-errata Future Fusion while being consistently accessible out of the extra deck, enabling all sorts of strategies for FDKs or setting up nearly insurmountable floodgates and boss monsters. The most recent addition to this list, Chaos Ruler the Chaotic Magical Dragon, was terrorizing basically every form it was part of for years just for being easy to summon and binning five random cards off the top of your deck while being able to add one of them to the hand most of the time. The entire tier limits archetype floods the ban limited list in tandem with the Shizu cards as an entire tier zero deck in recent memory whose entire strategy revolved around dumping as many cards of the graveyard as you could and enabling powerful effects for your efforts, whether it was fusing with chillin' monsters or getting more meals or quick effect graveyard disruptions with the Ishizus. Mass dumping cards of the graveyard with these cards defined arguably the most overall powerful deck in the history of the game to this point, and I would be remiss not to mention perhaps the most absurd card ever at dumping cards of the graveyard, that grass looks greener. It has the potential to mill 20 or more cards in most formats thanks to grass decks playing 60 cards, and most other decks wanting to play closer to 40. Basically, nothing in the game compares to resolving that Grasslick Screener deck with graveyard effects. It's comparable to drawing three extra hands worth of value all off of one card, and is probably the best example of why cards that fill up your graveyard are often subject to a long time trip to the Forbidden and Limited list. And the second biggest reason for cards at this list is that they create powerful floodgate effects. Or, like in the case of the card Branded Expulsion, are directly related to enabling an extremely difficult to deal with floodgate. Floodgates in general have been very powerful in Yu-Gi-Oh! ever since Skill Drain beat down in burn decks abusing Gravity Bind and Level Limit Area B were top decks in the DM era, with all of these cards finding their way onto the limited list at one point. But that's only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Floodgates. With Yu-Gi-Oh!'s increased pace of play and the higher focus on decks piecing together several monster effects, powerful spells, and special summons throughout a turn, oftentimes the best way to win in Yu-Gi-Oh! is to make it so your opponent can't play. Some floodgates are just far too easy to splash into any deck and have way too big of an impact for such a minor cost. Cards like Imperial Order can be functionally one-sided, as you can play all the spells you want on your own turn and then just flip Imperial Order on your opponent's turn and reap all of the benefits of the floodgate with none of the consequences. With Special Summoning being so important, the same situation arises with Vanity's Emptiness and Royal Oppression. It's incredibly hard for modern decks to play without Special Summoning, and any deck being able to play these backbreaking cards often turns formats into a game of who won the coin flip and who drew the overpowered purple card. Some decks might have some in-engine outs to these cards though. A deck like Ed Emancipator might run Tackle Crusader or Spiral could run Spiral Tough who can destroy back row without special summoning. So why not just shut down monsters entirely with arguably the best floodgate ever in Mystic Mine? Still, despite their banworthy power level, these cards are all much harder to consistently access and easier to interact with than really big problems. The worst kinds of floodgates are the kind that you have nearly no opportunity to interact with. We did a whole top 10 video on lingering effects that include many of these cards that you might be interested in, but the biggest culprits are cards like Number 16 Shockmaster and Arch Nemesis Protoss who can activate their effects on the player's turn and have a floodgate that extended to your opponent's turn with nothing they can play in their turn to affect it. Or a monster like Outer Entity Azathoth who doesn't start a chain when summoned. So once it hits the board, no amount of interaction matters anymore. Sometimes the floodgate is attached to a protected monster that has functionally no way to be dealt with, like number 86 Heroic Champion Rongo Miniat. The previously mentioned Branded Expulsion is just like that, as it has the ability to summon something like Gimmick Puppet Nightmare to the field to prevent victims from summoning anything at all. 
And the only counter to it once it's set up is Red Reboot. Incidentally, Red Reboot is banned for being too powerful as an anti-trap card that floodgates the target for playing any more traps for a turn, while being a counter trap speed itself so only other counter trap cards can ever interact with it. Floodgates, by their very nature, they protect themselves by limiting your opponent's potential options, and thus limiting their potential cards they can play to deal with them. Floodgates are a combination of incredibly powerful interaction, incredibly hard to deal with interaction, and incredibly frustrating to play against because most of the time, when a floodgate is good, the gameplay just devolves into one player not getting to try to play their cards. Even a card as relatively simple as Barrier Statue of the Stormwinds has found itself on the ban list, despite maybe being the easiest floodgate ever to out by just normal summoning a monster with more than a thousand attack. Even this easy to out but still powerful floodgate becomes problematic when it becomes too easy to implement, as it was with Fluenderese or with some more Bird of Sovereignty before the latter was banned or when a simple floodgate is backed by another interaction to protect it. Floodgates take up an enormous amount of the Forbidden Limit list at any given time, with over 22 cards banned at the time of this recording for either being a floodgate or enabling one at some point with even more on the limited list. There's almost nothing in Yu-Gi-Oh that gets abused to the degree that Konami has to exterminate it from a format as much and as often as floodgating short of one very important mechanic. And taking the top spot on this list of reasons that get cards placed on the Forbidden Limited list, we have Special Summoning. Now, Special Summoning is so incredibly common in Yu-Gi-Oh that most cards that can't enable such a basic mechanic are hardly problematic. But when you have over 5,000 cards in your 12,000 card pool mentioned Special Summon in some way, by the sheer weight of numbers, of course, this effect was going to be at the top of the list. The strongest example for this mechanic at its worst, Magical Scientist, shows off maybe one of the most dangerous kinds of special summoning. Special summoning monsters from the extra deck while bypassing their summoning requirements. The extra deck is where a lot of power in modern Yu-Gi-Oh lies, and while Magical Scientist was banned for its burn FDK shenanigans mentioned previously, and is an insane toolbox option for cards like Thousand Eyes Restrict way back in the early days, it's hard to describe just how absurdly powerful Magical Scientist would be in the modern game, with free access to links, XCs, and Synchros to summon by cheating out basically as many fusion monsters as you want. Similar cards like Cyberstein and Metamorphosis are banned for it usually only doing this effect once, with Guard Dragon Agrapain sitting on the ban list for cheating out just dragon monsters in a similar way. Some monsters can basically special summon something infinitely many times, like how Fishboard Blaster, Level Eater, and Ronin Toten, with their lack of once per turns, just keep popping back on the field after you use them for material for an extra deck play, or how Mind Master can just summon as many psychic monsters as you want. This effect has some overlap with the previous enter on this list, Token Summoning, as Grinder Golem's penchant for infinitely resummoning itself so as long as you can bounce it is the second half of why it's so broken, along with the token generation. Special summoning is so ubiquitous and so powerful that every other enter on this list has a special summoning card somewhere in their roster that enables them. Phoenixian Cluster Amaryllis is banned for being a burn FTK enabler, but only can do so because of how it can special summon itself. Card of Safe Return can draw your entire deck for if you want, but requires you to special summon monsters from the graveyard to do so. Half the time, sending monsters to the graveyard is only broken because it enables some crazy special summoning plays, like Fairy Tale Snow being able to summon itself from the graveyard forever, so as long as you keep filling up the graveyard. Some cards are banned just for summoning a ton of monsters at once, like Dimension Fusion, Return for the New Dimension, or perhaps the worst culprit of all, Soul Charge, who all have the potential to mass summon monsters you've either banished or put in your graveyard from your previous plays. The list just keeps going. As of today, there's 192 cards populating the Forbidden Limited list, and 82 of those cards have to do with special summoning either themselves or other monsters. And that's underselling it, as some cards don't summon themselves or other monsters, but might enable broken special summoning otherwise, like Spiral Master Plan, or adding cards that can special summon to the hand, or Thunder Dragon Colossus being banned in part because it's just too easy to special summon by ignoring its own summoning requirements. Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game largely about special summoning, and really, more often about trying to break certain special summon mechanics to absurd degrees. It's the biggest and most common reason any card will ever find itself riding off into the sunset on the Forbidden Limited list, and that earns it the top spot on our list. A hand trap is a term for a card which can be activated from your hand during your opponent's or your own turn. Mainly during your opponent's turn though, with the vast majority of hand traps actually being monster cards and not traps. And hand traps are kind of required in order to play the modern metagame, because of just how game-changing they can be if you're able to resolve their effects. So on this list we'll be going over the best ones of all time. And at number 10, we have Effect Veiler. 
This is one of the OG original staple hand traps, as it simply has the effect where you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard in order to negate one monster effect until the end of this turn. It can only be used during the main phase, although it can be used during your opponent's turn from your hand, which is still kind of a novelty when the card first came out in 2010. Hand traps weren't super prevalent when Effect Veiler came out, but they did exist. They just didn't get really good until much later on in the game's history. And then once decks started coming out which had ridiculously good first turns, and could win you the game if they weren't stopped from the hand going second, like the wind-up hand loop combos, Effect Veiler started seeing tons of competitive play in order to try to curtail those first turn kill combos. In fact, it became all but required to try to open a hand trap, otherwise you would instantly lose by just having all the cards in your hand discarded to the graveyard before you had a chance to play the game. But opening a single Effect Veiler would have prevented the whole situation from happening. So over the years, being able to negate one monster effect until the end of the turn has always just been kind of good. As Effect Veiler even keeps negating monster effects even if it leaves the field. Like if you use it on one of your opponent's Lone Fire Blossoms or Rescue Rabbit. Two cards which remove themselves from the field in order to activate their effects. Those effects will stay negated even though they're no longer on the field. Although Effect Veiler has been kind of power crept, so it's only really seen play in decks that just want to play extra copies of the card which is technically better than Effect Veiler, which happens enough where it still sees play even in the modern era. Effect Veiler is also a level 1 tuner which situationally makes it useful as a card to bring out in the field if you want to go into Crystal and Halky Firax combos. Effect Veiler is one of those rare cards that still sees play even after being power crept and has just seen a whole bunch of play over its history of being in the game for over 10 years, but not as much as some of the higher spots on this list. And at number 9 we have DD Crow. I have DD Crow on here to represent four different cards essentially, because we also have Skullmeister, Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion, and even Ally of Justice Cycle Reader. All four of these hand traps accomplish basically the same thing. If your opponent is activating an effect in the graveyard, chances are one of these four cards can stop it. And DD Crow was the first of these cards to be released coming out in 2007, and being one of the first modern hand traps to see widespread competitive play, being the only card in this list which predates Effect Veiler. And all DD Crow does is allow you to banish one card from your opponent's graveyard. It can be used whenever you want as long as you have a card in your hand, unlike Effect Veiler which can only be activated during the main phases. So if your opponent's trying to resolve a card, like Monster Reborn for example, you can chain DD Crow to that card in order to remove the target of Monster Reborn from the graveyard, so the effect fizzles out and just goes to the graveyard wasting that card. You can also use DD Crow to preemptively remove something from your opponent's graveyard so they can't activate it, like an Orcist Harp Horror. But for the most part, you do have time in order to chain DD Crow to the effect, so you don't have to use it preemptively too often. However, cards like Skullmeister, which simply has the effect to negate a card effect which activates in your opponent's graveyard, can be activated in response to pretty much anything your opponent's trying to do in the graveyard. And because of this tiny little distinction, Skullmeister sees more competitive play than DD Crow in the modern era, even though they're both good for basically the same reasons. Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion allows you to negate pretty much any effect that it has to do with the graveyard. If your opponent tries to move a card from the graveyard to their hand or deck or extra deck, or tries to special summon a monster from the graveyard, or tries to banish a monster from the graveyard, you can use Ghost Bell in order to shut down any of that. And it's one of the few Ghost Sister hand traps which actually negates the activation of the effect instead of just the effect itself, which means it can be used to proc something like Witch's Strike. The reason Ghost Spell isn't played as much as DD Crow or Skullmeister, even though its effect is clearly superior to both of them, is because its effect is a hard once per turn, whereas Skullmeister and DD Crows are not. So if you draw into multiple copies of Ghost Spell and Haunted Mansion, you can only use one of them in your hand, whereas you can use all copies of Skullmeister or DD Crow in your hand in the same circumstances. And then Ally of Justice Cycle Reader just has the same effect as DD Crow, except it's able to target two cards instead of one, but only if those targets are exactly light attribute monsters. Which means it sees the least amount of play of all the four cards, but is definitely better than all four of them if you're just trying to counter a light based deck. And with light being a very popular attribute, this comes up more often than you'd think. With DD Crow being the longest lived card out of all the four graveyard disruptors, seen play ever since it came out and still sees play in the modern era, I have to have it a little bit above the other three, taking the number 9 spot on this list even if it technically is not as played as much in the modern era as Skullmeister, which was released in 2010 and also has a long history of competitive play, just not as much as DD Crow. And at number 8 we have Droll and Lockbird. 
This card has a hand effect, where if your opponent adds a card from their deck to their hand, except during the draw phase, you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard in order to make it, so that for the rest of the turn your opponent cannot add cards from their main deck to their hand. So it doesn't actually stop the first effect, which triggers the effect, it simply applies a lockdown to your opponent for their entire turn, where they can no longer perform any searches, or draw extra cards from their deck. Which is actually incredibly good for shutting down combo plays. In fact, it's so good, that if you ever play in a traditional format, where every card is unbanned, Draw and Lockbird will probably be the only way to stop your opponent from performing a first turn kill, as pretty much all of those combos require tons of drawing or searching in order to accomplish their complicated broken strategies. Which is also why Draw and Lockbird sees the most amount of play whenever there is a ridiculously broken deck in the meta. Back when Spirals were tier 0, Draw and Lockbird shot up to being one of the most played hand traps in the game, but then as soon as Spirals got hit in the ban list to no longer be crazy overpowered, Droll and Lockbird shot down in popularity again. You can kind of see how broken the game is when Droll and Lockbird is being played in droves, and the less Droll and Lockbird sees play, the more healthy the game is to an extent. Droll and Lockbird was also just used as a good way to get rid of every card in your opponent's hand because of how its triggering works. You see, there's this rule in Yu-Gi-Oh where you can't activate effects if they can't be resolved. So, if you have something like Protector of the Sanctuary on the field, which only has the effect where your opponent can't draw cards, then you're not allowed to activate cards like Disturbance Strategy or Trickstar Reincarnation, as both of these cards have effects to get rid of your opponent's hand in order to cause them to draw the same number of cards that they got rid of. With Protector of the Sanctuary on the field, this would be super easy combo to just get rid of every card in your opponent's hand. But with the ruling where you can't actually do that, you just straight up would not be able to activate the effects of those two cards. That's where Draw and Lockbird comes in. You see, the trigger for a Draw and Lockbird is just your opponent adding a card from their deck to their hand. Although, the activation window of this trigger is kind of generous, as it happens after the fact but not during the chain which is doing the search. So, if your opponent searches out a card with Elemental Hero Stratos, for example, after they add the card to their hand, you have the trigger available to activate Draw and Lockbird. But, what you could do is then just activate Trickstar Reincarnation first, and then chain Draw and Lockbird to Trickstar Reincarnation, which will resolve backwards and applies the effect where your opponent cannot draw any cards. And then Trickstar Reincarnation will banish their entire hand, and then not refill it. Now, there's technically ways to do something similar with Protector of the Sanctuary, but it's much easier to just use Draw and Lockbird combo since it doesn't require any other setup. Just playing an already good hand trap in a deck that could realistically pull off the Trickstar Incarnation combo. And what do you know, Trickstars used to be a competitive deck, and loved to use Trickstar Reincarnation. So this hand trap was basically just a combo tool in order to get rid of every card in your opponent's hand in that deck, and it was really easy to pull off too. In fact, they could kind of pull it off while just doing their plays like normal. And for some reason, none of the cards in this combo ever got banned, just some light limitations on the ban list. And then the power creep of the game got to the point where people weren't really playing Trickstars anymore anyway. And at number 7, we have Artifact Lancia. This card has a hand effect, where you can tribute this card from your hand or face up on your side of the field, in order to make it so that neither player can banish cards for the rest of the turn. Now, when this card first came out, it did see some competitive play, but only a minor amount. It was kind of one of those lesser known tech cards that people would sometimes use, as the best artifact of the time was Artifact Moral Touch, which was so good it was actually limited on the ban list for a long time. And then, when they released Artifact Scythe, it was basically just Artifact Moral Touch and Artifact Scythe that were the only artifacts that saw any competitive play. But then, the metagame kind of shifted, and people started playing decks which loved to banish cards in order to do their combos like normal. Like the Dinosaur Engine, for example, which basically requires them to banish cards in order to do all of their plays. So against a Dinosaur player, who are able to protect a lot of their effects normally from hand traps because of Miscellaneousaurus, you could completely shut down their entire turn with a single artifact Lancia, which could straight up just win you the game in most cases. And ever since then, there have just been more and more meta decks released that require them to banish cards to use effects, and artifact Lancia has been a staple of the metagame ever since, to the point where it is now the most played artifact card in the game's history, and people rarely play artifact Moral Touch or Scythe, which is kind of funny for me, because I made a joke skit years ago about how useless the other artifacts were besides Moral Touch and Scythe. Because Artifact Lancia is so good that it's kind of single-handedly kept a handful of meta decks in check, to the point where they can never become tier 1 because Lancia just shuts them down way too easily. And at number 6, we have Infinite Impermanence. 
This is an actual trap card, which can be activated from the hand if you control no cards on your side of the field. And what it does is negate the effects of one phase of monster until the end of the turn. So basically, the same effect as Effect Veiler. Although Infinite Impermanence can be activated at any point, rather than just the main phases, you know, as long as you don't have any cards on your side of the field. Which does give it some more utility over Effect Veiler, if you just want to be able to negate the effect whenever and not during one particular phase. Even if it is the most common phase where combos happen anyway. Additionally, this card has an extra effect if it's set on the field. Where if this card is set and then activated, in addition to the effect of being able to negate the effects of one monster, you also gain the effect where if you successfully negated the effect of a monster, then you also negate the effects of all spell and trap cards activated in the same column as this card. Which means it doubles as spell and trap card negation as well. If you simply set this card in the same column as one of your opponent's spell or traps, then whenever they activate that card, you can just chain infinite impermanence to it in order to both negate that spell or trap card and also one of your opponent's monster effects for the turn. Or if you just use it to negate one of your opponent's monster effects, you're going to permanently shut down that column for the rest of the turn. And because it has the dual purpose of both of its effect being good and useful, it's definitely played over Effect Veiler almost every time, if you just need a hand trap in order to negate monster effects. Because it has Effect Veiler's hand trap effect, but it also has an even more useful effect if you set it as a normal trap card. And another niche benefit that Infinite Impermanence has over Effect Veiler is that it's actually a trap card instead of a monster effect. Since most hand traps are monster effects, People will sometimes play monster effect negation cards in order to stop hand traps, like Apalooza, Bow the Goddess, or Amano Iwato, which does nothing against infinite impermanence, which can actually be used on both of those cards in order to shut them down so you can use your other hand traps like normal. And at number 5, we have Psyframe Gear Gamma. This card has the effect where, if you control no monsters on your side of the field, and your opponent activates the effect of a monster card, you can then negate the activation and destroy that card in order to both special summon this card and Cyframe Gear Driver from your hand deck or graveyard. But both itself and the driver are then banished during the end phase if they're still face up on the field. So, in order to use this hand trap, you do have to play a level 6 vanilla Garnet in your deck. Although, one of the advantages of Gamma over cards like Infinite Impermanence or Effect Veiler is that it both negates and destroys a monster card, rather than just negating the effects of the card for one turn. And more importantly, it can be used on hand traps. In fact, that's the best way to use this card, because you see, if you use Cypher and Gear Gamma during your opponent's turn, then it's just going to banish itself from the driver during your opponent's end phase, and you won't really be able to make use of the fact that Gamma is a level 2 tuner, and can use Driver in order to go into a level 8 Synchro Monster, like Cypher Lord Omega, or even Borolode Savage Dragon. Although, take for example, you activate a card like Reinforcements of the Army, and your opponent tries to activate Drill and Lockbird to stop you from searching for the rest of the turn. You can then activate Cypher Gear Gamma in response to Drone Lockbird in order to negate and destroy the card, which will then special summon itself and Driver from your deck, and give you two free monsters on the field while also negating one of your opponent's effects. And that's the main benefit of Cypher Gear Gamma, being able to negate one of your opponent's hand traps during your turn while going plus two in the process, as having two monsters on the field is just incredibly useful for pretty much every deck especially if you can use his materials to go into Christian Huggy Fibrax, and of course, Borla Savage Dragon, which has an excellent negate. And with hand traps being so prevalent in pretty much every meta deck, this situation actually comes up a lot more often than you'd think. Which is why Cypher Gear Gamma sees so much competitive play. It's one of the few cards that can negate and destroy while also granting you advantage. Although it is limiting in how you can use the effect, since you can't use it at all, if you control a single monster on your side of the field. And at number 4, we have Red Reboot. This is another one of those very rare hand traps that is actually a trap card. And basically has the effect where, if your opponent is activating a trap card, you can negate the activation of that card and then set it face down. Then, your opponent gets to search out and then set one other trap card from their deck. But for the rest of the turn, your opponent cannot activate any trap cards. And you can activate this card from your hand by paying half your life points. So technically, the effect doesn't actually get you any advantage at all as you go minus two in card advantage when you use Red Reboot, as your opponent gets a free search of any trap card from the deck, in addition to the original trap card not actually being destroyed or sent to the graveyard, just set back face down. And even with all the advantage it gives your opponent, you still have to pay half your life points to use it, and Red Reboot is so good that it's kind of overpowered, and limited to one copy of the ban list. And the reason for that is because it's a counter trap card. Counter Trap cards hold the distinction of being the fastest cards in the game, where if you activate Red Reboot, your opponent can't negate the effect of Red Reboot unless they have another Counter Trap card. 
So if your opponent has a full board of monsters with negates, like Borolode Savage Dragon, and they're trying to activate a trap card, you can stop that without fear of any of your opponent's monsters trying to stop Red Reboot, since it's too fast to be responded to. The other thing that makes Red Reboot broken is that it stops your opponent from activating trap cards for an entire turn without any setup. So if you're trying to push for game and your opponent has a full back row of trap cards, none of that matters unless they specifically have a counter trap card which can negate Red Reboot. Otherwise, you're about to shut down your opponent's entire back row for the entire turn, and then just win and ignore whatever resources they get from Red Reboot. Red Reboot is like the modern version of Cold Wave, except a slightly better because it's spell speed 3 and can't be negated easily. And Cold Wave is a banned spell card which just shuts down all of your opponent's spell and trap cards for a turn. Although Cold Wave requires it to be used preemptively, whereas you can just save Red Reboot in your hand until you need it. And it's so good at countering trap decks that it's actually better than cards like Jinzo or Royal Decree, which are two cards that negate the effects of all trap cards basically forever. Because generally, you only need to negate your opponent's traps for one turn, and Red Reboot doesn't require any setup, and can be used from your hand, and is much harder to negate than Royal Decree or Jinzo. And pretty much any deck which plays a majority of traps fears Red Reboot more than anything, as it's probably the strongest trap deck counter in the game. And if one card is able to completely counter one third of the cards in the game, you know it's pretty strong. And the only saving grace is that trap decks are not very prevalent. So Red Reboot is only limited to one copy, and it is still an absolute monster at that. And at number three, we have Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring. This card can be activated when your opponent basically moves a card from their main deck to another location, whether they're adding the card from the deck to their hand, special summon a monster from the deck, or send in a card from the deck to the graveyard. You can use Ash Blossom in order to negate that effect. And because all three of those things are some of the most common things you do in modern Yu-Gi-Oh!, and in fact, some of those things are some of the best effects in the game, Ash Blossom and Joy Spring is almost always live if you have it in your opening hand. And in fact, Ash Blossom is kind of the reason a lot of rogue decks can't compete. Because if your deck can't play through a single Ash Blossom, then it's never going to be meta. And what separates a good meta deck from a rogue or casual deck is how they can play through an Ash Blossom on their first turn. And because it's so good against pretty much every single deck in the game, it's also one of the most played hand traps ever, even though it was only released in 2017. And in fact, 2017 is kind of a hallmark year, as that's when a lot of the modern hand traps are released, as post-2017 is kind of the era of hand trap Yu-Gi-Oh! Whereas before, they weren't nearly as meta-relevant as they are today. Hand traps absolutely still existed before 2017, and did see lots of competitive play, they just weren't in every single deck like they are now. And why is Ash Blossom and Joy Spring better than cards like Drone Lockbird, which just straight up stops all searching for the whole turn? Well, because Ash Blossom stops the triggering card. Drone Lockbird can only be used after an effect has already occurred, and sometimes that's not good enough if your opponent's deck only needs to search a single time, and the rest of their combos for special summoning from the deck or just setting the cards from the deck to the graveyard, which Drone Lockbird doesn't lock out. Being able to negate one summon from Christian Hockey Fibrax or a selective mill from an Armageddon Knight can win you the game in some cases. Although only in some cases, there have been some formats where Ash Blossom has seen less play, where it's not actually the most played hand trap in the game, just in the top three. As it's kind of hard to determine which of the top hand traps are actually played more than the others, as I'm pretty sure Effect Veiler might be the most played hand trap in history, simply because it was just around longer. Although the next card on the list definitely gives Ash Blossom a run for its money, in the category of the most played hand trap in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Or at least from the last couple of years. And at number two, we have Nibiru the Primal Being. This card has the hand trap effect where, during the main phase, if your opponent normal or special summoned five or more monsters this turn, you can then tribute all face-up monsters on the field in order to then special summon this card from your hand. Then, special summon a Primal Being token to your opponent's side of the field, whose attack and defense are equal to the combined original attack and defense of all the tributed monsters. And what's notable about Nibiru is the effect can be activated at any point once your opponent has reached the five summon threshold. It does not need to be activated immediately as soon as they're at five cards. So you can just wait until your opponent is done doing all of their combos in their main phase and is about to enter the battle phase in order to use Nibiru right before they enter the battle phase in order to give them a big rock token. And what makes Nibiru so good is the fact that a lot of monsters don't have any protection from being tributed, especially on a mass scale which doesn't target anything. Cards like Red Eyes Dark Dragoon can't be targeted or destroyed by card effects, can be very easily removed by Nibiru by having it tributed. And since the token you give to your opponent is basically a vanilla monster with lots of stats, it's very easy to just destroy that with any kind of removal, which is much better than trying to destroy all of your opponents individually 
hard to destroy monsters or negates. Basically, resolving a single Nibiru on your opponent can actually win you the game most of the time. And Nibiru is kind of like Ash Blossom, where if a broken deck isn't able to stop Nibiru from tributing their monsters, then they can't compete in the modern meta. And Nibiru is so prevalent in the metagame that it even goes a little bit further, where if you're not able to get a monster negate on the field within your first five summons, then you probably aren't going to be able to do anything about Nibiru tributing your entire field. So a deck that's able to get negate in the field as early as possible is much more valuable than the ones that require more than five summons to do the same thing. And decks that aren't able to accomplish this, like the hero archetype, are commonly joked in the Yu-Gi-Oh community as ending on a rock token, because they just don't have an innate way to deal with Nibiru completely screwing over their combo plays. And since Nibiru is one of the few hand traps that actually has very high stats, it was able to situationally get over common hand trap counters like Neo Space and Aqua Dolphin, who was able to rip hand traps in your opponent's hand that had less than 600 attack. And because Nibiru can basically win you the game if you're able to resolve the effect, it's definitely one of the best hand traps in the history of the game. And it kind of warps the game around itself, where decks are not competitive if they don't have a way to deal with Nibiru, and need to special summon more than 5 monsters a turn. Although, even with how strong Nibiru is, it's not actually the strongest hand trap in the game's history because the number one spot is just probably the strongest card in the game, period. And at number one, we have Maxi. This card has a hand effect where you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard in order to draw a card each time your opponent special summons a monster this turn. This card does have a hard once per turn on its effect, so you can't use multiple Maxis in order to draw two cards every time your opponent summons a card. But there's no trigger on its activation requirement like Draw and Lockbird, so you can use it in response to your opponent performing any special summon in order to draw a card immediately. Now, in order to explain why Maxi is one of the strongest cards in the game, I kind of have to explain what the strongest kinds of effects in the game are, because Maxi's potential is not readily apparent if you just read the card effect like normal. You see, the strongest effect in the game is Victory Dragons, because if the effect resolves, you instantly win the match, which is a best 2 out of 3 duels that you do in competitive events. So, it allows you to win another duel without ever having to do that duel, so you get to avoid your opponent's side deck. Since the effect is so strong, the card that is tied to it is currently banned, even if the only legal card which can do the effect is kind of terrible. The second best effects are cards which allow you to win instantly in the current duel, cards like Exodia or Final Countdown. Pretty much all of these have very tough conditions, because simply activating the effects of these cards and resolving them win you the duel. Now, the third most powerful effect is the ability to skip your opponent's turn. If they printed a card in the game which was to simply skip your opponent's turn, but then you lose at the end of that next turn, everybody would play three copies of the card in every deck and it would probably be banned for being too overpowered. There's a card in the game called the Six Shinobi, which is a trap card that can only be activated if you control six Six Samurai monsters with different attributes, in which case you get to skip your opponent's next turn. The activation requirement for this card is crazy difficult to accomplish because you had to set a trap card in order to gain the effect on your next turn, and of course you need a full board of six different kinds of monsters. There's also Arcana Force 21, The World, which has the effect that when it's summoned you get to toss a coin, and if the result is heads, then it gains the effect where during your end phase, you can send two monsters you control to the graveyard in order to skip your opponent's next turn. This card is always on the precedent of being overpowered, because if its effect is ever made too easy to accomplish, then pretty much everyone would use it. As it is now though, it's kind of a joke card because it's too hard to actually use reliably. Now, one of the top 10 best effects in the game is to draw cards generically without downsides. Upstart Goblin is limited to one copy, and all it does is allow you to draw one card at the cost of giving your opponent 1000 life points. And the reason this card is so good is because it allows you to basically play a smaller deck and cycle through your cards faster. Pot of Greed is banned because it allows you to generically go plus one in card advantage, which is just super good in pretty much every deck. Because that plus one in card advantage could bring out a card that allows you to go plus five if you use that card to go into something like Magical Musketeer Max, which has the effect to allow you to go plus five in card advantage and only requires a single monster on the field as its materials. There's also super powerful cards which can just win you the game on their own like Nibiru the Primal Being, Red Reboot, Drone Lockbird, Evenly Match, Lightning Storm, or Dark Ruler No More. Very powerful cards that only require a single card from your hand to completely turn the duel around. So, how does this all relate to Maxi? Well, if you chain Maxi to one of your opponent's special summons of a monster, like them summoning a Neo Space Connector for example, 
there's a good chance your opponent will just stop their turn right there. Because they'll know, if you get too much advantage from the activation of Maxi, then no matter what plays they put on the board, they just won't be able to play through the massive amount of advantage you're about to generate. Because there's lots of one card game changers in the game. And the more cards you draw, the more chances you have at drawing a game changer hand trap which can just stop their plays anyway. Like drawing into a Nibiru, or an Effect Veiler, or a Drone Lockburn. It is just literally better for them to not play through Maxi, and just end their turn and hope that you don't have another Maxi on your next turn. And the player who used the Maxi doesn't lose any card advantage doing this, because the best way to use Maxi is right when they're about to special summon a monster. So, because of how the metagame works, and because of all the powerful cards you can draw into, and the extra advantage you can get in archetypes with just a single extra card, the activation of Maxi is akin to using the Six Shinobi and Upstart Goblin all in one. Except, without any of the downsides of either of those two cards or the crazy activation requirements, as you can just use Maxi whenever. Basically, Maxi allows you to skip your opponent's turn without losing card advantage, and without having any kind of setup. And this is what makes Maxi one of the strongest cards in the game. It's possible to play around Nibiru, because you have 5 summons before you have to get in a gate on the field. Maxi can be used immediately before your opponent gets a chance to get any monster negates on the field. In fact, unless your opponent has some kind of anti-hand trap support, like Call by the Grave or Cross Out Designator, then they just kinda had to skip their turn, or lose to the amount of advantage you're about to generate. So while on surface level Maxi's effect doesn't seem that overpowered, as all you're doing is drawing a card every time your opponent summons, it's actually so ridiculously good that the card is banned and should probably never be unbanned. Because the entire game would basically be decided by whoever is able to draw Maxi in their opening hand. Or if you're able to play a deck that doesn't require you to special summon too many monsters. Or it would just kind of create an arms race of playing a whole bunch of anti-hand trap support cards in your main deck. Kind of like what's the case over in the OCG where Maxi is unbanned and the metagame is completely different because of it. In fact, it's to the point where people don't even play Maxi anymore because everybody is so afraid of Maxi that all decks are kind of playing around it already by default. So there's no reason to even have it in your deck anymore. In Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel, pretty much every deck is going to need an extra deck full of staple monsters. But a lot of the best extra deck staples are of very high rarity and kind of hard to craft. And while you're waiting to craft all the highest rarity extra deck monsters, these are some good ones you can use to fill up your extra deck which might actually be useful, and some of them might even be used after you get all your high rarity staples. And at number 10, we have Super Quantal Mech Beast Grampulse. This is a rank 3 monster, so only really useful if you play level 3 monsters and are going into XC's monsters. But, it has a pretty decent effect where, you can just detach one of its materials to destroy one spell or trap card on the field. And Super Quantal Beast Mecha Grand Pulse is only of the rare quality. Now, Nightmare Phoenix is one of the most played Link monsters in the game, precisely because it just has the ability to destroy one spell or trap card in the field. And that card requires you to discard a card from your hand in order to use its effect. So. If you have the ability to go into a rank 3 monster, Super Quantal Mech Beast Grand Pulse is kind of like a cheaper version of Nightmare Phoenix, just without all the versatility of Nightmare Phoenix, but can be used in pretty much any deck. Grand Pulse also has some other effects which are only really relevant within its archetype, and we're only talking about the card for its generic use. Which I should probably mention one other thing here, the card cannot attack unless it has Xyz materials, so it does have a downside, but generally, this card doesn't survive that long anyway, and it's useful even if you're only able to use the effect a single time. And at number 9, we have number 49, Fortune Tune. This is another rare quality Xyz monster. In fact, most of this cards in this list are rare quality, with only two of them being normal quality. So I'll stop mentioning that for the other spots on this list right here, and just focus on their effects since it's just as easy to get rare quality cards as it is normal quality. And what Fortune Tune does, is it's a rank 3 monster with generic materials just like the previous card and has the passive effect where it cannot be targeted by card effects. And also, if this card would be destroyed by battle or card effect, you can detach one of its materials instead. So when this card hits the field, it stays on the field for a while because it's kind of hard to get rid of with being fully target immune and having two materials baseline in order to detach to save itself from two battles or non-targeting destruction effects. Although, it does have very low defense at only 900, so chances are it will be destroyed by battle eventually. Additionally, during your standby phase you get to gain 500 life points if it's on your side of the field. And if this card is finally sent from the field to the graveyard, 
You can target two level 3 monsters in your graveyard, shuffle both of them into the deck in order to return this card to your extra deck. Now, normally this effect is not why people play this card, but it definitely gives some benefits if you go into the grind game, because you can constantly reset Fortune Tune back into the deck, while also giving you two of your resources back into your main deck if you're playing a deck that wants to search them out later or a lot or something. Fortune Tune is one of the few cards on this list that actually sees competitive play in just normal decks, and isn't replaced by higher rarity cards later. And at number 8, we have number 52, Diamond Crab King. This is a rank 4 monster with generic materials, i.e. two level 4 monsters of any kind, and simply has the effect where you can detach one of its materials in order to set its attack to 3000, and change its defense to 0, which basically swaps its attack and defense. This will last until the end of the turn, and if this card attacks, it's changed a defense position at the end of the battle phase. And it also has a negative effect, where if this card is attacked, it's changed to attack position at the end of the damage step if it doesn't have any XE's materials. Now before this video, I didn't even know it had that negative effect, because I've never actually seen it last that long. Generally, what this card is used for is to come out on the field and have a 3000 attack beat stick with only two level 4 monsters. That way you can swing for game with 3000 points of damage, or attack over one of your opponent's monsters. And it was really good back in the day when that kind of mattered for getting rid of towers. But nowadays we have cards like Utopia the Lightning or Utopia Double, which are able to beat for more damage and have the same materials as Diamond Crab King. However, both of those cards are of much higher rarities. So Diamond Crab King definitely serves its purpose as being the beat stick for low rarity rank 4 Xyz monsters, and is useful even if there are more useful cards that you can replace it with later. And at number 7, we have number 70, Malevolent Sin. I'm sure a lot of Duel Links players recognize this card as it's the most played rank 4 monster in the game over there. But in Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel, it's actually of only normal rare quality, the lowest quality in the game. Which is kind of hilarious because the card is actually pretty decent. The card has generic materials just like the previous spot, and has the effect where you can detach one of its materials in order to banish one of your opponent's monsters until the next standby phase. And if this card attacks, at the end of the damage step it gains 300 attack and increases its rank by 3, which is a permanent increase. So the more this thing attacks, the stronger and stronger it gets. Where after its first attack, it will end its turn at 2700 attack. So it has a pretty decent stat line for a monster that's able to temporarily get rid of one of your opponent's cards for a turn. Or just remove their last card in the field so that you can attack for a game. There's also lots of cards you can bring up on top of it later with its increased rank. But for the most part, you can just ignore that because the card is good by itself. Or if you want some more Duel Links tech, Digital Bug Corbage is also of the rare quality Master Duel, so that could be an option to rank up on top of Malevolent Sin immediately in order to spin one of your opponent's defense position monsters. And at number 6, we have Proxy Dragon. For the first four spots of this list, I just went over a couple of Xyz monsters of two of the more popular ranks in the game, but for the rest of this list, we're going to go over Link monsters, which are a lot more generic and useful in more decks. And Proxy Dragon is definitely generic, as it's a Link 2 monster with just any two monsters as its materials, which means it's an excellent card to use as a Link Climbing tool if you're trying to convert tokens into effect monsters. As a lot of Link monsters have clauses where they need an effect monster specifically as one of their materials. And the effect of Proxy Dragon is, if any card you control on your side of the field will be destroyed by a card effect, you can destroy one monster this card points to instead. And this means your spell or trap cards too. So if you have something like a field spell that you really want to protect, you can have Proxy Dragon just point to a monster for some added protection. It also protects multiple cards. So if your opponent tries to Harpy's Feather Dust to your back row, Proxy Dragon can be used in order to stop the effect. However, it can't be used to stop all of your monsters from being destroyed, since it can't destroy a monster to prevent the destruction of your monsters if that monster is going to be destroyed as well. And also, it can't really be used as a combo starter since its arrows only point left and right. So you need to have another Link monster on the field that allows it to be in the main monster zone before its effect can be live in the first place so that it can start protecting your cards. However, the best use of this card is just as a Link climbing tool to technically have an effect monster, and it's better than not having a generic Link 2 monster to go into, which situationally has a useful effect. And at number 5, we have Steel Star Regulator. This is a Link 3 monster which requires any three non-Link monsters as its materials, which does mean you can use tokens to bring it out. And it has the effect where it gains extra attack equal to the combined original levels slash ranks of the monsters used for its Link summon times 100, which it kind of needs because it only has 1000 attack baseline. Then it has the activatable effect on the field where once per turn you can target one non-Link monster your opponent controls that has an attack less than or equal to this card's attack 
where you can then destroy that card and then inflict damage to your opponent equal to half that monster's attack if one of the monsters used as this card's link materials was an XC's monster. Either way, you get to destroy a monster. The only benefit you get for specifically using an XC's monster is just doing a little bit of extra burn damage. So basically, with Steel Star Regulator, you have a card which can destroy a monster and potentially have a very high attack power value if, for whatever reason, you use a whole bunch of really high-level monsters to bring it out. However, there's generally better uses of three monsters to go into a Link monster. So, it's not the best thing in the world, but does give you emergency monster destruction if you really need it in low rarity. And is a nice option to just have being in your extra deck, rather than not having the option to have a monster destruction effect, if you can't get a higher rarity monster to do something better. And at number 4, we have Puzzlomino, the drop-in deleter. This is a Link 2 monster whose materials are just any two monsters of different levels. And this card has the effect to basically destroy one of your opponent's monsters, but only if you're able to fulfill the conditions where you special summon a monster face up to a zone this card points to, then you have the option to change that monsters from levels 1 to 8, where you choose the same level as the monster your opponent controls that you want to destroy, because it has another effect where you can target two monsters in the field that have the same level, one from each player's side of the field, in order to destroy both of those targets. And you can only use each of its effects once per turn. So, Puzzlomino is just another extract monster which gives you the option to maybe destroy a monster on the field, just like the previous spot on this list. Although it might be easier to use in the previous spot depending on what kind of deck you're playing, but both of them basically require three monsters to have a monster destruction effect anyway, as you have to destroy one of your monsters in order to destroy one of your opponents. And only if that monster is below level 8, which means it has to have a level in the first place. So, no XEs or Link monster destructions. Now, again, not the best destruction effect in the game, but it is a destruction effect on an extra deck monster that most decks can go into pretty easily, and it only requires two monsters to start the whole thing up. It could also just allow you to manipulate the level of one monster that you special summon to a zone it points to, which could be used for something else if you don't want to use it to destroy cards. And at number three, we have Codebreaker Virus Swordsman. This is a Link 2 monster with 2300 attack, which is kind of high for a Link 2 monster as they don't usually go above 2000. And it has some extra effects of its special summon while it's co-linked, but the main reason to use this card is because of its other effect where, if this card is destroyed by your opponent, you get to special summon from your graveyard during the end phase, but then banish it when it leaves the field. So, you can turn two monsters into a 2300 attack beat stick, who's able to float back if it's destroyed by your opponent, which is just some nice longevity on a card. It's probably not as useful as being able to destroy one of your opponent's cards as a link monster, but it is pretty easy to bring out as it only requires two effect monsters. It does have a downward pointing arrow which can be useful for link plays, and it has an extra effect that allows you to special summon a specific card from your deck if it's co-linked, which is an option to climb in link three or higher monsters if you want to play a Garnet. More importantly, it floats and can stay around for a little bit, and a lot of effects in the modern metagame do destroy cards by card effects, so you can expect the floating effect to be live more often than not. And you don't have to jump through hoops in order to use its effect. It just comes back if it's destroyed during the end phase and has a decent sized body at 2300 attack. And at number two, we have Cross Sheep. This is a Link 2 monster which just requires two monsters of different names. So one of the easiest type of Link 2 monsters to go into. And it has an effect where, if a monster is special summoned to one of the zones this card points to, you get to apply one of its four effects based on the type of monster that's summoned there. Where if you summoned a ritual monster to the zone, you get to draw two cards, then discard two. A fusion monster allows you to special summon a level 4 or lower monster from your graveyard. A synchro monster will gain all of your monsters 700 attack permanently. And an XC's monster will make all of your opponent's monsters lose 700 attack permanently. Now, Cross Sheep is actually played quite a bit because its fusion effect is really easy to activate in a lot of different kinds of decks. And it's just a straight plus 1 in card advantage being able to special summon any level 4 or lower monster from your graveyard. And is a great extension tool. So if you use something like Instant Fusion to just cheat out a fusion monster to a zone that Cross Sheep is pointing to, you then get another monster from your graveyard, and then you can go into a Link 4 monster with all the monsters on the field. And since Cross Sheep is one of the few cards on this list that's just used normally in the meta, it's obviously going to get a high spot on this list even if it's not as generic as some of the ones I've talked about previously. And at number one, we have Power Code Talker. This is a Link 3 monster which just requires any three monsters as its materials, which is a distinction that matters because a lot of good Link 3 monsters allow you to use two plus monsters as materials, where generally Link 3 monsters that require exactly three 
are not as good in comparison. However, Power Coat Talker does have a good effect where it's kind of worth going into, because its first effect is, once per turn you can just negate the effects of a monster on the field until the end of the turn. Additionally, it has another effect which is admittedly not as good but still somewhat useful, where once per turn if this card battles an opponent's monster, you can tribute one monster this card points to in order to double this monster's attack. So this allows Power Coat Talker to attack over anything with less than 4600 attack, which is a vast majority of monsters in the game. But you do have to tribute one of your monsters to do it, which is kind of a strict requirement for just doubling the monster of the attack for a short while. Especially since the card already requires exactly three monsters to come out in the first place. Although the unconditional monster negate once per turn is pretty good, to the point where the card is actually played in just normal meta decks and happens to be generic and is usable in pretty much any deck too, because even though it requires three monsters, those three monsters can be of any type, including tokens. And also, Power Coat Talker is only of a normal rarity card, like number 70 Malevolent Sin, which definitely makes Power Coat Talker one of the best of the normal rarity cards, and also one of the better generic extract monsters of just the low rarity distinction. Counter Traps are a distinct type of trap card compared to regular continuous traps. While they largely revolve around countering specific effects and cards, they also are the only cards that work at spell speed 3, where only a counter trap can respond to another counter trap. This makes counter traps uniquely powerful in Yu-Gi-Oh, and today we'll be going over some of the best counter traps ever. And kicking off this list at number 10, we have Curse Seal of Forbidden Spell. This card's effect lets you negate the activation of a spell card and destroy it at the cost of discarding one spell card. If you do successfully destroy the card, your opponent cannot activate spells with that name for the rest of the duel. Curse Seal the Forbidden Spell is one of the most targeted kind of counter traps. It's very limited compared to most of the other entries that will be on this list, as it can only hit spell cards and come saddled with a rather hefty specific discard cost to use. But no other counter trap replicates Curse Seal's ability to completely lock an opponent out of potentially crucial spells for the rest of the game. Curse Seal was originally designed to lock out an opponent from recycling and reusing incredibly powerful DM staples from early on in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. Cards like Pot of Greed, Graceful Charity, Monster Reborn, and basically every other game-dominating spell card from that era could quickly break a game wide open when recycled with cards like Magician of Faith or Dark Magician of Chaos. Curse Seal was not an uncommon card to see even back then, as despite the discard being even more costly in the resource-managing metagame of the mid-2000s, a resolved Pot of Greed was just as bad as the minus one you inflicted on yourself and a second Pot of Greed would be even worse. Once many of those busted staples were banned, Curse Seal saw a complete drop off in play, but not for long. Its unique focused effect earned it multiple resurgences throughout history. With the advent of Diamond Dew Turbo, a deck that revolved around Destiny Hero Diamond Dew to spam the effects of powerful spell cards multiple times, Curse Seal found itself being played again. Since a deck that was all spells really hated being locked out of its best ones, Curse Seal was a common main and side deck option then. Years later, when Spellbucks became the other dominant deck alongside Dragon Rulers, Curse Seal found itself seeing play again. It was very crippling against the deck, as cutting players off of Spellbook of Judgment or Spellbook of Fate for the rest of the game was typically game over, especially in the mirror. Fast forward to 2016, where Monarchs became a major meta deck all about incredible draw power and digging through multiple spells a turn with cards like Chicken Game and Pantheism of the Monarchs, another spell-based strategy that Curse Seal really shined against. Finally, and most recently, Curse Seal was the number one going first answer to Mystic Mind decks. These stall strategies really couldn't win without resolving a Mystic Mine, and Burn variants couldn't win without Colder and the Old Man resolving. So locking them out of those spells for the rest of the game locked up that whole match. Curse Seal the Forbidden Spell is one of the best ways to target a problematic spell in any format and make sure it's no longer a problem for you, and that's been quite the useful role for this card for nearly 20 years. Next up at number 9 on this list, we have 9 Pillars of the Yang Zing. This card states that when a spell, trap, or monster effect is activated, you can negate the activation, shuffle the card back into the deck, then destroy one Yang Z card you control. Nine Pillars is the first archetypal counter trap on this list, and is one of the best ones in the history of the game. The playability of an archetype specific counter trap is largely based on three things. Is the effect good? Is the deck it's in competent? And how easy is the counter trap to search? Well, Nine Pillars has a great effect as an Omni Negate that shuffles, but having to destroy a monster you control to do so would usually be a huge downside. This is generally a positive thing in Yangzing, but Yangzing as a standalone archetype isn't particularly great, making Nine Pillars a bit questionable if you were only playing Yangzing. But that's not such a big deal when you see the car that makes it so easy to search, Denglong first of the Yangzing. Denglong is a completely generic level 5 synchro, meaning any deck that can set that up can summon Denglong and use its effect to easily search 9 pillars. So the list of decks that use 9 pillars goes from one middling archetype in Yang Zing to hundreds of different decks that can synchro summon level 5s. 
Danglong also has two other effects. First, you can send a worm from your deck to the graveyard and modulate Danglong's level accordingly. Second, when Danglong leaves the field, say by being destroyed by 9 peelers, you can special summon a Yang Xing from your deck. Danglong could send a Qi Wen Light of the Yang Xing to the graveyard with its first effect, and Qi Wen's effect would summon itself when Danglong gets destroyed. Then, upon being destroyed, Danglong could summon Bian, Earth of the Yang Xing. Bian could synchro on your opponent's turn, and make this synchro summon monster immune to being destroyed by battle. This paired nicely to synchro summon a Herald of the Arc Light, a Floodgate and an Omni to get in its own right, whose major weakness was its low stats and being able to run over in battle too easily. All of this power on the back of 9 pillars being searchable and using its cost to set up an entirely separate combo to create another disruption. It wasn't long before Denglung found its way in the ban list for these interactions, spelling the end of 9 pillars seeing large amounts of competitive play. But the time in the spotlight marked 9 pillars as one of the best counter traps ever, and it was at the bar for future archetype counter traps going forward. And at number 8 on this list, we have Solemn Scolding. Scolding is part of the Solemn series of counter traps, which are the best known counter traps in Yu-Gi-Oh! Scolding's effect is, if it is the only spell or trap card you have set, you can pay 3,000 light points when a monster is summoned, or a spell trap or monster effect is activated, and negate that summon or activation and destroy that card. Solemn Scolding has arguably the most powerful effect of any of the Solemn cards, and nearly any other counter trap card. It basically negates anything your opponent can do that can be responded to, putting its power level above and beyond your usual Omni Negate that can only negate effects and activations. That said, the limitations of needing to be the only set card you have make it much less friendly with back overline decks that typically want powerful counter traps. This has earned Solemn Scolding a long history of being a one copy inclusion in decks that run a variety of trap cards for interactions, usually alongside other Solemn cards in higher numbers, as well as more generic traps. You never wanted to draw two Solemn Scoldings in those decks, since having two set meant you could never activate either. But having one Scolding was great since you could just save it as your last set card to activate. Its incredible range of cards and effects and negates meant it was rarely ever dead when pigeonholed into being your last activated card, so long as you had 3,000 life points to spare. Solemn Scolding does stand out as the best counter trap to play when your deck has no other background directions and only wants to include a single, powerful counter trap for specific reasons. While Scolding often plays second fiddle among the Solemn cards, the one time it got to shine out of all of its fellow counter traps was during Spiral's Tier 0 era, thanks to Spiral's needing an answer to Ghost Reaper and Winter Cherries, and being a largely monster-based combo that had no need for other back row. This was a perfect situation for Scolding, as when you only wanted one trap card to set, Psalm Scolding was almost always the best option. Still, even after Spiral's Fall from Grace, it wasn't unusual to see decks even in faster-paced Yu-Gi-Oh! still include that one copy of Psalm Scolding, due to just how much more powerful it was than any other trap for that one slot. And at number 7, we have Orcus Crescendo. This card states that when a spell trap or monster effect is activated while you control an Orcus Link monster, you can negate the activation and if you do, banish that card. Its second effect lets you banish Crescendo from your graveyard to add a Dark Machine monster that's either banished or in your deck to your hand. You can only use one of these effects per turn, and Crescendo also has the unusual Orcus limitation of locking you to only being able to spell up in Dark Machines for the rest of the turn. Orcus Crescendo is another archetypal counter trap, so let's ask the question, how good is it in its archetype? how easy to search, and how good is it as a card. Well, Orcus is one of the best decks of all time, so that's an easy one to check off. Crescendo is also trivially easy to search in the deck. Orcus' main link monster, Galatea the Orcus Automaton, is pretty much the first extra deck play Orcus goes into, and its effect searches out any Orcus spell or trap and sets it to your field. And while this was often used to grab an orchestrated babble, Orcus Crescendo was always a good option because Galatea naturally fulfilled the requirement of having an Orcus link monster on board. Crescendo's effect as an Omni Negate is great, and an Omni Negate that banishes makes it similarly as good as Nine Pillars of the Yang Xing, as it can play around graveyard effects. Speaking of Nine Pillars, Crescendo has a very similar history to Nine Pillars thanks to another banned and busted X deck monster, Nightmare Mermaid. Thanks to Nightmare Mermaid, any deck that could create a generic Link 2 in the form of either Nightmare Cerberus or Nightmare Phoenix could go into Mermaid. Use Mermaid to summon Orcus Nightmare, and then link the two off for Galatea and search Crescendo. And a Link 2 for free Omni Negate was even easier to access than a Synchro 5 like Denglong, and nearly every deck while Mermaid was legal ran this small setup. But what also set Orcus Crescendo apart was just how incredibly good its secondary effect is. Being an easy to search Omni Negate is great, but being able to banish itself on your follow up turn to add a Dark Machine, like say Orcus Harp Horror, and get your plays going again was just as nice. The fact that you can't activate both effects of Crescendo the same turn does make it a little awkward sometimes but it was rarely that important as you usually would just use Crescendo to negate something on your opponent's turn, then activate it on your turn afterwards for the free plus one. While there were playable archetype counter traps before Crescendo, Crescendo really pushed the boundaries for what kind of effect a card that's already a good, generically searchable counter trap could have 
with its powerful Omni Negate and easy advantage search effect. And at number 6 on this list, we have Solemn Warning. This card states that if a monster would be summoned, whether normally or by the activation of a spell, trap, or monster, you can pay 2,000 light points, negate the summon or activation, and destroy the card. Solemn Warning is another counter trap in the Solemn family, and is the most focused effect of all of them. Solemn Warning was designed specifically to stop summoning, and was the first Solemn card to be released after Solemn Judgment. Solemn Warning is the lowest power level Solemn card, as it was meant to emulate Solemn Judgment's anti-summon capabilities without the same generic power Judgment has against all spells and traps. Solemn Warning was meant to be a fixed version of Solemn Judgment, which had been limited a little over a year before Warning's printing because of just how powerful and heavily played Judgment was. That said, Solemn Warning immediately saw tons of play. By its 2010 release date, Yu-Gi-Oh! was already moving towards more extra deck reliant and monster combo based gameplay in the Synchro era, so a card that punished over commitment into extra deck summoning fit perfectly in this time frame, and became better as more and more powerful extra deck monsters and summoning mechanics were created. Solemn Warning saw an absolute ton of play in release, to the point where it was quickly semi-limited and later limited over the course of the first three years because of the extreme abundance players max in it out. Special Summoning has been the name of the game in Yu-Gi-Oh for years, and life point costs are nearly always worth paying if they can stop your opponent from setting up their strategies. While Warning might compare unfavorably to its sibling cards in power level, it might be the most played Solemn card in history due to its early release. Judgment's strength wasn't picked up on until later in its lifetime, where it saw pretty quick limitations and even banning, and Warning's long-term existence meant basically every single deck that played any number of trap cards was likely maxing out Solemn Warnings for years. Even with Psalm Skullin's release in 2014, because it was only good as a singular copy of most decks, Warning was still more heavily played. Solemn Warning saw continuous play from 2010 all the way until 2017, where the increased speed of the game made counter traps and traps in general a less solid main deck strategy. There are hundreds, maybe even thousands of event topping deck lists throughout history that were sporting as many Psalm Warnings as you could play. And even in the high paced Link era, the few decks that still wanted some backroll disruption were still occasionally playing Solemn Warning like an Alter Geist and Invoked. Solemn Warning may be intended to be a lower power level fixed version of Solemn Judgment, but was still incredible in its own right. Next up on this list at number 5, we have Salomon Great Roar. This trap is your usual Omni Negate, negating the activation of any spell, trap, or monster effect and destroying the card, so long as you control a Salomon Great Link monster. Also, once in the graveyard, if a Salomon Great Link monster is linked summoned to your field using monsters with the same name as material, you can set this card to your field from the graveyard, but banish it when it leaves the field. And you can only use one of these effects per turn and only once that turn. Salomon Great Roar is the archetypal counter trap of Salomon Greats. As previously mentioned, archetypal counter traps are really only as good as their power level, the deck they're in, and how easy the card is to search. Salamagrate Roar is very easy to consistently get to. Salamagrate's main starter, Salamagrate Gazelle, can send Roar to the graveyard with its effect. With Gazelle itself being easy to get with the various search tools Salamagrate has, like Signet Mining, Salamagrate Mirage Dalio, and Salamagrate Circle. Though you do need to get it out of the graveyard, that is also fairly easy with Salamagrate Sunlight Wolf, who has the effect to add a Salamagrate spell or trap card from your graveyard to your hand if you summon Sunlight Wolf using another Sunlight Wolf. This Link Summon using a monster with the same name was Salmagrate's main gimmick, but was pretty much always online as Salmagrate Sanctuary enabled this and was searchable off of Salmagrate's Link 1 monster, Salmagrate Bay Links. So, it's easy to access, but how good was Roar? Well, a completely standard Omni Negate is pretty good, though it doesn't quite match up to Crescendo or Nine Pillars, since it only destroys after negating instead of shuffling or banishing. But it's still great and more than makes up for that shortcut with its secondary effect. Roar's ability to set itself from the graveyard is obscenely powerful. Salmon Great largely relies on being a controlling, grind-based deck, and does this by constantly occurring incidental advantage and recycling its own cards. The fact that you don't even need to use Sunlight Wolf to add it to your hand, instead just using its secondary self setting effect, means you can double up on your interactions by using Sunlight Wolf to add a different piece of interaction, like Salmon Great Rage or adding back Salmon Great Circle for follow-up next turn. Even if you don't do that, being able to use Roar on your opponent to stop their plays, then reset it with its own effect on turn 3 to continue overwhelming your opponent gives it a huge advantage over other counter traps by functionally replacing itself for free. It's similar to Orca's Crescendo as a free plus 1, but recycling an Omni Negate is so powerful even compared to adding a starter for your next combo. Salma Great was a really good deck for quite some time, even still seeing fringe low tier play to this day, despite the limitations to Salma Great Gazelle. Salmagrate Roar's status as one of the best archetype counter traps is a huge part of both how powerful the deck is and the core identity of how Salmagrate plays. Continuing this list at number 4, we have Tier Limits Crime. This card states that when a spell, trap, or monster effect is activated, you can negate the activation, shuffle the card into the deck, and then send one monster from your hand to the graveyard, so as long as you control a Tier Limits monster or a Visa Starfrost. 
Also, when Chillmate Crime is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can return one banished Chillmate monster from your banished pile back to your hand. Chillmate's Crime is another archetypal counter trap. So let's go through the checklist again. Is the deck it's in good? Well, Tier Laments is arguably the greatest deck and archetype in the history of the game. So, that's an easy guess. Crime is quite powerful as an omni negate that shuffles, just like Nine Pillars. But its main strengths compared to other counter traps is how easy it is to search, its secondary effect, and even its condition. Tier Laments are known for mass milling their own deck, which might often make searching a specific one off counter trap a problem. What if you mill it? Well, Tier Laments has access to Tier Laments Heartbeat, which they can mill or intentionally send to the graveyard to add Crime back. More importantly, the deck typically ran multiple copies of Tier Limit Scream, which when sent to the graveyard adds any Tier Limit Trap card from your deck to your hand. And of course, if you have nothing better to search for, when you inevitably summon Tier Limit Kalos, it can add a Tier Limit card to your hand, including Crime. So Crime was powerful and had several different ways of searching out, while it just so happened to be an arguably the most powerful archetype ever. It definitely passes the test. Well, if all of that wasn't enough, Crime's secondary effect is also awesome. The main ways decks had to combat Tier Limits milling and fusing from the graveyard was by using cards that banish monsters from the graveyard to stop their fusions, like DD Crow or the Bistials. They could use this to snipe Kid Kalos to prevent your opponent from summoning Tier Limits Root Kalos, or just hit an early main deck Tier Limit that was trying to use its graveyard fusion effect. A correctly timed banish could not only stop your turn, but cut off the entire Tier Limits engine recursive capability. But Crime helped to deal with those problems by getting milled and either recurring the banished chillment monster to your hand, or recycling a crucial banished extra deck chillment. And if all of this wasn't enough, the so-called cost of chillment's crime of having a monster sent from your hand to the graveyard just lets you send a card to trigger its effect, like your own chillments or maybe even an Ishizu monster. This would, in turn, let you counter your opponent's cards and just go into an entire combo line on your opponent's turn. Similar to how Denglong and Nine Pillars interacted, but with a way higher ceiling and playing much better cards enable it than the middling Yang Zings. A lot of archetypes have a searchable counter trap. What sets Crime apart is that not only is it a good card in that category, it even comes equipped with an incredibly useful secondary effect that shores up one of the deck's few weaknesses and a cost that's actually just a combo enabler. Easily one of the best counter traps ever. And taking the number three spot on this list, we have Solemn Strike. This card states that when a monster would be special summoned or a monster effect is activated, you can pay 1500 life points and negate the summoner activation and destroy that card. Solemn Strike was the most recently released Solemn card and is widely considered the best of the Solemn Judgment retrains. Released in 2016, by this point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, monster combo strategies were the name of the game. And cards like Solemn Scolding and Solemn Warning, while still good, just weren't versatile enough to really keep up. Then came Solemn Strike, a card designed in a similar fashion to Solemn Warning in that it was meant to stamp down the extreme special summon spamming in the game. But Solemn Strike's update came with a monster effect negation, giving decks a back row option that could stand up to the dangerous monster effects that could activate anywhere, rather than just countering summons like you would with Judgment or Warning. This was a big deal, as it wouldn't be long before more and more meta-defining hand traps like Ash Blossom and Joy Spring were filling up deck slots. And a card like Solemn Strike was one of the few answers to monster hand traps. Solemn Strike seemed especially geared towards giving players more options in the heyday of the Pendulum era, as it could both prevent important monster effects Pendulum decks needed to hit a critical mass of material, or completely negate a huge Pendulum summon. Solemn Strike was also a great card in Pendulum decks, as their access to Guiding Ariadne let them reveal three counter traps from the deck and let your opponent choose one to add to your hand, with at the time banned into Solemn Judgment and limitations of Solid Warning, Revealing three Solemn Strikes to get yourself a powerful piece of interaction was an incredibly popular and effective strategy in Pendulum decks that use Ariadne. Even outside of Pendulum dominant formats, Solemn Strike found its home in hundreds of topping deck lists as just the best anti monster Solemn card around. Even Solemn Judgment, long considered the best generic counter trap, couldn't quite cover Solemn Strike's niche, since it couldn't negate monster effects. Only Scolding was similar, but Strike's lack of limitations and lower life point costs made it a standout well above Scolding. Solemn Strike is one of the absolute best counter traps ever, and only some insanely powerful cards are designed by people who probably didn't realize what they were doing could compete with it. And speaking of which, at number two on this list, we have Solemn Judgment. This trap lets you pay half your life points in to get the summon of a monster or activation of a spell trap card and destroy that card. Solemn Judgment is the father of all powerful counter traps. Obviously, it's the progenitor of the rest of the Solemn cards, and to this day, it still outshines all of them. Solemn Judgment's effect is so incredibly powerful that, despite being an over 20 year old card, it still holds up to this day as an amazing card. Basically any back row deck that exists plays this card when it's legal. Even decks like Trap Tricks or Labyrinth, who primarily revolve around non-counter trap cards, 
still tend to max out on judgment as a generic way to answer back row hit cards like Lightning Storm, while still being incredibly versatile in general. The funny thing about Psalm Judgment is, despite being so outstanding, it did not see a lot of play for many years after its first release. Players early on tended to overvalue life points and tempo, and even if it could negate something like a Pot of Greed to prevent falling behind the card advantage, that 4000 life point cost attached to it while only breaking even on total card advantage scared early players. It took years for the competitive scene to realize that just having a card that can completely shut down any critical play your opponent could muster was unbelievably good. It would go plus one in any situation with tribute summoning, which was fairly common back then with cards like Jinzo and the early Monarchs seeing lots of play. It was even one of the few cards that played around cards that abused Yu-Gi-Oh's early priority system, where players can activate even slow effect cards before their opponent could respond after summoning a monster. So cards like Chaos Sorcerer or Blackluster Soldier Envoy of the Beginning could use their banished effects before you could respond with a more typical piece of disruption. But not if you negated their summon entirely with Judgment. Once players figured out how good Judgment was, it was an automatic 3 of in basically every deck for quite some time. This led Konami to limiting it and eventually banning it, though it was unbanned years later. Retrospectively, we can acknowledge Solemn Judgment was right up there with many of the other powerful DM staples of its time, and likely should have been an automatic 3 of inclusion in any deck back then. Which is why players do just that in legacy formats, and its power level has only gotten better since. Despite Konami scaling back just how powerful effects were for a time, Power Creep is the name of the game in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, and Solemn Judgment has aged as well as any other counter trap could. Even its life point cost has aged well. While it might initially seem like a half life point cost is terrible compared to other Solemns, usually eating 4,000 or starting 8,000 life points would be the most expensive one. That's actually an advantage. Unlike every other Solemn card, Judgment is usable no matter what your life point situation is. You can always pay half your life points, no matter how low you get. Meaning, it's active in a larger variety of game states than its successors, Solemns, and their flat life point costs. Solemn Judgment really is the alpha and the omega of counter traps. It doesn't quite cover every single possibility, as mentioned with Solemn Strike, but it's just so good and so ubiquitous that no other counter trap cards really match it when it comes to setting a card and using it and stopping your opponent's best play. Its only real weakness is that you do still have to set it and wait a turn before using it. And speaking of, taking the number one spot on this list, we have Red Reboot. This card states that when your opponent activates the trap card, you can negate that activation and set the trap card face down, and then your opponent can set another trap card of their choice from their deck. But for the rest of the turn after Reboot resolves, your opponent can't activate any more trap cards. The most important part of Red Reboot is you can activate it from your hand by paying half your life points. Red Reboot is number one on this list because it just does something that no other counter trap does. It plays from the hand and sets up a lingering floodgate. You don't have to set it, and usually it's worse to do so as life point cost is often not a huge consideration, and it's better if it's not susceptible to back row removal. Red Reboot is the only counter trap card currently on the ban list, and for good reason. While on a historical level, you might consider Royal Decree as the anti-trap floodgate counterpart to Imperial Order. Red Reboot is really the most powerful anti-trap card ever, and is better at Royal Decree's job than Royal Decree. The fact that it shuts down traps for the rest of the turn makes it function just like all the other Floodgate traps that have earned bans, and is in some ways worse thanks to leaving the Floodgate as a lingering effect where you can't interact with it. And with the speed of the modern game, that turn 1 of Floodgating is all you need, as you can just clear both the traps that got set and push for lethal. When Red Reboot was at 3, it was practically impossible to play any trap-centric strategies. It completely shut down all of them with little counterplay thanks to its spell speed 3 nature. Only other counter traps like Solemn Judgment could contest it, and because Red Reboot had no hard ones per turn, nothing was stopping from a player from chaining a second Red Reboot to that. It wasn't long before it became apparent that three Red Reboots existing in every side deck did too good of a job of pushing every trap deck out of the format, so Reboot was eventually put to one to ease that problem. And one copy, it was still a very popular inclusion in side decks, as Red Reboot wasn't only just good against trap-centric decks. Tons of modern Yu-Gi-Oh decks and archetypes rely on their main deck traps. Tear Limits has Tear Limit Suliac and Tear Limit Crime. Trap Brigade relies heavily on Trap Brigade Revolt. Sword Soul uses Sword Soul Blackout. And the list goes on and on. A majority of the newer archetypes Konami creates have some important archetypal trap card that Red Reboot can squash with little to no recourse against it because of its spell speed 3 nature. Red Reboot single-handedly invalidates the entire design space of traps, both as a primary strategy and even as part of other decks. While putting it to one copy lowered the oppressive nature it had over trap-heavy strategies, all that did was make Red Reboot an incredibly sacky card in its good matchups that still had no consistent answers. 
The woes of trap players were eventually heard, and Konami brought the full ban hammer down on this combination floodgate, hand trap, and counter trap. A testament to the most oppressive counter trap in history. Just a little over three years ago, we looked at 10 cards that could never come off the ban list without some kind of errata. And within those years, only two cards from that list have been freed. Spell with Good Judgment with no changes and is now limited, and Miyakura is at three with its new errata. However, the Yu-Gi-Oh! ban list contains a lot more than just 10 cards that can never be on ban. So today we're going to look at 10 more cards that will never come off the list without some kind of change, why they were banned in the first place, and why they couldn't come off today. And growing into number 10, we have Fiber Jar, a level 3 flip monster belonging to the Jar series of monsters, and the only flip monster in the game that's currently banned now that Cyber Jar has come to 1. However, Fiber Jar isn't banned because its effect is good. It's just because it's annoying. Because when Fiber Jar is flipped face up, both players shuffle every card from their hand, field, and graveyard back into the deck, and then draw 5 cards essentially resetting the duel back to the first turn, wiping both players' fields and graveyards of resources. Back in 2004, this effect was quite strong as it could be used to clear away your opponent's field in a format where removal options weren't as available. And it being a flip monster didn't matter as much because it was likely your opponent was going to try to beat over it by battle. So if you were losing a duel while your opponent had overextended into a lot of powerful boss monsters, or had a bunch of back row, you could set Fiber Jar to reset their advantage back to the beginning of the duel so you'd have a fighting chance. But even back in 2004, where this effect was strong, it wasn't the reason why it was banned. It was instead because it was capable of stalling out a duel for way longer than it needed to be. Now, there are plenty of stall and stun tools that exist that can slow the game down to a crawl. But these cards usually advance the game state in some way, either by restricting your opponent or by interrupting their plays. In the case of Fiber Jar, it doesn't advance the game state at all, and stalls in an unproductive way where both players have to basically play out the entire duel again. This is a nightmare for Yu-Gi-Oh! events, as now duels that would have only lasted 15 or 20 minutes end up lasting double the amount of time after Fiber Jar has resolved. Now, in the modern era, it's a lot less likely that Fiber Jar is ever going to have a chance to resolve. It being a flip monster makes it incredibly vulnerable to removal, and it's likely your opponent is going to have a negate up in the battle phase, so if it were unbanned, it likely wouldn't be having the same stall capabilities it did back in the day. But with cards like Self-Destruct Button banned in the TCG, it's been made pretty clear that cards that are designed to stall at matches for no reason are mostly looked down upon. So even though Fiber Jar is pretty bad when compared to most other cards in the ban list, it's not likely to come off anytime soon. Overall, Fiber Jar isn't a very good card in the modern day, but its ability to stall at games and make duels and events really annoying makes it a permanent feature on the ban list that probably won't ever be coming back without changing how the card works entirely. And at number 9, we have the Forceful Sentry. A normal spell card with a simple but devastatingly powerful hand rip effect. Whenever you activate Forceful Sentry, you get to look at your opponent's hand and choose one card from it to shuffle back into their deck. In part 1, we talked about how strong cards that discard from your opponent's hand are, and why cards like Delinquent Duo, Trap Dust Shoot, and Gumblar Dragon are all on the ban list. Because every one of these cards has the potential of sniping out your opponent's best playmakers before they have the opportunity to use them. And Sentry is one of the strongest hand ripping effects ever printed because you actually get to look at your opponent's hand and then choose what card you want to shuffle back into the deck instead of it being random like with Duo. Even back when it was first released, this was crazy because it gave you free hand knowledge while also allowing you to shuffle back your opponent's best cards. So if you saw that they had a Blackluster Soldier, you could put it back while also get an idea about how they're going to be playing in future turns. Or if they had any powerful trap cards that you can now play around. And this effect is even stronger now than it was back then. You see, a huge part of what makes modern Yu-Gi-Oh! so interesting is playing around what could be in your opponent's hand. You could choose to play around Ash Blossom, but still lose to Nibiru. Or you could build a smaller board so evenly matched doesn't hurt as much, but still lose to a Kaiju. But if Forceful Center is legal, you could just immediately activate to scout out your opponent's hand and shuffle back whatever interruption or board breakers they might have, while also gaining knowledge about their hand and what deck they're on, allowing you to build your board to counter exactly what you know they have. Now, technically speaking, this effect is legal in the modern format, since Triple Tactics Talents, a card designed to mirror three banned cards at once, can be used just like Sentry to shuffle back a card in your opponent's hand while also getting free information. But the difference between Sentry and Talents is that in order to use Talents, your opponent has to have used a monster effect during the main phase, giving them a chance to hand trap you before you look at their hand, and if they don't hand trap you or activate any monster effects, it's basically just a dead card in hand. Sentry doesn't have this same kind of restriction meaning that you can just use it to scout out your opponent's hand and shuffle back the best card before you combo off. But, even with the restrictions that talent has, its sentry mode is game-winningly strong, and sometimes feels almost ban-worthy itself. Which is why there's no way that sentry, a card without the same restrictions as talents, is not coming off the ban list anytime soon. And climbing into number 8, we have Level Eater, a level 1 insect monster that wasn't broken at first, but became so after the advent of Link Monsters. 
Like a lot of other banned cards, Level Eater's effect is deceptively simple. Because whenever it's in the graveyard, you can reduce the level of a level 5 or higher monster you control by 1 to Special Summon Level Eater from the graveyard. But while you control it, it can't be tributed for anything other than a tribute summon. Something you might have missed about this effect is that it doesn't have any kind of once per turn on it, making it so that while you control any high level monster, Level Eater represents a ton of material that can be used for extra deck summons. And for a while, this made Level Eater a really strong, but not yet broken, combo piece in a lot of synchro focus strategies that would flood the board with a bunch of high level synchro monsters, while also valuing the free materials that Level Eater provided. The thing that pushed Level Eater over the edge, though, was the subsequent release of Link Monsters and more specifically, the release of Link Karibo. Link Monsters meant that a ton of material that Level Eater represented could actually be put to good use and gave you a lot of insanely strong payoffs. And all of this was enabled because of Link Karibo's printing, which gave you an easy way to instantly put your Level Eater in the graveyard. This was already insanely strong back in 2018. And since then, the variety of Link Boss monsters and their strength has increased dramatically, and now there's some absolutely insane Link payoffs available to any deck playing Level Eater. There's Appalooza, which is both an amazing end board piece and a negate for whatever hand trap your opponent might have, Saryuja to dig deeper into your deck and extend your plays even further, or just Boral Sword and Axis Code in case you don't decay your opponent. In general, while there might have been an era where Level Eater could just exist as a strong card, we're well beyond that point now. And with the link payoffs that are available in the game, as well as a number of ways that Level Eater can easily be put into the graveyard, there's a low chance of it ever coming back. And shocking nobody at number 7 is number 16, Shockmaster an extra deck payoff that can lock your opponent out of the game entirely. Because with Shockmaster, you can detach your material and call a type of card between monster, spell, and trap. If you call spell or trap, your opponent won't be able to activate that type of card you called until the end of the next turn. And if you call monster, they won't be able to activate monster effects for the same duration. Now, it does require a lot of investment to go into, since in order to summon out Shockmaster, you need to commit three level 4 bodies to the board. For a while, this high investment was too much for most decks, so in its early days, Shockmaster didn't see too much competitive play. However, Shockmaster was honestly just waiting to be broken wide open. Because even though it requires a decent amount of monsters to go into, stunning your opponent out of an entire card type for their turn is game winning by itself. So once decks like Windup could consistently get to Shockmaster, the card began to see near instant success because even just a single Shockmaster activation could stop your opponent from playing entirely depending on their deck. And because Shockmaster's effect is a soft once per turn, you could even make multiple Shockmasters stop your opponent from activating any card type, forcing them to pass without doing anything. And in the modern game, Shockmaster would have even more utility, because it's not only just good to stop your opponent's turn, it's also good at stopping their hand traps during your turn. So if you make Shockmaster early in your combo, you could guarantee that your opponent is never going to hit you with an Effect Veiler or Droll while you pop off, which incidentally allows for decks to make nearly unbreakable boards, or sometimes just straight up FTK without fear of having their field tributed. And in the modern game, making Shockmaster isn't really that much of a difficult task anymore, as there are now better and more extenders available that allow you to swarm the field with a ton of level 4 bodies. Overall, Shockmaster is far too strong to ever come off the list with how fast the modern game is. It's not that hard to make anymore, and because of the speed of the current meta, you could just OTK your opponent after they're forced to pass turn without doing anything. So now definitely isn't the right time to unlock the shock. And leading the charge at number 6 is Soul Charge, a reborn spell so good that it even managed to power creep monster reborn. You see, while Monster Reborn can let you summon out any monster from the graveyards, Soul Charge will let you summon up to 5 at once. However, unlike Reborn, Soul Charge actually comes with drawbacks. Its first is that for every monster you summon with Soul Charge, you lose 1000 life points. So, if you summon one monster, you only lose 1000 life points. But if you summon 5, you lose 5000. The second drawback is that you're locked out of the battle phase entirely during the turn you use Soul Charge, putting a stop to any OTK potential with the card. The thing about these drawbacks, though, is that they don't do anything to balance out the card and are relatively minor in comparison to the payoff that summoning 5 monsters from your graveyard is. You see, in general, Reborn effects in Yu-Gi-Oh are some of the strongest types of extension in the game, and allow to use the cards in your graveyard as an extra resource, summoning them back out to either use their on-field effects or just as a free bodies for extra deck plays. And these effects being so strong is a big reason why cards like Premature Burial and Monster Reborn are both on the Forbidden and Limited list. And in the case of Soul Charge, it doesn't just summon back one monster, it can summon five. This made the card absolutely amazing to turn the time it was legal, as long as you had some way to see the graveyard by either using monsters as materials or extra deck plays, or just by filling it up over the course of a duel. Even in cases where you couldn't put five monsters in the grave, Soul Charge was, at worst, a monster reborn that you to pay 1000 life points for, which is still a great effect. And when Link monsters were introduced, Soul Charge was even more busted. Suddenly, it became easier than ever to fill your grave with a bunch of monsters while you climbed into powerful Link bosses. And then, once you finished with your main combo, you could just summon out another 5 monsters with Soul Charge to turn a strong board into an unbreakable one. 
but even without Link monsters, Soul Charge would be overpowered if it ever came back and would likely see play in almost every strategy, since it basically allows a Pendulum Summon from the graveyard for almost no cost. It's honestly a wonder how Soul Charge even got printed in the first place, as even back when it first came out, it was an astonishingly strong card that even managed to match the strength of old goat staples like Pot of Greed and Painful Choice. And powering in at number 5 is Red Reboot, the only counter trap that's currently on the ban list, and for good reason, because Reboot is capable of shutting down a ton of trap-based strategies and winning the game all on its own. You can only activate Reboot whenever your opponent activates a trap card, and it allows you to negate the activation of that trap card and set it back face down. But then your opponent gets a chance to set any other trap card they want from their deck. However, they won't be able to use it on the turn to use Reboot, because for the rest of the turn after Reboot resolves, your opponent can't activate trap cards at all. Both of these effects are quite strong. But if Red Reboot were a regular trap card, it's likely that it never would have seen that much competitive play. But Reboot isn't like a regular trap card, because you don't need to set it to use its effect, because by paying half your life points, you can activate Red Reboot directly from your hand. This made Reboot an absolutely wild card for combo-based strategies when facing any kind of trap deck. Because into a board of a ton of trap cards, drawing Reboot meant that your opponent had basically no way of interacting with your combo. Because the moment they activated any trap card, you could just chain Reboot to lock them out of their entire field making it an insane counter to your opponent's potential floodgates, removal, and interaction, all from a single card, making it very similar to another banned card, Cold Wave. But Red Reboot is arguably even better than Cold Wave because it's a counter trap. This makes it incredibly difficult to interact with, since both players can only respond to it with another counter trap card. So unless your opponent has a Solemn Judgment set, they just can't even chain their other set cards to it. Now, technically speaking, Reboot does have a huge downside where your opponent gets to set any trap card they want from the deck, allowing them to grab the vital engine pieces or floodgates. So if they make it back to their turn, your opponent actually is in a really solid spot. But that's only if they make it back to the turn with their field in one piece. Because when your opponent is under red Reboot, nothing is stopping you from clearing away their field with something like Zeus, or just OTKing your opponent outright for a win. Trap decks have a lot of hate targeted towards them already. But even in spite of that, a ton of trap strategies are still really playable in the modern era, with some of the best decks of the current format relying almost entirely on trap cards. With Reboot at 3, most trap decks are going to be pushed out of the game entirely, since the card has almost zero counterplay. And even if it only came back to 1, like it was previously, it would be a very sacky one of that every combo strategy would play in their sides just for the chance of stealing a free game from control decks. The likes of Evenly Matched and Lightning Storm are also great counters against trap decks, but Red Reboot is the ultimate counter and one that floodgates your opponent out of interacting with you entirely. It would make it a lot harder for trap decks to see competitive success. And summoning into number 4 is Summon Sorceress, one of the earliest truly broken Link monsters. Summon Sorceress is a Link 3 monster that can be made using at least two monsters of the same type, other than tokens, and comes with two effects. When you Link Summon it, you can special summon a monster from your hand to your opponent's field to a zone where Sorceress points to. But its main effect, and the reason why it's banned, is its second effect, as it allows you to target a monster that Summon Sorceress points to and special summon a monster from your deck with the same type as that monster to another zone that Summon Sorceress points to, but its effects are negated. Even if the effects of the monster you summon are negated, having the potential to special summon any monster from the deck is amazing, because not only was it a great way to extend into another busted link monster like Firewall Dragon, it was also a way to basically foolish monsters for powerful graveyard effects after linking them off because even though their on-field effects are negated, their graveyard effects were fair game. So Summon Sorceress was used in a ton of different strategies to search out a variety of different monsters from the deck, depending on the strategy you were playing. World Chalice would send Eva to get two free fairy monsters from the deck to the hand after it hits the graveyard. ABC decks would often summon out their missing ABC piece so they could eventually go into Dragon Buster. And the best part was the effect was incredibly easy to use. You had the option of summoning out a monster from your hand to your opponent's field in a pinch, but because Summon Sorceress has two downward-facing arrows, you could just summon a monster to one of her arrows, and then use the effect to summon out another monster from your deck to the other downward pointing arrow. And because it was so easily usable, just about every deck that could play summon sorcerers did, which is why it was banned. And if it came back today, every deck would do the same. Summoning nearly any monster from the deck is just too powerful an effect not to be abused in some way. In fact, Halki Fibrax, a card similar to summon sorcerers that was only capable of summoning level 3 or lower tuner monsters, was also banned for having too many potential options it could summon from the deck. And Summon Sorceress has even more options than Halki Fibrax, as it can pull pretty much every single other monster in the game. Any card that can summon monsters from the deck is going to be useful in some capacity or another, and Summon Sorceress might just be one of the best ways to summon a monster from the deck ever printed. Being an accessible extra deck monster with a superbly easy to use effect that can summon just about anything, so it's pretty safe to say it's never coming off the ban list. And sitting on its throne at number 3 is Imperial Order. 
a floodgate that was capable of shutting down every spell card of the game by itself. Because while Imperial Order is phased upon the field, all spell effects are negated. But during each standby phase, there is a mandatory cost of 700 life points that you have to pay, otherwise Imperial Order destroys itself. Out of the three main card types in the game, spell cards are the most powerful since they're instantly usable and have fairly low cost commit when compared to monster and trap cards. And the sheer variety of spell effects has led to hundreds, if not thousands of different strategies of relying on spell cards for their plays in some way or another. Some decks use spells for extension, others will instead use them for consistency, and some might even use them as going second tools. And because so many decks in the game are reliant on spell cards in some capacity, Imperial Order was a powerhouse of a card. Because most of the ways to deal with floodgates are with spell cards, so it was actually really difficult to out since it would just negate the effects of your Harpy's Feather Duster and Lightning Storm if you ever tried to activate them. This made Imperial Order one of the craziest going first tools in the game. Since, because it was a trap card, you could combo off during your turn and use all of your powerful spell cards to pop off. But after you build up your board and pass to your opponent, you can then flip over order to lock them out of their spell cards before they get a chance to play. And all of this is for a relatively negligible cost of 700 life points per standby phase. Which basically means nothing if you're winning on turn 3 of the duel anyway. And what's even more wild is that Imperial Order used to be even stronger, because its maintenance cost in 2003 wasn't mandatory. So you can lock your opponent out of their turn for the best spells, then just choose not to pay Order's cost during your standby phase so it destroys itself so that you could use your spell cards again. This led to Imperial Order being banned up until it received its modern errata, which made its cost mandatory rather than a choice. But this wasn't enough to keep Imperial Order balanced, especially not in the modern form. And as soon as it was legalized with its errata, Imperial Order saw instant competitive success as one of the most absurd going first tools available, and that virtually guaranteed a win. And this made it so that Imperial Order, even with its errata, ended up being banned for a second time in 2022. Now, Modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is no stranger to strong, going first traps, but in the side decks of combo strategies to ensure a victory. Cards like Super Ancient Organism and Rival of the Warlords fluctuate in viability depending on the current meta, and Imperial Order even has a weaker version of itself that sees a ton of play in side decks because of its ability to shut down spell cards for just one turn. But Order is one of the strongest of these tools, and while it and Anti-Spell Fragrance do similar things, you have to flip up Anti-Spell Fragrance before your opponent uses a spell card to stop them. But with Order, it can be reactive, activating it in response to your opponent's playmakers to negate their effects and make them waste a resource in the process. Imperial Order was often a frustrating card to face. It floodgated you out of the game and even protected itself from its own outs. It was so powerful they had to ban it twice, even with its errata. And at number 2 on this list, we have Magical Scientist, one of the oldest cards in the ban list and one that was responsible for one of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s first consistent FTK strategies. With Magical Scientist, you can pay 1,000 life points to special summon out any level 6 or lower fusion monster from your extra deck, but that monster can't declare direct attack and it's returned to the extra deck during the end phase. The key thing to note about this effect, though, is that it doesn't come with any kind of once per turn. So as long as you can afford the life point cost, you can flood the field with a ton of fusion monsters for basically free. Now, back during the time when Magical Scientist first came out, before Lynx, XCs, or even Synchro Monsters, there wasn't much that you could actually do with the free bodies that Scientist summons out, especially since there were fewer options for good fusion monsters to summon, and Scientist's restrictions made it so you couldn't really use it to OTK. But you could FTK instead with the effect of Catapult Turtle. Catapult Turtle's effect allows you to tribute a monster you control to deal damage to your opponent equal to half that monster's attack, and in the modern era, Catapult has a soft once per turn. But back then, the effect actually had no restriction on how many times you could use it per turn. So if you could swarm the field with a ton of high attack monsters to tribute, you could just burn your opponent for 8,000 life points on your first turn. And that's exactly what Magical Scientist provided. And even though you had to pay life points each time you use Scientist by tributing enough fusion monsters, as well as Scientist and Catapult Turtle, you got to win on your first turn by burning for exactly 8,000 points of damage. But since then, Catapult Turtle has gotten errata, making it a soft once per turn, so you can only use it once per turn, per copy, and you'd have to resummon out again if you wanted to burn your opponent's life points twice or more, making this FDK a lot less consistent in theory. But that still doesn't mean scientists can come back in the modern era. While it may not be used for Catapult Turtle FTKs anymore, there's a lot more things you can do with the free bodies that it provides now. For starters, there are now a lot more really strong level 6 lower fusion monsters compared to back when scientists first got access to them. The cards you're summoning out are no longer vanillas with high attack stats, they're cards like Mud Dragon of the Swamp with insane on-field effects, or even El Shadal App Cologne for its powerful graveyard effect. But that's not all, because Scientist doesn't just allow you to use it for powerful fusion plays. As with the bodies you summon, you can now easily access a ton of different synchros, XCs, and link plays, all from a single Magical Scientist on field. Magical Scientist is one of the most broken monsters in the game, and it's interesting to think about all the reasons why it was banned back then, in the context of the modern game that keeps it banned to this day. But one thing is for certain, summoning a bunch of bodies has always been an overpowered effect in Yu-Gi-Oh! 
there's no way that scientists can ever come off the list. Its effect is just too strong for so little investment, and even cards that have tried to act as weaker versions of scientists like Instant Fusion have still found themselves on the Forbidden Limited list in some way or another. And crawling into the number one spot is Maxi, one of the most controversial cards in Yu-Gi-Oh's history and the most powerful hand trap ever printed. You see, Maxi has an easy to understand but absurd effect. On a hard once per turn and a quick effect speed, you can send Maxi from your hand to the graveyard to make it so that during this turn, whenever your opponent special summons a monster, you get to draw one card. Now, if you play Master Duel the OCG, you might be surprised to see Maxi on this list at all, let alone at number one spot because it's actually at three in both of these formats. But in the TCG, Maxi has been banned since 2018, and it's one of the defining differences between the TCG and the other mainline formats, because the legality of Maxi changes how Yu-Gi-Oh is played just because of how centralizing it is as a staple. While in the TCG you can build your deck to be a lot greedier and more focused on extension, meta decks in the OCG and Master Duel need to be built with Maxi in mind, because whenever Maxi has resolved, you're left with a really difficult choice. You can stop special summoning entirely so that your opponent doesn't get any draws, but you end on a board of basically nothing. Or you could instead accept the Maxi challenge and continue going for a board filled with a ton of interaction, while giving your opponent a lot of free cards while just hoping they don't draw the outs or hand traps they need to stop you. Or you could just build a small board, giving your opponent only a couple of free cards in the hand, but still ending on some kind of interruption. And for a lot of players, this appears more like a lose-lose scenario, as you have to gamble on the correct choice every time Maxi is activated. And the correct choice is often based on an unknown information, like what your opponent is playing, whether or not they're on other hand traps, and what cards are already in their hand. In fact, Maxi is so format warping that most decks in these formats are forced to play a ton of different Maxi counters that they have to use to stop their opponent from getting free draws. From Called by the Grave to Cross a Designator and even Ash Blossom and Gamma, these cards are strong in their own right, but their ability to stop Maxi makes them even stronger in Maxi formats, warping not just the game, but your deck building choices around it as well. The TCG, however, is a whole different game because deck builders and pilots don't need to worry about their turn being stopped by what many consider an unfair floodgate, so you'll often see stark differences in how decks are built between the three formats. Choices that make complete sense in the TCG might be wrong for the OCG, and a deck that is meta in Master Duel might not fully translate over to the TCG. This doesn't make one format better than the other, but it does make them different. If Maxi were to come back to the TCG, the way people play Yu-Gi-Oh would change forever, and a lot of modern deck building theory would need to be revised and altered purely around the card's presence. And to a lot of people, that anti-Maxi way of playing the game, constantly hoping you have a counter for the card, just isn't fun. But whether or not you're pro or anti-Maxi, both sides can agree that the card shapes the metagame around it, and is one of the most important cards for defining the differences between the OCG and the TCG formats. And so long as these different formats exist, it's really unlikely that Maxi ever returns to the TCG or is banned in the OCG, because it creates a divide between the formats that allows for different ways to play the game to suit different audiences. But let us know down in the comments whether you enjoy maxing the format or prefer having it banned. In Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel, the R rarity cards are some of the easiest ones to get in the game because it's very easy to get enough duplicate rare cards in order to craft whatever you want. And luckily, there are a lot of pretty decent staple cards you can pick up in the R rarity. So, in this list, we'll be going over 10 of the best cards you can craft very easily and include in pretty much any deck. And at number 10, we have Phantom Knight's Fog Blade. This is a continuous trap card which has the effect where you can target one effect monster in the field and equip with this card, where that monster's effects are negated and it cannot attack. Also, other monsters cannot target the monster for attacks. Additionally, it has the graveyard effect that only works within the Phantom Knight's archetype, which allows you to special summon a Phantom Knight's monster from your graveyard, but it's not on this video for that graveyard effect. That's just a bonus within Phantom Knight's. Now, what makes Phantom Knight's Fog Blade a pretty good staple is just the versatility in which it can be used. Usually the card is only used with other Phantom Knight cards because they can search it out pretty easily, and Phantom Knights are a pretty splashable engine. Although the Phantom Knight's Fog Blade is useful on its own because it can be used to negate a monster's effect or stall out a whole battle phase. You see, while a monster is equipped with Fog Blade and their effect is being negated, it also can't be targeted for attacks. Which means, if that's the only monster you have on your side of the field, and it has a Fog Blade on it, then your opponent just can't attack at all. This also means the same for your opponent's monsters, or if you do use it on one of your opponent's monsters to negate its effects, you have to find some way to get rid of that monster or fog blade before you're actually able to attack over it, which is normally not a problem for most meta decks, as one of the requirements for being a meta deck is just having some form of removal anyway. And fog blade is just a great disruption tool, so you don't really care very much about the downsides of the effect. So because fog blade can be used as both a disruption tool with its effect negation and as a way to protect you during the battle phase, it's usually used over Fiendish Chain, which is able to accomplish a similar thing, 
just without the battle phase full stop interactions. As it also permanently negates the effect of one monster that it's equipped to and stops that one monster from attacking. And Fiendish Chain is also a rare quality card, which can be crafted pretty easily if you don't want to use Fogblade, but want to use some cheap effect negation that stops attacks. And at number 9, we have Planet Pathfinder. This is a level 4 machine monster with the effect where you can tribute this card to add a field spell card from your deck to your hand. Now, it's not the best way to search out a field spell card in the game, but the best ways to search out field spells in the game are all higher rarity. Both terraforming and metaverse are ultra rares, and additionally limited to one copy per deck. The second best choice after those two is Demise of the Land, which is a super rare card. So, if you're playing a deck that really needs to search out a field spell card, this spot is just to remind you that Planet Pathfinder exists. In fact, there are some meta decks already that play Planet Pathfinder alongside terraforming, because Planet Pathfinder and Terraforming are the only field searchers you can reliably activate on your first turn. Whereas Metaverse and Demise of the Land require them to be activated during your opponent's turn, or for you to lock in on your opponent's special summoning monsters during your first turn in the case of Demise of the Land. At number 8 we have Gadarla, the Mystery Dust Kaiju. Now, what this card does is, if it's in your hand, you contribute one of your opponent's monsters in order to give this card to your opponent from your hand. Then it has a couple of other effects, which is rarely used with this card, but I'll go over them anyway. Where, if your opponent controls a kaiju monster, you can special summon this card from your hand to your side of the field. Also, you can only control one kaiju monster total, and it has an effect where you can remove three kaiju counters from anywhere on the field in order to permanently cut the attack and defense of all other monsters in the field in half. Now, the only reason people use Godarla is because it's the third lowest attack kaiju monster. All Kaijus share the effect where they contribute one of your opponent's monsters to summon themselves to your opponent's side of the field. And this is an excellent form of removal because it gets rid of pretty much any monster in the game. There are only a handful of monsters which have protections from Kaijus tributing them, and almost none of them see regular competitive play. So if your opponent has a big scary boss monster that's really oppressive, you can use a Kaiju in order to get rid of it without any problems, because you can't properly respond to the summon of a monster so there's no way to actually negate the tribute since it's a requirement for the kaiju to come out. And because the main use of a kaiju monster is to just give it to your opponent, you want the monster to have the lowest attack possible. Which is why normally the sea turtle kaiju is the most used kaiju, when just trying to use it for a form of removal, because it has the lowest attack power value of 2200. But in Master Duel, Gamma Seal is of a super rare quality card, and so is the second lowest attack kaiju, Cumungus the Sticky String Kaiju. So, the third lowest attack kaiju is Godarla the Mystery Dust Kaiju, which happens to be of rare quality and is much easier to craft than the other two, and is just as good at doing the same job of getting rid of your opponent's unbeatable boss monsters. And at number 7, we have Lost Wind. This is a normal trap card which has the effect where you can target one special summon monster in the field in order to both negate that monster's effect and cut its original attack in half permanently. So, it's a very strong monster negation. Not many of these kinds of effects last forever. Additionally, if this card is in your graveyard and a monster is special summoned from your opponent's extra deck, you're able to set this card from your graveyard to your field, but then it's banished when it leaves the field after that. So, Lost Wind is an inherent plus one in card advantage because you're able to use the effect twice, or gain the effect from the graveyard if it's built through some kind of card effect. And the effect is very good, useful against pretty much any meta deck. There is another card in the game called Titanocider with a very similar effect, where it also negates the effect of a monster and lowers its attack, but is able to lower the monster's attack to zero instead of just cutting it in half. And also comes back from the graveyard once when a monster is special summoned from the extra deck. However, Titanocider only works on extra deck monsters, and Lost Winds works on any special summon monster. And Titanocider is a super rare card, whereas Lost Winds is only of a rare quality. So they're both good, but Lost Winds is definitely more easy to get, and definitely one of the better trap cards you can craft at this rarity, although surprisingly, doesn't have as much play as some of the other ones which we'll be talking about later. And at number 6 we have Dimensional Fissure. This is a continuous spell card which has the effect where all monsters that would be sent to the graveyard are banished instead. Now, most meta decks have monsters which want to go to the graveyard in order to activate their effects, or to use monsters in the graveyard as a resource later on to do other things. Modern Yu-Gi-Oh! basically uses the graveyard as a second hand. So, having one card which basically gets rid of that is incredibly good to the point where Dimensional Fissure is limited in the TCG to only one copy per deck because of how good that Floodgate is. But for some reason it's unlimited to three copies in the OCG and therefore Master Duel, and is only of rare quality. So if you want a super good Floodgate that's of a lower rarity, Dimensional Fissure is your best bet. 
And at number 5, we have Paleozoic Dynamiscus. This is a trap card which has the effect where you can discard one card from your hand in order to banish one face-up card on the field. Then, if this card is in your graveyard, if a trap card is activated, you can special summon this card from your graveyard as a normal monster with 1200 attack, which has the lingering effect that it's immune to monster effects, and then it's banished if it leaves the field afterwards. So, what's great about Paleozoic Dynamiscus when compared to something like Raigeki Break or even Karma Cut is the fact that Dynamiscus both banishes the card that it targets and is able to target any face-up card on the field instead of just monsters or spells. Raigeki Break is also a rare quality trap card with a similar versatile effect, where you can discard one card to destroy any one card on the field, but being able to banish a card is better than being able to destroy it. And Karma Cut can banish a monster from the field and all copies of that card from the graveyard, but being able to have the option to choose spells and traps is better than only being able to banish a monster. Because you never know if your opponent has a skill drain out on the field, and you just really need to banish that card. And then you just get the added bonus where it comes back later on from the graveyard as a plus one, and can be used for link plays or whatever else you're doing. And at number four, we have Mystical Space Typhoon. This is a quick play spell card which destroys any spell trap card on the field, and because it's a quick play spell card, you can use it immediately when you have it in your hand, or wait for your opponent's turn in order to maybe disrupt plays. And that's pretty much why the card has seen play pretty much throughout all of its history of existing in the game. Mystical Space Typhoon has been power corrupt by some more better cards, but all the power corrupt versions are of higher rarity. And Mystical Space Typhoon is still good, despite being power corrupt. And since a lot of the meta in Master Duel is done with no side decking, a lot of decks are choosing to run spell trap card removal in their main deck, and the best lowest rarity versions of spell trap card removal you can get is Mystical Space Typhoon. So it's currently seen a lot of play in a whole bunch of different decks because it's still good, even if there are technically more versatile or better effects in the game, and it's easy to get. And at number three, we have Compulsory Evacuation Device. This is a trap card which has the effect where you can simply target one monster on the field and then return that target to the hand. So if you use this card on an extra deck monster, it's basically a form of removal which gets rid of that card advantage. Whereas if you only use it on a main deck monster to return it to their actual hand, you could just be giving them a resource back. So the best way to use Compulse is just to use it on an extra deck monster in order to get rid of it without destroying it. Which is an important distinction because a lot of monsters have immunity to destruction effects. And the best part about Compulsory Evacuation Device is the fact that it's a straight one for one in trading that can be done during your opponent's turn to disrupt plays. And additionally, one that's completely generic and usable in any deck without any kind of setup. Technically, Dogmatica Punishment, another R rarity card, also trades one for one with its effect and sees a lot more play than Compulse. As Dogmatica Punishment is able to destroy one of your opponent's monsters if you send a monster from your extra deck to the graveyard with an attack equal to or higher than that monster's. But the most useful part of Dogmatica Punishment is in combination with ultra rare cards like Elder Entity Natis to destroy a card and Titan Clad the Ash Dragon to special summon during the end phase. Plus, the card locks you out of special summoning from the extra deck during your next turn. And other cards which trade generically usually have a discard cost associated to it, like Paleozoic Dynamiscus from earlier. And because Compulse is just excellent removal, being usable in every deck, and doesn't really have any side effects, I'm honestly surprised this card is only of the rare quality because it's pretty useful, and too powerful to be added to even Duel Links yet, even if it doesn't actually see super much play, because if you only have the option to play a handful of traps, there's not really a reason to run a one-for-one -one trade like Compulse over just destroying all of your opponent's cards, like the next spot on this list. And at number two, we have Torrential Tribute. This is a trap card which has the effect where, if the condition is met that a monster was just summoned, either yours or your opponent's, you can then destroy all monsters on the field. And being able to destroy all monsters in the field during your opponent's turn is an excellent way to disrupt plays. Which is why Torrential Tribute sees a whole bunch of competitive play and is probably the most played rare quality trap card in the game. Currently, as of looking at the date of the game that's been out for less than a week when researching the script. In fact, I was surprised to see Torrential Tribute as only a rare quality card in Master Duel, because they made pretty much all of the other commonly played staples much higher rarities, and Torrential Tribute still sees play in the normal, modern TCG. So of course it would have a ton of play in Master Duel as well, and even in decks that don't use the spell card which can search it out. And at number one, we have Forbidden Chalice. This is a quick play spell card which allows you to target any face up monster in the field in order to both negate that monster's effects and increase his attack by 400 until the end of the turn. Now the reason this card sees a lot of competitive play is basically because of its ability to negate a monster effect 
Rarely do you actually use the effect in order to increase the attack of one of your monsters by 400, because 400 is kind of a minor attack boost. However, because Forbidden Chalice technically does have an effect that increases attack, it's able to be used during the damage step. You see, the damage step is a really complicated phase in Yu-Gi-Oh where pretty much nothing works in the damage step, except for cards that specifically say they work during the damage step, counter traps, and cards which specifically increase or decrease the attack or defense of a monster. So if you want to negate the effect of one of your opponent's monsters, but they have a whole bunch of negates on board ready to go, what you could do is enter the battle phase and just attack something randomly. Then, during the damage step, you can use Forbidden Chalice on that one monster you want to negate for the rest of the turn, which is kind of a very convoluted way to go about it. Normally, the cards just used to negate that one negate your opponent monster has, because what are they going to do? Waste their one hard once per turn negate on Forbidden Chalice when their effect is about to be negated anyway? It's basically a way to just negate a choice monster effect to set up your plays during your turn, since you can use it immediately from your hand since it's a quick play spell card, even if a lot of the better effect negation cards in the game are trap cards. So you're inherently limited in how fast you can actually use those ones. For example, technically it is better to just use Lost Wind, but since you can use Forbidden Chalice immediately as soon as you get it, it's used more often. Although there are better cards which are able to do a similar effect, more specifically Dark Ruler No More or Forbidden Droplet, but both of those cards are ultra rare quality, and Forbidden Chalice is good enough. So it's currently one of the most played rare quality staples, and that's why it takes the number one spot on this list. A staple card in Yu-Gi-Oh! is a term for a card that's useful in pretty much any deck. So in this list we'll be going over some of the easiest to get staples in Master Duel, as all of these are only of the normal quality, the lowest ones in the game. And at number 10, we have the Monk of the Tenyi. Monk of the Tenyi is just a Link 1 monster with no effect that simply requires a non-Link Tenyi monster as one of its materials. So it's not exactly a generic Link 1 monster, but it is part of a very efficient engine you can run. You see, there's another Tenyi card called the Tenyi Spirit Vishuda, which is a rare quality monster, so not exactly normal rarity, but also easy to get in Master Duel. And Vishuda has two effects, where it can special summon itself from your hand if you don't control an effect monster, and also it can banish itself from your hand or graveyard in order to bounce one of your opponent's cards, as long as you control a face-up non-effect monster. So, the way you use Vishuda is you special summon it from your hand when you have a clear field, then you use it as a full material to go into Monk of the Tenyi. Then you're able to use Vishuda's effect from the graveyard, because Monk of the Tenyi is a non-effect monster on the field, where you can then bounce one of your opponent's cards. So with a single Vishuda, you're able to go plus one in card economy because you end your combo with one card on the field, and removal of any one of your opponent's cards, including a back row floodgate, like maybe skill drain, and you still have your normal summon free, and there's no other restrictions. And this is why the Monk of the Tenyi and Vishuda combo were just used in normal TCG decks as a mini engine, and any kind of deck that could support it, because Vishuda is also just a free level 7 monster in the field if you need that for something instead of going into Monk. Although since this combo really relies on Vishuda to be used as a staple, it is kind of cheating a little bit by putting Monk of the Tenyi on here in order to mention this combo, which is why it's only at the number 10 spot. Even though this little combo could probably be included in a lot of meta decks much more readily than a majority of the spots on this list. And at number 9 we have Giant Rex. This is a level 4 monster with 2000 attack, which is way higher than normal for a level 4 monster, so it has a negative effect where it can't attack directly. Now, the useful thing about Giant Rex is that if this card is banished, you can then immediately special summon it, and then, if you have any banished dinosaur monsters, it will gain 200 attack for each of them. The way Giant Rex is normally played is with any deck that might want to banish it from the graveyard for some kind of play, or you can actually banish it directly from your deck with Gold Sarcophagus, in order to essentially special summon it directly from your deck, since it will just special summon itself immediately after being banished. Its effect to special summon itself is a hard once per turn, but as long as you kind of space out when you banish it, you essentially get a free monster on the field if you're playing some kind of deck that can banish Giant Rex every turn pretty regularly. And at number 8 we have Pentastag. This is a Link 2 monster that just requires any two effect monsters as materials, and has the effect where, if you have a linked monster that attacks a defense position monster, they inflict piercing battle damage to your opponent. Just as a reminder, that piercing battle damage is one of the very few keywords in Yu-Gi-Oh! and basically just means your opponent will take damage if you attack a defense position monster with an attack position monster where they take damage equal to the difference between the attack and defense of those two cards, instead of normally where they wouldn't take any battle damage. Now, what's great about Pentastag 
is that it grants piercing damage to basically any monster you want. In Yu-Gi-Oh, a card is considered linked under two conditions, where either it's been pointed to by a link monster, or if it itself is a link monster pointing to another monster. And because of Pentastag's link arrows are just up and down, it's incredibly easy to start off with Pentastag, and then special summon a monster that you want to give piercing damage to underneath it or to special summon Pentastag underneath a monster in the extra monster zone. Now, normally piercing damage is not super good of an effect, and you don't really play monsters because they have piercing damage. It's just a nice effect to have if a monster doesn't already have it. It's like a flavorful bonus effect. However, when you can readily give any monster piercing damage from the extra deck with a generic monster, then it kind of opens up a little bit more avenues on how you can push for game, like being a cheap out to an invulnerable crooked cook, for example, which you'll run into occasionally in Master Duel. It's not like some super high tiered card, but it does see competitive play, and it is definitely an excellent option if you don't have all the other really good high rarity staples in the extra deck, and can probably win you a game because it's just an excellent tool to just have in the extra deck, because sometimes all you need is a little bit of piercing damage. And at number 7, we have Orbital Hydrolander. This is a level 8 monster with 3000 attack, which can special summon itself from your hand if you meet the conditions where you simply have 5 or more monsters in your graveyard that have different names from each other, and no monsters in your graveyard that share the same name. Its special summon effect is not once per turn, so if you have 3 copies of Orbital Hydrolander in your hand, you can bring them all out, assuming you meet the conditions for a single one of them. Or if it's bounced back to your hand, you can just bring it out again, which sometimes is beneficial because it has another effect where on spell speed 2, or during yours and your opponent's turn, you can send the top three cards of your deck to the graveyard in order to destroy one card in the field, and this effect is only a soft once per turn. However, before it destroys a card, it checks your graveyard to make sure you don't have any monsters that share the same name. So if the mill of the three cards to meet the cost of the effect happens to mill extra copies of the monsters in your graveyard, then it won't actually destroy anything. So because of the conditions of its summoning effect and its spell speed 2 pop, you have to play Orbital Hydrolander in a deck that only has cards with one copy of monsters each. That way you don't accidentally mill other copies of it and turn off its effect. So, technically, Orbital Hydrolander can be played in any deck. It's just most decks like to play multiple copies of their best monsters, which you can't really do with Orbital Hydrolander. You'd have to build your deck around Orbital Hydrolander, and while it is a really good card, it's not good enough to build your deck around it, which is probably why it's only at the normal rarity, but if for some reason you're playing a deck that can afford to only play one copy of each of your cards, or you're playing in a limited format, then it might be worth running three Orbital Hydrolanders for an excellent main deck boss monster. And at number 6, we have Danger Mothman. This is a level 4 monster, which is part of the Danger archetype, where all the Danger main deck monsters have this shared effect where, if the monster is in your hand, you can reveal the card for a hot second in order to activate its effect, where you then stop revealing your hand to your opponent, shuffle your hand, and have your opponent randomly choose one card in your hand to discard. And if the monster chosen at random was not the danger monster who was activating the effect, or one with the same name, you then get to special summon that danger monster from your hand and then draw one card. And the way all of the danger monsters differ is in their second effects, where they all have an effect that procs if they're discarded by a card effect, i.e. like being discarded by their first effect. And Danger Mothman's second effect is that if it's discarded, both players get to draw one card, and then both players discard one card. So basically Dark World dealings, and out of all of the normal rarity dangers, Danger Mothman is definitely one of the best with its discard effect. Although the good thing about dangers is their first effects, and how none of the first effects have a once per turn on them. So if you activate a danger from your hand in order to try to special summon it, and your opponent chains an Ash Blossom and Joy Spring to it, you can just do it again, even if its effect was negated once because the effect is not once per turn. And because the first effect is not once per turn, it is possible for danger decks to just draw through every card in their deck in one turn if they're really lucky with them not hitting in their danger monsters and getting them discarded. In fact, there were some really competitive decks in the past that were aiming to do exactly that. And because the first effect of all the dangers is so good, it allows you to basically play them in any kind of deck that wants to send cards to the graveyard, and might want extra cards in the field to be used as link materials, or for any other kind of extra deck summoning. So technically, all of the danger monsters are good, because the good part of the dangers is their first effect which they all share, and a lot of them are in the lower rarities, so it's possible to play a full engine of danger monsters without any of them being SR or higher. And at number 5 we have Right Hand Shark. This is a level 4 fish monster which has the effect that, when it's normal summoned you get to add a left hand shark from your deck to your hand. This is rarely how the card is actually played though, 
The good part of this card is everything else about it, where its second effect is that if this card is in your graveyard and you control no monsters, you can special summon it but then it's banished if it leaves the field. And if it's used as an Xyz material for a monster, or you're only using water monsters as its materials, then that Xyz monster gains the effect where it can't be destroyed by battle. And here's the fun thing about Right Hand Shark. It can apply this battle protection to any Xyz monster, just as long as the other material is also water. So it can provide battle protection to something like number 59 Crooked Cook in order to have an invulnerable monster in the field that can't be destroyed by battle or affected by card effects. And also another interesting thing about Right Hand Shark is that if it's detached as an Xyz material, it will just go right back to the graveyard. So you can use the effect next time your field is clear. The card does say it's banished when it leaves the field if it's special summoned with its effect, but being detached as an Xyz material doesn't count as it leaving the field and is kind of a workaround to these kinds of effects where as long as you just don't use it for some other kind of summon, and only an XC summon, you'll always have Right Hand Shark in the graveyard where it can use this effect to come back again. And at number 4, we have Bottomless Trap Hole. This is a trap card which can only be activated in response to a monster being summoned, where it destroys all monsters with more than 1500 attack that were summoned, and then banishes them. So if your opponent summons a whole bunch of monsters at the same time, like say through the effect of Tri Brigade Revolt, or through a Pendulum Summon, you can banish all of the choice cards that meet the conditions of having 1500 or more attack. Normally you just use it on a single summon though to banish one monster with more than 1500 attack. But since it can be used on multiple monsters, Bottomless Trap Hole was actually on the ban list for a long time, at either two or one copies per deck. Currently it's unlimited and for some reason it's only on a normal quality card in Master Duel, and that's probably because it rarely sees any competitive play anymore. And that's mainly because if you're playing against a meta deck, a lot of them have ways to just dodge the effect of Bottomless Trap Hole or destroy the card before you have a chance to activate it, or just to have some kind of negate that can stop it. But not all of them, and it's still pretty effective against meta decks. And especially non-meta decks, because a lot of decks just don't recover from having their key pieces banished. Take Eldlich for example. If Eldlich the Golden Lord is special summoned through the effect of Eldlixir of a Scarlet Sanguine, or Eldlixir of Black Awakening, you can banish Eldlich and permanently deprive your opponent of one of their key resources. And you can kind of beat an Eldritch player if you're able to banish all three copies of their Golden Lord. But Bottomless Trap Hole won't be able to banish Eldritch if it's special summoned through its own effect, since Eldritch gains destruction immunity for around the first two turns after it comes out. And Bottomless Trap Hole does need to destroy the monster first before it banishes it. There's also the fact that a lot of meta decks just don't like to play trap cards at all. And there's lots of really good staple trap cards in the game that you can play instead of Bottomless Trap Hole, like Ice Dragon's Prison which accomplishes a similar thing but without targeting or destroying, so Bottomless doesn't see tons of competitive play. But it's still a really nice option at a very low rarity that you should keep in mind. And at number 3, we have Paleozoic Olenoids. This is a trap card which has the effect to simply destroy any spell or trap card in the field. And being able to destroy a spell or trap card is pretty good in every deck. Normally, there's just other higher rarity cards that are able to accomplish the same thing, but without being a trap card that needs to be set first. However, Paleozoic Olenoids has the other effect, which is shared amongst all the Paleozoic trap cards, where it can special summon itself from the graveyard as a monster if another trap card is activated on the field. And while it's a monster, it's treated as a level 2 Aqua type with 1200 attack that's immune to monster effects. So actually kind of hard to get rid of for most meta decks, as normally they'll have to enter the battle phase in order to attack over it, or waste a similar spell and trap card removal on it. And since it's a level 2 Aqua type monster, you could potentially use two copies of Paleozoic Olenoids to go into Totally Awesome, an Xyz monster that can negate and steal cards. And there is one other benefit of having a spell or trap card removal on a trap card, and that's having an out to something like Imperial Order. Imperial Order is a floodgate which can just negate the effects of all spell cards, and is normally played in floodgate decks that want to protect their back row, because some of the best spell and trap card removal cards in the game are things like Harpy's Feather Duster, Lightning Storm, and Twin Twisters. But Paleozoic Olenoids can destroy Imperial Order, so the budget option of those better cards can actually be more useful sometimes. Especially since it comes back as a monster later on that can be used as a material for some kind of extra deck summon, so it's actually a plus one in card advantage too, if you're able to make full use of both of its effects. And at number two, we have Geonator Transverser. This is a Link 2 monster that just requires any two effect monsters as its materials, and has the effect where, if this card is linked, this linked card and the monster it points to can't be destroyed by your opponent's card effects. And remember that linked just simply means that a link monster is pointing to something and it includes itself. So pretty easy to grant one of your monsters and its self-protection from destruction effects by just having it point to at least one of your monsters, 
or one of your opponent's monsters as it has an arrow that can point on your opponent's side of the field, which is necessary for its second effect, where if this card is pointing to two monsters, you can switch control of both of those monsters. And because of this, if your opponent has a monster in the middle monster zone, or the rightmost monster zone, it's vulnerable to being stolen by the effect of this card, where you can just give your opponent one of your weaker cards in the field, like maybe a Paleozoic Olenoids that was summoned after using its second effect. And one really good thing about this card is that it doesn't target, as it simply denotes pointing to a monster rather than having to target a monster. So it's an excellent form of removal against just a lot of boss monsters that might have some indestructible effects or can't be targeted, just as long as they're in the middle or rightmost monster zones. So if you don't want your indestructible boss monster being stolen, make sure you avoid bringing them out in the middle or leftmost card zones. The effect of this card is so good, it's probably one of the best low rarity extract monsters in the game. And I actually didn't find out about it until I had released my video on the best low rarity extract monsters in the game, and my chat told me about this wonderful gem that I had definitely missed. And at number one, we have Parallel Exceed. This is a level eight monster, which has the effect that, if you link summon a monster, you can special summon this card from your hand to a zone that a link monster points to. Additionally, if this card is normal or special summoned, you can special summon another copy of this card from your deck. But it has another effect where, if this card is special summoned by its own effect, it becomes level four and its attack and defense become halved. And all of its effects are a hard once per turn. So how you use this card is you just link summon any monster from whatever archetype you're using and have a parallel exceed in your hand where you'll then be able to special summon it from your hand and get another copy of it from your deck, essentially going plus one in card advantage, while giving you two level four monsters in the field and not using your normal summon. And this is pretty good in pretty much any link deck that can afford to play Parallel Exceed. It's such a no-brainer extender option, it doesn't lock you out of anything special, it just gives you free monsters in the field while being super generic in how it does it. The only real problem with this card is if you draw all three copies of them in your opening hand, as you'll have nothing but Garnets, because they can only special summon other copies of themselves from the deck. But you can eventually special summon them from your hand, so they're not completely dead either. The Parallel Exceed engine is so good, it's kind of a wonder why it's only at the normal rarity, because it's played in all kinds of decks, including meta decks, and is a staple at that. They can allow you to easily go into something like Baguska to shut down your opponent's card effects, or go into an Abyss Dweller to turn off your opponent's graveyard. You can go into some very powerful Floodgate Xyz monsters while just doing your plays like normal, as long as you can afford to play three copies of them in your main deck. In fact, most people only opt to play two copies of the card, since you can't really special summon the third copy anyway. So because Parallel Exceed is just such a good card that you actually want to play for its own merits, rather than trying to replace it later on like you do a lot of the other cards in this list. It's easily the best normal rarity stable monster in Master Duel, and almost seems like an oversight that it was put at such a low rarity in the first place. However, it's a good thing they did because it's just an easy engine you can add to pretty much any deck that's super cheap to craft. Going second cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! refers to cards that are ridiculously powerful if you're able to use them going second in the duel rather than first. And because there are so many very powerful going second cards in the game, Sometimes there are decks that are built their whole strategies around just going second, so they can play as many of them as possible. And at number 10, we have Max C. This is a hand trap which has the effect where, after you use it, each time your opponent special summons a monster, you draw one card. This card is currently banned in the TCG, but unlimited in the OCG and Master Duel. And since it's unlimited in Master Duel, I thought I would include it on this list, where normally I just want to talk about cards that are not banned in the TCG. So. Why Maxi is a powerful going second card is because you can use it during your opponent's first turn in order to draw a whole bunch of cards. That way you can then use them on your next turn to dismantle whatever board your opponent might put up due to just the pure card advantage. Or eventually draw into another hand trap that allows you to interact with your opponent to stop their plays. Maxi is one of the strongest cards in the game, and I have a 30 minute video going over why. But the gist of it is, generic draw card advantage in Yu-Gi-Oh! is so powerful in meta decks that it's usually a good strategy to just end your turn as soon as your opponent drops a maxi on you, rather than try to play through all the advantage you're going to give your opponent. Which, in essence, turns maxi into a skip your opponent's turn card, which is one of the strongest kinds of effects in the game. And you can skip your opponent's turn without losing card advantage, if you're able to chain the effect to one of your opponent's special summons that they can't stop, like maybe activating a Vishuda from their hand. However, since Maxi is banned in the TCG, I'll also add another powerful going second hand trap to this on the list, that being Psyframe Year Gamma, 
That is one of the few hand traps that can both negate any monster effect and destroy the card afterwards. Whereas most of the other hand trap negates only negate the effect and don't actually destroy the card. And Cyframe Gear Gamma can only be activated when you don't control any monsters. So it's pretty much only a going second card that might be useful going first too if your opponent hand traps you before you summon a monster. And at number 9, we have the Winged Dragon of Ra, Sphere Mode. This card has an effect which allows you to normal summon the card by using three monsters on your opponent's side of the field, where you then give this card to your opponent, and the card has other effects that don't matter as much, where it can't attack, it can't be targeted for attacks, and you contribute the card in order to special summon the Winged Dragon of Ra from your hand or deck, ignoring its summoning conditions, and changing its attack and defense to become 4,000. The main important part of the card is being able to tribute your opponent's monsters for it, because that turns this card into basically a nearly undisruptible monster removal of three of any of your opponent's cards, because there are very few cards in the game that have protection from being tributed for a summon. And if your opponent has a big, bad Herald of Ultimateness with five cards in their hand to fuel its Omni Negates, they can't do anything about being tributed by Sphere Mode as long as they have two other cards on their side of the field that you can get rid of also. Which is usually the biggest problem of Sphere Mode in that sometimes your opponent just doesn't have three monsters out. If you're playing against a big combo deck that puts up huge boards, Sphere Mode is not really that hard to bring out, but against any decks that only ends on two or fewer monsters, then you kind of just have a dead card in your hand that you can't use. Which is why some people will opt to play Lava Golem instead, which can do the same thing but tributes two monsters. Or one of the various Kaiju monsters, which can also do the same thing as both Lava Golem and Sphere Mode, except only tributes one monster, and doesn't take up your normal summon to do it. And at number 8, we have Red Reboot. This is a counter trap card which has the effect that allows you to negate the effect of a trap card, and then you can set that card you negated face down instead of sending it to the graveyard, then your opponent gets to set another trap card of their choice from their deck, but also your opponent can't activate any other trap cards for the rest of the turn. And what makes this card really good is the fact that you can activate it from your hand by paying half of your life points. So if your opponent sets up a board of five back row cards, and you have Red Reboot in your starting hand, you don't really have to worry about that back row, because Red Reboot will allow you to push for game through pretty much anything, since your opponent can't negate a counter trap card, unless they have another counter trap card that can specifically negate traps, like Solemn Judgment. Unless your opponent has Solemn Judgment, there's not really anything they can do about Red Reboot. Red Reboot single-handedly counters pretty much all trap-based decks in the game, because you can just completely ignore their back row for a full turn, and then just go for game with whatever strategy you're using. Even though you have to pay half your life points, your opponent doesn't even lose the card you're setting, and they even go plus two in the whole exchange because they get an additional trap card from their deck, it doesn't matter if you win that turn, which is the huge power behind Red Reboot. Especially if you're playing other going second extra deck monsters, like number 39 Utopia Double or Boroso Dragon, which allows pretty much all decks the option to easily put out over 8,000 points of damage in one turn. And because Red Reboot pretty much single-handedly counters trap-based decks, it's currently limited to one copy. And at number 7, we have Dino Wrestler Panker Tops. This is a 2600 attack level 7 monster, which can special summon itself from your hand as long as your opponent controls more monsters than you do. And then it has an effect where, on a quick effect, you can tribute the Dino Wrestler monster you control in order to target and destroy any one card on your opponent's side of the field. And both of its effects are a hard once per turn. Now, what's really great about Dino Wrestler Panker Tops as a going second card is its high attack power value, and how it can bait out disruption effects. For example, if your opponent ends only on a 2400 attack Appalooza, Bo the Goddess, where they have three monster negates live, and you have a deck full of monster effects that you very much want to go off, you can special summon down a wrestler Panker Tops in your hand, and then just attack over it. Then after Appalooza is destroyed, you could use this effect to destroy another card, and then continue your plays like normal during the main phase too. Or if your opponent has out a spell speed 2 disruption effect, like Zodiac Dryden't, you can just try to attack over it in order to bait out the destruction effect, where you can then chain down a wrestler Panker Tops effect to tribute itself in order to destroy the card anyway. And since the only condition for special summon of the card from your hand is just having less monsters than your opponent, you automatically meet the conditions as soon as you're going second and your opponent has out even a single monster. 
and it doesn't lock you into any kind of restrictions when using this effect, so it's pretty much completely generic and usable in all decks. Which is why the card is also limited to one copy, because it's too good of a going second card. It was pretty much an auto-include in just all decks, because it could also be used as a combo extender if you didn't want to use its effect or its attack stats at all. If you want a card similar to Dino Wrestler Panker Tops that's not limited, there's also Alpha the Master of Beasts, which can special summon itself from your hand if your opponent controls more monsters with more attack points than the attack of the monsters you control. And then it has an effect where you can bounce any number of your beast-centric monsters to your hand in order to return a similar number of cards your opponent controls to their hand. So, if your opponent has a full board of monsters, you can special summon out Alpha, and then use its effect to bounce itself and one of your opponent's cards back to their hand, and then you can just bring it out again as long as your opponent has another monster in the field and yours is still empty. Since only its bounce effect is a hard once per turn, but its special summon effect is not. It also serves the same purpose as Dino Wrestler Panker Tops of being a really strong monster that could special summon itself from your hand very easily to attack over something like an Appalooza. Although its bounce effect is not spell speed too, which is why it's not as good as Dino Wrestler Panker Tops, even if it does have a higher attack power value and can remove one of your opponent's monsters without sending itself to the graveyard. And at number 6, we have Dark Ruler No More. This is a spell card which allows you to negate the effects of all of your opponent's face-up monsters until the end of the turn. However, your opponent also takes no damage until the end of the turn. And the good thing about this card is its last effect, where neither player can activate monster effects in response to this card's activation. So, if your opponent has a full board of monster negates, Dark Ruler No More can just turn them all off, and there's nothing your opponent can do about it unless they have a spell or trap card which can negate the effects of this card. So, the main purpose of Dark Ruler No More is to turn off all of your opponent's big boss monsters in order to set up your own board of boss monsters, since you can't exactly win the turn you use Dark Ruler No More, since your opponent won't take any damage due to the drawback. But you can get rid of all of your opponent's monsters if you just attack over them and put yourself in a much better game state than your opponent, because most people can't recover from having all of their big boss monsters destroyed. So, even if you can't win immediately after using Dark Ruler No More, it can definitely put you in a very advantageous game state. And at number 5, we have Evenly Matched. This is a trap card that can only be activated at the end of the battle phase if your opponent controls more monsters than you do, where you can force your opponent to banish their own cards face down so they control the same number of cards as you. And what makes this trap card an excellent going second card, just like Red Reboot, is its ability to be used from your hand, but only under the conditions that you don't control any other cards. So, if your opponent sets up a full board of monsters, or even back row, what you do is enter the battle phase, and then immediately just end the battle phase and you meet the conditions for evenly matched, in order to get rid of all of your opponent's cards. And unless they have a way to negate a trap card, which a lot of boss monsters don't, as a lot of them only negate monster effects, you can wipe out your opponent's board with one of the best forms of removal in the game. Since the way evenly matched remove cards prevents floating effects from activating and also bypasses pretty much all boss monster protection. The only bad thing about evenly matched is the fact that it doesn't have spell speed for protection like Dark Ruler no more. So your opponent can negate the effect of the card if they have an Omni to get in the field, like maybe Borelode Savage Dragon. But if you combo Dark Ruler no more with evenly matched, you pretty much have a two card combo that gets rid of almost any board, as long as they don't have any spell or trap card, spell or trap card negations, like Solemn Judgment. And at number four, we have Super Polymerization. This is a quick play spell card which allows you to discard one card in order to fusion summon any fusion monster from your extra deck using monsters on both players' side of the field as fusion materials. So, obviously, the best way to use Super Polymerization is to use it on your opponent's monsters as materials in order to remove those monsters from the field. And the great thing about Super Polymerization that makes it a very powerful going second card is the fact that your opponent can't activate any cards in response to it. So, just like Dark Ruler No More, your opponent's big boss monster negates don't do anything against it, and they're super vulnerable to this form of removal since it doesn't target or destroy. So, as long as you build your extra deck to have a lot of common fusion monsters that get rid of your opponent's cards, like maybe check out my video on the top 10 best super polymerization targets, you can clear your opponent's field while getting a strong boss monster out of it on your own. Like, if your opponent has three dark monsters in the field, you can go into Predator Plant Triffy over Utum. But more often than not, you'll probably only have to settle for a Mud Dragon of the Swamp. And of all of the equalizers, or going second cards, I think Super Polymerization is probably one of the better ones for lesser power decks, because it both gets rid of super hard to outboss monsters, like maybe Herald of Ultimateness, 
while also doing more than just turning off their effects like Dark Ruler No More, and potentially gives you a really strong monster in the process. But it does take up a lot of extra deck space in order to run effectively, which is why you'll see a lot of combo decks that might like to go second opt to not use Super Polymerization because they don't have the free extra deck space for the fusion monsters required to play it effectively. And at number 3, we have Nibiru the Primal Being. This is a hand trap that can only be activated during the main phase after your opponent has normal or special summoned 5 or more monsters this turn, where you then tribute all face-up monsters in the field, special summon Nibiru to your side of the field, then special summon a super token to your opponent's side of the field, whose attack and defense is equal to the combined original attack and defense of all the monsters tributed. So obviously, a card that tributes all cards in the field is better if you're going second, and generally, you use this card during your opponent's first turn in order to stop all other plays. So, if you're tired of going against a whole bunch of decks that summon a million monsters in one turn, Nibiru is kind of the answer to those decks. Because unless their decks can get out a monster negate on their board before their fifth summon, then they're super vulnerable to Nibiru the Primal Being. In fact, Nibiru can just kind of win you the game on its own, as I once had a game where I resolved Nibiru three times against a Virtual World player, where they eventually just quit out. Because they could recover from two Nibiru's wiping their field, but not a third one. And at number 2, we have Lightning Storm. This is a spell card which can only be activated if you control no face-up cards at all, i.e. only going second basically, where you can pick one of its two effects, to either destroy all of your opponent's attack position monsters, or destroy all of their spell and trap cards. And it's the versatility of this card that makes it one of the most played going second cards in the game, because it's useful against pretty much every kind of deck. If you're playing Nibiru, that card is only useful if your opponent summons a whole bunch of monsters, which means it's kind of useless against certain kinds of control decks, or decks that are able to do all of their combos in less than 5 summons. But Lightning Storm is useful against both control decks and combo decks, because you can just wipe out all of your opponent's monsters, or wipe out their entire back row if they're playing a control deck. In both cases, you're probably going to force out one of your opponent's negates. So Lightning Storm, again, can be a very good combo tool if you use it with Dark Ruler No More first or the number one card on this list. If your opponent doesn't have a way to negate a spell card, because again, a lot of boss monsters only negate monster effects, like Appaloosa, Bow the Goddess, then it's an easy out to all of your opponent's monsters. That only takes one card from your hand, that is also an easy out to your opponent's back row if they're playing a control deck. And at number one, we have Forbidden Droplet. This is a quick play spell card, which basically allows you to negate the effects of your opponent's monsters, while making it so your opponent can't respond to this card with a negate, and cuts the negated monster's attacks in half, and also does not target. So, just like how Dark Ruler No More can turn off your opponent's board of monster negates, Forbidden Droplet can do the same thing, except it can choose to be immune to your opponent's spell and trap negates as well. But it does require a little bit more resources to accomplish this. Because in order to activate Forbidden Droplet, you have to send any number of cards from your hand or field to the graveyard, and then it gains effects based on the amount of cards you send, as well as the types of cards that you send. So, if you want to make it so your opponent can't respond to Forbidden Droplet with a monster negate, you have to send at least one monster to the graveyard to activate its effect, as it only gains protection from the types of cards sent to the graveyard. So, if you want to make sure your opponent can't negate it with a Solemn Judgment, you also need to send a Trap card too. And then based on the amount of cards you send, you can then negate the effects of that many cards your opponent controls. So, if you send 5 cards to the graveyard to activate Forbidden Droplet, you can negate 5 of your opponent's monsters, cut their attacks in half, and do all of this without targeting any of them, to get by targeting protection. Which is definitely a very steep price to pay if you're trying to negate all of your opponent's monsters. Which is why you usually only use Forbidden Droplet on a choice 1 or 2 cards. Whatever your opponent's most high priority targets are to get rid of, like maybe a Herald of Ultimateness. And since Forbidden Droplet does allow you to use cards on your side of the field, you could send something like your field spell card to the graveyard in order to be one of the cards sent for Forbidden Droplet, or some of your already set back row, or just some of your monsters if you're using this during your opponent's turn and they're about to destroy those cards anyway. Because Forbidden Droplet is one of the few going second cards that also doubles as a former disruption. Since it's a quick play spell card, you can set the card to be used during your opponent's turn, in order to maybe use Forbidden Droplet to disrupt their plays, or use it to send some of your cards to the graveyard if they're being targeted for your opponent's destruction anyway, in order to disrupt your opponent's plays preemptively. Forbidden Droplet is definitely a more meta-going second card, 
because a lot of lower power level decks can't afford the steep cost of activating Forbidden Droplet. But this is a card that allows you to play through unbreakable boards and guarantee you're able to play through anything since it has the potential to be completely immune to all forms of negation except cards that don't allow you to activate the card in the first place like Imperial Order. And Forbidden Droplet is one of the most used going second cards, even using decks that like to go first because it's also a disruption tool as well, which makes it a good going first card too. So it's a pretty good card to make the number one spot on this list. But there's lots of very powerful going second cards that can easily take this card spot in your deck. Where I would say the top six cards on this list are all of pretty equal power level, with Forbidden Droplet just being played more than the others. 2022 has allowed for a whole host of powerful unique staples to shine in the competitive metagame. Whether they've been to counter the best decks of the format, a game-winning Floodgate, or even their own strong supplementary engine, the staples that have seen play this year have warped the game in their own right and have been integral over the success, or demise, of a ton of different decks vying for meta status. So today, we're going to take a look back at the best staples of the year, why they saw competitive play, and how they helped to shape their respective formats. And hoarding the number 10 spot, we have Token Collector. A level 4 Earth Fiend monster with a niche effect, but one that was single-handedly capable of completely shutting down some of the best decks of the year. Token Collector has three effects. The first effect is a hard once per turn, and allows you to special summon it from your hand or graveyard if a token monster is special summoned to the field. The second effect is a mandatory effect that occurs on the Token Collector's special summon. The effect destroys all tokens on both players' fields, and gives Token Collector an extra 400 attack for every token destroyed. But it's Token Collector's third effect that makes it so strong, as while it's phase up on the field, neither player can special summon tokens at all. At first glance, this effect appears way too specific to ever see use, because in order for each of its three effects to be relevant, it relies on your opponent playing a deck that specifically requires token monsters to perform their plays. This wasn't completely unheard of, but when compared to other staples like Ash Blossom and Infinite Impermanence, Token Collector is a lot less applicable. However, this year Token Collector managed to see a surge in popularity, specifically because of how strong its effects were against some of this year's strongest strategies. The best example of this, of course, is Sword Soul. Even after the 2022's first ban list, which saw the banning of Arch Nemesis Protoss, Sword Soul's consistency, strength, and adaptability made it a tier 1 meta threat and one that was quite difficult to put a stop to with most other hand traps. Token Collector, on the other hand, was almost guaranteed to be game-winningly strong. Every single main deck Sword Soul monster is a non-tuner, and relies upon their effects to special summon out token tuners to the field to actually access their synchro boss monsters. But with Token Collector in your hand or graveyard, you can special summon it to your field as soon as your opponent is done resolving the effect of their Sword Soul monsters, wiping the field of their token tuners, and locking them out of summoning any more to the field, essentially shutting down almost the entire deck. But Sword Soul wasn't even the end to Token Collector's utility, as it also happened to be an amazing counter against the newly released Adventure Engine. By getting rid of the Adventure token, the entire engine no longer functioned. Griffin Rider couldn't use its negate, and Dracoback couldn't bounce back cards, making Token Collector an amazing counter against any rogue and meta deck strategies, trying to take advantage of the Adventure Engine. The best part is that Token Collector didn't just destroy the main engines at Sword Soul and Adventure, it also cut off their Plan B option, Halkadon. Halkadon was a small engine that used a combination of Christian Halki Fibrax, Despot 001, Mega Fantabisa Rurudon to summon a bunch of machine tokens to Synchro Summon with. But because this strategy required tokens to function, that meant Token Collector could apply here as well. These three strategies being as good as they were, made for a format where Token Collector was able to dominate as a tool that was both insanely strong, and applicable to multiple decks in the format, to the point where this once niche and specific card could even be played in your main deck and win games because of it. In fact, Token Collector was so strong and so versatile that decks would even use extra deck tools like Shooting Riser and Curious to send Token Collector from the deck to the graveyard to ensure that it was always available to counter these token-based strategies, to the point where Sword Soul and other token-based strategies were forced to adapt to Token Collector by playing cards like Ghost Mourner or Forbidden Chalice to keep their tokens on board. Currently, however, Token Collector has been seen far less competitive play because while its effect has been insane for countering token-based strategies, the meta around it has shifted so tokens are a lot less common. But if Sword Soul or any token-based decks come back to the meta, Token Collector will be found in the side or main decks once more. Looming into the number 9 is Dark, the Dark Charmer, Gloomy, a Link 2 monster belonging to the Charmer series of links. The Charmer links actually all have the same effects and stats, the only thing that changes between them all is the particular attribute that they support. So in the case of Dark, you can summon them using any two monsters provided at least one of them is a Dark monster. Its on-field effect allows you to target any Dark monster in your opponent's graveyard in order to special summon to a zone this card points to. And if the Link Summon Dark is destroyed by battle or an opponent's card effect while you control it, you get to search any Dark monster from your deck with 1500 or less defense. 
and each of its effects having a hard once per turn. The dark attribute has always been the strongest in the game, and a monster being a dark monster means it can benefit from a whole host of support and synergy that no other attribute has. This meant that from its release, Dark the Dark Charmer was always likely to see some kind of competitive success. Since even in decks that don't play any dark attribute monsters in their engine, it was likely that a stray DD Crow or IP Mascarina would find its way into your opponent's graveyard eventually. But this year specifically has shown how busted Dark is. With the release of Power of the Elements, Dark saw a ton of competitive success. This is because the best decks within that set, Sprite and Tier Laments, both happen to be made up a bunch of powerful dark monsters, which gave Dark a ton of interesting utility. For example, Tier Laments could run a small Sprite engine in their main deck consisting of at least one Sprite Jet and Sprite Smashers. This is because Dark could summon back an opponent's Sprite Blue in their graveyard, and then you could trigger its effect in order to search a jet from your deck, in order to get a Sprite Smasher, a free interruption that also happened to be an optimistic mine. Sprites also benefited greatly from Dark. They could also revive an opponent's Tier Limits merely for a free level 2 body that they could use to go into L for Gigantic. This era showed Dark's potential, especially when its destruction effect could also be used to gain free advantage in search for most of the Sprites or Tier Limits, but the release of Sprite Sprint boosted Dark's power by a lot and made it a near mandatory in both of these strategies. What makes Sprint so busted is that it can be used to send any level 2 monster from your deck to the graveyard, and is played both in Sprite to send Nibble Angler, and Tier Laments to send Merely, and kickstart their combos. The reason why this is so good with Dark is because of Sprint's summoning conditions. You need any two monsters provided one of them is a level, rank, or link 2 monster. This means that any monster that Dark revives in the graveyard can be used to go into Sprint, and allows Dark to be absurdly strong as both an extender and a starter for your plays. Now, provided there is a strong Dark deck in the meta, Dark is likely to see a lot of competitive play, but its Dark synergies with Sprite and Tier Laments has made it an absolutely bonkers staple. Whether it's bringing back a Havness, a Skullmeister, or a Sprite Blue, the card has been incredibly powerful and will likely remain in people's extra decks for years to come. Fusing into the number 8 is Super Polymerization, one of the strongest board breakers in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. By discarding one card for cost, you can fusion summon a monster from your extra deck using monsters on either player's side of the field as materials, letting you use your opponent's monsters for a fusion summon. But the part that makes Super Polymerization so strong is that it can't be responded to by either player with any card or effect, whether that be the Negate of Baron de Fleur or even a Solemn Judgment. Super Poly is an insanely strong board breaker, because as soon as you activate it, there's nothing your opponent can do to stop it, clearing away their problem boss monsters and giving you a free fusion monster on the field. But Super Poly's strengths will always change depending on the best decks of the format and what Super Poly targets are actually available. Cards like Mud Dragon and Starving Venom have been integral to Super Polymerization's success, with Starving Venom even being used a lot earlier this year as it, alongside Dragostopalia, was a great counter to Phantom Knight decks running DPE. The reason why these kinds of targets are so strong is because of their really generic summoning conditions as they allow for Super Poly to be more versatile and be used against multiple decks in the format, rather than just targeting specifically one. So, the more Super Poly targets that are available, and the more generic their materials, the better the card is. And with the release of Power of the Elements, Super Polarization got a huge buff with the release of a new fusion monster, Garura, Wings of Resonant Life. Garura has two effects. The first doubles any battle damage your opponent takes when Garura battles, and the second allows you to draw a card whenever it's sent to the graveyard in any way. However, the strongest aspect of Garura is its summoning condition, where it just needs any two monsters of the same type and attribute, but with different names. This made Garura a superbly generic Super Poly target, increasing the range of decks that Super Poly could be used against, and meant that Super Polarization could now be used against both of the decks of the upcoming format, Sprite and Tier Limits. The Sprite end board, post Power of the Elements, actually didn't play into any of the traditional Super Polarization targets, as it ended on the Fire, Thunder, Elf, and Red, alongside the Water, Aqua, Totally Awesome, and Dupefrog to protect your board from battle. But with the release of Garura, not only were you capable of using Super Poly against the Sprite board, you also had options of what you wanted to fuse away. You could fuse away your opponent's Sprite Red and Elf, depriving your opponent of a Monster Negate and their follow-up from Elf, or you could instead move to your battle phase and Super Poly to fuse away their dupe frock and Totally Awesome. Not only did this mean clearing away two of your opponent's monsters, it meant that you could use Garura to beat over your opponent's Elf since it has exactly 100 more attack, and because Elf is main phase only, they wouldn't be able to activate its effect letting you clear away most of the sprite end board for free. This was so strong that eventually it led sprite pilots dropping dupe frog from their list entirely in order to give themselves a better chance against super poly. Against tier limits, you had a few options for how to use super poly. You could fuse away their dragon stapalia and time thief redoer into a dragon stapalia of your own. Or you could even use your opponent's tier limit monsters to fuse a kid Kalos to start your own combo. But the release of majestic mavens and darkwing blast made super poly even stronger against the deck. As with these sets, Tier Limits got new several pieces of support which helped them reach their Tier 0 status. 
In Darkwing Blast, they got Tier Lament Rukalis, a fusion boss monster which made Nibiru ineffective against Tier Laments as it came with the negate of any card effect that would summon a monster. And in Majestic Mavens, they got the Ashizu cards, Kaldo and Mudora, who can shuffle cards in the graveyard back into their deck at quick effect speed, and the Millers, Agito and Kelbeck, who can mill the top 5 cards of your deck to trigger even more Tier Lament names. But one of the key issues with the Millers is that they also milled cards from your opponent's deck and could allow them to benefit from a whole host of graveyard effects. And so, to stop your opponent from gaining any sort of advantage, Tier would usually make a Bistweller to prevent your opponent from gaining any advantage from their graveyard effects. This allowed for super polymerization to shine, as both Rukalos and Abyss Dweller had the same attribute, but a different type, letting you fuse into a dragon with ease. This was really important for Graveyard Reliant strategies, as you could use super polymerization as your first action in the draw phase, with the turn player priority, to immediately fuse away your opponent's board before they even had a chance to activate Dweller, and lock out the graveyard effect since they can't respond to super poly with Dweller. Overall, super polymerization is always going to fluctuate in and out of the meta, but Garura, as well as the other classic targets, has ensured its use has become far more common, and the card is only going to get even stronger as more targets get released. Shifting into number 7 is Dimension Shifter, one of the most busted, lingering effects in the game, and one that's been absolutely integral for certain rogue strategies to prosper. At quick effect speed, you can send Dimension Shifter from your hand to the graveyard, but only while you have no cards in your graveyard. This makes it so that any card that would be sent to the graveyard is banished instead until the end of the next turn. From its release, Dimension Shifter has always been an absurdly powerful tool. A lot of Yu-Gi-Oh's strongest meta strategies use their graveyard as a resource to either generate a ton of advantage or to actually combo off. The macro-like effect of Dimension Shifter, however, cuts off your opponent from the graveyard entirely for two whole turns. In fact, it's actually better than Macro Cosmos since it can be used during your opponent's first turn making Dimension Shifter an amazing going second tool. The main issue with Dimension Shifter, however, is that for as strong as it is, not every deck can play it, because it doesn't just lock your opponent out of the graveyard, it also locks you from using your graveyard as well. So while a deck like Math Mech would appreciate their opponent's tier limit cards being banished, they can't use Dimension Shifter themselves because they want their Math Mech cards to hit the graveyard to actually use cards like Diameter and Super Factorial. But even in spite of that, Dimension Shifter has seen widespread use this year either by decks that have adapted their usual strategy to use it, or by decks that already natively synergized with it. Sprite is a great example of the former. Most sprite lists do actually have cards that need to use the graveyard in some way. Nimble Angler needs to be sent to the graveyard in order to summon two beavers from the deck, and Swap Frog is usually sending other copies of Swap Frog to the graveyard, so they can later be revived with Sprite Elf to make totally awesome. But the main sprite engine actually doesn't use the graveyard at all and actually have a superbly easy path to OTK your opponent even while Dimension Shifter is up by using Sprite Jet to search for Gamma Burst, a card which increases the attack of all level, link, and rank 2 monsters in the field by 1400 points. Although because of the likes of Angler, Totally Awesome, and Elf are so valuable for Sprite, they only play Dimension Shifter on the side as a tool for going second. Although there are some strategies that are willing to main deck Dimension Shifter because they don't care about their graveyards at all. Like Fluendarese, a deck that can use Shifter so easily that it's almost as if the deck was made for it. You see, most of the Fluendarese cards don't actually interact with the graveyard at all, with all the level 1 birds banishing themselves whenever they leave the field, even when not under Shifter, so they can use Dimension Shifter freely. However, there are still two important cards in Fluendarese that do need to interact with the graveyard. Fluendarese and Stree needs to banish a card from either player's graveyard so that you can perform your additional normal summon. And Rise of the Mega Monarch has to target at least one card in either player's graveyard to spin a card from the field back to the top of the deck. But because Dimension Shifter goes to the graveyard for cost when you trigger it, you will at least have one card in the graveyard to use either of these effects. And in the case of Ryza, you can just choose your own Dimension Shifter in your graveyard and put it on the top of your deck. By doing this, you can ensure that the next card you draw is a Dimension Shifter on the turn where Shifter's Lingered Effect stops applying. And because you wouldn't have any cards in your graveyard again, once Shifter is gone, you could use the Shifter again, and basically keep your opponent locked under Macrocosmos for the whole game by looping your Shifter over and over with Ryza. These small synergies, as well as how easily Flunderies plays through Shifter, have made Shifter a mandatory inclusion in the deck, and has been an integral part of the deck's consistent status as the best anti-meta strategy of the format. Shifter is probably the least generic staple on this list, but there's no denying the impact it's had on the metagame this year, and if your deck is at least somewhat capable of playing Shifter, you have access to an amazing tool that's capable of making even the best decks of the format struggle. And tuning in to our number 6 spot is Crystron Halky Fibrex, a recently banned Link 2 monster that provided so much utility for any strategy playing any tuners. In order to actually Link Summon Halk, you need any two monsters but at least one of them has to be a tuner, making it incredibly generic, especially given how strong its two effects are. 
The first effect allows you to summon any level 3 or lower tuner monster from your deck in defense position, but that monster it summons cannot activate its effects this turn. And the second effect makes Halk a 1 card synchro summon, because during your opponent's main or battle phase, you can banish Halky Firepacks from your field to special summon any tuner synchro monster from your extra deck for free. Both of Halk's effects are shockingly powerful for such a generic card. Its first effect was format warping. Being able to summon out any tuner from your deck made it far too versatile to the point where even strategies that would never use synchro monsters use Halky Firebrax, such as Sky Striker, which would use Halk to easily climb into Axis Code Talker to OTK your opponent. It could also be used to build boards, as by playing a single copy of Deathspot 001 and summoning onto the field with Halk, you had access to a powerful board building tool when using both Halk and 001 to summon Mega Phantom Beast Aurora Dawn. Aurora Dawn then gave you three level 3 machine tokens, which would trigger Deathspot 001's effect and summon it from the graveyard to perform a bunch of synchro plays. This engine featured commonly in a ton of different rogue and meta strategies because of the insane advantage it generated since it was an amazing plan A for decks like Infernoble and Adventure, and a superb plan B for decks like Sword Soul. And even after Aurora Dawn was banned this year, it didn't stop decks from capitalizing on Halky Fibrax. Because as long as there was a busted tuner in the game, Halk was going to be able to take advantage of it. Even prior to the banning of Aurora Dawn, adventure decks were instead using a Rose Dragon engine to access powerful synchro boss monsters like Baron de Fleur by generating a ton of free level 3 tuner bodies that could be used for synchro and link climbing. And even after Red Rose Dragon was limited, Hal could easily just special it from the deck so you'd access to it at all times. But for as absurd as Hal's first effect is, its second is just as strong and is a huge part in why it eventually found its way to the ban list. You see, Halk's second effect has a particularly broken synergy with another amazing link too, Artifact Dagda, which could set Artifact Scythe directly from your deck to your spell and trap card zone. And when destroyed during your opponent's turn, Scythe special summoned itself from the graveyard and locks your opponent out of special summoning from the extra deck for the rest of the turn. After the May 2022 ban list, Halky Firebrax became the best way of destroying your own Scythe to trigger its effect, as you could summon TG Wonder Magician from your extra deck during your opponent's main phase which could pop your own set Scythe to summon it to the field and lock your opponent out of their extra deck. But that's not all. Because that Wonder Magician was a level 5 tuner that also had an effect to synchro summon during your opponent's main phase, and could synchro with a level 5 artifact Scythe, you could then go into the level 10 Baron de Floor for a free negate. Halk is an absurd card, especially for how generic it is. And even during this tier 0 format, Halk would still likely be seen play if it was legal for how absurd it is. And continuing our list from last video, at number 5 we have Predaplant Verte Anaconda, an even more generic Link 2 monster than Halky Fibrax. Verte could be made with any two effect monsters and had two effects that you could take advantage of. The first effect lets you target any monster in the field to change its attribute to dark until the end of the turn. But it's the second effect of Verte which made it see widespread use, as by sending a normal or quick play spell card with fusion in its name from your deck to the graveyard, and by paying 2000 light points, you could have Verte copy the effect of that fusion spell card, but you couldn't summon any of the monsters for the rest of the turn. While Verte's second effect is incredibly strong, it's only as strong as the fusion spells it can copy. If it could only send Polymerization or Super Poly, this effect would actually be quite bad and fairly situational. Fortunately for Verte, however, there have been three fusion spells that saw common use this year that were so busted that a ton of different strategies were willing to change the way they built their decks, just so they could accommodate using them with Verte Anaconda. These three fusion spells were Red Eyes Fusion, Fusion Destiny, and Branded Fusion. These fusion spells all require different materials, all summon different boss monsters, and all saw play in different kinds of decks, but the one thing each of these cards had in common is that they summoned a powerful fusion boss monster by sending materials from the deck to the graveyard. This gave any strategy that could put two effect monsters on the field a free end board piece that could be used as a plan B option in case their main engine was interrupted, provided they were willing to play the fusion spell's respective bricks. Red Eyes Fusion was the worst fusion spell of the three, as it required you to play two normal monsters that you couldn't use for anything, and Red Eyes Dark Dragoon, for as strong as it is, was by far the worst payoff between the three fusion spells. Branded Fusion was slightly better, as it only required you to play a single copy of Fallen of Albaz that you could fuse away into Mirror Jade alongside Verte, and was particularly synergistic with a few Albaz lore strategies. But Fusion Destiny was by far the strongest fusion spell that you could use with Verte Anaconda. Fusion Destiny did require two monsters in your deck to actually use, Usually, decks would play Destiny Hero Celestia and Destiny Hero Dasher, but these two bricks had such good graveyard effects that they would make up for any advantage you lost by drawing them. Since Celestia was a free draw too if you had no cards in hand, and Dasher could let you summon out a monster from your hand for free during your draw phase, meaning these two bricks actually represented a ton of follow-up. And that's all without even mentioning the boss monster that Verte and Fusion Destiny facilitated, Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer. 
a Destiny Hero boss monster that allowed you to pop a card you controlled and a card your opponent controlled at quick effect speed, and whenever DP was destroyed, you could trigger its effect to special summon out a Destiny Hero monster from your graveyard during your next standby phase. DPE was an astonishingly good card. Its interruption had so much potential for what it could be used for. It could be removal from one of your opponent's key combo pieces or boss monsters. It was a way to deal with your opponent's floodgates. It was a way to pop your own artifact scythe to lock your opponent out of their extra deck. There was just so much that so many different decks could do with DPE. From being one of Phantom Knight's main boss monsters, to seeing play in Sword Soul, Sky Striker, Prank Kids, Branded, and so many more strategies, Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer and its associated Garnets were more than worth it to play for the amount of free advantage it represented. And a huge part of why so many strategies, Rogue and Meta alike, were able to use DP is because of Predator Plant Verti Anaconda being so easily accessible, as it made the potentially difficult draws of DPE well worth it. And in the first 5 months of 2022, if you're facing a deck, it was extremely likely to have featured both Verte and DPE. Currently, however, just like Halk, Verte is banned in the TCG. Fusion Destiny is at 3 copies, so decks can still play the DP engine if they want, but it's no longer worth it when you don't have the same guarantee that you were getting with the engine without Verte. But for while it was around, Verte changed how most pilots built their deck, and was an integral part of the success of so many different strategies throughout the year. And flipping into our number 4 spot is Dimensional Barrier, a normal trap card that saw a lot of playing people's side decks this year for being a card that would guarantee that you were winning either game 2 or 3. When you activate Dimension Barrier, you have to declare one monster type from among Fusion, Synchro, Xyz, or Pendulum monsters, and for the rest of the turn, the effects of monsters declared type are negated, and neither player can special summon monsters of that declared type. Basically, with Dimensional Barrier, you could just lock your opponent out of summoning from the extra deck. Against Sword Soul, you could call Synchro, against Branded, you can call Fusion, and against Phantom Knives, you can call Xyz. And this basically acted as a turn skip and auto win against a lot of this year's best strategies. But despite being so strong, Dimensional Barrier and cards like it couldn't be playing the main deck because it relied too much on going first, and as a result mainly saw competitive play in people's side decks. Because while Dimensional Barrier could be relied on to win a game 1, it was virtually guaranteed to win game 2 or 3 when you have opportunities to choose to go first, especially with specific knowledge of what deck your opponent is playing. This meant that with a single card, you could lock almost any non-link strategy that uses the extra deck out of playing the game at all. Especially when backed up by a strong board of monsters that could just OTK your opponent as soon as you reached your second turn. Dimensional Bear is a trap card that makes on this list because of how effective it's been this year against a lot of the top decks. But there have been a number of amazing trap cards in people's side decks this year which have been incredibly important in winning games too. Anti-Spell Fragrance is another great example, and while less effective than Dimensional Bear against something like Sword Soul, Anti-Spell Fragrance was even better at countering other common staples, like Dark Ruler No More or Rite of Iron Masir. Likewise, a Pointer the Red Lotus is also another incredibly strong card. A Pointer is basically a power crept mind crush, and could be used to look at your opponent's hand and banish a card from it until the end phase, and would use this to snipe your opponent's board breakers like Evenly or Forbidden Droplet. Or if they didn't have any board breakers, you could just steal their combo or starters instead. A Pointer specifically was so strong that it even found its way onto the limited list this year. Side decking winning trap cards is by no means a novel strategy, but it's one that performed excellently in 2022. Guaranteeing a free win off of a single card is amazing, it meant that you were likely to win the actual match. But as it stands right now, these staples are currently seeing a lot less play because of the rise of tier limits, which are capable of playing on your turn before you even have the ability to make your game winning trap card live. Rolling into number 3 is Rite of Arbasir, a normal spell card which allowed for the adventure engine to become an integral part of so many different decks this year. Rite has one effect, but the effect guarantees a ton of advantage off of a single card. You can only activate Rite when you don't control an adventure token, and it allows you to special summon an adventure token to your side of the field for free. Then you can place a fateful adventure card directly from your deck into your spell and trap card zone. But Rite also comes with a restriction that prevents players from using on-field effects of any normal summon monsters during the turn it's activated. Rite's restriction is actually really interesting, because it made the card, and by extension the adventure engine, generic enough to be played in a ton of different strategies but gave deck builders a hard choice between using either the Adventure Engine to cover for some of the deck's weaknesses, or having access to effects of their powerful normal summons. And in a lot of cases, the Adventure Engine won out because of how incredibly strong it is. A single Rite of Armasir gives you heaps of usable card advantage. It generated a free token body and allowed you to grab your Fateful Adventure from your deck, and that Fateful Adventure could be used to search out Draco back whenever any monster is summoned to the field. Then you could use the other effect of Fateful to search for your Wandering Griffin Rider, as long as you discard a card. And if you just so happen to discard the Draco back that you searched, you can trigger Draco back's graveyard effect to equip itself back onto your field to the adventure token, and then special summon out your Griffin Rider from your hand for free. So, the one copy of Rite gives you two bodies on field, with one of them being a negate, 
and gives follow-up for Fateful Adventure, which you could use on your next turn to search for either Enchantress or Griffin Rider again, and a way to out an opponent's monster or floodgate with Draco back. And as a result of its general strength, when the Adventure Engine released this year, it saw a ton of playing rogue decks, like Phantom Knives and Branded, that had adapter lists to not need their normal summons effects. But the best decks that could take advantage of the Adventure Engine were ones that never used on-field effects of normal summons in the first place, so they didn't need to adapt their strategies to gain access to the powerful staple. And by far, the best decks that could use the Adventure Engine this year was Prank Kids. Prank Kids were already a decently strong deck going to 2022, as during 2021 they topped multiple events but it did have a few issues. The deck was astonishingly consistent and could play a ton of hand traps and staples, but the deck itself also struggled against hand traps and didn't have a strong archetypal way to deal with spell and trap cards. But with the release of the Adventure Engine, Prank Kids basically got a free negate in Griffin Rider that they could use to stop an opponent's Ash Blossom and allow them to combo, or just allowed the deck access to a free negate they could use to stop an opponent's board breaker like Triple Tactics Talents and made the deck fairly dominant during the early parts of the year. But Prank Kids wasn't the only deck taking advantage of the Adventure Engine. A lot of decks that did use Adventure Engine this year used it in a similar capacity to Prank Kids in order to get a free negate to help with their main strategy. But one of the most interesting uses of Adventure was in Rose Dragon's synchro strategies that centered around Crystron Halky Fibrax. This deck didn't use the Adventure Engine as a negate, instead the deck used the free bodies that the Adventure Engine provided to more easily access their synchro boss monsters alongside the Rose Dragon engine because the bodies they provided happened to be extremely beneficial levels that helped make the deck work even after Roradon was banned. Griffin Rider was level 7 so it could be used really easily with the level 3 Rose Dragon tuners in order to go into Baron de Floor, swapping one negate for another while getting to use their effects of your Rose Dragon to summon Rock's Rose Dragon from the deck. Meanwhile, the actual adventure token was level 4. This also synergized with the level 3 Rose Dragon tuners and would be used to dip into the pool of level 7 synchros to access cards like Shooter Riser Dragon, and more importantly, Yazi. And that Yazi could be popped with the effect of Baron de Floor so you could use its effect to summon out any more monster from your deck. In the Scythe build you can grab Mare Mare for Link Summons, or in the Tenyu build you can grab Moye or Taya. Essentially, the deck had an insane range of options by using the Adventure Engine even though they weren't using it in the traditional way. Right has been one of the best staples of the year and has been used by a ton of strategies in a myriad of different ways for the insane amount of advantage it provides, to the point where even decks like Branded and Sprite, which actually care about their normal summon effects, were willing to build around using the engine. Digging its way to number 2 is Mystic Mind, a card which has terrorized formats since its release and 2022 was no exception. Mystic Mind is a field spell with the effect that it's capable of floodgating your opponent out of the game entirely and winning the game on its own. While it's on the field, the player who controls the most amount of monsters cannot declare an attack nor activate any monster effects but it does come with its own built-in out, as if both players control the same number of monsters during the end phase, Mystic Mind will destroy itself. A resolved Mystic Mind can be game-winning by itself, so it's no surprise that it's made its way into the side and main decks of a ton of different strategies this year, and as a result, made deck builders change the way they built their decks so they had at least a single out to Mystic Mind in their main deck and didn't randomly lose one of their games in a match. Sprite had Smashers, Adventure decks had Dragoback, and Flunderese had Unexplored Wins. But not every deck was so lucky. The likes of Tri Brigade, Branded, and Sword Soul all really struggled to deal with Mystic Mind with the tools that were available to them. This gave Mind several opportunities this year to see competitive play. And while it's seen a ton of play in decks this year, it was most infamously used by Sky Striker during May Hart for its YCS. Despite being only a rogue contender at mass, Striker actually won the entire YCS, beating Sword Soul in the finals. But while Striker is a good strategy, a huge part of why it won was because of the deck's use of Mystic Mind. Since it played a lot of ways to find mine and lock your opponent out of the game, by doing it on one cards like Demise of Land and Metaverse, Sky Striker could basically ensure that mine was accessible to them at all times, which was really important because of mine resolved since Sky Striker had full control over the game. As they could either try to push through their opponent's board with the use of their spells and ray, knowing that their opponent couldn't use their monster effects, or they could just sit behind it if they believed their opponent had no out. This, along with the other floodgates that Striker could easily play, led to its upset victory. But this, of course, wouldn't be the end of Mind's use this year. Because it also just so happened to be amazing carbon facing Tier Limits. You see, Tier Limits actually struggled to out Mystic Mind after it had already been resolved. The Ishizu cards made things a little bit easier, as you could just shuffle back a tier name to trigger your Pelerino's effect to pop their mind. But if Pelerino wasn't on the field already, you were going to lose that game. And as a result, Tier Limits experimented with a number of interesting Mystic Mind outs that would have never seen play otherwise. Fusion Substitute could put back Kid Kalos to draw you a card to trigger your Pelerinos to pop mine. Pot of Avarice could also trigger your field and let you draw two cards and can easily be used by Tier Limit so they fill up the graveyard so quickly. The deck even tried to run a small sprite package just so they could natively run sprite smashers to deal with mine. Mystic Mine was bound to be banned eventually, and it was in this year's December ban list. But the impact that mine had on the game, both this year and as a whole, cannot be understated. When a single card changes deck building this much, it's always going to be format warping. But for as strong as Mystic Mine is, 
one staple this year had even more of a meta impact. And breaking their chains as the best staple of 2022 is Bestial Magnum Hut, along with the Bestials as a whole, which can act as both hand traps and as an engine at the same time. Most of the Bestials all share a common effect, which makes them useful as hand traps. This common effect allows you to spell summon from the hand by banishing a light or dark monster from either player's graveyard. This effect is normally just spell speed 1, but if your opponent controls a monster, it actually becomes a quick effect that you could use at any point during either player's turn. Every hand trap Bestial also comes with its own unique effect as well. So Roner lets you foolish a Bestial monster or a branded spell or trap card when it's sent to the graveyard. Bestial Druid Swarm lets you send a spell summon monster your opponent controls to the graveyard whenever Druid Swarm is sent from the field to the graveyard. And last, but certainly not least, Bestial Magma Hut triggers on its special summon and lets you search for any dragon monster except for Magma Hut itself that's in your deck or in your graveyard during the end phase of the turn. The majority of the Bestial archetype is actually just a series of DD Crows that specifically target light and dark monsters, and even just DD Crow itself has had an almost game warping impact this year. Whether it's been used to banish your opponent's token collector, or their target for Brandon and Red, or even just to take your sprite opponent's Ronin Toten out of the game, DD Crow and by extension Graveyard Interaction as a whole has been extremely important in 2022, especially with Ishizu tier limits being the best deck of the format as they mainly play using their graveyard effects. But despite how strong Crow has been this year, it's actually currently seen very little play against tier limits. And it's not because Crow's effect has gotten any weaker, it's just that for the current format, the Bistials do what Crow does, but better. While DD Crow is solid against Ishizu tier limits, all DD Crow really does is interact with the opponent's graveyard, and even then, it makes you go minus one at card advantage to do so. The Biz deals, however, do a lot more. They can interact with the graveyard like Crow, and stop the graveyard effects of the dark tier limit monsters by banishing them before they can resolve. But in doing so, you also get to special summon out a free body to the field with an impressive 2500 attack stat that can be used to apply pressure to your opponent by threatening their board with the battle phase. In the case of Saronir, this is where its utility ends, unless you play a branded or bestial based strategy. But for Druid Swarm and Magma Hut, their bonus effects are insanely useful. Druid Swarm allows you to break boards by linking it away, or even just crashing by battle and easily force out interaction from your opponent. But by far the strongest of all the bestials is Bestial Magma Hut. Magma Hut's effect is what allows for bestials to more than just be a series of hand traps. Because while it's great for any strategy using any kind of dragons, like Dragon Link, this effect can also be used to add any of your other bestial monsters to your hand, ensuring you'll always have a way to interact with your opponent's graveyard. This has allowed for the bestial monsters to see play as a stable engine of at least three Magma Hut and one Druid Swarm and a ton of strategies that are trying to counter tier limits right now. Tier limits themselves have even been running a bestial engine so they can counter other tier limit pilots, especially since they can use Dark to steal an opponent's Magma Hut from the graveyard to get their bestial engine online. In fact, the best rogue strategies of the format are decks that are capable of dodging or not caring about the effects of bestials. Naturias and Medulce are earth monsters, so the Bistials can't interrupt their grave. Sprite can lock both players into level 2s before dark monsters hit the graveyard, and Flunderese only ever puts Dimension Shifter in the graveyard. Overall, the Bistials are an extremely recent engine, but the way they've twisted the game around them is huge. These cards aren't just format warping, they're game warping. And even after two elements leave the metagame, it's likely the Bistials are still going to see playing people's main or side decks for years to come, making them the best staples of 2022 by far. In this video, we'll be going over staple cards, cards which are usable in pretty much any deck that are of the SR rarity, and I'll be avoiding any of the limited or semi-limited cards, because the Master Duel ban list loves to limit some of the really good staples, so those are pretty obviously good by their restricted status. And at number 10, we have Eater of Millions. This is a level 1 monster which can't be normal summoned, and can only be special summoned from your hand by banishing 5 more of your cards face down, which can include cards from your hand, field, or extra deck. So, normally you bring this card out from your hand by banishing 5 cards from your extra deck that you don't need, and then what this card does in the field is if it's attacking something, you can banish the attack target face down at the start of the damage step. So, what's really good about Eater of Millions is how it's just able to remove pretty much any monster in the game, except ones that are just straight up immune to card effects. So if your opponent has some kind of unbeatable boss monster, Eater of Millions can definitely get rid of it, assuming the attack goes through or its effect is not negated. And it also applies its effect if it's attacked by your opponent, but has a soft once per turn. So if your opponent's trying to get rid of Eater of Billions without a card effect, they'll have to attack into it twice before they're able to destroy it by battle. It also has some really niche protection, where it cannot be tributed or uses material for an extra deck summon except for Link Monsters. Which means your opponent can't Kaiju the card, and also your opponent can't get rid of it with Super Polymerization. I'm sure the intended uses of its drawbacks was not to give it some protection, but to make it so you can't use it as an extender but it unintentionally gives it some protection against common outs to hard to take out boss monsters, even if it is fragile to pretty much everything else. Now, 
Even though Eater Billions is really good at eating through any boss monster your opponent has, a lot of the best boss monsters have effects that can negate activated effects. So it's not a one-stop shop remove of all of your opponent's boss monsters, but it is a scary threat that your opponent will definitely spend resources to get rid of, if you can afford the main deck space and banishing five of your extra deck monsters to use it. And at number 9, we have Ice Dragon's Prison. This is a trap card which allows you to special summon one monster from your opponent's graveyard to your side of the field, but its effects are negated. Then you can activate an additional effect, where you can banish one monster from both players' fields that have the same type as each other. So the reason Ice Dragon's Prison sees play as a staple is because it can be used for both defense and offense, and because it's a generic, non-target banish. If you're trying to push for a game and you only need a little bit more damage, you can use Ice Dragon's Prison to special summon a monster from your opponent's graveyard, and then just attack with it. More commonly, you'll use it for its banish effect, where you go to special summon a monster from your opponent's graveyard as a type of monster that you wish to banish on the field. Then you'll have the option to non-target banish it, as well as deprive your opponent of a resource from their graveyard. So if your opponent has a particularly nasty monster which is either immune to targeting or destruction effects, or maybe even both, Ice Dragon's Prison is a good way to get rid of it. And since most meta decks will play a whole bunch of monsters of the same type, it should be pretty easy to actually activate the effect of the card against the average meta deck. And because it has the versatility of also being useful as an offensive tool, in addition to a disruption tool, it actually sees competitive play, which is why they made it an SR rarity and mastered. And at number 8, we have Sekka's Light. This is a spell card which allows you to draw two cards, then if this card is in your graveyard, you can banish it from your graveyard in order to shuffle one monster from your hand back into your deck in order to draw another card. So, it's basically a pot of greed that also allows you to mulligan one card in your hand from your graveyard. So, two excellent effects, and because this card has such excellent effects, it has some really nasty downsides, where you can't activate its draw two effect unless you have no spell or trap cards in your graveyard, and also, the card locks you out of using any spell or trap cards for the rest of the duel, except other copies of this card. So, if you play Sekka's Light, it's the only spell you're playing in your deck, which is why both of its effects are so generically good. However, the effects were so good that the card is currently limited in the TCG, but unlimited at three copies in Master Duel. So if you're playing a deck that has a whole bunch of hand traps and doesn't really use spells and traps anyway, Sekka's Light is the perfect card to be the only spell card in your deck, and preferably at three copies. And at number seven, we have Skill Drain. This is a continuous trap card which requires you to pay 1,000 life points to activate it. Then, as long as this card is face-up on the field, it negates the effects of all face-up monsters on the field. It does not negate the effects of monsters anywhere else, though. So, you can still use hand traps or graveyard effects no problem. Although, being able to negate the effects of all monsters on the field forever, or as long as this card stays up on the field, is incredibly powerful, to the point where this card was limited in the TCG for a long time for being too good of a floodgate. And it reigns unlimited in Master Duel, so it's obviously an excellent card to add to your deck if you can play around it, which there are a lot of competitive meta decks doing exactly that. Because most decks in the game are very monster effect heavy and don't play a lot of spell or trap card, spell or trap card destruction. So activating a skill drain can just kind of win you the game against certain decks, unless they have a specific spell or trap card in their hand that can answer it immediately. And one of the only reasons they took it off the ban list in the TCG is because the ban list in the TCG is balanced around a best of three matches, where you can go into the side deck in order to add more spell or trap card removal. In a best one of format like Master Duel, Skill Drain is kind of overpowered, and I won't be surprised if it's banned from the game in the future. And at number six, we have Droll and Lockbird. This is a hand trap which has the effect where if your opponent adds a card from their main deck to their hand, except during the draw phase, you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard in order to prevent them from doing that again for the rest of the turn. However, Unlike Ash Blossom and Joy Spring, which is able to negate a similar thing, Draw and Lockbird can only be used after the effect has already taken place. So it doesn't negate the effect of the card from happening, and simply prevents your opponent from adding any additional cards that turn. Now, this effect seems a lot better than it really is, because there's plenty of meta decks that can totally get by by only searching a single time on their turn. But a lot of the really good meta decks are able to search out a whole bunch, and Draw and Lockbird definitely keeps them in check. If you ever see a whole bunch of people maining Droll and Lockbird in the TCG, that usually means there's a whole bunch of overpowered decks in the meta that are probably going to get on the ban list pretty soon. However, in Master Duel, for some reason, they have maxi available at three copies. So a lot of average decks are drawing a whole bunch during certain turns. And a Droll and Lockbird can be used in order to stop that from being too much of a problem. However, usually people play maxi during your turn, 
And Draw and Lockbird also applies to you as well as your opponent. So in the process of stopping your opponent's maxi from drawing too many cards, you might inadvertently stop yourself from being able to search out any of the cards to continue your plays. So there are some drawbacks to the card, but it's still good enough that it's definitely a staple that should be considered to be included in your deck. And at number 5, we have DD Crow. This is another hand trap which has the effect where, at any point you want, you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard in order to banish one card from your opponent's graveyard. So, the best use of DD Crow is on one of your opponent's cards that they're already activating an effect that targets a monster in the graveyard, like maybe a monster reborn for example. Since DD Crow's effect is quick effect, you can just chain it in response to those cards in order to remove that target and cause the card to fizzle out, which sends it to the graveyard wasting the effect. Outside of that little combo, DD Crow can also just be used preemptively to remove resources from your opponent's graveyard if they're trying to set it up to do their plays, or get rid of a choice card from the graveyard that keeps them from coming back, like Sky Striker Ace Ray for example. There's also another SR card which has graveyard related hand trap effects called the Skullmeister, which is arguably just as useful as DD Crow, and are usually used alongside each other in decks that really want to shut down their opponent's graveyard. And at number 4, we have Evenly Matched. This is a trap card which has the effect where, at the end of the battle phase, you can force your opponent to banish cards they control so that they have the same number of cards that you do on the field. And also, if you control no cards on your side of the field, you can activate this card from your hand. So, Evenly Matched is one of the most powerful forms of removal for two reasons. First, it forces your opponent to remove the cards from the field, which bypasses pretty much all forms of protection, and it banishes the cards face down, which also bypasses pretty much all forms of floating effects. And since you can just use this from your hand during your turn, if you're going second, it's an excellent card to just get rid of everything on your opponent's side of the field, unless they have a way to negate this specific trap card, which makes Evenly Match one of the ultimate going second cards, as it can completely win you the game on its own if it resolves, and your opponent has a large enough field, since almost no monster is immune to the effects of Evenly Match. However, you do need to give up your battle phase in order to do this, and you can only do this going second, after your opponent has already set up their field. If you go first and open evenly matched, it's definitely not as useful as if you were going second, so there are some drawbacks to the card. However, the upsides is being one of the best removal cards in the game, period, so I think its few downsides are very warranted. And at number 3, we have Twin Twisters. This is a quick play spell card which simply allows you to discard one card from your hand in order to target up to two spell or trap cards in the field and destroy them. So, trading two cards in your hand to get rid of two of your opponent's back row cards, and it can be done during your opponent's turn if you wish, or immediately upon drawing the card. Twin Twisters is the ultimate power crept version of Mystical Space Typhoon, another card which has a similar effect but only targets one card and doesn't require you to discard anything. Now, with how much floodgates exist in the game that are not limited or restricted to Master Duel, looking at Skill Drain from earlier spawn this list, having a spell and trap card removal is a must. And Twin Twisters is one of the best ones you can have outside of the one copy of Harvey's Feather Duster that's allowed in your deck. Or if you're playing Lightning Storm, which is another really good UR rarity card, which can destroy all of your opponent's spell and traps, but only if you control no cards on your side of the field. Twin Twisters is obviously not as strong as Harpy's Feather Duster, which can pop all of your opponent's back row unconditionally, but it's like the second best thing. It can get rid of up to two, and it has the option to be used during your opponent's turn if you wish. There's also Cosmic Cyclone, which is a popular option in the SR Rarity, Spell and Trap Card Removal category, that is also a quick play spell card, but has the ability to banish a spell or trap card instead of destroying it at the cost of 1,000 life points. Both Twin Twisters and Cosmic Cyclone see a lot of heavy use, as do pretty much all the other spell and trap card removal cards, because of just how many floodgates there are in the game currently, and just how useful they are at popping other back row cards as well. And at number 2, we have Nightmare Phoenix. This is a Link 2 monster which can be brought out with any two monsters of different names, and has the effect on its summon where you discard one card from your hand to destroy one spell or trap card your opponent controls. So, the reason Nightmare Phoenix is one of the most played Link monsters in the game is because it's super easy to go into in pretty much any deck, and it allows you targeted back row removal, and it's because of this card that a lot of decks don't bother to run main deck spell and trap card removal in the TCG. You do have to discard from your hand in order to use it, but a lot of meta decks can easily facilitate that discard, which is why the previous spot, Twin Twisters, sees so much play with little problem. And Nightmare Phoenix also has the added benefit, where it can situationally give battle immunity to a Link monster that it's co-linked to, including itself. And it can just be used as a Link climbing tool, because there's no restrictions on how you can use it after it uses its effects. So when it hits the field, its effect is usable immediately, so you only have to worry about a negate stopping its effect from happening, 
and then it can be used later on to go into a bigger, better boss monster. And the most important thing is having all of these useful features while being versatile in how you can bring it out, with just any two monsters of different names, including tokens. And at number one, we have Pot of Desires. This is a normal spell card which allows you to draw two cards, but at the cost of banishing the top 10 cards of your deck face down. You can only use one of these cards once per turn, so the worst possible thing you can do with Pot of Desires is draw into two other copies of Pot of Desires with its effect. Because normally you only want to resolve one Pot of Desires per duel anyway, because banishing 10 cards from your deck face down is kind of a steep cost, but is definitely worth it for the effect at least once. However, having to do it again might be a lot more costly, and rarely will you even be able to resolve the effect three times in a duel. Either way, most people do opt to play through copies just to have an increased chance of drawing at least one of them, because being able to draw two cards for one is just a pure plus one in card advantage that can extend pretty much any play, as there are very few decks where Pot of Desires is bad in, and every deck benefits from a generic plus one in card advantage, especially if that plus one is just pure drawing, which is why Pot of Extravagance is also a heavily played staple, which is also in the SR rarity. Pot of Extravagance also allows you to draw two cards, but at the cost of only being usable at the start of your main phase one, you have to banish six cards from your extra deck face down randomly, and you can't draw any other cards for the rest of the turn. And Pot of Extravagance is played just as much as Pot of Desires, because being able to draw plus two cards generically from your deck is good in pretty much any deck. Although Pot of Extravagance is a lot harder to use than Pot of Desires, because you don't really want to risk banishing any key extra deck monsters, if your deck really needs your extra deck. If you don't really need your extra deck, Pot of Extravagance is probably better to play than Pot of Desires so you don't have to worry about banishing key combo points from your main deck. Then there's also Pot of Prosperity, which is another SR pot card which is played just as much as the other two, but isn't a generic plus one. The way Pot of Prosperity works is you can banish three to six cards from your extra deck face down of your choice, then you look at the top cards of your deck equal to the amount of cards you banished, and you get to add one of those cards to your hand. Then you place the other ones on the bottom of your deck in any order, and all damage your opponent takes for the rest of this turn is cut in half. Pot of Prosperity also has a hard once per turn on its effect, and also prevents you from drawing other cards for the rest of the turn. And the reason you would play Pot of Prosperity over the other two is because it gives you more choice in which cards you're actually adding to your hand, if you're only looking for one specific piece. So these three pot cards, all of the SR rarity, are all very good staples that are usable in a very wide variety of decks. And the one you use is pretty much dependent on which kind of deck you're playing, as rarely do decks play all three of these cards. In the SR rarity, there's also Pot of Avarice and Pot of Duality, which occasionally see play but aren't as generic to use as the previous three I just talked about. A staple card is a term for a card that's usable in pretty much every deck. So in this list we'll be going over the cards of the highest rarity in the game that are probably some of the best ones to craft or they're just going to be useful in everything. And at number 10, we have Solemn Judgment. This is a counter trap card which has the effect where, if your opponent would summon a monster or activate a spell or trap card, you can pay half your life points to negate that thing and destroy the card. Now, paying half your life points seems like a steep cost for a card effect, but if the thing you need to negate was something that would have completely destroyed your board, like maybe a Harpy's Feather Duster, then that is a pretty cheap price to pay for not losing the game instantly. And that's kind of why Solemn Judgment is played, normally to protect back row cards from devastating cards, like Harpy's Feather Dust or a Lightning Storm. And it's also just useful at stopping key summons, since if you're able to disrupt your opponent's plays, then you don't really care if you have half your life points missing. Your life points are a resource to be used, not something to be hoarded, as you only need one life point in order to win, and most decks don't really have burn damage, so you don't have to worry about being at a low life point value anyway. And also, since it's a counter trap card, most monster negates can't respond to it, so you can safely negate your opponent's stuff if they have a board of monster negates on the field, like a Borrowload Savage Dragon or even Herald of Ultimateness. And at number 9, we have Effect Veiler. This is a level 1 tuner hand trap which has the effect where, during your opponent's main phase, you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard in order to negate the effects of one face of effect monster your opponent controls until the end of the turn. Which does also carry over to the graveyard in some circumstances. So if your opponent tries to use the effect of Lone Fire Blossom under the effect of Effect Veiler, its effect will still be negated, even though they're no longer on the field. Now, Effect Veiler is kind of power crept by Infinite Impermanence, as it can kind of do the same thing. But Effect Veiler has seen a huge resurgence in popularity due to the effects of Selene, Queen of the Master Magicians. Because outside of being a decent hand trap that can negate your opponent's effects, which is the name of the game in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, it's also just the perfect type for a pretty generic combo that's usable in a whole bunch of decks. Here's how the combo goes. If you have a way to go to Crystron Halky Fibrax, which is a card that's played in a whole bunch of different kinds of combos, then 
You can use Crystal Hockey Fibrax in order to summon Effect Veiler from your deck. Then you can use those cards to go into Selene, Queen of the Master Magicians, who then gains spell counters equal to the amount of spells on the field and in the graveyards. And if it gained at least three spell counters, you can use its effect in order to special summon a spellcaster type monster from your hand or graveyard, which you use in order to bring back the Effect Veiler. Then use Effect Veiler and Selene, Queen of the Master Magicians to go into Axis Kotaker, with a three material link monster as one of its materials, giving it an extra 3,000 attack points. So Effect Veiler is both useful as a hand trap and as a combo tool into going into Axis Kotaker, if you're able to get Crystron Halky Fibrax on the field, which a lot of decks try to do with whatever engine they're running anyway. And at number eight, we have Lightning Storm. This is a going second card, which can only be activated if you control no cards, where it allows you to choose one of its two effects to either destroy all attack position monsters your opponent controls, or destroy all of your opponent's spell and trap cards. The reason something like Lightning Storm is played more than cards like Raigeki or even Harpy's Feather Duster is because it has the versatility of being able to choose one of those two effects to use, even if those other two cards can do the same thing but with less restrictions. And if a card is able to perform multiple tasks, which are all good, it's going to see infinitely more play than something that only specializes in one kind of thing. Kind of like why Effect Veiler saw a resurgence in play, because of its combo with Selene, Queen of the Master Magicians. And in number seven, we have Infinite Impermanence. This is a hand trap which can only be used during your opponent's turn as long as you have no cards on your side of the field, where it simply negates the effects of one monster until the end of the turn, just like Effect Veiler. And the reason this card is really good on a hand trap is because you can use it during your opponent's first turn in order to stop their combos, so they can't set up an unbreakable board of monsters. Which is just infinitely more usable than having to set the card first and then wait an extra turn, where they might already have an established board where they can just destroy everything you're trying to do. However, if you do go the route of setting the card, it gains an additional effect where, if Infinite Impermanence is activated while it was set in the Spell and Trap card zone first, and you successfully negate the effect of a monster, it also goes on to negate the effects of all Spell or Trap cards in the column as the card until the end of the turn. Which means you can set Infinite Impermanence in the same column as one of your opponent's Spell or Trap cards, and use it as either a Spell and Trap card negate, or a monster negate, just as long as you have a monster effect to negate on the field, because you have to negate the effect of a monster in order to activate its columns lockdown. And both of its effects are really good. And since it has this versatility, just like Lightning Storm, it's one of the more played hand traps in the game. And at number six, we have Nibiru the Primal Bean. This is a hand trap that can only be activated when your opponent has normal or special summon five or more times this turn, where you contribute all face-up monsters in the field in order to summon a token to your opponent's side of the field and this card to your side of the field. So basically, it's a full board wipe during your opponent's turn when they're trying to set up combos, which can kind of win you the game on its own. However, the effect is completely useless against decks that don't combo or don't summon more than five times per turn. So against the deck that it's usable against, it's one of the best cards in the game. Can completely win you the game on its own, especially if you summon one three times in a duel against the Virtual World player. If your opponent's not playing combo though, then it's a dead card in your hand that you're probably not going to get to use. Which is why it's better used as a side deck option in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! But it's still really good nonetheless in Master Duel, even though it does have these downsides. And at number five, we have Forbidden Droplet. This is probably the best going second card in the game, because it has the ability to completely shut down all of your opponent's monster negates without giving them a chance to respond to it or negate its effects. Because it has the effect where, on a quick play spell card, you can send any number of cards in your hand or field to the graveyard to choose an equal number of effect monsters your opponent controls in order to cut their attacks in half and negate their effects until the end of the turn. And your opponent is not allowed to respond to this card with other cards of the same types of cards you sent to the graveyard for its activation. So, for example, if you sent a monster card to the graveyard to activate its effect, your opponent is not allowed to activate a monster effect in response, and so on and so on. And just remember, since this is a quick play spell card, in order to kind of circumvent the cost a little bit, what you can do is activate the effect of a spell or trap card first, then just chain forbidden droplet to that card in order to send it to the graveyard, since most spell and traps don't need to be on the field in order to resolve their effects. So you can basically use this card for free if you just chain it in response to one of your own Monster Reborn or Upstart Goblins and then send that card to the graveyard because its effect will still resolve. Or any other search you have for whatever archetype you're playing. But most of the time you're using it, you're probably trying to negate one of your opponent's monster negates, so you probably want to send at least one monster from your hand to the graveyard as well. And Forbidden Droplet is really good if you're trying to out an unbeatable boss monster like Herald of Ultimateness, as they can't respond or negate Forbidden Droplet as long as you send a monster. And one of the advantages Forbidden Droplet has over other going second cards is that you can also set it and use it during your opponent's turn as a form of disruption as well. And at number four, we have Axe as Code Talker. This is a Link 4 monster that only requires two plus effect monsters as materials, 
and has a whole bunch of effects that are basically designed in order to counter meta decks. Where, when this card is summoned, it gains a thousand attack times the link rating of one of its materials, which allows it to go into some really high attack power values and beat over any of your opponent's big boss monsters. A lot of unkillable boss monsters only have the weakness of being destroyed by battle. So if your opponent has something out like Ultimate Falcon, which is immune to all card effects and has a high attack power value, Axe's Code Talker kinda makes quick work of it. It also has a whole bunch of spell speed 4 effects, where your opponent can't respond to anything it tries to do, as it has the effect where your opponent can't activate any cards or effects in response to this card's effects, which is important because it has another effect where you can banish a Link monster from your field or graveyard to destroy one card your opponent controls. And this effect is not once per turn and only has a restriction where you can only use one attribute of Link monster per banish. So if you banished a fire monster to use the effect, you can't banish another fire link monster for the rest of the turn. And since your opponent can't respond to any of its effects, and more importantly, its destruction doesn't target, you don't have to worry about your opponent trying to negate its destruction. And since the name of the game in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is negating your opponent's effects, Axe's Code Talker does a really good job of just responding to the effect negate meta by just ignoring it, and also ignoring cards that can't be targeted by card effects, while also being a big beat stick that can just destroy stuff really easily. And at number 3, we have Called by the Grave. This is a quick play spell card which has the effect where you can banish one monster from your opponent's graveyard in order to gain the effect where the effects of monsters of the same name are negated until the end of the turn. Which means you can use this card in order to stop your opponent's hand traps. You see, most hand traps send themselves from the hand to the graveyard as a cost. Which means you can chain Called by the Grave to a hand trap in order to banish the card from the graveyard in order to retroactively negate the effect of the card as the chain resolves backwards. And since it just negates the effect of the monster's name for the rest of the turn, you don't have to worry about chain blocking, so it's one of the best ways to negate a monster's effect too. But be careful, because it also stops you from using cards with that monster's name for the rest of the turn too. So, Called by the Grave is one of the best cards you can have if you're trying to go first instead of an unbeatable combo, because it's like an anti-hand trap card that can also be used during your opponent's turn as a form of disruption, because a lot of decks like to use the graveyard in order to set up their plays. And since it's useful both as an anti-hand trap card going first, and just as a form of disruption on its own, it's one of the most played cards in the game, and currently semi-limited to two copies in Master Duel. And at number two, we have Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring. This is another hand trap which has the effect where, if your opponent would move a card from their deck somewhere else, you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard in order to negate that effect. And since most meta decks like to move cards from the deck somewhere else in order to accomplish their plays, by either searching out a card, sending it from the deck to the graveyard, or special so many monsters directly from the deck, Ash Blossom hits pretty much one of the best types of effects in the game that is one of the most common as well. If you have Ash Blossom and Joy Spring in your hand, chances are you're going to be able to use it against pretty much any deck you're facing against. And Ash Blossom is so useful in so many decks that it's kind of a benchmark for a meta deck, where if your deck can't play through a single Ash Blossom negate, then it's probably not competitive. And at number one, we have Maxi. This is a hand trap which has the effect where you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard in order to gain the effect, where for the rest of the turn, each time your opponent summons a monster, you get to draw one card. It does have a hard once per turn, so you can't stack up the effects. But basically, if you chain the effect in response to one of your opponent's cards that's about to summon something, you can guarantee to draw at least one card. And what makes this card very powerful is that in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, there are a lot of very powerful singular cards that can kind of win you the game on their own like Nibiru the Primal Being or Lightning Storm. And because just a singular card is so powerful, being able to draw cards too easily is heavily restricted in the game. Which means if you drop a Max C and your opponent's playing a combo deck, they know they pretty much have to stop summoning cards, otherwise they're just going to give you a whole bunch of card draw, which might have a whole bunch of really good going second cards that will just completely shut anything down they might put up anyway. All that to say, dropping Max C on your opponent is basically like telling them that their turn is over now. And since you can do this without losing any card advantage, Maxi is one of the most powerful cards in the game for basically letting you skip your opponent's turn. And the fact that it's a generic hand trap means it's definitely usable in pretty much every deck. If you're trying to find a card to craft for every deck, you can't really find something better than three copies of Maxi, because it's literally just the best card in the game. It's currently banned in the TCG for being too powerful, but for some reason, unlimited in Master Duel, so you should definitely take advantage of it until it eventually gets banned there as well. Yu-Gi-Oh! has come a long way since Legends of the Blue Eyes White Dragon and currently features over 10,000 different cards. With such a wide array of choices available, duelists have discovered hundreds of different wild and wacky tech options that can be used to strengthen certain strategies or be used to counter others. So let's take a look at some of the strongest tech choices of the past year, if they're any good, and why they managed to see any amount of play in the first place. Crawling in at number 10 is Neko Main King. 
a card with an effect that's seemingly impossible to activate, but if you do trigger it, it basically wins the game all on its own. You see, when Neko Main King activates, it becomes the end phase. No matter what phase of the turn your opponent was in previously, acting as a turn skip that can stop your opponent from playing and force them to pass the turn to you. The issue with Neko Main King, however, is that in order for it to actually use its effect, it must be sent to the graveyard by an opponent's card effect during their turn. And for a long while, this was the nail in the coffin for Neko Main King. Its effect was just too difficult to actually activate. And while there are a few gimmicky strategies that were centered around using cards like Yajiro Invader to force your opponent to trigger it, Neko Main King never really saw any widespread use. Until the release of the Ashizu cards. You see, the latest Ashizu cards can be split into two different categories. There's the modern Keldo and Mudora, which are known as the Shufflers, because they banish themselves from the graveyard in order to target up to three cards in either player's graveyard and shuffle them into their deck at quick effect speed. And then there's Agito and Kelbeck, the Millers, which both have graveyard effects that trigger when they're sent from the hand or deck to the graveyard, which causes both players to mill the top five cards of the deck. Every one of these Shizu monsters has seen play in tier limits, and is a big reason for their tier zero success. It's real easy to mill these Shizu cards with the effects of the tier limit monsters, and when you do, you either get free graveyard interaction with Keldo or Mudora, or you get to mill five with Kelbeck or Agito allowing for Telemans to access more of the graveyard effects so they can continue fusing and extending even further. But, one of the main downsides of Agito and Kelbeck is that while they both give you a ton of free mills that you can take advantage of, your opponent also has to mill 5 cards as well. This is where Neko Main King shines, because while there are a number of different graveyard effects that Telemans can accidentally trigger for you, like Nimble Angular if you're on Sprite, or even your own Telemans monsters, there are very few as game-winningly strong as Neko Main King. Now, unfortunately, Neko Main King, despite how good it was in theory against tier limits, didn't really stick around in people's deck lists for too long. It just relied too heavily on your opponent using both Kelbeck and Agito for it to be reliably triggered, which was becoming less and less common as tier limit lists began either focusing more on their shufflers and their millers, or would make Abyss Dweller before triggering any of their millers so your opponent can gain any advantage from the graveyard when you both milled. This, unfortunately, meant that Neko Main King became mostly unplayable, since tier was already playing around the opponent having good mills anyway, so it didn't really make much sense to play a breaky card that was unlikely to actually do anything. Currently, Neko Main King isn't seeing too much competitive play, but it hasn't fallen off completely. Even though it isn't really used as an effective punishment for Telemans anymore, it is still played as a centerpiece in certain Dark World strategies, as the effect of the new Graph of Fusion changes an effect an opponent activates to cause you to discard a card. And if you choose to discard Neko Main King, it's an easy way to skip your opponent's turn, since it technically still counts as your opponent's card effect. But as it stands right now, it's definitely not as strong as other tech choices that can be used to counter tier limits. And pouring in at number 9 is Magical Spring, a quick play spell card that has the potential to draw you a ton of cards. But it only draws cards equal to the number of face-up spell and trap cards your opponent controls, and then discards cards equal to the number of face-up spell and trap cards you control. So if you're facing a board of three face-up floodgates, you actually get to draw three cards, and then discard one since you control a face-up Magical Spring. This can be a pretty strong effect on par the likes of Graceful Charity but it actually comes with a major downside since it prevents your opponent's spell and trap cards from being destroyed or having their effects negated until the end of your opponent's next turn. This is usually what holds Magical Spring back from seeing too much competitive success, as the decks that you're usually going to be able to use it against are back row strategies reliant on continuous trap cards that are going to actively benefit from the floodgates being protected, even if you have the potential to draw a ton of cards. However, in 2022, the stars align for Magical Spring, where you could use it against the best decks of the format without worry about the downside, and against other strategies, this downside was actually a benefit instead. You see, up until the May ban list, after the release of the Adventure Token cards, Prank Kid's Adventure was undoubtedly one of the best decks you could play, and it ended off on multiple faces spell and trap cards that you didn't have to out in order to actually play, allowing you to draw a ton of cards to find your important board breakers or engine pieces. But that's not all. Because Magical Spring wasn't just a graceful charity in this format, it was also really strong into scythe locking strategies that just so happened to play the adventure engine. These types of decks would often use Artifact Dagda in order to set Artifact Scythe from their deck as a spell card, and then link some Inverte Anaconda to go into Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer, which could easily pop that set scythe on your opponent's turn and lock them out of the extra deck, effortlessly winning the game against most strategies. But if you chain Magical Spring to the Adventure Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer on your turn, your opponent's spell and trap cards, including that set scythe, won't be able to be destroyed by either player's card effects. This lets you draw a ton of free cards, all while stopping you from being floodgated out of the game. Unfortunately, Magical Spring doesn't see too much play right now. The time where it saw play was the perfect storm of everything going right for the card. But if Scythe decks do begin to see play again, alongside the Adventure Engine, it could potentially be in people's decks once more. And patrolling the streets at number 8 is Beat Cop from the Underworld, the third monster in the Underworld series of monsters. 
Bead Cop is actually a generic link monster, but can use any two monsters as material. However, it doesn't have an effect unless it's summoned with two dark monsters with different names. But if you do summon it with two dark monsters, it gains an effect which allows you to tribute a monster and target a phase-up card in the field to place a patrol counter on it. And if a card the patrol counter would be destroyed, either by battle or card effect, you remove the patrol counter instead. This effect actually has a lot of utility. It can be used to protect an important boss monster from powerful board breakers like Dark Hole or Raigeki. It can be used to protect your key spell and traps like Gene Raider Boss Stage or Pacifis. Or it can be used to protect an important Floodgate. This is precisely why sprite decks were running Beat Cop for a while. You see, post Power of the Elements, Mystic Mind was still a really powerful staple that could be used to put a stop to a ton of different strategies. However, decks like Tier Laments had native Mystic Mind outs, usually revolving around the pop effect of Pirla Reno and cards like Fusion Substitute and Pot of Avarice in order to trigger it. However, a lot of removal options available for Mystic Mind are based around destroying cards. This is why Sprite found so much value in Beat Cop from the Underworld. They would Mystic Mind their opponents, summon out two dark sprite monsters, and then go into Beat Cop from the Underworld so they could put a patrol counter in Mystic Mind. And because Beat Cop tributes a monster for cost, you can tribute Beat Cop itself to leave you with no monsters, locking your opponent under Mystic Mind. And since the protection of patrol counters is tied to the counters and not Beat Cop, the protection still applies. This meant that going second, landing a Mystic Mind with a patrol counter on it could just be game winning, since tier limits usually only played Mystic Mind's outs as one ofs. Beat Cop is a very interesting card, though with Mystic Mind banned, its best synergy is no longer available. However, its protection effect is still very strong and can come up again someday, especially for how generic it is. And hopping into number 7 is D3S Frog, a GX era fusion that technically supports the frog archetype, but has never actually seen play, until now, for how difficult it is to summon. Basically, to actually summon D3S Frog, you need to fuse not just one, not two, but three copies of Death Frog to bring it out. And if you do, you get a bad beat stick with a mediocre effect. As D3S Frog's only real effect is that it gains 500 attack for every Treeborn Frog in your graveyard. D3S Frog is not a card you ever want to summon, even in Frogs because its materials is incredibly specific and requires a ton of resources to go into, especially when a card like Guardian Chimera has a way better effect that allows you to clear the field and draw cards, while also just having a higher attack stat. However, even though 3DS Frog is one of the worst fusion monsters, it managed to see play in the extra decks of the currently Tier 0 Tier Limits. Prior to the release of Darkwing Blast, Tier Laments was an incredibly strong Tier 1 contender, but had yet to reach the heights of its power because it was missing a ton of tools that would get it later sets. So a lot of different unique cards and engines managed to see play in Tier Laments, with one of the best available being branded in High Spirits. With the effect of High Spirits, you can reveal a level 8 Aqua Fusion Monster with 2500 attack or defense in your extra deck, send an Aqua Tier Limit Monster from your hand to the graveyard, and then add Albion the Shrouded Dragon, this netted you a free draw Albion and allowed you to trigger the graveyard effects of your tier monsters. However, tier still didn't have access to Tillman's Recalus yet, the best target for high spirits, and so instead had to scour the card pool to find another level 8 Aqua Fusion monster with 2500 attack or defense until Recalus was released. And D3S Frog was the only monster in the game that happened to fit that description. So for a while, Tier Limits had to play D3S Frog in their extra deck if they wanted what High Spirits gave them. Now, even though D3S Frog was never being summoned, its specific type and attribute made it a necessary choice in Tier Limits and one that saw a decent amount of success, especially in Tier Lists playing a heavier branded package. D3S Frog is probably never going to see play again because of how bad of a card it is, but if Tier Limits Recalus ever finds its way onto the ban list, Tier might just have to go back to using it anyway. Posting itself at number 6 is Messenger of Peace, one of the oldest cards on this list that manages to play because of its really simple effect. And this effect just stops all monsters 1500 more attack from declaring an attack while it's phase up on the field. But during each of your standby phases, you either have to pay 100 life points or destroy the card. Compared to a lot of other floodgates in the game, like Gozen Match or There Can Be Only One, Messenger of Peace is definitely a lot weaker. But a key issue with these floodgates is that for as strong as they are, they still allow your opponent to attack to either threaten your life points or to go into Zoo so they can wipe your field. This is an issue that Runic had for a while. Runic can play a whole host of different floodgates to stop your opponent from comboing off so that you can eventually deck them out with your quick play spells. This gave the deck a ton of synergy with Mystic Mine since you could stop your opponent from using monster effects or attacking and just gradually banish cards over the course of several turns. But once Mystic Mine was banned, Runic was faced with the ever-present threat of the battle phase. While clearing your opponent's board with Lava Golems and Flashing Fire can be game-winning, your opponent is eventually going to find a way to deal damage to your life points, or a way to get to Zeus, leaving you a sitting deck. This is what Messenger of Peace prevents, because while it's phased up on the field, most monsters aren't going to be able to attack, leaving you safe from almost any threat. 
The best part is that Messenger of Peace has particularly strong synergy with Moonin, one of the Rudic monsters you can summon from the extra deck with your quick play spells. Because Moonin has 2000 defense, which makes it fairly difficult to out by battle, especially so a Messenger of Peace is on the field, stopping any high attack monsters from beating over Moonin. And because Moonin gains 1000 life points during each of your end phases, you'd never have to worry about paying the cost of Messenger of Peace, letting you stall with the card really easily until your opponent eventually decks out. Messenger of Peace is definitely an interesting choice and shows how powerful Floodgates, even weak ones, can be. Runic does benefit from a ton of other Floodgates, but Messenger of Peace is definitely one of the strangest parts of the deck that just so happens to work really, really well. And shining at number 5, we have Crystal Beast Emerald Tortoise, one of the worst Crystal Beast monsters in the game. Because on its own, Emerald Tortoise doesn't really do anything. It has a standard Crystal Beast effect, which allows you to place it face up in your spell and trap card zone as a continuous spell when it's destroyed as a monster, rather than send it to the graveyard and its unique effect just allows you to target a monster in the field that's attacked this turn and change it to defense position. Neither of these effects do anything powerful or important for most strategies, to the point where Emerald Tortoise isn't even run in current Crystal Beast decks, as you'd rather play stronger Crystal Beasts like Pegasus and Carbuncle before you even start considering cards like Emerald Tortoise. But even with how bad Emerald Tortoise is in its own deck, it actually saw a fair amount of competitive play this year because of how it worked in Tier Limits. One of the key strengths of Tier Limits is being able to mill a ton of cards so that you can take advantage of their graveyard effects, and as a result, they would play a ton of different cards with powerful graveyard effects they could use if they were randomly milled. Fairy Tail Snow gave the deck a strong piece of interaction. Vivid Tail and Fusion Substitute allowed the deck to easily out Mystic Mine, and even the Paleozoics gave you free body after you summoned them back to the field. But another great graveyard effect that saw a decent amount of play in Tier Limits was Rainbow Bridge of Salvation. This graveyard effect lets you banish it in order to add a Crystal Beast monster and any field spell in the game from your deck to your hand. This gave Tier Limits a ton of options when it milled it. You could use it to grab Pillar Rhino to get your play started, Zombie World if you are facing down Fluent Ares, or even Mystic Mine if you were going second. One of the key issues with Rainbow Bridge of Salvation, however, is that it required that a Crystal Beast monster was in your deck in order to use it. This meant that if you were playing something like Topaz Tiger or Amber Mammoth, Drawing that Crystal Beast or even milling it meant that Salvation was pretty much offline forever. However, Emerald Tortoise just so happens to be the perfect card for Tier Limits to pair with Salvation, and having that card in hand or in the graveyard was even a benefit for the deck because Emerald Tortoise is an Aqua Monster. This meant that drawing or milling Emerald Tortoise wasn't a big deal, as if you wanted to use the graveyard effect of your Bridge of Salvation, you could just use the graveyard effect of your Tier Limit monsters to shuffle back Emerald Tortoise in order to grab Tier Limit's Kit Kalos, a fusion monster whose required materials are any Tier Limit monster plus any Aqua type monster. So, Bridge of Salvation not only gave you any field spell you wanted, it also gave you a free card that you can actually use as a fusion material. With Trevi Karma soon to be released, however, it's unlikely that Tier Limits will end up playing Rainbow Bridge again, since Trevi Karma is just Rainbow Bridge for decks in the Visa Starfrost lore that just has built in more utility especially since you don't need to play a card that doesn't really do anything in your main deck for it. But for the time it was around in Tier Limit decks, Rainbow Bridge managed to make one of the worst Crystal Beast monsters in the game an absolute boon to the now Tier 0 archetype. Stretching the number 4 spot is number 29, Mannequin Cat, a rank 2 monster that's managed to see a ton of competitive play this year because of Sprite, and has allowed for a ton of old and strange cards to shut down other meta strategies. Mannequin Cat has two effects. The first allows you to target a monster in your opponent's graveyard and special summon it to their side of the field. Now, normally, this would be a pretty bad effect, but it also feeds into Mannequin Cat's second effect, which you can trigger whenever a monster is special summoned to your opponent's side of the field. And whenever it's activated, you can target any monster your opponent controls, and then special summon a monster from your hand, deck, or graveyard with the same type or attribute as that monster targeted. Essentially, this second effect is an e-tally for any monster in the game but only if your opponent controls a monster with the same type or attribute as the monster you want to summon. And so, Sprite plays different Mannequin Cat targets to side into depending on the matchup. If your opponent is playing Tier Limits, you can either play the End of Anubis, since most tier monsters are Dark, or Tetsu Arad Numen, since most tier monsters are Aqua. Both of these cards act as floodgates, which can stop tiers from playing entirely if they're summoned at the right time, since End of Anubis is basically a Abyss Dweller, and Newman stops any monster with over 1800 attack from being summoned. But if you happen to be in a sprite mirror match, you might instead choose to summon Thunder King Ryo, since all the sprite monsters are thunder monsters. This prevents sprite from being able to use the search effects of sprite blue and sprite jet, and could even be used to stop Link or XC summons of key boss monsters with its second effect. And even when against decks that don't special summon at all, Mannequin Cat still has a ton of utility. Against Fluinder Rees, for example, it may appear like Mannequin Cat can't really do anything, but it's actually a really important tool for Sprite to be able to play through an opponent's Dimension Shifter. Because if your opponent activates Dimension Shifter, you can then XC summon Mannequin Cat and use Mannequin Cat's first effect to summon that Shifter from your opponent's graveyard to their side of the field. This then allows you to trigger the second effect of Mannequin Cat to summon out Chaos Hunter from your deck, yet another Floodgate which prevents your opponent from banishing any cards at all. 
restricting the Fluent Reese engine and preventing some of their strongest cards from being used at all. Overall, Mannequin Cat is actually an absurdly strong card that's only managed to begin seeing play again because of how easily Sprite can access it. But now it's seen play, Mannequin Cat has allowed for a whole host of strange and quirky monsters that otherwise wouldn't have seen the light of day to not only see play, but be integral for winning games. And it, alongside its targets, will likely be great tools and sprites for years to come. Being summoned to this list at number 3 is Ra's Disciple, a piece of the Egyptian god support with one of the most restrictive floodgates in the game. Disciple's first effect is actually incredible, as it allows you to swarm the field up to two other copies of itself whenever it's summoned, and if that's where the effect ended, this card would have actually been a really stellar way of generating free materials for Link or XC summoning. But it's Disciple's other effect which makes this card so terrible, as while you control it, you cannot special summon any other monsters at all, except by the effect of Ross Disciple, locking it out of your extra deck and main deck monsters. And you can't even tribute it over for something like Abyss Deal, as Disciple can't be tributed except for the tribute summon of one of the Egyptian god cards. Essentially, if you summoned out Ra's Disciple to your side of the field, you're locking yourself out of doing anything else apart from summoning an Egyptian god, which is why Ra's Disciple never really saw too much play outside of Egyptian god decks, despite the advantage its first effect could generate. But this year, Ra's Disciple has actually seen a ton of use in a deck that doesn't play any Egyptian gods at all, specifically because of its floodgate effect. You see, branded decks would actually use Ra's Disciple as a fusion material when fusing for Albion the Branded Dragon, since Ra's Disciple is a light monster. So you would use the effect of a Luber to search for Branded Fusion from your deck, then use Branded Fusion to summon Albion with Ra's Disciple in Fallen of Albats. Then you would use the effect of Albion to fusion summon Lubelion by banishing Albats from your graveyard and a Luber from your field, and with the effect of Lubelion you would shuffle back Albion and Albats to summon out Mirror Jade the Iceblade Dragon. After that you would use the effect of Mirror Jade to banish itself and another copy of Albion into graveyard, then during your end phase Albion can set Branded Expulsion to your field. Then, during your opponent's turn, with the effect of Expulsion, you can tribute your on-field Albion to target your Banished Aluber and Ra's Disciple in your graveyard, and summon out Aluber to your field and defense position, while giving Ra's Disciple to your opponent. This locks most decks out of play in the game entirely. They can't link off Ra's Disciple because of its Floodgate, and they can't crash it if you summon it to their field and defense position, because you can't change the battle position of a monster during the turn at summon, leaving normal summoning as the only option most decks have. This is basically an FTK for most decks. But others, like Fluent Reese, can actually function incredibly well under Ross Disciple since the entire deck is based around normal summoning. And in Master Duel for a while, this was actually a pretty prominent issue as Fluent Reese was a really popular deck prior to the statue ban, which made Ross Disciple a risky gambit, as it either won you the game on the spot or lost hard to Fluent Reese. So to counter that, branded decks would actually pivot to yet another terrible card that they could give to their opponent to floodgate them out of the game. Edo, the Supreme Magical Force, has a really similar effect to Ra's Disciple, and can be summoned to your opponent's field with a combo very similar to the one to bring out Ra's Disciple. But the key difference is that Edo stops all summons. So in Master Duel, it was actually the go-to option for Expulsion over Ra's Disciple, because it also stopped Flunder Reese from playing the game. Both Edo and Disciple are undoubtedly terrible cards. But even despite how weak they can be, Branded Expulsion has managed to turn them into terrifying threats that can be used to lock your opponent out of the game entirely with self-restrictive floodgates. Winding up to number 2 is Windup Kitten, an often forgotten member of the Windup archetype that saw a spike in play this year because of its level and powerful removal effect. And this effect is very simple, but deceptively strong, as it lets you target a monster opponent controls and return it to the hand but you can only use this effect of Windup Kitten once per copy on the field. This effect represents a free way to remove an opponent's monster from the field. This is a really strong effect, but one that decks haven't been able to take advantage of until now because of how hard Windup Kitten was to access. But because Windup Kitten is level 2, it actually became a really valuable asset for Runic Sprite. Runic Sprite is a great deck, but it has its own fair share of weaknesses. The Runic cards force you to skip your next battle phase, so it was actually fairly difficult to remove your opponent's threats and boss monsters from the field during your turn. The deck definitely has its fair share of options, like Onibimaru and Flashing Fire, but losing the battle phase meant that losing out on one of your best ways to clear your opponent's field, and if you use Flashing Fire on a tier limit monster, you just trigger its graveyard effect. And that's where Windup Kitten came in. Because Windup Kitten is level 2, it can be summoned off a gigantic sprite, and then you can use the effect of Kitten to bounce one of your opponent's monsters to the hand, making it a really nice way to clear your opponent's monsters and was particularly effective against tier limits, since it didn't trigger their graveyard effect since they'd be bounced back to the extra deck. But that's not all, because you can also link off Windup Kitten and Gigantic to link Summon Sprite Elf, and then use the effect of Elf to bring back Windup Kitten from the graveyard. And because Kitten is treated as a different card when you summon it back from the graveyard, you can use this effect again to bounce yet another monster your opponent controls, giving you free removal every turn so long as you re-summon out Kitten with Elf. Nowadays, Kitten is very rarely played, even in Sprite, but for the brief period that it did see play, it was an incredibly effective tool for clearing away your opponent's board. 
especially in a deck that rarely ever had access to its battle phase. But even for as strong as Kitten was, there is one more card that shined even brighter than it in 2022. Swimming into the number one spot of this list is King of the Swamp, another really old card that was released in 2004 and has only now just managed to really start seeing a ton of play in the metagame 18 years later. Like most older cards, King of the Swamp's effects are very simple. Its main effect allows you to discard it from your hand in order to add a copy of Polymerization from your deck to your hand. And King of the Swamp's other effect allows it to be substituted as material for any fusion material that's specifically listed on a fusion monster, as long as the other materials used to fusion summon that monster are correct. Every aspect of King of the Swamp has allowed for Telemans to take advantage of the card more so than any other card on this list. The fact that it can add polymerization for free has allowed Telemans access to one of the strongest generic fusion monsters in the game, Guardian Chimera, which gives them an extra option to clear away an opponent's field while also drawing cards for free. But that's not all, because King of the Swamp also just so happens to be an Aqua-type monster. So when you discard it to the graveyard to search Polly, you've set up your graveyard already, so that when you send a Tillman monster to the graveyard, you can use its effect to fuse it and King of the Swamp into Kid Kalos and combo from there. By far, the most appealing aspect of King of the Swamp for Tillamans is its substitution effect, which allows them easy access to their own fusion boss monster, as well as the fusion boss monsters of other decks. With the strongest example so far being how the deck can access Graffa, Dragon Overlord of the Dark World, the latest Dark World boss monster. You see, Graffa's effect is actually incredible for Telemans, as it changes the effect of your opponent's monster or normal spell or trap card to force the controller of Graffa to discard a card instead. And if you discard a Telemans, you're sent it to the graveyard by a card effect, allowing you to use its effective fusion summon and combo off on your opponent's turn after negating one of their combo pieces. One of the key issues with Graffa, however, is that it requires the original Graffa in order to summon, a card which is great for Dark Worlds, but not something you'd want to run in Telemans. King of the Swamp remedies this issue. As now, instead of having to play a brick that does nothing for your deck in order to access new Graffa, you can instead use King of the Swamp to act as the original Graffa for a fusion summon. And because fusion Graffa's other materials is a dark monster, which most of the tier limits are, the card becomes laughably easy to go into. But King of the Swamp's utility doesn't even stop there. In the OCG, tier limits have been around for a lot longer than the TCG and have had a recent ban list which saw tier limit Kid Kalos, one of the deck's biggest combo pieces, completely banned, as well as a ton of limits to the other tier cards. And you would think this would make tier limits unplayable, since banning Kid Kalos meant they can no longer access one of their best end board pieces, tier limits Rukalos, since one of its fusion materials is Kid Kalos. However, King of the Swamp has allowed for Rukalos to still be summoned in the OCG, since Rukalos just so happens to specifically mention Kid Kalos allowing you to fuse any tier limit name with King of the Swamp to access Rukalos easily. So, even with all of the hate it's received in the Forbidden Limited list, Tier Limits is still around in the OCG, partly due to how it specifically synergizes with King of the Swamp. A ton of strange and old cards have seen competitive play this year, but none are as unique or as strong as King of the Swamp. And for as long as Tier Limits is relevant to the deck, King of the Swamp is going to be a great card for them to fall back on, especially if the deck receives the same kind of treatment in the TCG as it did in the OCG. But even as it stands right now, it's the strongest but strangest card of 2022. I made a video on infinite loops that cause illegal game states, and with this video I'll cover infinite loops that are totally legal in Yu-Gi-Oh! and can win you the game. In this list we'll try to cover 10 cards which cause infinite loops in legal game states, if not completely legal, with the ban list. A lot of these cards are going to be banned cards. And at number 10, we have Flintlock. Now, this card is able to cause an infinite loop with another copy of itself, and Flint. Flintlock has the effect where it can move the equipped spell card Flint to any other monster on the field, and not once per turn. It does have a once per turn effect of moving Flint to itself, though. So if you move Flint to another copy of Flintlock, the other Flintlock can just move it back to the original Flintlock, and they can just both keep on moving Flint between each other infinitely. And this movement counts as the equipping and equip card, so if you have morale boosts out on the field, you'll gain a thousand life points every time you move Flint. And you can gain an infinite amount of life points during your turn with this combo. Or, if you combine it with Fire Princess, who inflicts 500 points of damage every time you gain life points, you can OTK your opponent with this infinite life point gain loop. The loop itself requires three cards, infinitely gaining life points requires four cards, and actually being able to OTK your opponent requires five cards. So it's not the most consistent infinite loop in the world, and that's why it's only at number 10. Number 9, Primal Seed. This card allows you to infinitely recycle one removed from play card. Primal Seed has the effect where you can only activate it if you have Blackluster Soldier Envy of the Beginning or Chaos Emperor Dragon Envoy of the End on the field. You can add two removed from play cards to your hand. So in order to set up the loop, 
you need to get BLS on the field, a card that banishes all cards like Macro Cosmos or Banisher of the Radiance, and have two copies of Primal Seed in your hand, plus the card you want to loop. In the example in the video, I'm using Tremendous Fire in order to OTK my opponent. So I just use Tremendous Fire to inflict 500 points of damage to my opponent, then Tremendous Fire will be banished due to Radiance's effect. Then I use Primal Seed to recover Tremendous Fire, and then use it again. Then I use my second Primal Seed to recover Tremendous Fire, and the first copy of Primal Seed. Then I can just use Tremendous Fire, and then Primal Seed to recover Tremendous Fire and Primal Seed. And you can just do this as many times as you want. With this loop, you can technically recycle any card, so you can also give your monsters infinite attack if you recycle an attack boosting spell card. It's just, Tremendous Fire was the quickest way to OTK my opponent for this video. In order to set up this loop, you need four cards. One specific card on the field, two specific spell cards in your hand, and a way to banish all cards. Which makes this loop not at all consistent, and that's why it's only at number 9. Number 8. Red Eyes Flare Metal Dragon. This card has the effect where each time your opponent activates an effect, you immediately inflict 500 damage. One of the more popular ways to use this card in a practical duel is if your opponent brings out Beals on their side of the field. Beals has the effect where it gains attack equal to the damage you take. So if your opponent has Beals out and they activate any effect while you have Flare Metal Dragon, it'll start an infinite loop that will kill your opponent. As Beals will gain 500 attack, which will cause Flare Metal Dragon to inflict 500 damage which will then cause Beals to gain 500 attack, and then Flare Metal Dragon will then inflict 500 damage, and it will just repeat until your opponent loses. Now, there is a way to force an infinite loop with a Red Eyes Flare Metal Dragon without relying on your opponent having Beals, or giving your opponent a Beals. If you give your opponent a Gelin Duo with the effect of Summon Sorceress, and you have Red Eyes Flare Metal Dragon on your side of the field, you can wait for your opponent to activate an effect which will then cause Flare Metal Dragon to inflict 500 damage. Gelin Duo has the effect where if you take damage, this card is destroyed. But, its effect will be negated on your opponent due to Summon Sorcerer's effect. So it won't actually destroy itself. But Flare Metal Dragon will chain to its effect trying to go off and inflict 500 damage. Which will then cause its effect to try to go off again, but will be negated and will stay on the field and then Flare Metal Dragon will inflict 500 more damage. So with this combo, a much easier to pull off combo since Summon Sorceress can give it to your opponent straight from your deck, and is easy to bring out, you can cause an infinite loop to OTK your opponent. Number 7, Colossal Fighter. Colossal Fighter is a synchro monster who has the effect where, if it's destroyed by battle, you can special summon a warrior type monster from your graveyard. Colossal Fighter himself is a warrior type monster, and can target itself. Now, in order to cause the infinite loop, you need to have rainbow life, and your opponent needs to have a monster with a higher attack than Colossal Fighter, which can be accomplished by giving your opponent a kaiju. Colossal Fighter then can just attack into the higher attack monster and destroy itself, and then bring itself back, and then you'll gain life points equal to the damage he took due to rainbow life's effect, and you can just repeat this as many times per turn as you want, allowing you to gain an infinite amount of life points. And because this combo is so easy to set up, you just need one trap card and a way to bring out Colossal Fighter, and for your opponent to have a stronger monster, which you can just give them, it's actually kind of a problem for some sanctioned events, to the point where Rainbow Life is routinely banned for the World Championship tournaments. It used to be you could OTK with this loop if you were to equip Armory Arm to one of your opponent's monsters and attack into it. Armory Arm inflicts damage to your opponent equal to the attack of the monster destroyed by the monster this card is equipped to, which works if you equip it to one of your opponent's monsters and then attack into it. But they create a special ruling that states the monster must be in the graveyard for the effect to apply. And since Colossal Fighter's special summon itself after being destroyed, the damage never actually takes effect. So in order for this combo to work, you need two copies of Colossal Fighter, which is a lot more difficult to pull off. Number 6. Manticore of Darkness. This card has been involved in a lot of loops in the past, but I'm only going to mention two of them for this video. Manticore has the effect where if it's sent to the graveyard, you can send a beast, beast warrior, or wing beast type monster you control or in your hand to the graveyard to special summon this card from the graveyard during the end phase. Since this card itself is a beast warrior type monster and its effect is not once per turn, if you manage to get one Manticore in the graveyard and one in your hand, 
you can infinitely special summon one Manticore by sending the other one to the graveyard. Now, in order to OTK with this card, you can combine it with Archfiend Eater and Backfire. Archfiend Eater has the effect where during the end phase, you can destroy one monster you control to special summon this card, and not once per turn. Backfire has the effect to inflict 500 damage to your opponent every time a fire type monster is destroyed. So, if you have Archfiend Eater in the graveyard and Manticore on the field with Backfire, during the end phase, Archfiend Eater can destroy Manticore to bring itself out, which will cause Backfire to inflict 500 damage to your opponent. And then Manticore can send Eater to the graveyard to bring itself out. And then Eater can activate its effect, since it's still the end phase, to destroy Manticore and bring itself back out. And this can happen an infinite amount of times, which can OTK your opponent with the Backfire's damage. This combo requires three cards to set up, so it's not that inconsistent. More recently, when Zodiacs were at full power, if your opponent activated a Max C, you could use the Zodiacs to search out two copies of Manticore, since they were Beast Warrior type monsters. And if you could just send one to the graveyard, you could infinitely special summon them during your end phase to cause your opponent to draw every card in their deck. And since Max C was a pretty good counter to Zodiacs, some people were signing in two Manticores of Darkness in order to deck out their opponents who used Max C. Number 5, Knight Assailant. This card has two effects. First effect is unimportant for this loop. Its second effect is, whenever this card is sent from your hand to the graveyard, you can add another flip monster from your graveyard to your hand. Since Knight Assailant himself is a flip monster, you can add a second copy of it from your graveyard to your hand. So with two Knight Assailants, you have infinite discard fodder, as one can just add the other one back to your hand if discarded. If combined with a card like Snipe Hunter, whose effect is to discard a card to potentially destroy one card on the field as many times per turn as you want, you could infinitely clear out your opponent's board. And that's why Knight Assailant is limited. This is one of those cards on the list who's broken with multiple copies of it in your deck, but is completely fine if there's only allowed one copy in your deck. Number 4, Firewall Dragon. Now this card has two effects. Uh, I'm only going to talk about its second effect though. Its second effect is if a card this card points to goes to the graveyard, you can special summon a monster from your hand. And this effect is not once per turn. So, if combined with a card like a Assault Core, whose effect is that if this card is sent to the graveyard, you can add another Union monster from your graveyard to your hand, and a card like Toon Cannon Soldier, who allows you to tribute a monster to inflict 500 damage to your opponent, as long as you have one other monster in your hand, you can infinitely cycle between two assault cores, recycling themselves, and then being special sum with Firewall Dragon. And because of this, assault core got limited so it couldn't loop itself. Kinda like why Knight Assailant was limited. But then when Firewall Dragon got banned, they put assault core back to unlimited, since it was only really a problem as long as Firewall Dragon existed. Unlike Knight Assailant, who was useful in much more situations. The thing with Firewall, though, is it could allow other infinite loops and not just with Assault Core. And that's why this card got banned. He was too easy to bring out and caused too many infinite loops which could be done on your first turn to win. And as the most recent card on this list to come out, this goes to show you that they are not at all afraid of still printing cards which cause infinite loops, and they have definitely not learned their lessons from all these other past cards. Number 3, Samsara Lotus. This card can be used in a whole bunch of different infinite loops, but for this video, I'm going to use a more gimmicky one. Samsara Lotus has the effect where, during the end phase, if you control no spell and traps, you can special summon this card, and this effect is not once per turn. So if you can infinitely destroy the card with a card like King Tiger Wangu, and have another card like Genix Ally Bell Flame, who gains a counter every time a card is destroyed, which increases attack by 100, and inflicts 300 damage to your opponent for every counter it has if it's destroyed by battle. You can gain an infinite amount of stacks with Samsara Lotus and King Tiger Wangu, infinitely destroying and reviving itself. This is not really the best combo in the world, and there are other ways to abuse this effect, and in more practical ways, but I think this one is funny. Samsara Lotus is currently banned for some consistent loop it was used in, but it can also be used in this gimmicky one I just showed in this video. Number 2, Ultimate Offering. This card has the effect where you can pay 500 life points to normal summon an additional time. 
and this effect is not once per turn. Now, there are many ways to infinite loop with this effect, but the one I'm going to show in this video is a little simple. What you can do is summon Athena to the field, have ultimate offering up, and use it to normal summon Honest from your hand, which will activate Athena's first effect to inflict 600 damage to your opponent since a fairy type monster was summoned. Then you can use Honest's effect to send himself back to your hand. Then use ultimate offering to pay 500 life points to normal summon it, which will activate Athena's effect to do damage again. And then you can just activate Honest to send it back to your hand. Since you're doing 600 damage every time this interaction takes place, while only paying 500, if you started out with even life points, you can OTK your opponent with this loop. But since you do have to pay 500 life points every time you use ultimate offering, it's not really an infinite loop since you can run out of life points. That is, unless you use the mysterious puppeteer, who has the effect to gain 500 life points every time a monster is normal summoned which then allows Ultimate Offering to enter Infinite Loop territory. Ultimate Offering is an incredibly strong card even outside of this loop, and that's why this card is banned. And at number 1, Butterfly Dagger Elma, a card basically on the ban list because of how easy it causes infinite loops. Elma has the effect to increase the attack of the monster it's equipped to by 300. Its second effect is, if sent to the graveyard while equipped, you can just return it to your hand. So if used on a card like Gear Free the Iron Knight, who has the effect to destroy any equipped card equipped to it, you can infinitely activate Butterfly Dagger Elma, have it destroyed and sent to the graveyard, and then return it to your hand. And if this is combined with a spell counter card like Royal Magical Library, you can create an infinite amount of spell counters, which can allow you to draw through your entire deck in one turn. Now, there's actually a lot of ways to use Butterfly Dagger Elma's ability to infinitely recycle itself in other infinite loops, and other ways besides just Gear Free the Iron Knight, and that's why this card is banned. Being able to return to the hand with no cost after being destroyed on the field is too powerful, and no other card in the game has a similar effect, without some kind of heavy restriction, or at least a once per turn clause. You'll notice that pretty much all of these effects in this video are viable only because they don't have once per turn clauses. Like Treeborn Frog used to be used how Samsara Lotus is used, until it got a text change to change its effect to once per turn. So really, they could fix pretty much all of these cards by just adding a once per turn to the card. And they do occasionally go back and do just that, like they did with Treeborn Frog. 